The Mystery of Freemasonry Unveiled by the Cardinal of Chile, Jose Maria Cardinal Caro y Rodriguez. First printing, circa 1928. Forward. The Book of His Eminence, the Most Reverend Cardinal Caro y Rodriguez, Archbishop of Santiago, Chile, has been highly approved in various countries. For this reason, we present to the public a new edition. We have no doubt but that this one will be equally well received because of its controversial theme, the necessity for its being divulged in the period of disorientation and confusion, and the concise and penetrating manner in which the subject is presented. We feel grateful for the encouragement which has come from His Eminence, Cardinal Rodriguez, in granting his gracious permission for this new edition. There are reasons and our sentiments. The public will judge our efforts. The Editors, 1957. Prologue to the Second Edition The rapidity with which the first edition of this work was exhausted, in spite of its large number, has proved clearly that its publication was opportune and that it met a real need. Without exception, those who have read it have altered their decision to become Masons. Many have thanked me for having opened their eyes about an institution which had been recommended to them, and many more have congratulated me for having brought into the open an association feared for its secrets and its intrigues. Among these have been some of the most outstanding personalities of our country. Especially encouraging to me have been the letters received from archbishops and bishops of Latin America and also of the Philippines, which were not only complimentary, but carried frank and effusive expressions of approval. Many have asked for copies of this little book in spite of its modest presentation. Among the good wishes I have received, I wish particularly to acknowledge those from the cardinals to whom both work had been sent, namely their eminence Cardinal Benlock and Cardinal Below. I have introduced in the second edition some improvements and additions. I have arranged in the index the divisions, changing in part the titles of the paragraphs, adjusting them better to the order of the book, and made one or two indispensable corrections. The study of masonry, which I have endeavored to continue pursuing, has but confirmed the ideas I had expressed in the first edition. Moreover, conversations which I have had with Masons have but strengthened my own convictions. While congratulating me on this little work, several people have wished to corroborate with concrete facts the judgment which I have expressed. I shall refrain from publishing the communications because there are still living brother Masons whose names are mentioned as having participated in deeds and activities which can be accounted as transgressions of the law. It is preferable to allow each reader to substantiate for himself his observations of people and their actions that come within the circle of his own experience, never forgetting what I so frequently repeat, namely that in masonry there are serious and sincere persons who are unaware of its objectives or of its works, and who are not regulating their lives according to the influence of the Masonic doctrine and spirit. Masonry has also judged my book and the brothers repeat the opinion which was published in the Revista. According to the brothers, I have collected all the mire of the anti-Masonic sewer, and with the broken or apocryphal references with repetition of concepts of foreign range and despicable hirelings which the clergy has had for its use and pleasure, attempted to discredit the holy work of love of neighbor which masonry spreads everywhere. Furthermore, the above-mentioned revista adds that because I availed myself of the free postage enjoyed by church dignitaries, the pamphlet has been distributed postage-free throughout the country. My reply will be brief. In the first place, the booklet was published in Santiago and distributed from there by the Society of the Good Press, which is not an ecclesiastical institution and which is not granted free postage. The copies which I were sent me at Enique arrived with the required postage attached. Secondly, if I have not quoted completely all the testimonies which I have examined, it has been in order to avoid making this work much longer than necessary or more lengthy than I had planned. Even though I may have wished to extend it, I have always pointed out the source of my references with great precision, contrary to the Masonic publications, which almost never do. Thirdly, the references either are taken from Masonic authors of recognized authority in the order, or else refer to historic deeds in which the brothers or the Masonic influence have taken part. 
if there is anything repugnant in all this, it is not due to me or to the enemies of masonry, but rather because of its own actions and doctrines. Someone has advanced the statement that I failed to prove what I said of masonry. Readers will say whether there is sufficient proof of the general affirmation, which is here made concerning the universal deception through which masonry gains and holds its initiates, and indoctrinates deeply and at times forcibly regarding their real plans for the destruction of the Christian order, and the banishment of the very name of Christ, and of even of God, all of which is proposed either openly or covertly, according to circumstances. The readers will also tell whether or not what they see and know of masonry and its works corroborates my statements. And as for a political intervention of masonry and its anti-Christian spirit, the events which in Chile preceded and surrounded the elections of 1924, such as use made of the army to mock and defy the popular will, the violation of pacts of honor, the irritant pressure exercised over the head of the government to sidetrack and degrade him, the development of the insufferable atmosphere which burst forth and the confusion and agitation of the scourge initiated by the army and navy supposedly for the defense of the national interests evince almost universal sympathy but all this was followed by anti-religious plans concerning divorce the confiscation of church property the separation of church and state etc all those measures proved to the country the duplicity of the statements made by masonry Moreover, Masons have said that it is very easy for them to destroy what this book established. Nevertheless, they have not as yet, in spite of having had more than enough time to do so. What they have done is to pursue their campaign against the Catholic Church, with the anonymous tract La Tribuna, consisting of vague references, impossible to prove, and with the usual statements, based neither on logic nor on truth, but rather on prejudice against Christianity. I've been asked if Masonry has taken revenge on me, and of course, there are readers who will be cur very curious to know this. Masonry is discreet enough to act by itself, and if revenge took place, it would lose instead of gaining. But it wears the mask of a political party by means of which it exercises all the actions which the influence of that party allows it to use. Those who have lived in, in Quique, and perhaps even the inhabitants of the whole country, have come to know something of what has been done. For instance, on the occasion of the coming of His Eminence, Cardinal Benlock, or of the Eucharistic Congress, which we are going to hold in the Municipal Theatre, whatever there may have been in it of personal offense, I forgive, and overlook with all my heart, for what there has been of offense to religion. I ask God to a pardon also, because they know not what they do. Finally, since this book has no other pretension but to inform its readers about masonry, I have thought it better to do it with the words of authoritative than I, even though it increased the number of references. Introduction Number 1. My Purpose With true temerity, I began to treat of the subject matter of this book with a presentiment that I am going to displease more than one person, owing to my intention of revealing it as is, with God's help, I propose to do. There are among the Masons serious and sincere individuals who perhaps have arrived at the conviction that the association to which they have given their name not only is inoffensive but honorable and worthy of recommendation. Among those persons there are some who treat me kindly and who honor me with their attentions, and to others I am obligated and grateful to them. But if those people whose sincerity I recognize think clearly, they understand that I, too, am going to deal with this matter with full sincerity and under no circumstance do I intend to cause anyone the slightest annoyance, but rather to fulfill an obligation which conscience imposes upon me. Moreover, they will discover in this work an effort to enlighten those who, in my opinion, and according to the rules of right reason, have fallen into this error without realizing it, or because of excessive complacency. There are many works written on masonry, as one can see in the bibliography, which lists encyclopedic dictionaries, especially the Encyclopedia Universal, Illustrata, which deal with it. Here in Chile, there have been a published a few booklets, and there have been some from other places, some translated from the French as those of Monsignor Seger and of Monsignor Fava. The re reader will say, quote, Why, then, a new booklet? Certainly, it is not because of an excessive desire to write, 
that which, for various reasons, has cost me enough, the outstanding works either are written in a foreign language or are too extensive and within the reach of only a few. The aforementioned booklets, either because of omitting the author's names or due to neglecting certain important aspects of the subject, leave, in my opinion, something to be desired. That is why I have undertaken this work, to place within the grasp of a great number of people, including Masons, matters which cannot help but be of interest to them. I believe that all the parents of Catholic families, all the young men and women, every person who is seriously concerned about his religion, his country, and the welfare of humanity should know something of the known facts about an institution and doctrines which are intimately related to matters of such vital importance. I wish to remove certain doubts and to dissipate certain misconceptions through which harm is done to many incautious or imprudent people who, being of a trustful nature, would be drawn into masonry, believe that they can improve their moral life, starting with the education of their own conscience. I am sure that many masons will be grateful to me for letting them know what is hidden from them. I have now heard from various people concerning their disillusionment about masonry, and the report that without this book they might have never penetrated to the foundations of its secrets. Precisely, this has been one of the incentives which led me to undertake this study of masonry. I hope to impart to many the light which they do not have now and for which they will eventually be grateful. Number two, can the uninitiated know anything of masonry? This is a question which necessarily must occur to all those who know the endless precautions which masonry takes to keep its secrets unknown. Many masons themselves are going to ask this question above all those who are very little concerned with knowing their institution, but accept blindly what is told them. There are among us many Masons who, I am sure, know much less of Masonry than I knew before devoting a little time to this recent study, since in this matter they rely with all good faith on what they hear in the lodges without spending time to concern themselves about it. Now, how has one been able to find out what is enclosed with the confines of the lodges and in the circles of masons bound by an oath of secrecy? Here's how. In the first place, there have been many who, realizing the objectives and the intrigues of masonry, and feeling the reproaches of conscience, have turned back, have separated themselves from the lodges, and have revealed what their conscience told them they should no longer conceal. I shall cite as an example the Count of Hogwitz, who, after having exercised much influence and having held high degrees in the lodges, in 1822 represent, presented a report to the Congress of Verona on the intrigues of the secret societies, quote, whose venom, he said, quote, menaces humanity today more than ever before. I shall cite Copen Albancelli, who, after having arrived at Rose Croix knighthood and on the eve of ascending to another higher degree, withdrew also and devoted himself to revealing the danger which Masonry held for his country, France, and for Christian civilization. He has established a newspaper and has written the work previously mentioned. I shall cite Domenico Margiotta, who is an ex-33rd degree Mason and an ex-Grand Master of many lodges of various rites in Italy, author of Adriano Leni, etc. Another means of knowing the secrets of Masonry is the official documents of the lodges which various states have succeeded in seizing. They give a good picture of what goes on behind the, quote, iron curtain of Freemasonry. For example, the government of Bavaria, in 1786, took by surprise all the papers and archives of the sect of the Illuminati, founded by Weishaupt, and had them published with the name, quote, Original Writings of the Order and Sect of the Illuminati. Other documents of this type were discovered in the castle of Baron Bassus and Sandersdorf, and they were published under the title of quote, supplement, etc. While writing his work, Eckert had at hand also those and other documents provided by the governments. Another means of knowing the secrets of masonry is the rituals themselves, which differ according to the rite, bar in concord with the general ideas of the sect. In this same vein are the Masonic works and publications circulated within the order, in which they usually publish the lectures or discourses of their leaders especially in their grand assemblies. Some well-known Masonic publications are the magazines El Mundo Masonico, La Revue Maconique, La Revista Masonica, and the works of Regan, Findel, Pike, Mackey, McLevican. These last three are from the United States. 
and many others too numerous to mention. Here in Chile, La Verdad is published. These exist sufficient Masonic literature for anyone, exercising patience and perseverance to pursue and form a complete judgment of Masonry. Number three, a true Proteus. What the fables tell of the mythological personage called Proteus, who could never be caught due his ability to transform himself into various shapes, is realized exactly in Masonry, which, as Proteus, changes its form according to its convenience. At times it manifests itself as Christian, at other times as atheist, sometimes it appears as monarchist, again as republican, and even occasionally as communist. Sometimes it incites to revolution, on other occasions it defends the existing order. Sometimes it protects the Masonic doctrines and recognizes as its own the deeds of its members. Other times, above all, when such deeds awaken public execration, it washes its hands and attributes those deeds to the excesses of personal passions of those who perpetrated them. On the other hand, what is done or taught in some lodges is unknown in inferior ones. Not all rites are the same. There remains then a broad field so that most Masons can truthfully say, quote, I am a Mason, and although I have occupied high posts in the lodge, I know nothing of that which is attributed to Masonry. These are calumnies hurled at us by its enemies. End quote. Some Masons are ignorant of many things concerning Masonry, but others will speak of these other untruthfully because it is expedient for them to do so. It is easily understood that a society which is hidden in the darkness of night or in secrecy in order to carry out its work has a tremendous advantage over its adversaries in sidetracking and deceiving them, and it will cause arduous work for the curious person who attempts to discover even a part of its activities. With this in mind, I shall, as I proceed, present proofs based on the most authentic and undeniable data available so that the reader may form for himself an idea of that organization, remembering all the while the words of an ex-Mason, quote, a Mason is unqualified to speak on Masonry. Kappen, Albancelli, La Drama Maconique. Part 1. The Nature of Freemasonry. Chapter 1. Organization of Freemasonry. Number 4. Government and Administration. It is not within my plan to give a detailed description of the organization of masonry, but I consider it necessary to give some idea of it even though it may be superficial. Those who wish more details can consult the works of Espaza, Dom Benoit, etc. Masonry consists of Grand Lodges or Grand Orients, which are also called Federations, Sovereign Consuls, Masonic Powers, and there are the Grand Divisions of Masonry, governed by a Council or Executive Committee with a Grand Master at the head of each of them. This council is elected in the Masonic Assembly, composed of representatives appointed annually by the lodges of the Federation, one by each lodge. The Assembly is the legislative body of the Grand Lodge or Federation. It is also called the Convent. The Grand Lodges or Grand Orients are composed of offices or lodges, which they have under their dependence greater or lesser numbers according to the prosperity of the order or the extent of the territorial jurisdiction. When the lodge is not regularly constituted, it is called triangle or lodge in formation. In Belgium, they are called fraternal circles, whose existence they attempt to hide carefully. Their rule was adopted by the Grand Orient in June 20 of 1880. Their gatherings are at least monthly and secret. Each lodge has its directive or executive board or council of administration, which is usually called Orient and is composed of the Venerable slash Master, First and Second Guards, Vice Presidents, Orator, Secretary, Treasurer, Host, Expert, Deputy to the Grand Lodge, Guard of the Temple, Master of Ceremonies, Organizer of Banquets, Standard Bearers, Archivists, etc., etc., and H8 Servants. Number five, Directive Council. Only the first seven form the Directive Council. The first five are called Quote unquote, the five lights or luminaries of the temple. They are elected by a majority of votes. I understand that it is in December of each year. Quote, a venerable is not then so high a personality as in ordinarily believed, end quote, says an ex-Freemason. Quote, he holds this position on his own lodge only where he is the first of the lights, and that for only one year, unless he is re-elected. 
Number six, Masonic Rates. These are the constitutions, rules, symbols, and observances of the Masonic institutions. Not all the lodges belong to the same rite. Although at least apparently independent among themselves and the groups which follow the diverse rites, yet it may happen that one same head or one same council governs many rites. Thus, under the empire of Napoleon, Cambaceres gathered together under his rule, says Ragan, quote, Grand Master attached to the Grand Orient of France, Grand Master and Protector of the accepted French Rite, Grand Master of Honor of the Rite of Herod, Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of the Philosophic Scottish Rite, Grand Master of the Primitive Rite, etc. As one can see, there are a great number of rites. Actually, at present, there are only about ten in activity, namely A, the Rite or York or Masonry of the Royal Arch, practice in England and its former and present colonies and in countries where are many people of English nationality as China, Puerto Rico, and Chile. B. The ancient accepted Scottish Rite, practiced by Masons of various nations, is the most popular and the most widespread according to the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. In many countries, especially Latin ones, their supreme councils are the only Masonic authority and is this one that is most in vogue in Chile. C. The Rite of Herod, practiced by Masons of Scotland, Germany, and Hungary. D. The French Rite, practiced by Masons subject to the Grand Orient of France. E. The Ancient Reformed Scottish Rite, practiced in Belgium and Holland. F. The Philosophic Scottish Rite, practiced in the Grand Alpine Lodge of Switzerland. G. The Joan Rite of Zinnendord is practiced by some Masons of Germany. H. The Electric Rite is practiced by the Grand Lodge of Frankfurt on Main, Germany. I, the Rite of Mizram, is practiced by some Masons subject to the Council General of Paris, etc. 7. The Degrees All rites have three symbolic degrees, namely Apprentice, Companion, and Master. But the number of philosophic degrees varies from 5 or 7 to 92 in the case of the Rite of Memphis. The masons of the inferior degrees meet in lodges, the superior degrees meet in chapter, councils, courts, tribunals, consistories, etc. The first three degrees are always conferred in accordance with the ceremonial in use. This is not always done with the higher degrees. Some follow the custom of conferring degrees by simple appointment, except the fourth, ninth, fourteenth, and sixteenth degrees of the Scottish Rite. As one can easily understand, the philosophic degrees correspond to the exact degrees of knowledge of the doctrines and understanding of the symbols and allegories which are propounded in masonry from the first degrees. Only in the final degrees of each rite are all the secrets revealed, and only then does one acquire in all its nakedness, free from the ambiguities and pretensions, the Masonic truth, which is not taught in the lower degrees because their minds are not yet prepared to receive it. The people of the United States, often through sarcasm or perhaps in seriousness, give to some t Masons the title of quote-unquote brilliant, to others of the Masons the degree of the quote knife and fork, and to still some others the title of rusty Masons. The brilliant Masons are those who know and practice the ceremonies to the very letter. It seems that there are many simple people who believe that in this lies Masonic perfection, and they consider themselves amply rewarded by the title. Those of the quote knife and fork think that the only objective of masonry is to have lavish banquets, and the, quote, rusty, one are those who vegetate in masonry without concerning themselves much in furthering their knowledge of its doctrines and purposes. I believe that there are many, quote, rusty masons, i.e. knowing what is all about, since they are giving their money and lending their names to an institution whose objective would horrify them if they ever found out. But let no one believe that the Masons content themselves with such modest titles as apprentice, companion, and master to classify their members. However, much equality may be one of their slogans. I know of no other institution in existence which has invented such highfalutin titles to distinguish its hierarchy as has Masonry. Here are some examples taken from the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Fifth degree, the perfect master, eleventh degree, the sublime elect of the twelve, or Prince Ameth, sixteenth degree, the Prince of Jerusalem, nineteenth degree, 
the Grand Pontiff, 28th degree, the Knight of the Sun or Prince Adept, 31st degree, the Grand Inspector Inquisitor Commander, 32nd degree, the Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, 8. The Influence of the Higher Degrees and Lodges. The dignitaries of the lodges are elected by the members, but the appointments to higher degrees come from above, without those who are ascending in rank realizing it. They believe that promotion is through their own initiative. This is because the organization of the lodges is admirably constituted to hide higher level influences. The inferior degrees are directed by a power which is at a great distance from them and which directs them without their knowing it. To have an idea of this organization, one must realize that in the lowest degree, that of apprentice, these people are never left working alone, but they are always watched by masons of higher degrees by masters or by others of very high degrees who wear only the insignia of masters. The apprentice who manifests aspirations of corresponding to the designs of masonry receives a quote increase in salary, that is, he is lifted to the degrees of companion and with the same lick will ascend to the degree of master. Intermixing with the masters, the quote brothers of higher degrees are in the habit of attending the lodges to spy upon candidates and to secure for them a promotion or a, quote, increase in salary if they deserve it. In this way, the apprentice have secrets from the outside world just as the companions and masters respectively have from their inferiors, and so does each degree have secrets from the one beneath it. Sometimes the, quote, brothers of higher degrees are known, sometimes unknown. He who attends the lodge sees them subject and obedient to the master and imagines that they are of his own degree, or at most of the master degree, since he is in the presence of members of a superior lodge. These are the ones who bring from above the Masonic inspirations as it, they in turn receive them from others higher yet. Each lodge stands in relation to the higher one, just like the outside world stands in relation to the lowest degree of Masonry. Known or unknown, the brothers of higher degree study the state of mind the preparation reached by the inferior lodge, and at the opportune moment they suggest the idea that they wish to make prevalent or the resolution which they want them to adopt. One of them proposes it to them and another or others, who are also members in a higher lodge, support it. Those of the lesser lodge, unaware perhaps that the resolution proposed to them has come from above, adopt it as though it were their own idea. There is then being built a very ingenious Masonic pyramid, as Coppin Albancelli calls it, for he had ample opportunity to know. From the above, one can judge of how much equality and liberty there reigns in the lodges. Number nine, Freemasonry, a universal association, its spiritual unity. It is customary to distinguish between English or Anglo-Saxon Masonry and Latin Masonry and indeed, there is a basis for this distinction. In view of the different manner of procedure which the lodges have of various nationalities. Furthermore, not long ago, there occurred a break between the English and American Anglo-Saxon lodges and the Latin lodges because of the extreme irreligion and materialism of which the latter professed openly. Nevertheless, that does not remove the fact that there still exists between them not only a common origin, but also a unity in the general spirit of the symbolic rites and one may rest assured that a union reigns in most su secret supreme rule of which the majority of Masons are unaware, because everything is carefully arranged to trap heedless ones. The supreme direction acts sporadically, according to the conveniences of time and place, and knows how to wait and how to withdraw when it is advisable to an adv advantageous position for new conquests in the future, in order not to compromise the ground already gained. At the end of the last century, a grand assembly of the principal chiefs decreed that a mason admitted to the first three degrees would be recognized as a legitimate, quote, brother in all the lodges of any right. This ruling is not arbitrary, since all masonry is contained within the first three degrees, of which the rest are no more than an explanation or repetition. As has been said, everything is a question of understanding with greater or lesser perfection that which is professed in the first three degrees common to all lodges. Quote, these are the texts, says Mackey, and the high degrees are the commentary. 
quote, Freemasonry is a cosmopolitan institution, end quote, says the first article of the Statutes of the Grand Orient of Belgium. That cosmopolitanism is affirmed in the organization of the lodges of the various countries by the reciprocal constitution of the guarantee of amity. The Masonic powers name among the brothers of each one of the other powers an official representative who bears this title. It is evident that there is not unity of rights, but this variation, quote, does not affect the universality of Masonry. The ritual is only the external and in extrinsic form. The doctrine of Freemasonry is the same everywhere. It is the immutable body remaining in all parts the same, end quote. Thus affirms Mason Mackey in the encyclopedia. After expressing the desire that the ritual might become still more perfect and similar everywhere, the same authority continues, quote, but if this is impossible as it is, at least we can console ourselves with a thought that while the ceremonies or the ritual may have varied at different periods and still vary in different countries, the science and the philosophy, the symbolism, and the religion of Freemasonry continue and will continue to be the same wherever true Masonry be practiced. This consequence, Dr. Macdy proves at once by the symbols which are used in the lodges and the right to visit the lodges conceded to all Masons of any lodge or any country, but for the few exceptions established by some lodges in the United States which have succeeded in destroying this general law. However, from that union results the sacred bond which, as he says, quote, joins men of the most discordant opinions and a band of brothers which only gives a common tongue to men of all nations and an altar to men of all religions, end quote. As with this reason, therefore, that the bond is called, quote, the mystic bond. And the Masons, on account of being united under its influence and enjoying its benefits, are called, quote, brothers of the mystic bond. So does that, quote, the Masonic authorities unanimously affirm that Freemasonry throughout the world is one and that all Freemasonry actually forms but one lodge." End quote. How does one explain then the break in relations from the Grand Orient to France due to atheism, which the latter professed by changing Article 1 of the Constitution of 1812, Paragraph 2, where there was professed the existence of God and the immortality of the soul? The distinction between esoteric or occult Masonry and the exoteric or external explains it easily is a question of tactics. In France, the Masonic world was believed to be sufficiently prepared to receive the profession of atheism, and it was established. In England and the United States, Freemasonry was not ready for so much. For this break which occurred was a purely exterior one, which affects only those poorly instructed in the principles of Masonry and not those of higher degrees, who are already permeated with those atheistic principles. Now we shall see that in the United States the ground is being rapidly prepared so as to arrive at the same declaration of atheism. In order to better evaluate the differences between English and Latin American Masonry as it concerns religion, it is necessary to see the first of the six articles of the old charges of the Constitution of the Grand English Lodge, which was printed by Anderson in 1723 and restored in the Book of Constitutions of 1756 and 1813. It speaks thusly, quote, A Mason is obliged by his profession to obey the moral law, and he, if he understands the art correctly, never will he be a stupid atheist or an irreligious libertine. <clears throat> in former times, the Masons were compelled to profess the national religion in each country or nation. However, now it is considered more advantageous to hold them only to that religion in which all men agree, leaving them to their own private opinions, to be good and true men or men of honor and honesty, whatever it may be the denominations or persuasions which distinguish them. Wherever Masonry comes to be the center of union, it is the means of establishing true friendship between persons who otherwise would have remained at perpetual distance. On the other hand, the Gothic, quote, Christian constitution of the ancient lodges of Masonic workers before and after 1747 says, quote, the first obligation is that you are faithful to God and to the Holy Church, and that you do not profess error or heresy. The difference is indeed striking. 
The new wording is calculated to admit into masonry everyone, even atheists, provided that they are not stupid. And if these things are carefully examined, they are applicable, as are indeed many atheists in the lodges of all nations. Anyone can see also to what the religion that exists among masons is reduced, namely, quote, to be good and true men, or men of honor and honesty, whatever their vi convictions may be, end quote. From that true scope of the English Masonic Constitution arose the change made by the Grand Orient of France, which was accepted by many Masons in the United States. Thus, in spite of the fact that by resolutions adopted in 1878, the Grand Lodge of England requests faith in the Grand Ar Architect of the Universe. There are recognized Masons who, like Spencer and other naturalistic philosophers of the present, call God the all-powerful occult principle, who works through nature, and those who follow the handbook, 3rd edition to 231, and uphold as two columns of religion, quote, the feeling of the smallness of man, and of the immensity of time and space, and the assurance that all that is real has its origin in good, and that everything that happens must be for the greater good, end quote. Everything in Masonry is full of ambiguities. The texts of 1723 and 1738 of the Fundamental Law Concerning Atheism are intentionally ambiguous. Atheism is not positively condemned, but disapproved of only to such a degree that it would conform to the demands of the time, for its frank admission would have been fatal to Masonry. Number 10. The International Masonic Federation since 1902, thanks to the regular subsidies of 25 Masonic powers and to the donations of generous brothers, there was functioned at Neufechtel, under the auspices of the Grand Swiss Alpine Lodge and in virtue of the efforts of the brothers of Courtier Latente, the International Masonic Offices. In 1921, there was established in Geneva the International Masonic Associations with the name, quote, Masonic Federation, whose statutes can be seen in Documentation Catholique of 1923. At that Congress, there were represented 27 Masonic powers, among them the Chilean with a total of 360,151 adherents. The Grand Orient of Santiago had 3,800. La Revista Masonica, from which this data is taken, gives notice that the illustrious brother Alfred Robbins, chief administrator of the most serene Grand Lodge of England, had gone to the United States to attend officially the annual meetings of the Grand Lodges of Massachusetts, New Jersey, Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, and Ohio in order to clear officially, in the name of S.A.R., the Duke of Connaught, that the Grand Lodge of England participates with full sympathy in the movement of the Masonic Congress of Geneva, seconded by the Grand Lodge of New York to realize the legitimate union and to deprive of authority the irregular Grand Lodges scattered throughout the world. If the English and North American Grand Lodges enter the International Masonic Federation, the Anglo-Saxon preponderance will be enormous since the membership of the Federated Grand Lodge of New York alone is roughly 287,000. Chapter 2 Masonic Secrets and Oaths Number 11 The Masonic Secret the Masonic secret is an essential part of Masonry. The day that secrecy may be abandoned, that same day Freemasonry will cease to exist. For secret societies are not organized to march in unison with the society in which they live. Secrecy is employed because they want to conspire against society. Masons usually deny that Masonry is a secret society. Copenhagen points out that Brother Limosin, Brother director and founder of the Masonic magazine La Aksha, in the course of a debate in 1903, affirmed that he was committing the grossest error in stating that Masonry is a secret society. He said it was a, quote, discreet society, not a secret society. The same limo sin in a discourse in the July 1907 issue of the Société de Statistique de Paris insists upon this same affirmation, and to prove it cites a number of princes and kings who have belonged to Masonry. In a debate which took place in the Chamber of Deputies in Chile about eight years ago, one of the members of the higher degree of Masonry argued that the oath of secrecy consisted of, quote, not revealing the means of recognition among members of the lodges, quote. He maintained there was nothing more, but in this, as in many other things connected with Masonry, either one does not know what one says, or the truth is plainly lacking. 
The Masonic secret does not consist of that alone regardless of the statement by the Chilean Grand Master. There is more, a great deal more. One can see from Dom Benoit and in Sarah the various lodges or formulas established in this respect, but one may say that as a general rule objects of secrecy are, quote, not only general methods and doctrines, but also special doctrines and particular methods, daily order, plans, commands, etc. The objective of masonry is secret, not only from outsiders, but from the majority of the initiates. Quote, the objective of the order must be its first secret. The world is not sufficiently robust to support its revelation. Quote, we maintain secrecy concerning our members and our internal resolutions. It is homage to ancient traditions. Quote, Thus said Hector Ferrari, most serene Italian grandmaster. Quote, it is forbidden as much to lodges as to each brother of any degree or office outside of the grandmaster and chief of the rites to make known in the outside world for any reason or by any means documents, records, circulars, letters, or official and officious writings connected with masonry without having first obtained written permission from the Grand Master. The world is deceived about doctrines which are taught in the lodges, and from the lower lodges are concealed the doctrines taught in the higher ones. Hidden also, not only from the outside world, but also from the lower lodges, are the plans formed in the lodges as well as the identity of persons taking part in them. The very organization of masonry and the form of societies superimposed one upon the other, in which the lesser members are excluded from the higher orders and the secret is recalled in each meeting and in each lodge, clearly shows that it is a secret society, and it hides something from its own members. It begins by concealing from them the identity of the supreme command as well as the supreme aim of the institution. Speaking of himself, Copen Abancelli says, quote, One would think that I should know perfectly the Masonic question since I had spent six years in the workshops of the, li the life, another name for Masonry. Nevertheless, that is not the case. I could imagine that I knew it, in reality, I did not know it. I knew of it only what I had seen, and what one sees in Masonry, whether he be Mason or not, is nothing more than an outward show designed to camouflage what you do not see. I had been successively apprentice, companion, master, and rose croix. In my lodge, I had occupied offices of secretary, orator, and first guardian. I had been displaced twice from the post of master, a position which I had been forced to surrender to those who were considered to be more capable than I of ensuring the prosperity of the lodge. Also, I had been named secretary immediately upon my entrance into the Clement ch Friendship Chapter. I was then a chapter, quote, light. One circumstance of which I shall have occasion to speak later had permitted me to see imperfectly that behind the Masonic world existed another world, more secret than the former, and even unsuspected by it as much as the outside world. In spite of everything, I repeat, I did not suspect the nature of the association which I had become active member. How skillfully things are devised to deceive those who are Masons as well as those who are not. Number 12 determination of masonry to hide the secret from its own members as well as from outsiders. The proof of masonry's insistence on maintaining secrecy toward its own members as well as to outsiders is in the fact that there is no one who can tell for a certain the objective of masonry, and this condition has prevailed during the two centuries of existence of the present organization. Is it a philosophical objective? Is it a charitable one? Is it anti-Catholic? Is it liberal, recreational, pornographic, satanic? There are adherents in the affirmative to each of these questions, and this is not true of outsiders alone, but of Masons themselves. It is, however, completely natural. Quote, in spite of the hypocritical declarations of the order, the objective and the methods of Masonry are found hidden with a marvelous astuteness and the explanation of the hieroglyphs and symbols which considered separately are susceptible to diverse and numerous interpretations. Some seem to be chosen for no other reason than to make more difficult the interpretation of the most important ones. The mystic sense concerns partly the inner circle of the order and partly its history. The apprentice is only given insinuations and never a complete explanation, because the lesser point could not be explained and understood completely without revealing the entire matter. Here are the words of Pike, 
one of the doctors of Masonic science, the blue degrees, the first three, are no more than the outer door of the temple portal. The work of masonry is in the construction of a spiritual temple. Part of the symbols are explained here to the initiated, but he is intentionally deceived with false interpretations. It is not intended that he understand them, but rather that he imagine himself to understand them. Their true interpretations is reserved for the initiated ones, the princes of masonry. Masonry, continues Pike, like all religions, all mysteries, hermeticisms and alchemies, hide secrets from everyone except the initiated, sages or elects, and employ false explanations and interpretations of its symbols to deceive those who deserve to be deceived and to hide them from the truth, which is called light, and to separate them from it. The majority of the members of Masonry believe the organization was formed for charity or mutual assistance in work, business, or financial affairs. Others will tell you is purely a social organization whose activities consist of banquets, parties, and conventions. Still others believe it to be a study or workshop. One must not believe they speak insincerely. Consequently, their very replies are a manifestation of the fact that they know nothing of the history of Masonry. They are victims of the intentional deceit of which Pike speaks. Masonry places emphasis on misleading its own initiates concerning the superior degrees by means of symbols, rituals, and the organization of itself. Thus, for example, Copenhagen says that they attempt to give the apprentice the idea that all Masons, seen with the insignias of cords, are masters, and, if afterward, one realized that there are hi other higher degrees, they will tell him the higher degrees are unimportant and give as proof the fact that Brother X or Brother Y are like all the rest, subject to the master, in spite of their higher rank. If his curiosity continues, he is told a legend which tends to make him believe that masons of higher degrees are rather inferior to the masters, being rather weak in their fondness for gold braid. The masters are the, quote, perfect masons, according to the ritual. The rest have not learned to comprehend the higher meaning of that expression. They have allowed themselves to be tempted by what they believe to be a dignity, and they are in the higher lodges without having anything to do. And if they are surprised that masonry will favor such a weakness without object, they reply that it is tolerated because it belongs to the heritage of traditions which must not be abandoned. Thus an attempt is made to calm the apprentice who looks upon no one as his superior except the master whose election depends also on his vote. The same thing happens to the master from whom an attempt is made to hide the existence, or at least the importance, of the superior degrees, and the idea is given to him that blue masonry, the three lower degrees, is all of which the organization consists. In the Masonic Catechism concerning his degree, certain questions and answers deal with this matter, and since that theory flatters him, he remains satisfied. For that reason also, in the administrative order, there is no difference made in the degrees, and it is usually follows that a master is the venerable in the lodge, where there are the masons of high degrees, all of which confirms the idea which they have attempted to inculcate in him. The truth is, nevertheless, that the higher degrees have been created precisely to conceal something from the lesser degrees. Quote, Since the three degrees of ordinary masonry, quote, says Louis Blanc, a mason, quote, comprise a great number of men opposed because of status and of principles to every plan for social overthrow, the innovators multiplied the degrees as steps to climb the mystic scale. They instituted the high degrees as a dark sanctuary whose portals are not open to the initiate until after a long series of tests are designed to prove the progress of his revolutionary education, the constancy of his faith, and the temple of his heart." End quote. Therefore, says the orthodoxy mechanique masonry, invaded, so to speak, and took us by assault in its first degrees by the common herd has sought refuge in the higher degrees. In conferring the 29th degree of the ancient accepted Scottish rite, the degree of the great Scot of St. Andrew the Patriarch, it is declared to the neophyte that the secrets of masonry have not been revealed to him. Quote, you must believe firmly, quote, he is told, that what you have been learned up to this day is nothing in comparison to the secrets which will certainly be revealed to you continually if you are chosen and if you are not unworthy. As for the mysteries concealed there, 
under those emblems, I cannot yet reveal them to you. But the time will come when you will penetrate them, etc. If this happens in the 29th degree, then what might be said of the first three degrees? The supreme command of the institution is the most occult part of Freemasonry. Its activities are much more secret than the doctrines of the order, and, as we shall see later, they begin to shine through the veil and the symbols which envelop them. There is no doubt that there is a hidden supreme command different and distinct from the Grand Orients and Grand Lodges, which are the visible high directives. No other way would explain the unity and universality of Masonry in spite of its external divisions, or can the uniformity of action which has been revealed by it in separate jurisdictions at some epochs be otherwise explained. After what has been said regarding the secrecy and explaining the doctrines and concerning the existence of the high degrees, one understands easily how the majority of Masons, like the outside world, are ignorant of the whereabouts of the center of this unity of Masonry and the names of those who direct this vast organization. What I shall say presently of the Masonic princes or kings will confirm the secrecy of the supreme command of Masonry. The common law of discretion and secrecy is, according to Mackey in his Masonic Ritualist, the very essence of Masonry, those virtues of secrecy and silence which are the very essence of the Masonic character, according to the same author observed, not only toward outsiders, but toward the brothers themselves of the lower degrees in such a manner that they know little more than we if they do not learn outside the lodge what their institution really is. There has been in Masonry frequent use of pseudonyms to hide the name and to avoid the responsibilities of its members. It is found everywhere in the past century, and it still continues in use today for revolutionary propaganda. Quote, it will have been noted, quote, says La Casa, quote, that there is an invariable tendency in this universal conspiracy to use pseudonym undoubtedly in the part for reasons of security and also to increase the mystery which will not fail to have its effect on the public imagination as well as to conceal that two clear traces of the racial origin as we have shown each one of the secret directors of the french revolution chose his name and is an exception to find russian bolshevik who is not known by a name taken not to reveal but rather to conceal his name and his race usually jewish famous names <coughs> of Nubius, Vindex, Toroto, De La Alta Venta of Italy, Philo, Baron of Nige, Spartacus, Weishaupt, etc. Number 13. Comparison with the Catholic Church. Masonry tells its initiates in all the world that it is an institution which investigates and teaches the truth. The Catholic Church makes the same statement. But masonry hides that truth from its own members to such an extent that not even in the degrees near the highest is it taught clearly and completely. The Catholic Church since the beginning has taught everyone without distinction. All its mysteries, all its interests, and vehement desire are devoted toward making its doctrine well known to all, even to its enemies and persecutors. If the teachings of masonry are true, why does it fear the light? If it is truth they teach, why be selfish in hiding it from its own initiates? Quote, if before communicating its secrets the order wishes to first prepare humanity, why does it not open all the sanctuaries of knowledge where according to them nothing is taught that offends the principles of morality, religion, or social economy? That would be the most efficient method of securing for everyone the facility for revealing them. And why does the order exclude the poor who have neither political nor economic value? Number 14. The Masonic Oaths. The Masonic secret or secrets are sealed by the most grave oaths which are continually recalled to mind. Here is the formula of the oath concerning secrecy, which has been used in the degree of apprentice in England, Scotland, Germany, and in the Scottish Rite Lodges of France, for a time at least. We say this because when Masonry discovers that some of its secrets have been exposed, it usually alters its front, its rituals, and everything in order to maintain the deception of its own adepts as well as that of outsiders. Here is the formula of the aforementioned oath, quote, I swear in the name of the supreme architect of all the world never to re reveal the secret signs, touches, words, doctrines, or customs of the Freemasons 
and to maintain above all an eternal silence concerning them. I promise, and I swear to God, not to reveal anything by pen, signs, words, or gestures, and never to have written, lithographed, printed, or published anything which had been confided to me up to now, and may be confided henceforth. I bind myself and submit to the subsequent punishment if I fail to keep my word. May they burn my lips with a red-hot iron. May they cut off my hand and my neck and snatch out my tongue. May my corpse be hanged in the lodge during the admission of a new brother, so that it may serve as a stigma of my infidelity and an object of horror to the rest. May it be burned afterwards and ashes cast to the wind, so that no trace remain of the memory of my treachery. Thus may God and his holy gospel help me, so be it. This is from La Franc Macanier, Don Sa Veritable Signification, Volume 1, pages 33 through 34. Naturally, this formula has been modified where all positive Christianity has been cast aside. And in the general statutes of the order, the name of God has been replaced by honor, by the sword, etc. The oath is renewed with each, quote, increase in salary, quote. Perhaps later on the occasion will occur in which to reveal other formula of Masonic oaths. Number 15. The Masonic Secret as Opposed to Conscience Before continuing, it would not be amiss to search one's conscience about a secret so absolute and so binding as the Masonic Secret. This secrecy is, as we have just seen, promised with terrible oaths without knowing of the substance of the secret, and without knowing whether this oath is not going to be found in opposition to other more fundamental duties which we have as citizens, as members of the church, or as simple rational beings. Here we have what keeps people whose conscience is properly developed from joining masonry. What if under this severe and universal secrecy I am requested to do something contrary to my conscience? Suppose I am asked to do something against my country, and what if it is demanded of me to act against my religion or my own family? Such are the questions which a would-be mason should answer. Number 16. Masonic Secret as Opposed to Common Sense I have heard of many people who have been invited to enter masonry, but who have replied that they see no reason for so much secrecy that contrary to masonic claims, in order to act well, it is not necessary to be so secretive, etc. They have spoken, no doubt, the language of common sense. If we do not wish to do good ostentatiously, must we do it so secretively that we awaken distrust in our good conduct? For is it typical of evildoers to work in darkness according to the words of the gospel? Quote, he who does evil hates the light. We shall see later just what this good which masonry does really is. Both Christianity and right reasons dictate that true liberty, with all its consequences, adds responsibility to our actions. Secrecy tends to debil debilitate the consciousness and importance of our responsibility, thus facilitating the task of those who ridicule the social or public station, sanction which those acts merit. Furthermore, Anyone may ask himself whether the doctrines and deeds of masonry are good or evil. If they are evil, it is clear that conscience should repudiate them, and one should not enter into such an association. The famous Philo Baranigi, who was the right arm of Weishaupt, said, quote, I have spent much time employing my experience in and knowledge of the cause to divert many young, active, and industrious men from joining any secret society, however attractive its name may be. I am certain that all are not reprehensible to the same degree, but all, without distinction, are useless and dangerous. And after proving the first statement, Philo proves the second arguing, among other reasons, quote, that what it does in darkness awakens legitimate suspicions, because the initiates are not all fully instructed in the wicked intentions which are frequently masked by beautiful hopes, such as my profession of faith, concerning secret societies. As for myself, I do not know of any which is not guilty of one charge or another. The Catholic Church is a society which professes to do good and not only does it not use secretly to do so, but it hides neither its teachings or its mysteries, nor its sacraments, 
Rather, it exerts all its efforts toward having them examined by all men. Why? Precisely because it knows that those teachings and mysteries are good, and it wishes to share them with all men. That is thinking with sincerity of the good which one does or one has. Why does Masonry put the people aside? Number 17. The Masonic Oath as Opposed to Morality Masons usually swear on the Bible and by the grand architect of the universe, which some understand to be God and others to be nature, at least in the first degrees, and where they wish to maintain certain appearances of religion. There are still other interpretations of the Supreme Being. What moral value does that oath have? Will the Mason be obliged by conscience to fulfill it as any legitimate oath? Morality answers no, because it places God as a witness and guarantor of what is promised and what is promised is against the dictates of wisdom, of, of right reason, and conscience. God cannot be the guarantor of acts by which he is offended rather than honored. Still less can the oath be valid for a Catholic, for who such an act is severely prohibited under the penalty of excommunication. We cannot invoke God as a guarantor of evil. If one invokes nature, unrelated to the Creator, as a guarantor and a witness to an oath, he falls into dilemma since he thinks of nature as not possessing intelligence and, and thus being incapable of hearing, guaranteeing, approving, or disapproving his invocation. The same may said, be said of honor, a thing at times as controversial as it is transitory. Chapter 3, The Objective of Masonry, Number 18, The Objective Indicated. I shall set down here some of the various official declarations of Masonry concerning its objective. Quote, the Masonic Order has as its object beneficence, the study of universal morality, and the practice of all the virtues. End quote. So states the Constitution of the Order in Chile of the year 1862. The 1912 Constitution changed the declaration slightly. Quote, Freemasonry is an essentially a philosophic and progressive institution. It has as its object the investigation of truth, the study of morality, and the practice of virtue. End quote. The Constitution of the Belgian Grand Orient assigns as its end the investigation of truth and the perfecting of humanity. Mackey, Grand Masonic Doctor of the United States, says that Masonry is a science of morality. The International Masonic Association of Geneva says that Freemasonry has as its object the investigation of truth and the study and practice of morality. Quote, the Germans, says Encyclopedia Universal Illustrata Masonry, quote, are more concrete and divine thusly. The activities of intimately united men making use of symbols taken primarily from the craft of the builder and of the architect, working for the well-being of humanity, attempting through morality to ennoble themselves and others, and by this means to arrive at a universal league and peace, which it will aspire to exemplify in its meanings. Number 19. The Construction of the Temple of Nature Since the word masons means builders, and since everything in masonry is taught through the medium of symbols or allegories, the object of a society of builders must be related to the trade which they represent. It is common in Masonic language to say that Masonry proposes to construct or to restore a temple. What is that temple? It is the temple of nature, and which should reign liberty, equality, and fraternity, understood in the Masonic sense, a temple in which are taught the truth, virtue, and morality peculiar to Masonry. Masonry, in its symbols and rites, frequently uses also military ornaments and expressions. It speaks much of war against intolerance, fanaticism, ignorance, etc. It is then a militia, an army which is disciplined and armed against an enemy. Finally, Masonry says that it proposes to establish in the world a new universal religion. It has in indeed everything to be desired in the way of rites and ceremonials related to a religious cult. It is then also a religion. According to Masonry, the state of nature is the ideal state of man. It is a state in which he finds and keeps his perfection and felicity. That state has been destroyed by religion and society, by kings and priests. 
They have taken from man his primitive liberty and equality and have destroyed his fraternity. Masonry proposes to return to man his original perfection and happiness, his liberty, his equality, and his natural fraternity. Quote, man is not free if he is not sovereign master of his thoughts and acts. Liberty is identical with sovereignty, says L. Ere Nouvelle. Quote, when we are no longer subjects but sovereigns, then shall we be free, quote, says Brother Fleury. Quote, Each man is his priest and his king, his pope and his emperor, quote, says Brother Potvin. Quote, we do not answer for our acts except to ourselves, quote, says the Brother Lacroix. Equality, likewise understood in the Masonic sense, comprises not only the equality of nature and of rights, which are innate as its rational philosophy teaches, but it also comprises absolute equality in all kind of rights, whether they be innate or acquired. Quote, men are equal in rights. All men from every point of view are of equal condition. Quote, is the synthesis of the Masonic doctrine concerning equality as expressed by Leo the Thirteenth in his encyclical Humanum Genus. Quote, among the Masons, and thanks to them one day it will be so among all men. There is neither first nor last, neither strong nor weak, neither great nor small. There are only brothers, all equal in all wishing to be so. Fraternity, in the Masonic sense, involves not only our common origin, which makes us say, quote, our Father who are in heaven, end quote, but it also includes the suppression of all inequality and all distinction of rights in such a way that one can only speak of a universal family and not a separate families, as it is now. There must be but one single nation, not separate ones, one single church, and that single family, and that single nation, and that single church, that is humanity. Moreover, in masonry, fraternity is also given the restricted meaning of mutual aid among brothers masons, and as in all other societies of mutual aid, it is carried by them to unacceptable extremes, as we shall see later, God willing. Furthermore, for certain initiates, that word fraternity has another meaning, more secret and abominable. It has the word, quote, charity, for the ancient Gnostics, licentious customs, association for sensual pleasures, etc. This prompted Pope Gregory the Sixteenth to say in his encyclical condemning masonry that quote, everything which has been most sacrilegious, blasphemous, and shameful in heresies, and in the most criminal sects has been joined together in all the secret societies as in a universal sower of all infamies. Encyclical Mirari Boss. To build the Masonic Temple of Nature, it is necessary to completely destroy all authority, all hierarchy all family life, and all religion. Number 20. What are the obstacles which masonry has to overcome or the enemies it has to combat? One immediately understands against whom the army of masonry is armed and disciplined. It has before it civil society with the authority which sustains and governs it. It has religious society, especially the Catholic Church, which is the bulwark most firmly opposed to the destruction of Christian beliefs. It has the family, above all the Christian family, the center of virtue, opposed to freedom of custom. It has property, opposed also to Masonic equality and fraternity. Quote, from the explanation of ritual, quote, says Eckert, as well as from the history and confessions of the order, one rightly then concludes that Freemasonry is a conspiracy against the altar, the government, and property to rights with the objective of establishing over all the face of the earth a social and theocratic reign whose religio-political government would have its see in Jerusalem. The indispensable condition to this realization is the destruction of the three obstacles which are opposed to it, vis-a-vis -vis the church, the government, and property. Number 21. What is the God of Masonry? What is the object of the Masonic cult? What is the God whom the new and universal religion of Masonry adores? Is it God, the supreme architect of the universe, as they have called him? Is it nature, with which many identify that God? 
Is it man in whom that identity is realized with greatest perfection? Is it the sun as the most perfect symbol of the power of nature? Is it Satan, whom the Masons hold to be the good God? Yes, it is all of that, but all do not know that, nor do all practice it consciously. At present, I shall limit myself to the above resume. Later, I shall devote a special article treating with Masonry as a religion. He who wishes more complete details can consult the works which I have indicated in the beginning, especially those of Benoit, Serra, and Casa. Number 22. The Supreme Objective of Masonry. It is customary to point out also as an object of Masonry the political dominance of the sect and to judge it by the activities which are developing in the political field, since on the surface appears that politics is their motivating interest. However, careful investigation reveals this not be so. Politics is none other than the most powerful and assured means that Masonry can employ to attain its end. One wonders if the Judaic influence in Masonry is the controlling factor and whether that organization is merely a front enabling the Jewish people to establish with greater rapidity and security their long desired domination of the world. Or, if, on the contrary, the Jewish action is only an auxiliary of Masonry, helping to succeed in realizing its designs of universal anarchy and destruction followed by the worship of Satan, who is the very split of rebellion and anarchy. For the present, this outline of the objective must suffice. The study will continue to verify the truth of what has already been expressed. Then, too, I wish once more to warn the readers that the majority of Masons are completely ignorant of all that has been said of the manifestly perverse objectives of the institution to which they belong. The integrity, the seriousness, and the honor of many are manifest proofs that they are ignorant of it. If they knew it and still remained in Masonry, they would be quite different from what they are, and it would be necessary to acknowledge in them a hypocrisy incompatible with their mode of behavior. They would be super hypocrites. Chapter 4 Formation and Function of Lodges Number 23 Formation of Lodges As you understand, it is very easy to form a triangle or an irregular lodge when there is in a city five or more Masons who are authorized or delegated for that purpose or are simply zealous for the progress of Masonry. They will converse with other friends They will make them see the convenience of associating themselves in a lodge for their mutual aid. They will alleviate any fears which they may have had, and at once they will appoint a master from their midst. All of this will cause the innocent man to believe that he is greatly honored, without his suspecting that he is only the victim and an instrument of his friends, who have told him nothing concerning the character of the Masons of superior degrees. On the other hand, the idea of entering into communication with other lodges or being brothers of a great national or foreign personages, and of knowing the secrets of masonry is a powerful inducement, which causes many to fall into traps laid with such cleverness and secrecy. Quote, In order to satisfy the curiosity seeker, said Blavler Clavel, one makes sure the society keeps religiously a secret, which can only be shared by Freemasons. In order to satisfy pleasure seekers, they are allowed to participate in the frequent banquets, at which good food and plenty of wine excite happiness and strengthen the bonds of fraternal friendship. As for the artisans and merchants, they are told that masonry will be beneficial to them by extending the circle of their business contracts. Number 24. Forces of Proselytism Mackey assures us in his Encyclopedia of Freemasonry that masonry, quote, not only forbids its members to make any efforts to recruit initiates, but actually ruling is that each candidate for admission to the sacred rites declares seriously as a first step that in his voluntary offerings of himself he has not been influenced by improper solicitations from the brothers. Nevertheless, it is evident that masonry makes active propaganda to gather members even in universities, high schools, and military and naval academies. I have heard various public officials of repeated incidents relating to their having been urged to join lodges of masonry, One instance of a particularly extreme nature concerned an individual who withdrew after an initiation. He was forcibly dragged away to a car waiting at the door and driven to the ceremony which repelled him. 
He was never informed en route of their plans, thereby suffering extreme embarrassment. These efforts correspond to the recommendation which Grand Masonic authorities make to the brothers, quote, is of the greatest importance for the success of our sublime project, the restoration of the state of nature, and to facilitate and secure better its execution, to drag into our order members prominent in the clergy, as well as civil and military authorities, youth organizations, even kings and princes, and above all, their sons, their ministers, and their advisors. In short, all those whose interests would be in opposition to our doctrines, it is necessary to hide them under a seductive form, the germ of our doctrine, thus accustoming them insensibly to the shock which might otherwise overwhelm them. Number 25. The Art of Recruiting Members Masonic propaganda, in spite of its activities, usually encounters great obstacles. This is perhaps due to the fear of the unknown and the mysterious, to the disrepute which usually surrounds masonry among serious people of Catholic countries, or, most likely, to the prohibition of the Church. In order to overcome these fears, they assure potential recruits that masonry has nothing to do with politics or religion. They attack no religion, least of all Christianity, that they render adoration to God, the grand architect of the universe. That there are many of the hierarchy in religion who have belonged to masonry, even bishops and popes. That Pius IX was a mason, Leo XIII was one too. That masons swear in the Bible when taking oaths, and there is in the statutes of constitutions of masonry, faith in God and our Lord Jesus Christ, etc. Many respectable and well-known people were named as masons, many of them falsely, as in the case of the popes. Quote, if there is any man of great reputation because of his merit, cause it to be believed that he is one of us. End quote. This was one of the recommendations of Weishaupt. Being thus reassured, much strength of character is needed to resist the invitations of a friend who perhaps speaks with sincerity. Masons have told him the same thing, and he has not had time to learn the truth, or he has remained unconcerned by it. Now let us examine the value of these reassurances. Weishaupt, in his Code of Illuminism, has given minute rules which should be followed by the recruiters and adepts for new members. His most important recommendation is to obtain a detailed examination of the character and circumstances of the possible candidate. Subscript. I do not deny that there have been ecclesiastics who deceive by the hypocrisy of the sect, above all in the beginning of the development on the European continent, in good faith have given Masonry their cooperation and support. Quote, in the beginning, says Mao, the lodges assumed the character of associations for philosophic studies and for charity. They were called Catholic lodges, and many Catholics were deceived. That is how, in 1770, the perfect intelligence laws of Liege had as master the Count of Jeans, canon treasurer as first guard, the Knight of Thiers, council of the Bishop Prince as orator, the canon of Paz. In France, Brazil, and other countries of Europe and America, there have also been priests who have fallen into this deception, so cleverly planned and so firmly maintained. Quote, Venezuelan masonry, says Monsignor Juan B. Castro, Archbishop of Caracas, quote, since it has organized in our republic, has insisted upon not appearing as a declared enemy of Catholicism, and it has multiplied its testimonies both in word and writing to make us believe that it is nothing more than a society for benefits, fraternity, and charity, which seeks only moral perfection and mutual aid for its members. The consequences of this procedure have been most harmful to the Church. The priesthood has sometimes seemed to waver in the face of character of the claims of masonry and the good faith with which those affirmations were embraced by many a good person. Number 26. The Preferred Recruits the preferred recruits are young men, especially those who are studying for the liberal professions for whom Weishaupt established a special degree called Minerval. Weishaupt, author of La Causa, is quoted many times in this book, so perhaps we had better tell our readers something of his background. His full name is Adam Weishaupt, and he was born in 1748. At the age of 28, he became professor of laws at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria. It may be said that he was a complete rascal. Among his correspondence, there was a series of letters written by him to various members of the Illuminati 
imploring their help to find the means of destroying the unborn child of his sister-in-law before its birth could overwhelm him with disgrace. Weishaupt also urged the conquest of professional people, lawyers in particular, who have ability as speakers and are astute and active. Quote, These people are good, true demons, most difficult to lead, but their conquest is always good when it can be obtained, he said concerning them. Teachers, university professors, and even the superiors of seminaries, whenever possible, were also the object of his recommendations. All lodges work actively to conquer public officials, more to mo monopolize public offices, and above all, those of the greatest income and influence. We know this only too well. Kings and princes are also a preferred objective of Masonic conquests. Quote, the assistance of the influential is an indispensable necessity to bring about reform in a feudal country, quote, said Mazzini. The rich and the discontented are also targets for the cleverness of the recruiters. The data and references of Benoit on this point are interesting. Number 27, the front of masonry. And speaking of Masonic secret, I mentioned earlier the reason Brother Limosin gave to prove that Masonry is not a secret society, namely by pointing out a number of kings and princes who belong or have belonged to Masonry. Many people protest the exposure of Masonry by pointing out good and upright men who belong. They will say, quote, Mr. So-and-so, a very upright and charitable man, is a Mason. What makes you think there's anything wrong with Masonry? This argument is put forth by many Englishmen in good faith. Quote, is not the Prince of Wales a Mason, and the King is Grand Master of many lodges? Competence in the rectitude of their princes or king's honors them, but not their ignorance of the wiles of masonry. Masonry likes to have such personages among its members. It suits them to remove from the unobservant, the ignorant, common people any precautions against their sinister plans. It suits them to mislead the authorities who are most childish and ridiculous in their opinions that everything is innocent in masonry. Louis Blanc, revolutionist and Freemason, says that, quote, thanks to the able mechanisms of the institution, it found in princes and in noble fewer enemies than protectors. It pleased sovereigns like Frederick the Great to take up the plane and trowel and to wear the apron. Why not? The existence of the high degrees was carefully hidden from them. They knew of masonry only what could be shown without danger." End quote. This, in spite of the fears that masonry inspired in the most suspicious sovereigns. There are times when princes and kings are made to occupy the highest positions, but that does not mean that they have the secrets revealed to them. Of all the princes who were in masonry in the past century, including Napoleon himself, only Philippe Egalite was truly initiated into the secrets of masonry. He did indeed fall victim of the intrigues of the life, which elevated him to power. That is the explanation for the oath which is made in certain degrees, as in the 29th degree of the Scottish Rite, in which the initiate binds himself under the most severe penalty, the most rigorous secrecy, and all that happens in that degree. This secrecy is imposed even upon the name of the master of the entire order provided he is not a well-known person who has already been recognized in a high Scottish lodge, or the chiefs of the lodge have not made him known. Masonry has not only found protectors among princes and kings, as Louis Blanc says, but through pressure exercised by or through means of circumstances purposely created by masonry, used them as blind instruments. This tactic was very evident in Spain at the time of Count Aranda, and also in Portugal, when it was governed by the Marquis of Pombal, who pursued his unjust and bloody persecution of the Jesuits. It was also seen in Germany toward the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. We have seen it recently in our own myths when masonry, following the previously mentioned advice of Weishaupt, intensified its extreme demands from those whom it had elevated to power through the medium of those clever and bold men with whom they are surrounded. We know the part which was played by princes in masonry, regardless of the high position they may hold. They are the mask which serves masonry in its advances and the forwarding of its plans, as we shall see more clearly when speaking of politics. 28. 
the Masonic Popes. The statement that there have been popes who are Masons has been one of the most despicable inventions which has occurred in Masonry to mislead and deceive ignorant and simple Catholics. Later, we shall see the condemnations which the popes, almost without interruption, have been made against the sect from its inception. All of these condemnations have been made in the most severe terms and in absolute knowledge of the peril in making them. For the present, I shall tell only of the origins of the imputation made against Pius IX, which is the one the Masons tell most often and with greatest assurance. Here is the way of John Gilmary Shea tells and refutes that fable in his life of Pius IX, page 291 through 292, written in English. Quote, it began in Germany, and the Masons believe that by laying the scene in America, it might help to escape investigation. They declared positively that Pius IX had been received into a certain Masonic lodge in Philadelphia. They quoted their discourses and declared that several of his autographs were kept in this lodge. Unfortunately for the story, Philadelphia is in the civilized world. The people there know how to read and write. The claim was investigated and it was found that in that city, there is no Masonic lodge of the name given. It was also found that no lodges in Philadelphia had ever received a Juan Maria Must Die. No trace could be found that he had ever been there, because he never had been. No lodge had any of his autograph lovers letters. The Masons themselves testified that the entire matter was merely an invention. The calumny this refuted has been received from time to time, and the last version care was taken not to specify the lodge or city. To make it more credible, they have placed on the photograph of a mason with insignias the head of the pope, cut from his portrait and substituted in the place of the masons. The reader will recall the previously cited advice of Weishaupt to be sure that persons of merit belong to masonry, thereby helping to acquire new members. That lie involving Pius IX was calculated above all to deceive the clergy so that they might follow the example of one who had been their chief. I do not know if there could be found in the world a priest so naive that he would allow himself to be deceived by it. Indeed, the lie is repeated even in pre present society, which unfortunately is too ignorant in matters of religion and ecclesiastical history. Let it be remembered that Pius IX, who condemned masonry more than twenty times, Number 29. The Initiation. Each degree has its initiation ceremony, which is long and full of symbolism. Since I cannot describe them in detail, nor give a brief idea of the principal ones in my plan, nor even the first three degrees, I suggest to the reader who wishes greater knowledge of the Masonic ritual, Benoit's work. I limit myself solely to giving a brief description of the initiation to the first degree, that of apprentice which is the door to masonry. It seems that at the present, the tests which the ritual previously ordained are no longer in use because of their childish absurdity. Quote, they vary from lodge to lodge, says Mayo. The physical tests are almost abolished, but they have, must have been horrible since they have incited masons themselves to rebellion. Nevertheless, in Chile, it seems they are still in use, although they have been improved upon. Quote, the aspirant states the ritual is presented at the lodge in a state which is neither clothed nor naked, because our customs do not tolerate the condition of complete nakedness. He is despoiled of all metal, that is, of all money and jewels that he has with him. They bandage his eyes and lead him to a dark chamber called the Room of Reflection, a kind of tomb in which there are skulls and other human bones and inscriptions carved on the walls. The bearing of the candidate in this cavern or tomb is called the test of the earth. He remains alone a few minutes with his eyes covered. Suddenly, at a single, the blindfold is removed and he begins to read the inscription carved on in the walls. If you are capable of this deception, tremble. We shall probe the very depths of your heart. If your soul has been fearful, go no farther. If human distinctions please you, leave. Here they are known. We may demand of you the greatest sacrifices, even your life. Are you ready? Quote, At once, the candidate must make his testament and respond in writing to the three following questions. What are the duties of man 
toward God? What are the man's duties toward his equals? What are his duties toward himself? This, says Ragan, is a way of testing the candidates who are seeking admission. The terrible brother or instructor takes the testament and the replies and carries them to the master of the lodge. The candidate is always admitted regardless of what his answers may have been. The terrible brother returns to the candidate again, blindfolds him, then passes a rope around his neck, and holding the end of it, takes him in this condition to the door of the lodge. The aspirant struggles with the door three times. A voice from within asks, Who is the audacious one who tries to enforce entrance to the temple? The terrible brother answers, The man who has just knocked is an outsider, desirous of seeing the light and he comes to humbly beg of it of our respectable lodge. The door is open, and the candidate is introduced into the lodge covert in blue. The terrible brother leads him between two columns which support the building, which bear the names of Jacques and Boaz, like those of the portals of the Temple of Solomon. There the candidate undergoes an interrogation and is exposed to various tests called tests of air, of water, and of fire. Quote, by means of machines that imitate the fall of hail, the whistling of the wind, and the roar of thunder, that is the test of air. The candidate's left hand is submerged in a jar of water, that is the test of water. The hand is enveloped in purifying flames by blowing over it dust of lycopodium, which is set afire, which is the test of fire. Quote, always with his eyes covered, he moves around making five or six turns. He drinks a bitter mixture, he crosses over several more boards which slide from under his feet, and he climbs the steps of the endless stairway. A pretense is made of opening his veins to assure him of his adherence to masonry, because he is told, the society into which you wish to be admitted may perhaps demand that you spill the last drop of your blood for it. He is informed that the Masonic seal is to be branded on his body with a glowing red hot iron, but they actually apply only the end of a recently blown out candle on the bottom of a previously heated glass. Finally, they administer the oath that he reveals no secrets, sign, grips, doctrines, or customs of Freemasonry. Quote, then the blindfold is removed, and he sees his brothers armed with naked swords which are directed against his breast. Quote, My brother, says the worshipful master, do not fear the swords which are held against you. They are threatening only perjurers. If you are faithful to masonry, their sure swords shall be swift to defend you. If, on the contrary, you become a traitor, no place on earth will offer you a refuge from these avenging weapons. The neophyte receives the password. It is Tubalcain, which signifies metal or mineral kingdom, because this grandson of Cain, according to the scriptures, worked with metals. He is wrapped in a mantle of white fur, and there is handed to him a pair of women's gloves he is commanded to give to the one whom he most esteems. The initiation is ended. The outsider has become an apprentice. Number 13. The Fundamental Apostasy of the Initiated The ceremonies, rites, and symbols of Freemasonry are carefully calculated to reveal, little by little, to the initiate their true significance and to gradually teach them the true doctrines of the sect in which such a way that inadvertently he becomes aware of them without anyone having openly expounded them to him. This is true to such an extent that it is difficult among all the apprentices to find one who perhaps realizes that the act which he has just performed during which he has declared himself to be a Christian is nevertheless a radical apostasy from the religion which he professes. The apostasy is involved in the meaning of the ceremonies. Later it will develop, together with the information which is being acquired with it. Here is the way the frequently quoted author Benoit states the apostasy. The outsider has a bandage over his eyes and a rope around his neck. In effect, he is in the darkness of superstition and prejudice, and he drags the chains with which priests and kings have bound him. He presented himself at the door of the temple to receive the light and to recover his liberty, 
because only masonry can illuminate his spirit with true knowledge and give him the liberty of the natural, natural state. Those who inhabit the temple despoil him of his clothing and his metal, because if he wished to take a place among the disciples of nature, he must renounce all modesty, all property, and all luxury, for even clothing engenders all vices, and the true masons should possess nothing as his own. The candidate makes his testament before associating with the brothers because individual private property is contrary to the perfect equality which reigns in the temple. And furthermore, he who is received into masonry enters into a state of death. He is asked to make a profession of his faith concerning his duties to God, to his fellow men, and to himself. If he is truly worthy of the light, he can reply like a famous candidate, War on God! Liberty and quality for all. But if he replies as a, a deist or even as a Christian, he will still be received, because masonry asks of its initiates only one quality, that of tolerance or philanthropy. Let them think whatever they wish of God. That is unimportant, so long as they do not seek to impose their beliefs on anyone. The tests or trials teach him that he cannot free himself of his prejudices except by disciplining himself incessantly under the direction of his new chiefs. Although the elements may turn against him, he will persevere in his newly undertaken career. He journeys in all directions because he must devote himself to all types of research so that he eventually he requires new ideas contrary to those he has formerly held. Quote, I have learned in these journeys, says the companion, that is the most important above all and before all to know oneself and to work toward perfection and toward throwing off the prejudices and superstitions which blind us. Afterwards, he is given the light as the fruit and prize of his tests and works. The companions, with their swords held against him, show him that they will be ever at his side to defend him against outsiders and to make him faithful to his obligations. The password is Tubal King because he must work with metal, devoting himself to the study of nature, beginning with the mineral kingdom, which holds first place. He must also honor Tubal King as a descendant of Cain, and according to the Masons, he should also honor Satan through Cain, because Masonic traditions teach that he followed the cult of nature. He is given an apron, because being at the beginning of his Masonic initiation, he still has a feeling of modesty. The majority of these interpretations are given in Masonic books. They all result from the same nature of the ceremonies in relation to the end. In short, the ceremonies performed by the initiates are an acknowledgement that outside Masonry, the candidate, whether he be Christian or not, was in darkness, and therefore the faith which he professed formerly was neither truth nor light for him. One may refer to Proust's American Freemasonry, Chapter 4, for the clarification on this point. The author, with the authority of the great pontiff of Masonry in the United States, Pike and Mackey, not only established the change of doctrine which the new members make, denying, as he does, what he previously professed, but he also acknowledges the complete authority of the new master from which he is attempting to receive truth and morality. Number 31. Practical Consequences of That Apostasy the immediate consequence is the abandonment of those religious practices, at least the public ones like the Mass, which belong to that estate and a profession which he is abandoning as darkness in order to seek the light. At the end of his life, that apostasy faces the priest with the almost insurmountable problem of securing the reconciliation of the initiate with God. In this case, he is not dealing only with difficulties of the moral order as with other sinners, rather it is the complete and formal apostasy which he has made of Christianity, which prevents him dying with the help and consolation of the church. As we shall see, the Masons, upon being initiated, is excommunicated. Number 32, The Selection. The ritual of the unknown philosophic judge states, We must increase the number of our brothers, but with discretion. Quote, it does not suit Masonry to have all kinds of people enter it, nor even to keep all who enter. Neither does it promote to the highest degrees all those who desire them. Everything is calculated to make the selection which suits their plans. In the first place, the initiation itself is a good sorting device 
which denies entrance to those who are too independent to allow themselves to be governed by an occult power whose objectives and true representatives are unknown to them. The over-curious, the skeptics, who would either be prompted by doubts to investigate the true secrets of masonry, or would be indisposed to believe all that is said in its name. And individualists who may revolt can also be held back by the initiation ceremonies, which are too humiliating and ridiculous for them to permit. Cope and Abincelli says, As soon as the outsiders who belong to the group of curious or skeptics have contemplated the stupid gestures which the life obliges them to make the day on which it receives them into its house, they feel humiliated and disdainfully turn their backs. I have heard some say, quote, I saw that they were nothing more than perverted, and therefore I withdrew. Don Eliodoro Fonchea, a well-known newspaper man in Valparaiso and Conception, writes me as follows in regard to Carlos Palacio Zapata, ex-minister of the state, quote, on a hunt at his ranch, Santa Clara, I asked him, Are you a Mason? And he made these interesting statements. You needn't ask that question of students of state universities of my time. We all came out Masons, but many of us finally realized the many ridiculous and serious aspects of Masonry and abandoned that dangerous foolishness. I will tell you an amusing anecdote, he added. There was an important meeting for the reception of a delegate from the Chilean lodges to Peru and the delegate was received under a canopy. Do you know who it was that carried the canopy? It was Alta Morano, who now assiduously attends church and is a Catholic of the highest type. And, as for the delegate, he is now the parish priest of La Mache, who, like many others, abandoned the lodges. But the selection only begins with the tests of initiation. At once there comes the works of formation, or of deformation, as the cited author calls it. He was subjected to it for six years. It was during this time that the authorities became quite acquainted with the initiate and his aptitudes for serving the plans of the institution. If he shows aptitudes, he will be elevated to the superior degrees. If he does not give service nor shows hopes of giving it, he will be left to vegetate in order to help the treasury until he becomes bored and leaves masonry. If there isn't some brother who shows himself too recalcitrant in absorbing the spirit of the order, other masons become hostile toward him. And if there is such pretext for it, he is condemned or expelled as being unworthy of such virtuous company. If the fault is a minor one, he is suspended, i.e., he is allowed to sleep. But do not believe that those who withdraw from masonry have been have no use to it. The order has too much shrewdness and experience not to know how to take advantage of the forces and social position of each former member. Where nothing more can be expected from the brother, when he has given all he could in favor of the institution, he will be put aside and ignored and forgotten. They compare them with lemons, saying, quote, They are pressed hard, and when they no longer give juice, they are thrown away. Such was the pry given by an old mason, very zealous of propagating the order, to Don Eliodoro Fonchea. In a letter, Don Fonchea relates that when he was, when he saw this poor man completely ruined, reduced to extreme poverty, and begging for assistance, he asked him if he had received aid from his former brothers. At one time, this old man had been Don Fonchea's superior and general manager of the nitrate supply company limited in in Quique. at that time his masonic brothers were very anxious to associate with him not only this old man but another brother told me he too had become a lemon to avoid causing harm to anyone i shall give no further details number 33 the finances finance is a matter very dear to the heart of masonry which not only has many ordinary expenses but sometimes extraordinary ones. These are publicized as works of charity, but closer inspection would show a great deal more is spent for propaganda, politics, festivities, etc. There is a special rule which prohibits the admission of outsiders who cannot support the expenses of the order. There are ordinary fees such as dues, fees for matriculation or promotion, cost of insignia, etc. 
There are extraordinary assets arising from fines, donations, legacies, and perhaps government subsidies. Here is where the rich especially lead their services to the order, and for this particular purpose they are initiated into masonry. They will give their quota and give their donations, but they will not worry about what goes on inside the lodges. In the chapter of his instructions dealing with the exclusion from the high degrees, Weishaupt says, Avoid the stupid, the gross, the imbeciles. There is, nevertheless, a class of imbeciles of who it is not profitable to speak thusly, because some advantage is to be had from their stupidity. Even though they are fools, they serve as a shield. They are desirable people, and they fill the cash box. Augment numerum et aerium. Set yourselves to the task. It is necessary for them to swallow the bait, but let us be careful never to tell them our secrets. This kind of people must always be convinced that their degree is the final one. Since they are flattered and unaware that the consideration which surrounds them is not unselfish, they usually make large donations. It was learned from the notes in one of the papers of the Propaganda Club, found in the possession of Cardinal Bernice, that the Duke of Orleans had given 400,000 francs to the Masonic treasury. Masonry also received subsidies from the French government to prepare insurrections in other countries in order to stop the armies of the Republic. Number 34. The Meetings The sessions of the lodges are called meetings. We frequently read notices of them in the newspapers. The meetings differ according to the various degrees. Those of the higher degrees may attend meetings of lesser degrees, but not vice versa. They are of two kinds, the serious ones and those of committees or purely administrative meetings. One of each kind is usually held once a month. The serious meetings are attended by the members, but the community meetings are attended by the administrators, and the other members are not obliged to attend these ordinary meetings. However, there are also extraordinary meetings. In all meetings, the ritual is observed with strict formality. There are interrogations to ascertain if the lodge is covered, that is, that there are no outsiders present. After this, they make signs, batteries, and acclamations. The meetings are closed in the same formal manner. When the lodge functions with the three degrees of apprentice, com companion, and master, all signs and ceremonies must belong to the first degree, because the inferior degrees must know nothing which pertains to the higher degrees. Sometimes the meeting is open with the three degrees and is necessary to meet in three sessions. Then, once the first session has taken place, the apprentices are ordered to cover the temple, that is, to withdraw. At once the meeting of the next degree opens and the same procedure is repeated if it is necessary to hold a master's meeting. This must take place whenever it is necessary to initiate a master. The following order is usually observed in a session. Number one opening of the work according to the rite and with the accustomed mystery. Number two, reading and, a, and adoption of the minutes of previous works. Number three, introduction of visitors after the examination. Number four, reading of the correspondence. Number five, works in the order of the day, initiations, lectures, etc. Number six, circulation of the bag for the remunerations and proposals of the poor box for charity. Number seven, reading of the tracing board, or unfinished business, and the adjournment of the meeting. Number 35. The Grotesque and Ceremonial The following is the judgment given by a mason of the ceremonies which are observed in the solemn meetings. Quote, the solemn meeting is the one to be considered if one wishes to feel the palpation of his Masonic spirit. An observer, however much he might open his eyes and ears, would see or hear absolutely nothing beyond the interminable but the impressive words of the fiercest anti-Catholic fanaticism. And some ceremonies, which except for achieving grotesqueness in the assassination of Hiram, are only ridiculous. This explains why so many outsiders of a more serious nature cannot endure the stupid tests of the initiation and the ridiculous statements made in the meetings. They attend two or three meetings and then apparently ashamed of themselves 
and convinced of the complete uselessness of Masonic life, exalted by their imagination and never again set foot in the lodge. They renounced it or are ruled out an account of failing in their payment of dues. The rest of their lives they retain the conviction that they have been the victims of a shabby mystification. Quote, it seems that the higher ones rises in masonry. The more stupid are the exercises to which he must submit. This type of ascension and foolishness seems, on the other hand, marked by steps which are peculiar to each degree. It is necessary to understand that masons, once they enter into their lodges and commence work, do then begin to act peculiarly. Each degree has its step, that of the apprentice, the only one which it is permitted to execute in the solemn meeting in the presence of apprentices. It is already passably ridiculous, and the companion is even more so. As for that of the master, it reaches the ultimate limits of the grotesque. The mason, who executes the step of the master and of companion, and he ends up by running about, turning round and round, from right to left and from left to right three consecutive times, lifting his foot very high so that he will not trip over the condemner of the famous Haram, which, of course, isn't there. There is no doubt the reason why masons of low degree are inclined to attain no importance to the higher degrees. They accept without any difficulty the opinion circulated in the lodges, coming from unknown sources that the higher degrees must be reserved for those masons who are too vain to withdraw in the face of any stupidity because of their great love of gold braid. Examination and partial analysis, says Yassier, uncovers in them two constituent elements in all the lodges in the world, mystery and frivolity. Mystery concealed under the cloak of an apparent sanctity of trivial morality and frivolity and the light and recklessness with which since 1713 until now they have admitted the most miserable, the most abject, and the vilest of men, and the weakness and softness which with they have tolerated them after having made fully aware of their unworthiness, and the decided opposition of the majority to a more noble and instructive occupation, and the ceremonies of the board meetings and the conduct of the brothers at banquets and the insistent care which has been taken to transform the sanctuary of masonry, that object of all their vows and efforts, that august temple solemnity consecrated to wisdom and to brotherhood, into a den, a club, a casino, a place of entertainment, as a brother mason would describe it. Finally, to sum it all up in the hatred and fury with which it has pursued, any mason sought to oppose the frivolity of the lodges, to combat at any cost that degeneration, and to admit as members of the Lodge none who are not serious and reasonable men, etc. Number 36. The Famous Haram Since the corpse of Haram, or the name of this famous personages, figures importantly in the Lodges from the third degree upward, I shall tell here of the ceremony which is developed around him in the degree of Master, leaving for later the explanation of its symbolism. By reading the catechism and ritual of that degree, one learns that the masters commemorate in their gatherings the assassination, burial, and exhumation of a certain Haram, described as builder of the Temple of Jerusalem under Solomon, and as the ritual states, father of all masons in the world, past, present, and future, whether they be white, yellow, or black. This burlesque ceremony takes place in a special locale called Chamber of the Middle, where master masons enter one by one with covered heads like the Jews entering the synagogue. When entering, for the first time, they must walk in backward. Not only is there given in the chamber of the middle a reading of the assassination of Haram and of the discovery of his corpse, but among themselves the masons dramatize the scene of the assassination and of the search for the corpse for the light of candles covered with the immense shades, thirty centimeters high. This allows the light to pass through a hole made in the upper part of the base and through another hole made in one of the sides of the base. One master mason plays the part of Haram, others are assassins. The scene of the murder is a representation. Then Haram, feigning death, lies down in a casket and is covered with a shroud upon which is laid a great branch of artificial acacia. 
the casket is placed in the center of the chamber. Then the master, with great seriousness, reveals to his brothers that Solomon is disturbed by the disappearance of Haram, and that they have been ordered to begin a search for him. At once the whole band carries out its first search journey, i.e., they begin to go and come to please Solomon, to turn around and to search everywhere for the corpse, each one being careful not to see the casket. After proving that the searches are in vain, they are ordered to take up a second journey, because Solomon's increased grief. After the second journey, there is a third one. Only in the course of that last journey are they permitted to discover, not the corpse, it is not that easy, but rather the acacia branch. Then all rush to form a circle around this branch to remove the cloth under which the false Haram lies dead. They take his hand, they shake his finger, they pretend to see that the finger comes off the hand, and they exclaim with horror, like Benach, which seems to me the flesh has left his bones. After this, the pseudo-haram is raised, and he immediately re reappears with his finger of his very own skin, etc. Quote, the true masters never enter the middle chamber, except to take part in this extraordinary and unbelievable buffoonery. In spite of this ridiculousness and the fact that there are many Masons who have asked its suppression, these ceremonies have been kept for two centuries, which prove that they are kept for some special reason. In addition, they deceive the authorities by making them believe that Masonry is conserved with childish and ridiculous matters. They are also useful as obstacles to entrance into the lodges for those who are not sufficiently docile or who might be dangerous. Furthermore, they are used for the formation and preparation of the initiates for the acceptance of the suggestions of the occult power which directs masonry. With this end, they are treated as children of three, of five, and of seven, respectively. According to the ritual, they are obliged to march and counter-march counter like school children. With good reason, a gentleman told me that, upon hearing the exercises taking place in a lodge which functioned on the floor above him, he asked if there was a school upstairs. Quote, we see in the ritual, says Eckert, a theatrical presentation, too serious to be a joke, too farcical to be serious. That formidable apparatus is not in itself any more than a means of ludicrous hallucinations. When we see these actors who are not puppets or children, but adults, men of higher education, can such a spectacle be explained otherwise? One finds rather a reasonable means of solving this problem, namely belief in the symbolic teaching of a truly important end which the actors propose, and a teaching which, if it were orally and clearly formulated, would expose its people to the greatest dangers. In short, one would be obliged to believe that therein are veiled criminal plans. Is it not astonishing that so many important personages, congressmen, ministers, diplomats, generals, and even chiefs of states, have made their career preparing themselves with similar exercises? Chapter 5 The Masonic Instruction Number 37 The Symbols The initiation is nothing more than the beginning of the internal work of masonry. After that comes the work which must give light and dispel darkness, the work of Masonic instruction. For this purpose, Masonry has its instructors in certain sects and for some degrees. The chief of Illuminism, Weishaupt, set forth some very clever rules to assist instructors in furthering their work. He charges them, above all, to study initiates per carefully, to spy on them. But ordinarily, the instruction comes from symbols, from legends, and from lectures. Let us begin with the symbols. Everything is symbolic in Masonry. The first three degrees are usually referred to as symbolic masonry, to differentiate them from the others which are the philosophic degrees. The symbol, as Mackey explains it, is a perceptible image used to express an occult but analogous meaning. But the symbolic image is only conventional, i.e. it has only a conventional relation to the significant thing. Therefore it is impossible for him who is not in agreement to realize its meaning. It would not be possible to give here the symbolic meaning of everything there is in a lodge and of all ceremonial used in it. A great deal of space would be needed for that, especially since the meaning of the symbols is left as a secondary manner. 
to the free interpretation of each initiate, or rather, because the symbols have diverse meanings in such a way that the initiate goes deeper and deeper into Masonic degrees and knowledge. Nevertheless, for the sake of example, I am going to show the readers a few Masonic symbols. The two columns, Boaz and Jackin, represent the two principles who, according to agnostics and Manichaeans, have produced the word good and evil, light and darkness, Osiris and Typhon, Ormuz and Iraman, Satan and Jesus Christ, form and matter, fire and water, male and female. The white is the emblem of the feminine sex, the black of the masculine sex. By reading the letters backwards, one obtains the secret of nature formulated in Hebrew. This explanation is from Pike. The triangle represents the great architect of the universe, or the Masonic Trinity, i.e. nature with its three kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal. The word God begins in many languages with the letter D. The Greek letter D is a triangle. In the middle is the letter G, which signifies generation. This triune God, says Rigon, has three mysteries, which also symbolize the three sides of the triangle. First, everything is formed by generation. Second, destruction follows the generation in all its works. Third, regeneration under other forms follows the effects of the destruction. The sun, frequently represented in Masonic decorations, is a god beloved by the Masons, as by agnostics and Manichaeans, and represents the forces of nature, the true god of Masonry. In its honor in the Masonic temples, the presidential chair and the altar of the lodge face the east. The flaming star, symbol of the supreme grand master, i.e. of modern philosophy and belief in the divinity, in higher degrees it seems, according to the explanation given by Masonic authors, that it has more material and obscene meaning, which I cannot set down here. The square and compass signify equity and equality, and, in a deeper sense, the masculine and feminine principles of generation, which is represented among these symbols by a G. They also use the symbol of the rough stone, the polished stone, and the cleft stone. The exterior order, or blue masonry, must prepare the materials, the rough stone, i.e. outsiders, in order to introduce them carefully, worked as did the workers of the Temple of Solomon, to the interior order for the construction of the new temple. The apprentices must rub away the prejudices of the outside world. The cleft stone is the order of the Templars, which must be repaired by masonry. Number 38. Symbolism of the Bible. In many, if not all lodges, is found the Bible, and no doubt upon seeing it, the Protestant, who still retains something of Christianity, and the Catholic, who has some vague idea of his religion and of the Bible, will feel comforted in the face of his suspicions that it would be contrary to his beliefs. In some places, the cross is still seen, thus giving confidence to the timid. Must there not be something Christian in an institution which honors the cross and the Bible? Nevertheless, this only manifests their ignorance of the true significance of those emblems and of the hypocrisy with which they are used on them. The Bible is there in order to accustom Masons to scorn it to accord it Masonic tolerance on the same basis as other sacred books, as for the example the Quran, to interpret it according to the Masonic way, to form with it the legends which suits the order, to tear it apart, to translate it as they desire. Proust devotes an entire chapter of his work to the study of the Bible, and I'm going to set down its conclusion. Quote, Certainly, we have not denied the use of the book, Bible, in American Masonry, but we have proved that the Christian Bible is not an object of Masonic reverence, that such objects as the Bible, the square, and the compass must be taken as inseparable whole, if we must give to the passages of the Bible their just importance. We have shown, as if in reality, such an evident thing needed demonstration, that the Bible is a Masonic Bible, not a Christian Bible, because the material book is nothing when its contents are mutilated, contradicted, or altered. We have shown that in solemn Masonic processions its inferiority to the book of the Masonic constitutions. We have shown that the praises given to the Bible mean nothing on the lips of Masons, since for Masonry the Bible is only one of the books of divine revelation, 
on equal level with the Quran, Veda, Zendavesta, etc. We have shown how the tests are deprived of their Christian significance by the suppression of the name of Christ. We have seen with that absurdity the authenticity of the books is contraindicated. We have seen the Bible lowered in comparison with the Kabbalah. It is held as an imperfect form of Kabbalah. If this is Masonic reverence for the sacred scripture, what would its scorn be? The Bible as a Masonic symbol must be interpreted as the book of nature or the code of reason and of human conscience. The Bible and the Gospel of St. John in particular are not recognized in the order of St. John as books of the Old and New Testament, but the holy books are considered there only as a unit, certainly valuable as historic documents on the mysteries and their explanation. Christ himself is nothing more than, than the Grand Master of the order who illuminates with a perfect light. He is only a symbol of that which natural reason teaches us concerning birth, death, and resurrection. He is only Logos symbolized. Now Masonic readers, especially Protestants of good faith, know what the presence of the Bible means in the Lodge. 39. Symbolism of the Cross Will the presence of the cross have a better fate? Certainly not. To the Christian symbol of suffering and sacrifice, there has been given the meaning of carnal pleasure, above all when it is in conjunction with the rose, symbol of charity, which in the Masonic sense signifies sensual condescension. The inscription on the cross, I-N-R-I, has also a sensual meaning contained in the Latin, igne natura nonovatur integra. Nature is renewed completely through fire. That fire is the sun is concupiscence in the ultimate degree. In the Rose Cross degree, that inscription will mean Jew of Nazareth led by Raphael to Judea. And the word INRI will be the hostile word with which the brothers of that degree recognize each other. Naturally, these symbols and all the rest are being interpreted in diverse ways according to the degrees because Masonic teaching goes gradually in order not to frighten the initiate by showing all the vile profundities of the mysteries and of the pagan cult of the flesh too soon. The worship of the sun and the cult of nature are the origin of the celebration of the Masonic feast referred to in the solstices of summer and winter, as the feast of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. It is not devotion to these saints, but rather the cult of the sun which has made them choose those dates for Masonic solemnities. Number 40. Legends and Allegories The Masonic ritual is full of legends, especially in the higher degrees, beginning with that of Master, in which is found the legend of the death of Haram. In those legends are involved the allegories which Masonry uses to communicate its light to its members and to hide it from outsiders in the same manner as symbols serve to hide it from the members. The differences between the allegory and the symbol, according to the Masonic doctors, lies in the fact that the symbol has a purely conventional significance significance in such a way that it is impossible for him who is not in the secret to discover it. The allegory, on the other hand, quote, is a discourse or na narration in which there is a literal and figurative sense, one apparent sense and another related sense, the intention being that the use of the apparent meaning is to indicate the figurative or occult by analogy or comparison, end quote. The interpretation of the allegory is easy, and for this reason someone has said that, quote, the allegory inhabits a transparent palace, end quote. Almost all the legends of masonry are allegories. Only by reason of their legendary allegories or symbols do they have importance, regardless of what their true history may be. I shall give a resume of the legend of Hiram or Adon Hiram. This was the master who directed the work of the Temple of Solomon, a very wise man. The Masons were divided into three classes, apprentice, companion, and masters, and in order to recognize each other, each guild had a word. Hiram was murdered by three companions who wanted to extract the word from the master, but with his death the word was lost. The Masons gathered sadly, not only to mourn the death of Hiram, but also to search for the lost word. This legend is elaborated upon in higher degrees without the lost word being found, except in the ultimate degrees. Whom does the murdered Haram represent, and who are the murderers? 
Hiram represents, according to some degrees, Jacques de Molay, the Grand Master Templar. For others, it is Mans, founder of Manichaeism. Manichaeism. For others, it is Jesus Christ. Still others believe it to be Jehovah, God of the Jews, as opposed to the one God in the Trinity of Christians. For still others, it is the sovereign people, whose sovereignty has been destroyed by priests, kings, and soldiers, represented by a serpent with three heads. The head with a crown indicates the sovereign, the one with a tiara key indicates the popes, and the one with a sword indicates the army. Hiram is a symbol of Basan to some masons, which suffers a kind of apparent death in winter. According to more profound interpretations, it is humanity, mortal individuals, immortal in the species. The drama in the middle chamber indicates the renewal of humanity in the sanctuary of generation. According to others, Haram represents the state of nature, despoiled by the state of society, of their original liberty, equality, and fraternity. According to others, against Haram is Satan himself, the good god of the Masons, dethroned from his empire by Adonai, the god of the Christians, one god in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 41. Against whom is Masonic vengeance directed? The understanding of the three murders of Haram depends upon the interpretation accorded him. In general, one may say that they represent priest, king, society, and Christianity. Therefore, it is clear against whom must be executed the vengeance for which they are prepared and disciplined, and of which they speak constantly in the lodges. These explanations given are from Masonic doctors, as one can see in the cited works, especially those of Benoit, Prus, Serracasa, and Espaza. Number 42, The Lectures. Copen Abencelli says, What have I done in masonry? It is a question which the reader ought to ask me. It is, in effect, what one always hears. What is done in Masonic meetings? The reply is so simple that it always amazes those who hear it for the first time. In the Masonic meetings, one begins by listening to sermons, and later one gives them. Their lodges are places where one is preached to and where one preaches, and nothing more. If this reply has been able to surprise the reader, he continues, at the beginning of our study, it should not do so now. One who tries to understand the suggestions of the occult power residing in the spirit of Masonry has only one medium at his disposal, namely the sermon. Upon what are these sermons based? Upon two principal themes, which revolve unceasingly for every purpose and for no purpose. First theme, Freemasonry is a sublime, holy, and sacred institution. It is the eternal initiator of all that is upright, good, and great in humanity. Second theme, this association, so lofty, so respectable, so venerable, has one enemy. This enemy is Catholicism. How does one arrive at this conclusion? Since Catholicism is the enemy of Masonry, it is the enemy of all great causes to which the latter claims to dedicate itself. Consequently, if they truly love these great causes, it is necessary to combat Catholicism. Such are the two embryonic ideas which serve on, as a hinge for Masonic teaching. Such are the two suggestions which the occult power wished at all costs to implant into the minds of the members, the two parts which it is intended to impose upon them for good or evil, until such a point that those who refuse to accept them are definitely cast out of Masonry. That, above all, must serve as a base for all the rest. Around this, there are studies in common, in the form of lectures and discussions, in which the members are encouraged, and which deal with political and social questions, etc. To inculcate these two great ideas, Masons make use of ritual symbols, catechisms, and legends, especially that one which claims Haram as the father of Masonry. Another still more daring legend is that it was founded by Cain, born of Satan or Iblis, the angel of light, and of Eve, seduced by him. Masons believe all this, and they believe, too, all that is said about the influence of masonry on human development, says Copen Abengeli. Why did we not know it, or why did we not ask it? The widow has us under her fluent influence, literally. She has hypnotized us. The effort spent in making masons accept the first suggestion has no other purpose than to make the second one easier for him. 
notice what that same author continues to say. Its success has been complete. The occult power has suggested so skillfully to the Masons that the medium of the sublime and holy Masonry always concern, it says of itself, with the well-being of humanity that has blinded them completely, deceived, hallucinated, hypnotized, and fanaticized them. It has injected them so profoundly with the anti-Catholic virus that the majority of them have come to be obsessed with a madness which will not let them rest. In the same way that alcohol reacts upon the brain, so does this anti-Catholic insinuation react upon Masons. Many act without reason. They do not think, they chew, and chew again the suggestion, as do ruminating animals with the straw which has been given them. They react in an automatic manner to be repeated urgings of the occult power. Speak to them of masonry. Tell them that this association is the mother of civilization, of progress, of light, and they jump with joy. Do not believe they know what is civilization, progress, or light any more than they know what is this masonry of which they form a part. It has limited itself to insinuating skillfully that civilization is progress, that progress is light, and that light is masonry. Masons have asked no more, and each time they get these replies, they applaud with the most delirious enthusiasm. On the other hand, pronounce in their presence the words, only the words Catholicism, clericalism, and obscuritanism, and they will foam at the mouth. These words affect them like an electric shock. They arouse a fury of destruction in them. It is no because they know the meaning of Catholicism, clericalism, and obscuritism. Their holy and sublime mother, Masonry, has lied to them about this. They believe with a profound faith all that is told them because they are persuaded a priori of its sublimity. Nevertheless, when the brothers invite you to enter Masonry, they will tell you that in their organization they do not deal with religion or politics, and that you can be Masons and Catholic at the same time. They will tell you this in all seriousness. Number 43. The Imperious Demands of Masonry Masonry Speaks Masonry affirms matter solemnly to its members, it does not offer them proof. The Magister Dijit of Pythagoras is at its model. It confesses through its doctors that no man or corporation is infallible. It confesses that it has no documents or authentic accounts, spoken or written, on which to support its affirmation about the ancient origin of the sect. Neither does it have the date of the teachings, with no more foundation than that of having been taught by those ancient sects or sages. It does not prove its affirmations, but nevertheless it pretends to give light to the understanding of, of its members, to teach them the truth, the divine truth, the truth of God and the soul. The nature and essence of both is what constitutes the principal objective of Masonic teaching. Now, with respect to this form of teaching, the final apparent tribunal is the Grand Lodge. And before this authority, which declares itself infallible, and which manifestly affirms its essentially mendacious doctrines as the reader may well imagine, and you will then see, there go the Protestant and Catholic initiates to abjure their Christian faith, a retraction hypocritically enveloped in the veils of Masonic symbolism and ceremonial. Part 2. An Essentially Untruthful Society. Chapter 1. Masonry and Catholicism. Number 44. Personal Sincerity of Many Masons. I have said, and I repeat now, that I recognize there are many Masons who are serious persons, incapable of assenting to the spirit of Masonry, and of lending themselves to its intrigues. These men are in it, contributing to its work with their money and their prestige, only because they are ignorant of all or almost all that there is in Masonry, its objectives, its doctrines, its methods, and its deeds. Scarcely do they recognize it as a light sketch, traced before their eyes expressly to keep them deceived. Furthermore, I can name some individuals who I know and whom I am certain, on the day they realize even partly what they are now ignorant of, will withdraw horrified from the institution which has been deceiving them and exploiting their prestige and cooperation. Concerning others, without a doubt, it can be said that they walk in the shadows, suspecting somewhat, knowing a small part of the deceit being played, yet ignorant of a great deal. They undergo the struggle which is sure to take place between an honorable conscience and agreements entered into because of deceitful practices or a chain of deceptions. Having given this warning, I shall go on to prove the constitutional mendacity of masonry. Number 45. Does not masonry concern itself with religion? The large majority of the Masonic order believe that masonry does not concern itself with religion. They believe masonry is only a society of charity and philanthropy and mutual aid. 
Masonic constitutions declare, quote, Masonry concerns itself neither with the diverse religions existent in the world, nor with the civil constitutions of the state. On the height at which it stands, it must respect and does respect equally the religious faith and the political sympathies of its members. Consequently, in their meetings, all discussion which tends toward these subjects is expressly and formally prohibited. In the Constitution of 1912, it states, Masonry respects equally the religious faith and the political sympathies of its members. It is not concerned with the various religions. It must respect and does respect the religious faith of its members. These are the words of the Constitution. However, the truth is precisely the opposite. Masonry does concern itself with the Christian religion, especially Catholicism, in order to combat it and, consequently, it makes false statements when it says it respects the religion of all members. This is done in a systematic way. Here are some declarations which will give evidence of the mendacity of Masonry on this subject. Quote, Freemasonry is the counter-church, the counter-Catholicism, the church of heresy. As to Catholicism, we Masons must pursue its utter demolition. Bulletin of the Grand Orient of France, September 1885. A memorandum from the Supreme Council confirmed these declarations with the following, quote, The struggle being waged between Catholicism and Masonry is war to the death, without truce or quarter. In 1902, Brother Delpec, in his discourse, pronounced an official banquet, among other things, the following, quote, The triumph of the Galilean has lasted 20 centuries. May the Catholic Church die in its turn. The Roman Church, founded on the Galilean myth, has begun to decay rapidly since the day of the founding of the Masonic Association. From the political point of view, Masons have varied frequently, but at all time, Freemasonry has been firm in this principle. War on all superstition. War on all fanaticism. About two years ago, in one of the solemn banquets of the summer solstice, there were delivered in in Quique such blasphemous discussions against our blessed Lord Jesus and the Most Holy Virgin that the English Masons, who had been invited by the Chilean lodges, protested and withdrew. And... The first time, the notorious Belen de Sodaga came to the city at the banquet which Masonry offered her, recognizing her as a sister, it was declared that Masonry had had the honor of bringing her to Inquique. Everyone in Chile knew she had spent all her time attacking the Catholic Church with issues of lies, Masonic legends of the same kind that are read in certain degrees and with blasphemies. Number 46, the Renegade Grand Architect. Masonry has been accustomed to call its God the Grand Architect of the Universe. Who has not heard this name? which, to the ignorant or naive, seems an expression of faith and piety of those who use it. Nevertheless, this title seems so pompous, beyond the architectural significance with which it agrees with the art of building attributed to masonry, involves the denial of one of the first Christian doctrines, that of creation. The God-creator, or the God of masonry, is not the God-creator of Christians. The architect constructs the building with materials which he does not make, but which he finds already made. The creator constructs the edifice of the world, not with foreign already made substances, but with materials which he himself made from nothing. When you understand this, you will know that when they say masonry demands faith in God, you will realize this is not the same faith which a Christian has, faith in a creator God. It is only faith in an architect God, which is a very different thing, and after all, it cannot be said that masonry even clings to that faith. Who has not heard the phrase, quote, to the glory of the grand architect of the universe, which has been given as proof of the godlessness of masonry? Now, on September 10, 1877, that phrase was abolished in the Grand Orient of France, which rules not only Latin masonry, but also the United States masonry quote before the state they feasted in his glory the grand architects in his honors lodges were inaugurated not a word was said not a vow was taken not a letter written or a commission given except on paper which carried this pious phrase at the head on that day then the 10th of september at a time in which it considered itself sufficiently free to manifest its true sentiments the grand orient shamelessly renounced its grand architect it has gone still farther he has been declared their enemy to such an extent that in spite of the liberal professions of faith that are contained in the statutes of this federation it came to be a bad note for an outsider seeking initiation to declare that he was not absolutely convinced that the grand architect had ever been anything other than a myth falling upon a so-called deism fanatical and irreconcilable materialism what an extraordinary philosophical association Proudhon, one of the most famous masons of the past century said quote, our own principle is the negation of all dogma our point of departure nothing to deny always to deny is our method it has led us to place as our principle in religion atheism and politics anarchy and political economy non-ownership number 47 furious hatred toward christ in the initiation of the 28th degree knight of the son or prince adept of the ancient accepted scottish rite among other things which the president called adam says to initiate are found the following declarations quote, many outsiders have the fortune to enter our sanctuaries but few indeed are fortunate enough to come to know the sublime truth the secret they promised to reveal to him. If you ask what are the qualities a mason must have to arrive at the center of true good, it is necessary to have crushed the serpent of mundane ignorance, to have shaken off the yoke of the prejudices of childhood concerning the religion, dominant in the country of his birth. Here is the master under the form of a serpent, which he must exterminate. It is the faithful pictures of what the vulgar imbecile adores under the name of religion. The 19th degree, Scottish Knight of St. Andrew, of the same rite, sums it up in these words, quote, War on the cross of Jesus Christ. 
adopt the cult of Lucifer, of fire, and of flesh. In some lodges of the 30th degree, the Knight Kadash of the Scottish Rite, which according to Ragon is the non plus ultra and high philosophic masonry, makes the initiate trample on a crucifix, telling him, quote, trample upon this image of superstition, the king and the pope. According to another ritual, quote, the march of the candidate or initiate is made thus, placing himself at the foot of a cross of Jerusalem, which must be drawn on the ground. He goes around this cross with three steps of, of apprentice, three of companion, and three of master, in such a way that the last step leaves him on the high part of the cross, where the heels are brought together in a square. Another sign, called a sign of horror, consists of, quote, turning the head to the left, looking at the ground, and raising the hands a little to the right. Thus, after having renounced in the thirteenth degree, the knight rose croxy, the divinity of the Redeemer in this act, he tramples with his feet the instrument of redemption, with a show of horror and disdain. At the same time, they teach the initiate to defile the cross, they invite him to adore nature. It reaches such a point that they even show him Baphomet, that infamous idol, well remembered for the adoration rendered it in formal times by the Templars and even before the Gnostics. <coughs> Carbonazium, in its first seven degrees, speaks much of Christianity, yet in the last three degrees, war is declared on all religion and society. In the degree of master, our Lord Jesus Christ is accused of having opposed the original equality of men by declaring himself the Son of God. In the seventh degree, the initiate vows war on all religion and true government. In other rites, such as the Mizram, the adept in the last degrees embraces the cult of the sun. Spiritualism is practiced, and the preference of evil spirits over good ones is recommended. I believe that enough is said, and more than enough, so that one may see the sincerity of masonry when it proclaims in its statutes that it is not concerned with the religion and that it respects all religions. Brother Ganad, speaking at a banquet closing the convention of 1886, said, quote, There was a time when masonry found it necessary to declare, not as a rule, but informally, that it did not concern itself with religion or politics. Was it hypocrisy? I do not say so. Rather, it was that we were obliged under the pressure of laws and the fear of police action to dissimulate the one thing that we alone must do. Number 48. The Difference Between Clericalism and Catholicism To better combat Catholicism, Mason reinvented a distinction between clericalism and Catholicism, boasting of respect for Catholicism and of combating only clericalism, that is, the intervention of the clergy in politics. At the closing banquet of the General Assembly of the Grand Orient of France in 1886, Brother Chassain said, quote, We wish the fusion of all Masonic powers in a general federation which, better than our own present disorganized forces, will be able to combat and to conquer clericalism and reaction. Quote, this distinction, says Cope and Albincelli, was invented precisely at the time in which there were in the Chamber of Deputies 300 Masons and only one priest. But the cassock was seen and the aprons were not. Worthy of notice is the de declaration made in this respect by Brother Cordovana, professor of letters at Douai, who, in 1888, and 1889 gave conferences in the lodges of the province and of Paris. In one of the conferences, the following was read, quote, The distinction between Catholicism and clericalism is purely official, subtly adapted for the needs of the public. But here in the lodge, let us say it aloud. For the sake of truth, Catholicism and clericalism are one and the same thing. In Macanere Berger, pages 208 through 236, one can read of all the efforts of the Belgian masonry to enslave and to lower the clergy, to establish free, obligatory, godless schools, and to suppress the religious congregations. In the International Masonic Congress at Brussels, August 1904, the brother Koch, then Most Serene Grand Master, said in his toast, quote, Our illustrious brother of France, like ourselves in Belgium, must struggle against the Roman Church to guard the liberty of thought according to one's conscience. Proceeding as they do, the French Masons gave us not only with words but above all with their actions, an example which the Belgian Masons must strive to imitate. Brother Dues, delegate of the Grand Orient of Milan, said in turn, quote, The struggle against the papacy is a social necessity and must be the constant objective of, free of Masonry. Thereupon, Dues raises his glass, expressing the hope that Masonry will succeed in planting the flag of progress and liberty over the Vatican, which will have ceased to shelter the papacy. It is true that clericalism and Roman Catholicism are basically the same thing, but if we try to destroy the whole edifice at one blow, we undertake a tremendous task, whose end the present generations will not witness. Number 49. Masonic Action Against the Catholic Church in France is Anti-Catholic Fury. Louis Blanc, in his History of the Revolution, has an article entitled, quote, the mystic revolutionaries, in which he, as an undisciplined mason, far from being familiar with the supreme head of the lodge, describes the part which they had in the revolutionary work. First, he says, it is important to introduce to the reader the underground movement, which undermined the thrones and the altars, revolutionaries, the most profound and active of the encyclopedists. Then he describes masonry, its first three degrees, the creation of the degrees of the Arié lodges, reserved for ardent souls, the constitution of the Grand Orient as a central rule of the lodges, and he adds, quote, from that moment, masonry was constantly open to the majority of the men, whom we shall meet again in the midst of revolutionary strife. It is well known that the French Revolution not only dethroned the king, but also attempted to dethrone God, declaring that, quote, there is no God, man is his own God, 
humanity should speedily crush the cult of Christian faith. The most beautiful courtesan, symbol of the beauty of the divine being in humanity, must take the place of the savior of the world above the divine altars and must receive the homage of the nation and of public authorities. Baruel tells that on August 12, 1792, the revolutionaries began to date the years from the beginning of the French Revolution, or, quote, liberty, as it was termed. At the reading of the famous decree, there was revealed publicly the cherished secret of the Masons, quote, all of France is but one great lodge. The French are the f all Freemasons, and the entire universe will soon be as we are. One must read in history to what extent anti-Christian fury was carried in that lodge. For a time, it tolerated the constitutional priests, that is, those who had been weak enough to recognize the civil constitution of the clergy, which was openly schismatic. The rest, except for the very old and weak, who in many regions followed the common fortune, were condemned to deportation, and many were temporarily incarcerated in the cities near the sea, and treated with the greatest inhumanity. Of the 700 gathered at the Bay of Rockford, 500 died in 10 months, and the immense majority had to hide or flee the country. After the priests, the fury was turned against the churches, their monuments, their statues, and their sacred objects, etc. Quote, One would not exaggerate, says the collaborator, collaborator and apostate, Abbe Gregori, in saying that in the realm of art, the listing alone of stolen, destroyed, or degraded objects would fill many volumes. Everyone knows that a few years ago, in 1905, the government of France broke off relations with the Holy See, expelled from the country all the teaching orders as well as many who were not, took possession of their property, removed churches, and parish and episcopal houses after having taken from bishops and priests the income which, according to an agreement with the Holy See, was owing to them. In a word, the supreme effort was made to suppress the Catholic religion in France. They removed crucifixes from schools as well as from courts of justice. They erased the name of God from the official textbooks, and they intended to suppress at one fell blow all religious teaching. Quote, from the official documents of Freemasonry, contained principally in the official bulletin and acts or accounts rendered of the Grand Orient, it has been proven that all anti-clerical measures taken in the French Parliament were decreed beforehand in Masonic lodges and executed under the direction of Grand Orient, whose declared intent is to control each person and thing in France. Que persona ne bougera plus France en dehors de nous. Quote, I have said in the Assembly of 1898, says the Deputy Massey, official speaker of the Assembly of 1903, that it is the supreme duty of Freemasonry to intervene more and more in political and religious struggles. Quote, the triumph in the anti-clerical combat is due in great part to Freemasonry, he continues, because it is its spirit and its program which have brought about this triumph. If the BLLC, which is the name block was given to a number of French deputies who all voted together on certain measures discussed in poly Parliament, if the BLLC has been established, it is due to Freemasonry and to the discipline learned in the lodges. The means which we have now to urge are the separation of church and state and the law regarding the teaching profession. Let us place our trust in the work of Brother Camus. Since 1894, the Brother Gadud declared at the convention, as the act gives evidence, that Freemasonry is nothing other than the Republic undercover, just as the Republic itself is nothing other than Masonry uncovered. Brother Luci Pia, who presided at the Council of the Order, expressed the same idea, saying, at the head of the government, there are only, so to speak, Freemasons, not those Freemasons who, having received the light of day, have forgotten at once the way of our workshops, but Freemasons who have remained faithful and practice self-abnegation. Therefore, so that no one will be deceived, it is said everywhere that we are not now in the Republic, we are in Masonry. The word is that of a bishop. Indeed, this bishop would be right if Freemasonry and the Republic were not precisely one and the same thing. Finally, the president of the Grand Symbolic Lodge, speaking at a banquet honoring one of the members of the cabinet, said, quote, You will find it very natural, my brothers, that by a logical connection I may include in the same toast the entire government. For a long time you have heard our adversaries claim that France is in the hands of Freemasonry. They are not right. Today they can say so. With Brother Felix Faré, all the members of the cabinet, with the exception of two or three, are of our great family. Yes, we have a government of Freemasons, and Freemasons worthy of the name. From these declarations, it is evident that the religious persecution which has been in France in this century, and which the masses wish to renew at this time, is the work of masonry, as it was also in the epoch of the terror at the end of the 18th century. The spoliation of the property of the church, the separation of church and state, the expulsion of religious orders and congregations, the laws of civil matrimony and divorce, the compulsory lay schools, prohibition or restriction of public worship, etc., are all characteristics of the Masonic plan, which one sees fulfilled when and where masonry has been able to execute it or propounded by them as an ideal when has not been able to realize them. Number 50, in Spain and Portugal. In Spain, lodges were established with privileges issued from England in Gibraltar and Madrid throughout the year 1726, and in a short time, they rose to more than 200. The hatred which masonry has had for a long time towards the Jesuits is well known. The Jesuits are a foam bulwark of the Christian education of youth and of the Christian faith. It is a well-known fact that in the time of Charles III, the Count of Aranda, having been affiliated since his youth with the Madrilenian Lodge, drew from the king of the decree of the expulsion of the Jesuits from all Spanish possessions, 
the decree which was to affect them all on the same day, that is, April 2nd, 1767. The mind of the king had been prepared for this by inventing a letter from the most reverend P. Ricci, general of the order, a year before, against the legit legitimacy of the king, an invention which the Protestant Prussian, Joel, as well as many other Protestants, judge as absurd, etc. Aranda became the first Grand Master of the Red Madrilinian Lodge, established in the Grand Orient in 1767, or shortly afterwards. In a famous trial which Don Miguel de Moratay, Grand Master of the Spanish Orient, had initiated against the priest Wenceslas de la Guerre and the deacon Andres Serrano for crimes attributed by the press to masonry, one of the defenders of the accused, Raymond Nocedil, recorded at the hearing the crimes committed by masonry against the church. Señor Nocedal, oi, Señor Moreta, Supreme Head of the Spanish Grand Orient, two or three nights before July 17th, 1831, who was singing on the streets of Madrid that horrible couplet which began, Death to Christ, long live Lucifer, who spread the rumor that the monks had poisoned the water, who hurled against the Imperial College, St. Thomas, St. Francis the Great, the Mercy, the Discalced Car Carmelites, and the Patoka, those heartless hyenas who easily and without punishment murdered, tormented, and mutilated the British orders, who kept the troops in their quarters until the murderers had had enough of killing, who tied the hands of the regiment quartered in San Francisco so that it could not aid the monks, and who untied them to repel those who were going to seek refuge in the quarter, who stole in the commissary of the holy places the half million with which the murderers were paid. All Madrid knew who had planned the crime. The president of the Council of Ministers, upon defending himself as much as he could from the apathy of the authorities, also made it obvious through his actions and his writing, and no one has dared to deny that terrifying and sacrilegious hedicomb was the work of the secret societies. Senor Moreta, quote, the Carbonari did it. Senor no said all. In effect, I do not doubt that the Carbonari helped as much as they were able, since the progressist mobs were paid instruments. The Freemasons and the partisans of the Commune were the directors of the slaughter. There was another secret society, the Isabellines, and its members were fraternally divided into three parts. And who were those of the Commune but Masons? Who came from Masonry and returned to it? And who was unaware of the treaties and counter-treaties of Carbonari and Masons when they called a truce to their disagreements to ally themselves against a common enemy? Who does not know that Masonry is the fountainhead and mother of all or almost all the other secret societies which issue from her and return to her like rivers to the sea? Who ignored that some of these societies are formed by Masons more determined to consummate some iniquity even greater than Masonry wishes to be done for fear the unwary and to deceive might recognize their actions and their responsibility? But the slaughter of the religious bur of the religious burnings and sackings of convents of 1834 are public and notorious, and it is indisputable that they were the work of all the secret societies under the direction of Masonry. And who but the lodges of Saragossa, Barcelona, Murcia, and Reus continued the killings of religious and sacked and burned? I do not know how many many churches and convents in 1835. In the corresponding annotation, it is proved by Albert Pike himself, a Masonic authority, who already must be known to the reader, what Senor Nocedal affirms concerning the creation of a society of the communists and of others to mislead people concerning the action and responsibility of Masonry. In Portugal, Calvalhalo, Marquis of Pombal, had been a precursor of the Count Aranda enemy of the clergy and of monks, whom he called the most dangerous worms that ever gnawed at a state. He began by sending to the gallows the Duke of Aviero and the Marchioness of Tavora, as a means of getting at the Jesuits with greater security, according to St. Priest, his historian and panegyrist. On the night of January 12th through the 13th, 1759, on the square facing Tahoe, a scaffold was erected. There the servants of the Duke Aviero were burned to death, the Marchioness of Tavora was guillotined, her husband and children executed, and the Duke of Aviero was tied to a wheel and killed in the most inhumane and barbarous manner. They were blamed for a crime committed against the king. However, this was but a means of reaching the Jesuits, one of whom was confessor to the Marchioness. All were accused of conspiracy or of complicity. Their houses were surrounded. Three were burned. Father Malagrida, incarcerated in the dungeons of Tahoe, was afterwards burned, strangled publicly, accused of witchcraft, a charge which Voltaire called ridiculous, although he found such news comforting. The Jesuits were expelled from all Portuguese territories and driven to the shores of Italy. Two hundred were held in the dungeons of Tahoe, where eighty-one died of suffering and misery, and the rest languished for eighteen years until the fall of Pombal. A tribunal of eighteen members reviewed the trial of Marcionis of Tavora, and on April 7, 1781, the innocence of all who were condemned in the sentence of 1759 was declared. Their memory was rehabilitated, and the trial was declared null, a trial which had exemplified the depth of legal trickery to which masonry had resorted. And the funeral, panegyric of King Jose, delivered in Lisbon in 1777, the orator said, quote, Who would believe that a single man, abusing the confidence and the authority of the king, could, during the space of twenty years, shackle all the tongues, close all the mouths, inflict anguish upon all hearts, hold truth captive, bear untruth and triumph, erase all traces of justice, make iniquity and barbarism respected, and dominate public opinion from one end of Europe to the other? 
To this question of the Portuguese orator, the chance replies with precision. Only masonry can explain it. At the International Masonic Congress, which opened on September 20, 1921, in Rome, Magalhães Lima, Grand Master of the Portuguese Masonry, who was applauded fanatically, made the statement, In ten months of government, we have done what others have not been able to do in many years. We have expelled the Jesuits. We have suppressed the religious congregations. We have proclaimed the law of divorce and separation of church and state. Here we are reunited, sharing the same in thought, the same feeling and identical desire. It is a thought, the idea of new morality, of a new religion. The orator was congratulated with delirious ovation the kind that will never be forgotten. And what has been done in Portugal is not only what the orator has expressed, it has been an odious and tyrannical persecution, the most bloody and hypocritical contradiction of liberty, equality, and fraternity, which are so loudly proclaimed in the lodges. Number 51 in Italy. The Grand Orient of Italy has declared many times that, in its struggle against the papacy, it is enthusiastically followed by Freemasonry throughout the whole world, and especially by the Masonic centers of Paris, Berlin, London, Madrid, Calcutta, and Washington. This declaration has not been contradicted by any Grand Lodge of any country. No German Lodge or any other has broken off its relations with it on account of its political infamy or anti-religious activity. The following, recounted by Margiotta, will give an idea of the anti-Christian fury of Italian masonry. Quote, we know what the Jew of Istanbul, Adriano Lemmy, has done upon entering the residence of Pope Paul V, the Borgia Palace, where the Italian Grand Orient established its seat. It caused a great scandal, which the newspapers publicized widely at the time, even those which were, as a rule, rather indifferent. Lemmy had built above the private chapel the latrines of the Masonic Supreme Council, causing the drainage to flow over the altar. This proves conclusively his filthy mind, because in order to commit this abominable act, he could not avoid contaminating the whole area. Protests were heard, and the architect, for some reasons of hygiene, had to rearrange the latrines in another way. But Lemmy had conceived another idea. He had placed in the water closets a crucifix, with the head down, and above it, by his order, was nailed a sign with these words, quote, Before leaving, spit on the traitor. Glory to Satan. From the fact that a Jewish mason was able to do all that is evident that he was a perforce dealing with minds disposed toward tolerating such infamies. As for the rest, in conformity with the plans oftentimes brought to light, masonry has effected in Italy the confiscation of the Pope's possessions, expropriation of the property of the Church, godless teachings in the schools, and has attempted to promulgate the law of divorce which hitherto has been unsuccessful. Number 52. In Belgium, Germany, and Austria. Of Masonic activities against the Church in Belgium, I find manifestations on each page of the work La Maconnerie Belge de Malier. The anti-Christian program is the same everywhere, but in Belgium it seems that a greater attempt to realize it would have been made, for the same reason that it has not been yet taken possession of the power of the state in a definite manner. In 1854, at a festival, which was celebrated in turn by two lodges in obedience to the Grand Orient, Brother Borland, Grand Orator said, among other things, Quote, I say that we have the right and duty to concern ourselves with the religious questions of the convents, to attack it, attack it in a straightforward fashion, to dissect it. It will be necessary for the entire country to bring it to justice, even though it must employ force to be cured of this leprosy. In 1864, at the celebration of the winter solstice, Brother Van Hombeck, who became the Grand Master in 1869, said in a speech, quote, Yes, there is a putrefied cadaver corrupting the world. It obstructs the way of progress, that cadaver of the past, to call it plainly by its name, without paraphrases, is Catholicism. Today we have looked that cadaver in the face, and, if we have not yet cast it into the tomb, at least we have exposed it so that people can become more cons conscious of it. In 1875, the brother Op Opatat Skilquin, in a toast at the new Grand Master, sounded the clarion call against convents, using the formula often heard, quote, tried and perfect fire, to the unceasing and bloody struggle against those centers of ignorance and brutishness, which spreads like leprosy, over all the surface of the land, to war against the convents. Mr. Slui, Belgian delegate to the Masonic Congress of Paris in 1900, said during the course of a session, quote, It is necessary in Belgium, as in France, that we understand clearly that the most terrible enemy of the people is clericalism, and, if it is not destroyed at its very source, the solution of the social question is impossible. It is imperative, then, to combat it unceasingly and everywhere. In 1879, the law of godless and anti-Christian teaching for which Masonry has been fighting was passed, it was considered the first step for which, according to Brother Linen, at the meeting of the Grand Orient, Masonry had made laborious efforts to unite in a single group around a unique program, all the forces of Belgian liberalism. The great majority of the nation called it the Law of Disgrace. In order to succeed in the policy of confiscation of the property of the Church, the Lodges agreed to investigate them according to a formula introduced in 1902. In 1905, Le Courier de Bruxelles, which published the results of the investigation, gave details of the matter in which it had been carried out and how the Masonic Lodges which had been entrusted with the investigation, had also been put on guard against certain personal friendships. 
if until now Masons have not inflicted greater damage to the Church in Belgium, is because of the heroic effort with which that the Belgian Catholics have defended their religion. In Germany and Austria, the anti-Catholic action of Masonry cannot be a mystery for the reader already knows of something of the activities of Weishaupt, or of the confessions of the Count of Hogwitz, of the relations of the German Masons with the young Europe of Mazzini, etc. Eckert, in his frequently quoted work, shows that with the entrance of the Israelites into the German Lodge, Masonry received a considerable reinforcement in the middle of the last century, and that then there began an open attack against positive doctrine of religion in hell, which shortly thereafter was extended to other cities. The directors of teaching and of religion soon found themselves divided into two camps, liberal and orthodox. The latter were oppressed by the scorn and the disdain of the upper classes until the epithet of the orthodox became equivalent to the poor in spirit or to the Jesuit or to the fanatic. The Protestant pastors easily became apostate, and in a short while, religious, scientific, and literary instruction was exclusively in the hands of the revolution. Somewhat later, there was established the plan to annihilate the Catholic Church and taking advantage of the governments themselves to afterward turn some against others, to destroy them, and thus to arrive at their universal republic. Overconfidence caused them to revise their schemes before they could carry them out with the help of Gustavo Adolfo Association, and it was replaced by another with the name of German Catholicism. It continued the work by means of clubs for reading, singing, gymnastics, industry, and rhetoric. Nursery schools were founded to undertake the work from the time of babyhood. With the revolution of 1848, many kings and princes opened their eyes. Nevertheless, Prussia was considered by masonry to be the representative and protector of modern revolution against ultramontanism, fanaticism, and papal usurpations, and it worked to bring it to the hegemony of Germany. Later, the masons instigated the culture comp, an odious and useless persecution of the church from which it obtained benefits, as it always does from persecutions. Furthermore, the Grand Master Bunchili, one of the principal agitators, succeeded in establishing in Switzerland the culture comp. Upon his instigation, the assembly of the Federation of the Grand German Grand Lodges, quote, to increment the activity of the lodges and the significance of the culture comp, end quote, declared on May 24, 1874, quote, it is a professional duty to see how the brothers are becoming perfectly conscious of the relationship of Freemasonry to the sphere of the ethical life and the purposes of culture. Freemasons are obligated to put into practice in ordinary life the principles of, free, of Freemasonry and to defend the ethical basis of human society whenever they may be attacked. The Federation of the German Grand Lodges will provide a yearly plan of matters of current interest for discussion and for uniformity of action in all lodges. End quote. German Masonry takes upon itself the duty of exercising with tireless effort a decisive influence on the entire national life, guarding Masonic principles and maintaining a silent and permanent culture conf. In Austria, Masonry has undergone a variety of treatments, at times experiencing favor alternating with condemnation. In the time of Joseph II, who devoted himself to philosophy and humanitarianism, and who attempted to legislate upon ecclesiastical matters, Masonry was mistress of public opinion and was tolerated, thanks to the flattery with which they encouraged the vain emperor to pursue his arbitrary actions. But later, the same emperor placed restrictions on its development, thus bringing about the withdrawal from the order of a great many brothers. But this did not impair the order's secret preparations of plans for dechristianization and even the deconstruction of the imperial power, as was shown with the captures of Simonville sent from Jacobins of Paris to Constantinople. Primarily, it was concealed in an organization called the Bulldogs, in whose meetings were engaged in a ceremony befitting dogs, which apart from being intensely stupid, is confirmed or confessed by Masonic authorities. Decency keeps me from setting it down to paper. Since the emperors of Austria were representatives of a Catholic power, the lodges, in a special way, constantly concentrated their attacks against them until, with the crime of Sarajevo, of which I shall speak later, a monarchy was deprived of a virtuous Catholic prince. As for the rest, it is difficult to give an idea of the religious struggle, which according to the voice of the order, Los Vamran, has been supported by Judaic masonry, which was master for a time of the destiny of Vienna. Later it was deposed, thanks to the, the indomitable energy of Dr. Luger, who succeeded in organizing the Catholic forces to defend themselves from that tyranny. Number 53. In Russia. In the cause of the world unrest, I read a letter attributed by Le Diable au the 19th, Cecile to Albert Pike, in which the author exposes to Mazzini the plan of attack upon Catholicism in Italy to make it seek its last refuge in Russia. At the end of the letter, he says, quote, Therefore, when the autocratic empire of Russia will have become the citadel of papal Christianity, papist adonism, we shall unchain the nihilist and atheist re revolutionaries, and we shall provoke a formidable cataclysm which will show clearly to the nations, in all its horror, the effect of the absolute heresy, mother of savagery, and of the most bloody disorder. Then citizens everywhere, obliged to defend themselves against an enraged minority of revolutionaries, will exterminate those destroyers of civilization. And the multitude, disillusioned with Christianity, whose dia spirit will be from that moment on without direction and anxious for an ideal, without knowing where to put their worship, will receive the true light, by means of the universal manifestation of pure Luciferian doctrine. 
finally made public, a manifestation which will raise a general movement of reaction, which will follow the destruction of atheism and of Christianity, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. If this letter is not authentic, it is, in part at least, a prophecy which has prevailed since 1896, twenty years before the revolution of the anarchists and atheists were in loose on Russia, not in the way proposed by the Grand Sovereign Mason, because the papacy is not so easily moved as kings or revolutionaries have imagined, except if by realizing the formidable social cataclysm which had been announced. Did the Masons have a part in the upheaval of Russia? Quote, in that country, says Monsignor Junin, 457 Bolsheviks caused a reign of terror. Of that number, 422 were Jews. Brother Lenin, Ulyanov Zederham, belonged to a secret lodge in Switzerland before the war, which was working for the World Revolution. The Jews themselves glory in having introduced Bolshevism in Russia. Thus the Jew M. Cohen writes in the daily Der Communist, published in Sharkov, Russia, on April 12, 1919, quote, one may say that the great Russian social revolution has been the work of the Jews, who have not only managed the affair, but have taken in hand the cause of the Soviets. And now we know through much data that at present time, at least, it is the Jews who have the supreme direction of their lodges, which they use an, as instrument to realize their plans, as we shall eventually see. Therefore, everyone also knows that the horrible catastrophe which was unleashed against Russia not only has upset the social order, but has vented its fury against Christian beliefs, despoiling both Russian Orthodox and Catholic Church, and robbing them of their property. They have rendered it impossible to teach religion and make it extremely difficult and dangerous, the exercise of ecclesiastical ministry. This is how the principles of equality and liberty have been put into practice, after being preached so loudly in the lodges and among the Bolsheviks and communists. Still fresh is the memory of the assassination of Monsignor Bukowitz, which raised such a protest among civilized nations and the imprisonment of so many priests and of Monsignor Seplak, whose sufferings have been related by newspapers throughout the world. The hatred for Catholicism has reached such a point that the Pontifical Commission of Relief encountered such difficulties in the fulfillment of its mission of help to the needy that finally it had to abandon that country. Number 54, in England. Although English masonry has apparently been more conservative in the matters of religion and respect to the Bible, the demand for their belief in God and tolerance towards persecuted ecclesiastics during the revolution in France, nevertheless, their anti-Christian spirit is shown in many ways. In the first place, it is revealed in the change brought about by Anderson in 1723 and confirmed in later statutes spoken of in number nine. In the second place, the disappearance of positive Christianity and the spirit of faith among ministers or pastors affiliated with the sect among men of letters and in the people themselves, it has been less in England than in Germany, where masonry has been dominated by an anti-Christian effervescence more feverish and evident. Thirdly, the hostility toward the papacy, center of Catholicism, reached in England extremes which are scarcely believable, when, with Lord Palmerston, there were in the same hands the supreme direction of masonry and of English politics, which more than at present dominated world politics. Finally, the relationship of English masonry with the French Revolution is undeniable. Quote, English gold helped to finance the French Revolution. End quote. That is certain, but it is also certain, as Mrs. Webster shows, that it was not Pitt's gold. The government of George III did not put a hand in that wicked conspiracy. The help came from certain, quote, revolutionary clubs of England. Puget de Saint-André, in his recent work, Le Autour Caché de la Révolution Française, shows at each step not only the help of gold, but the very great tariff traffic of English masons with those of other countries, especially Germans, to bring to ahead the revolution and to assure its results. In 1770, Twelve principal German lodges met and founded in Berlin the Grand German Lodge, and in 1775 they received their patent from London, which means that they recognized the Grand English Lodge as the Mother Lodge. I've already mentioned the ardent anti-Christian spirit which animated German masonry. Eckert, among others, manifested very frequently. Number 55 in the United States. Trying to defend the charge of irreligion of American masonry, Brother John C. Struther of Louisville, confesses that masonry, quote, as it exists in France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and the South American republics, is an anti-religious political association which in the last years has developed into a kind of anti-theistic sect, which makes no secret of its hatred for revealed religion. He adds that the antagonism between the order and the church has grown so strong that in 1891, the Grand Orient of France passed on <coughs> to its subordinate lodge obligatory resolutions to the effect that, quote, it is the duty of every mason to use all his influence to bring about the suppression of all ecclesiastical, religious, or charitable associations, and to see that their property be confiscated by the state. And it is the duty of every mason to bring about the exclusion of every student who had received religious education in colleges or schools from every dependable official post in the government or in every branch of service, military, naval, or civil. This last has also been supported by the Masonic press in the United States, at least as it deals with teaching. Perhaps Brother Struther is very ill-informed about what happens in his own sect, which he tries to defend from the charge of hatred for religion. In the United States, 
where it is your ordinary belief that even the Masons are still respectful toward religion. There are published more than 40 periodicals which write in unison with the new age of Washington, in which the church is reviled in each issue and its destruction is sought, with as much insistence as in France and Portugal. The Pope is called, quote, the enemy and the curse of humanity. End quote. It is proclaimed that the plan of Masonry is to, quote, to free the world from the tyranny of Rome over conscience and free thought against the sinister power, end quote. It says, Masonry is aligned, the only power in the world which is the eternal enemy of this modernized paganism. This is the language which is used in the nation which had believed itself most tolerant of all religions. Here, one can trace the universal language of Masonry, especially now when there is no need of dissimulation. The dark and criminal sect Ku Klux Klan, which professes fanatical hatred for Catholicism, has found its best elements among Masons. The constitutional law adopted in the state of Oregon in 1922 obeys the general plan of Masonry in establishing compulsory public schooling and does away with all private teaching, especially Catholic. Fortunately, this law is declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States. Number 56, in Mexico and Central America. I am certain that Masonic action has been most terrible against the church in Mexico, as it has in many centuries of Central America. Unfortunately, the isolation in which we, in Chile, live has kept me from securing more complete information, but a few examples are enough to reveal it. In Mexico, according to the Espaza, there was in 1910 a Grand Lodge with 43 adhering lodges, of which 26 were of North Americans and the other 17 of Mexicans. In that year, there were formed two Grand Lodges, the York Valley of Mexico with 16 English language lodges and one Mexican, and the Valley de Mexico with 16 lodges, 10 of them in the capital. Outside of the capital, there were that year six Grand Lodges of Veracruz, of Nuevo León, in Monterrey, Oaxaca, Cosmos, of Chihuahua, of Cocajilo, in Torreón, and the Grand Texas Mexico Lodge. Horrible have been the tyrannies exercised against the Church and against Catholics in the past century, especially in the Constitution of 1857 and 1859, when laws fanatically hostile to the Church were promulgated. Under these laws have lived Mexican Catholics, who are the immense majority of the nation. At present, at the end of many revolutions and persecutions, they have been granted a little more liberty. There, in Mexico, the priests cannot wear their habit, they cannot make public manifestations of religion, and there was a time when they could not even expound the Catholic principles publicly without making themselves liable to imprisonment. Don Victoriano Agueros was jailed 21 times during an equal number of years for having published in El Tempo, of which he was the director and owner, opinions upon Juarez, the day of his birth, contrary to liberal and Masonic sentiments, masters of public opinion. Passing over those tyrannies of the past century, unworthy of civilized people, Masonry has given throughout the 20th century examples of what it is capable of doing to fulfill its proclaimed program of respecting all religions. It has confiscated and profaned churches, prohibiting even the simplest acts of worship. It has destroyed statues. It has persecuted the clergy to satisfy its insatiable thirst for gold and for blood. It has committed upon persons dedicated to God and to the service of suffering humanity brutalities and excesses of such nature that my hand cannot describe them. I shall content myself citing in respect to this part of what Monsignor F.C. Kelly says in his work entitled The Book of Red and Yellow, whose documentation he offers to whomsoever might wish to see it. Quote, Before the revolution entered the cities, the lodges fiercely attacked the Catholic religion by means of calumnies launched from the press and from the tribune. Its members served as spies and as informers, and even to close the hiding places of the priests and of the sacred vessels. This is not a supposition. It is an admitted fact in all Mexico. El Liberal, official organ of Carranza, can be cited as an authority on this point. Quote, it is indispensable, says El Liberal, that to fulfill our determination, a firm call to be made to those followers of the truth, so that they fall into line to fight for victory or for death, for liberty and fraternity, in temples consecrated by triumphs and inexplicable abnegations, the lodges. Mexicans, lovers of liberty, equality, and fraternity, let us hasten to unite in an army in defense of these ideals. Let us work in our lodges for its realization. That idea of liberty, equality, and fraternity is what caused the expulsion from Mexico of the apostolic delegate for the crime of having attended the laying of the cornerstone of a religious monument, and that according to what is said at the instigation of Belen de Saraga. Speaking of one of the states of Mexico, a friend writes me, quote, Here are committed more crimes in a week than before in a year's time. Divorces are granted in a single hearing and by the will of one of the parties, and the public schools are co-educational. This happens in the state of Yucatan, where, after having sacked Catholic churches and assigned for profane uses, they were subsequently returned to the church, but the central temple of Jesus Maria was given by Governor Alvarado, contrary to all laws to the brothers. They still keep it, having torn down its towers and arranged its facade with vulgar imitation of the Mayan style and adorned it with Masonic symbols. In Guatemala, with all the odious restrictions imposed upon the clergy against the exercise of worship, and with the arbitrary persecutions of even the archbishop, the situation of the church has been very similar to that of Mexico. Therefore, it is not a rash judgment to suppose that there the same hand has been executing the same plan. 
I draw from information published in the press by reason or of the report represented to the Vatican by Monsignor Rota, by order of the Holy See, has visited the republics of Central America. According to his reports, it is believed in the Vatican that there is no country in the world in which the church is in worse condition. The condition is attributed to masonry. Quote, the campaign, in reality, took place in 1871, when the majority of the religious and missionary orders were expelled from that country, as were also expelled the Archbishop of Guatemala, his auxiliary bishop, and numerous ecclesiastics. The charge made against him were having carried on a political activity, a charge which the Vatican has firmly denied. Quote, Today the Masons, as one order, have legal solicitor solicitorship in Guatemala, and their statutes have been recognized by the government, while the Church not only does not have legal status, but Catholics are denied the right of assembly. Quote, Various degrees which prohibited the entrance into Guatemalan territory by foreign Catholic priests were declared unconstitutional, but nevertheless they still continue in force. Quote, Since last November, the situation has been aggravated, owing to a decree of the government which prohibits collections of money for the maintenance of the Church. Number 57 in South America. To avoid being tedious, I shall point out only two or three proofs of the anti-Catholic and anti-Christian action which masonry carries on in countries of this part of the continent. I shall begin with Brazil, which is the most heavily populated country, and where the sect has had the greatest power. In Espaza and Eckert, etc., may be seen something of its history in Brazil. For my purpose, it will be sufficient to cite a testimony taken from the circular which the bishops of the mining province published on December 21st, 1909. It states, In the dark caverns of masonry, scattered far and wide throughout the world, there are being prepared plans for persecution, which are converted into laws by the representatives of the people. It is a proved fact, with irrefutable arguments, that there exists in the legislature chamber of the great nations of Europe a domination by masonry, and the same fact is no less palpable on the continent which we inhabit, with our own dear country in the Republic of Brazil as an outstanding member. With complete disregard for the belief of an almost entirely Catholic people, there are being proclaimed laws oppressive to their freedom of conscience, as if the representatives were taking pride in contradicting the desires of the people. Quote, here are some of the plans which masonry intends to convert into laws in our beloved Brazil, following the examples of France and their hatred for the supernatural, by announcing openly their ominous programs. The de Christianization of the nation by lay teaching, transformed into atheism, the expulsion, if not the extinction, of the religious communities, those phalanges of the apostles of a civilization, absolute divorce from the marriage bond, a cancer which corrodes public and domestic morality. Quote, and now they are progressing from plans to actual deeds of aggression. Take, for example, what is happening to the most zealous bishop of Piohui, to whom, for that very reason, we send our offers of close support, end quote, signed by the Archbishop of Mariana and five auxiliary bishops. In previous years, the intervention of masonry in the congregation had occasioned the persecution and imprisonment of the saintly bishop of Olinda. In a pastoral letter from Monsignor Juan V. Castro, Archbishop of Caracas, is the following, quote, Masonry of Venezuela, through its representatives, has signed a treaty of alliance and union with the masonry of Buenos Aires, which seems to be the most outrageous to date. It has adopted the resolutions dictated at the Congress of Buenos Aires in 1906, which has transmitted, transmitted to all the lodges of America, and has made them obligatory, even with penal sanction, for the Masons of Venezuela. Here are, without commentary, the articles which refer to religion and to the Church. Quote, Fifth, Latin American Masonry, by all means within its grasp, will combat clerical propaganda, read Catholic, and the establishment and growth of religious congregations by combining forces for its expulsion from these countries. To this effect, A. Masons will not have their children educated in schools directed by religious corporations. B. Masons will influence their wives to prevent them from going to confession and will forbid their children to go. C. Masons will not contribute in any way to the upkeep of congregation and their sanctuaries. 6. Masonry will strive to affiliate members from the political parties to defend their ideals and to bind themselves to vote for the separation of church and state, the expulsion of religious congregations, civil registration, purely lay instruction, hospitals served by lay nurses only, suppression of the military chaplains and of other clerical laws. Read Christian. Seventh, every Mason is obliged to proceed in the outside world in accord with the principles of Masonry. Those who violate this compromise of our honor are to be punished with all the strength of Masonic law. Tenth, Masonry will work for all governments to do away with all legations to the Vatican, not recognizing the papacy as an international power. Eleventh, Masonry will work to impede the exploitation of the Indian by religious congregations and will aid the institutions of lay missions to civilize him. Quote, what is here called the Grand Orient of Venezuela has approved, adopted, and transmitted to all Masonry of the Republic this agreement so that all members of each body, being fully cognizant of its contents, will fulfill it completely. Actually, the above agreements of the Masonic Congress of Buenos Aires does not necessi necessitate commentary. The commentary is furnished by the deeds themselves, which each may observe in his own country, the efforts that are made to fulfill that program of dechristianization, the tentative plans already realized, the propaganda by the press and all media within the grasp of the sect. All these are everywhere for everyone to see. In Uruguay, Ecuador, the plan is already making great progress. 
Number 58, Chilean Masonry is anti-Catholic and anti-Christian. Can it be said that Chilean Masonry has a different spirit from that of other countries? It is quite evident that what happens in the various spheres of social action, Masonry is, among us, in opposition to the Catholic religion to such an extent that when one wished to indicate that a person is hostile to religion, the shortest and most certain way to say it is to state he is a Mason. As for in Quique, it will be sufficient to recall the assault of the procession which we Catholics were celebrating on the anniversary of Constantine in 1913. The directors of the attack were recognized Masons. That attack was the epilogue to the meetings of the Mason Belan de Saraga, who had been brought to Inquique purposely at that time to disturb the Catholic festival. When they tried to answer my refutation of the first meeting, they violently abused the Bible, that Bible which was on the table of the president of the lodge, and upon which the initiate swore, and a bulletin full of blasphemies was published, after having been approved at a meeting of one of the lodges. And if this is not hostility against Catholicism, what is it? Scarcely anyone initiated who is a practicing Catholic, at least attending Mass, but he immediately ceases to become Catholic and leaves the church. I have a, on occasion to know several men who have told me of their entrance into the lodge and who afterwards express a regret at having done so. Quote, there is no argument against facts, in an old philosophical adage. Let us examine some of the things Masonry states in its statutes and repeats to outsiders, of which it tells its members who are capable of comprehending it, concerning religious neutrality and in respect to all religions. To begin with the press, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, the Divine Master said. In Masonic publications, it is not respect for religion, especially a Catholic, that abounds but rather a continual attack against it in all its writings. For example, La Verdad is a review which is circulated among the brothers, and which they try to have read by all those whom they believe ready to accept their attacks on religion. In it, they resort to methods of attack against the church to combat its doctrine. Facts are manipulated to suit this end. If there is some passage in the Bible which offers difficulty, they will surely take the most difficult side as if it were Catholic teaching, and will forget or disregard the most obvious explanation, conforming most to the text and to the general meaning of the scripture, etc., in order to create an irreconcilable antagonism between faith and reason or history. In Santiago, there is published also under the auspices of Masonry an almanac, El Almanac Popular, and a popular review, La Tribuna, which follow the same line. In Inquique, we have seen leaflets written and distributed with great zeal by brothers recognized as such, and which there have been divulged the vilest and grossest calumnies and injuries against the clergy or against the doctrines of religion. We have seen bulletins written with the same end in view in addition to atrocities at times, which have been published daily, inspired by brother masons without a sincere retraction ever being published. In Chile, thanks to God, we have not had those excesses of masonic liberty, equality, and fraternity, which have caused our brothers and other lands to suffer so terribly. But the field is cleared and it has been prepared in the same way as was done in other nations. Masonry is well directed and does not rush easily into a failure. That preparation will bear fruit at the opportune moment here as it did in other parts unless skillful strong and constant action is able to support their plans it is a tactic of masonry to treat as visionaries or columnators those who sound an alarm or call attention to their deeds there are however numerous well-intentioned and misinformed catholics who believe that masonry is an anachronism so out of style that to speak of it is out of place in these times nevertheless masonic action grows day by day and is more intense and universal it is reaching from the lowest positions to the highest ones Thus complying with the advice of Weishaupt, quote, Around the powers of the earth, it is necessary to gather a legion of untiring men who will carry on their work everywhere according to the plan of the order. In what branch of the administration are there not such untiring men directing public affairs to the will of the order? The country knows it. It can point to many. The Masons themselves, in order to make a claim for the order, proclaim it loudly when it suits their purpose. There are branches of the administration in which, which the outsider does not enter except with the recommendations or favor of the initiates or of those who obey its suggestions. Masonry has worked here, as in other places, to influence public opinion against the Catholic religion by means of the magic words liberty, liberalism, equality, fraternity, science, progress, or with declamations against fanaticism, intolerance, reaction, clericalism, and other similar words. Masonry knows by experience the value and force these words have in producing influence, although they may cry for liberty and liberalism when they are trying to exercise some oppression of the conscience, and they may decry fanaticism at exactly the same time they are showing signs of the fiercest fanaticism themselves. It is difficult to say how far Masonry has succeeded in influencing public opinion and in making humble servants of serious and honorable men, with the enchantment or with the magic terror of those words repeated in various tones. How many times, by taking very discreet and cunning forms, Masonry has made its influence felt not only in the circles of pious ladies and of respectable prince, priests, but perhaps in the episcopal tribunals themselves, as has been felt near the pontifical throne itself by means of clever diplomats affiliated with Masonry. They have stripped the schools of the crucifix and of images as if we were not in a Catholic country. In textbooks, they have, as far as possible, excluded the holy name of God and of Jesus Christ. In children's magazines sponsored by members of the Mastership, great pains are taken not to name the Creator or anything pertaining to religion. 
they are our recommendations, not to say orders, to organize not only in the high schools but also in public schools, associations of Boy Scouts or clubs, which have had the stated purpose of cultivating the body with physical exercises, but with the concealed purpose of alienating the children from the church. These instructions will not leave them time to attend Mass on Sunday, nor to be instructed in catechism, nor even to feel the influence of Catholic parents whose teaching authority is replaced imperceptibly by teachers of a lay morality without religion. Among these works are found in the Fiesta del Arbor, Arbor Day, La Fiesta Infantil de Pasus, Children's Easter Holiday, Los Recreas Dominicales Infantiles, Children's Sunday Sports and Games, as are mentioned in La Memoria of 1918, read in the Grand Orient of Santiago by the Serene Grand Master, Luis A. Navarrete Lopez. In certain provinces, it is very common to give the name of fanaticism or of superstition to the Catholic religion, which is the nationalist religion. Such is the language of the lodges. Obscuritanism is also a word with which they use as a weapon to make the church despised. By force of repetition, the Masons themselves have become convinced, and, at least confusedly, they have convinced others who are not Masons and who are ignorant of its teachings that the church is in a cavern in which reigns darkness. In Inquique, it was almost a daily occurrence a few years ago to revile the church with an invocation of obscuritanism, and the strange thing was that those who spoke thus at the times were not even able to write a letter correctly. They were simple peasants who had become phonographs that reproduced, without realizing the meaning of what they were saying, monotonous charges against the church. It has been necessary to make them turn a little to the reality of things, to make them understand they were far from the sources of light which they had managed themselves to be, and neither was the clergy in pure ignorance and mentally asleep as they thought them to be. The directors know this very well, and for this reason, they are determined to silence the clergy. Masonry gloried in this action in its official documents, as one can see in the short work La Masonería Ante el Congreso, Masonry Before the Congress, which ought to be read by all Chileans. From it, I have taken the following declarations. Quote, it is necessary to leave the limits of this group. Whatever, wherever in the public there are cathedrals and parishes, we must build in opposition. We must ever conquer new places. During the first phase of 1913, it continues, all Chilean Masons and a great number of lodges lent very effective cooperation to the anti-clerical campaign which Belen de Saraga valiantly undertook in our country. If indeed the lords of triumph belong entirely to the intrepid liberal propagandists, then an important part of the happy results is due to the Masons who backed it with their work, their enthusiasm, and their money. These are the declarations of the Grand Master Luis Navarrete de Lopez in his annual meet message read at the assembling of Grand Lodge of Chile celebrated in May 1914. Speaking of the campaign against Monsignor Sibelia, representatives of the Holy See, Mr. Navarrete adds, quote, It was a Freemason who organized the first action hostile to Monsignor Sibelia, in which the latter lost his sanctuary. At once the Masons brought advice, money, sympathy, and influence to the Federation of Students in support of their loud public campaign. The lodges established outside of Santiago became the organizing centers of the popular demonstrations which echoed in the provinces this metropolitan agitation. I still remember that Catholics who hated misery took part in the campaign. Yet, nevertheless, they fell into the web and served its cause, hypnotized by the magic word of liberal in which they gloried. Afterwards, they recognized the deception. Number 59. Obedience to Foreign Influence In comparing the work of the Chilean masonry with the following program of the work of the Grand Orient of France, you will find at the conclusion that a foreign occult power which, by means of the Chilean lodges, is directing a large part of our national life. The framework of this program is as follows. Freemasonry, which prepared the Revolution of 1789, has the duty of continuing its work. The principal means of achieving the ideals of Masonry are as follows. Number one, to destroy radically by frank persecution of the church or by the fraudulent and hypocritical system of the separation of church and state, all the in social influence of religion, insidiously called clericalism, and as far as possible to destroy the church in all true or revealed religion, which is something more than a vague cult of the mother country and of humanity. Number two, to secularize by a similar fraudulent and hypocritical system of non-sectarianism, all public and public life, and above all instructions and education. Non-sectarianism, as the Grand Orient understands it, is anti-Catholic, anti-Christian, atheistic, positivist, and agnostic, working under the guise of non-sectarianism. Liberty of thought and of conscience of children must be developed in them, systematically in school, and it must be protected as much as possible against disturbing influence, not only of the church and of the priests, but also of the parents of the children, if necessary, by physical and moral compulsion. The party of the Grand Orient considers this indispensable and infallibly sure way for the definitive definite establishment of the universal social republic. Number 60. Masonic Tolerance and Anti-Fanaticism Masonry professes to observe the most absolute tolerance of all opinions and to combat fanaticism tenaciously. Let us see if they are sincere and voracious in this as they are in other information. From Copenhagen's La Conspiration Juve, page 33, 130, we find, quote, Masonry, or rather the occult power which directs it, 
in order to make it accepted, invoked at its beginning the spirit of tolerance. Thus it succeeded in making Catholics accepted. Following this, it fought the Church in the same name of the same tolerance which had permitted it to exist. And so we are allowed to assist at a truly strange spectacle. According to Masonry, there are, in effect, two churches, one worthy of hatred because of its intolerance, Catholicism, and one admirable because of its tolerance, Masonry. The so-called Church of Intolerance has existed for a long while before the so-called Church of Tolerance. In fact, the Church they call intolerant has allowed the other to formulate, and now that it is established and fully triumphant, it is the very one which does not allow the functioning to the other. It is, then, intolerance which tolerates, and tolerance which does not tolerate. And what is even more ludicrous is the fact that it is those who call themselves tolerant and who do not tolerate, in the name of their tolerance, takes absolutely no account of their own intolerance. It is a little too ridiculous to be true, but nevertheless it is a spectacle of which the entire world can behold. So profound is the obedience which results from the suggestion launched into masonry by the occult power. How can their consciences be thus falsified? It would be impossible for me to comprehend and to explain this if my conscience had not been dragged down to this level, as were many others in the avalanche of madness, and if I had not been both actor and victor, victim at the same time. The same author, to show to what extremes are carried the intolerance and fanaticism which have taken hold of the Masons by the power of suggestion made to them, says further, quote, I had heard from those fanatics of tolerance, when they were beginning to be furiously intolerant in the name of their inordinate love of tolerance. I had been present at some irresistible comic scenes. One of them was held because of the codfish, which certain Masons confessed to having eaten on Good Friday of 1884. The act of observing Catholic regulation was, at that time, considered a Masonic mortal sin by these apostles of tolerance. One of the advanced ones on Good Friday of 1884 asked for a note of censure in his lodge against the Masons who, by eating codfish on Good Friday, were contributing to the, retain the prejudices of another age. I asked Masons, I asked their wives, mothers or sisters, if that intolerance, for the same reason, is a rare or unknown thing among us. I have already told that I myself had occasion to see and hear in this attack, which was made on the procession with which we are celebrating the century of Constantine, an attack which was planned as a result of the preachings of the Mason Belen de Saraga, and at whose head there were known Masons. That is an example of tolerance, with which they were combating the intolerance of our own religion, as they term it. On the other hand, when they, or those influenced by them, were forming lines, casting insults or throwing stones, we Catholics have not even countered insult with insult, nor have we experienced that nervous and frantic attack which the Mason feels upon seeing a statue or upon meeting a priest at the house of a sick person. My compatriots of almost all the cities of Chile, almost with absolute certainty, can testify to the same deeds and give accounts of the same experience. The modern history of all the nations dominated by Masonry is full of the same kind of proof. Once more, Masonry makes profession of a thing which it has no intention of practicing, except to deceive the innocent, who unfortunately are numerous. It professes to be tolerant and is satanically intolerant. 61 through 62. Anti-Catholic Fury. Who is credulous enough to believe that, after so many serious and constant affirmations and protests by Masonry, and by Masons concerning respect for all religions, and that Masonry does not concern itself with religion, that the preoccupation for religion and the hatred for the Catholic religion would be converted into fury? Nevertheless, this is what we have seen, not only in the Epoch of Terror and of the Commune in France, in Madrid in 1834 and in Italy, etc., but exists in certain Masonic degrees in which they blaspheme Christ, they blaspheme God, seeing of him that he is the fallen angel or prince. They profane the consecrated hosts, piercing them with a dagger. I myself have seen a certificate which gave power to found lodges, a certificate which doubtless came from some grand lodge. One of those emblems was a spilled chalice with which the host was pierced by a dagger, another the world with the cross upside down, still another the heart of Jesus with motto cor ex secrandum, exorable heart on it. In the reception of the elect of their reformed palladium rite, those who are to be initiated are taught to punish the traitor Jesus and to kill Adonai, the god of the Bible, through the power of their own evil, done first by master, then by initiate, piercing the host with a dagger in the midst of horrible blasphemies after they have been assured that is a consecrated host. In 1894, Dom Benoit says in a church in Paris the disappearance of 800 hosts, sacrilegiously stolen by the sectarians for their abominable mysteries, was verified. There is then a constitutional intentional lie, as much in the statues of masonry as on the lips of those who, in order to acquire members, began by saying that, quote, in masonry all religions are suspected, and it does not deal with religion. The first victims of that deceit are always the very ones affiliated with masonry. Chapter 2. The Masonic Religion. Number 63. Masonry has its own religion. I have stated before that masonry has the characteristics of a religious cult. Speaking of American masonry in the United States, Proust makes the following resume. Quote, it is evidently a separate religion which has its own and peculiar altar and even its own supreme pontificate, its own and peculiar consecrations and anointings, its own and peculiar religious creed, its own and peculiar morality, its own and peculiar theory of nature and of the human soul and its relationship to the deity its own and distinct and peculiar God, end quote. 
quote, with all this evidence found in Masonry, it is clearly demonstrated that Masonry is a very peculiar religion indeed, end quote. The author proves this systematically citing the greatest authorities of Masonry, Pike and Mackin, and concludes, quote, our enumeration has not exhausted the religious features of Masonry. We could have dealt with its invocations, its blessings, its croziers, used in the high degrees, etc. But we do not wish to devote any more time to the proof of the fact which is so evident. Call it all a religious masquerade if you wish. Reduce it all to an unholy mockery. To us the sincerity or lack of it in their protest is unimportant, end quote. Masonry, we have observed, is the same institution everywhere. One only needs to read the rites of initiation to comprehend that what Proust says of Masonry in the United States is found everywhere. Yet Masonry claims it is not concerned with religion, ever the customary sincerity. Number 64. Object of the Masonic Cult. The Great Architect. Nature. It is not easy to say in a few words what is known about Masonic worship in the lodges. Little by little, Masonry is introducing its new members into the sanctuary of their mysteries, adapting to their disposition and preparation the extent to which the veil is drawn back. The worship is practiced in separate phases or periods. The first phase, that in which one adores the great architect of the universe, who, as I have stated before, has already been denied by the Grand Orient of France. The new member imagines that he is dealing with God, the Supreme Being, whom he perhaps learned to love and adore at his mother's knee in church or in a well-directed school. The poor fellow does not guess that he is dealing only with a symbolic name, with which the true Masonic divinity is concealed. When and where the symbol was no longer necessary, it was put aside. Notice that the Masons avoid mentioning our God, in their official acts at least, in order not to name what is to them a false divinity. Second phase, that in which one adores nature, or it may be, when the idea of the grand architect is translated into that of God nature, universal cause of things, as conceived by the materialist, the pantheist, or the theosophist, who only disagree on name, but not on the idea which is formed of the first principal cause of things. The American Masonic authorities, after involved discussion or superm locutions, come to the conclusion that the divinity is the active and passive, or the masculine and feminine principle of generation. As for the worship of nature, Pike says, quote, There is a merely formal atheism, which is the negation of God in terms, but not in reality. A man says, There is no God, that is, there is no God who originates in himself or whoever was originated, but a God who always was and has been, who is the cause of existence, who is the mind and the providence of the universe, and therefore the order, beauty, and harmony of the world of matter and the mind do not indicate any plan or intention of divinity. But, he says, nature, signifying the sum of total existence, that is powerful, wise, active, and good. Nature originated within itself, or perhaps it always was and has been, the cause of its own existence, the mind of the universe and its own providence. Clearly there is a plan and purpose from which proceed order, beauty, and harmony, but this is the plan and purpose of nature. End quote. Quote, in such matters, Proust continues, the absolute negation of God is only formal and not real. The qualities of God are recognized and they affirm his existence. It is a mere change of name to call the possessor of these qualities nature and not God. So that it may not be a question of name only, the explanation proves what Pike himself keeps saying when he reduced the Holy Trinity to, quote, the soul, or, quote, the thought of the soul and the word which expresses that thought. I shall add nothing to what has already been said about worship of a flesh, a worship which Masonry has inherited from ancient pagans. Proust and Benoit bring out long discussions of it in their frequently quoted works. In Benoit, one may see that even in the ceremony of the Masonic burial, there enters this worship, veiled naturally in symbolism. What I have found out about this from witnesses has horrified me. Number 65, The Sun and the Flesh. Naturally, when one speaks of life, of fruitfulness, etc., then the sun is presented as the most active and grandiose agent of fecund duty, and of the procreation of beings, especially those gifted with life, which occupy the highest degree in them universality of things. It is very logical that in the worship of nature, the sun is taken as its representative and most characteristic symbol of the god nature, which Masons adore on a level with savages. The worship of the sun is referred to in many symbols or ceremonies which are customary in the lodges. According to Mackey, the circumambulation, or procession, which is made around the altar in the lodges, and which they begin in the east, travel toward the south, and return to the west, is an imitation of the course of the sun and a manifest proof that the pagan rites of the sun worshippers come from the common fount to which masonry owes its existence. Quote, Only masonry, he says, has kept the primitive significance, which was a symbolic allusion to the sun as a source of physical light and the most marvelous work of the great architect of the universe. The worship of the sun was introduced into the mysteries, not as a material idolatry, but as means of expressing a restoration from death to life, taken from the reappearance in the east of the solar orb after its nocturnal disappearance in the west. To the sun also, as a regenerator and vivifier, must be attributed the phallic cult worship, which formed a principal part of the mysteries. The three principal officials of the lodge represent the sun in its three principal positions, at sunrise, at noon, and at sunset. Quote, this worship of the sun, says Renan, a high dignitary of French masonry, quote, is the only reasonable and scientific cult. The sun is the particular god of our planet. The titan, or the sun is, according to a profession of faith of the unknown, philosophic judges, the only god, author of good and evil. 
The unknown judge, the supreme judge, is the son that must govern everything, who must rule the world and create the happiness of mankind. From this point is but a step to the worship of the flesh. The son is only a symbol. There is something which comes even closer to the most sublime manifestation of the God nature, of the source of life and of immortality. They are the beginnings by which life is diffused and its disappearance is avoided by means of propagation. The worship of the flesh is presented then as the most natural homage of the adorers of nature and its most sublime manifestations, and with this cult, the one approaches the most degraded and most corrupt pagan cults. Number 66. Satan or Lucifer. In order to remove fear, to transform all ideas which have been acquired in contact with the Christian society, and to erase even the existence which a natural rectitude would oppose, in certain lodges at least, worship is rendered to Lucifer or Satan. According to the Masonic laws, in conformity with which Belen de Saraga exposed here in Quiquique, the sin of our first parents, Satan is the good God or the angel of light who came to teach Eve the secret which was to make human beings like God, seducing her carnally, a knowledge which she afterwards shared with Adam. How then are the worshippers of nature to manifest to Satan their gratitude for the favors he bestowed upon men? They, the Masons, builders of the grand temple of nature, after arranging the biblical narration to their taste, cannot help but feel full of veneration, love, and gratitude toward the angel who taught man to have Masonic liberty by rejecting God and rightfully look upon Satan as their father and creator. Here is a brief synthesis of the worship of Masonry. I have said, and I repeat, that many Masons, even in many Masonic degrees, do not suspect the hidden meaning of the symbols which they use, nor of what is taught in practice in the highest degrees. In the anti-Catholic excesses committed by leading and illustrious Masons, they speak of the goddess reason, of man himself, etc. Everything becomes, quote, God for them, except the true God. Those who have not yet denied the great architect of the universe, for instance, the English and many American Masons, open their sessions, take oaths, etc., in his name, thus rendering him worship. The worship of Lucifer is not so mysterious that it has not reached the ears of those who have concerned themselves with Masonry. In the initiation of the 25th degree, Knight of the Brazen Serpent, one adores the infernal serpent, Adami of Adonai, Christ, friend of man, who with his triumph will make men return to Eden. In the 20th degree, the president says to the initiate, quote, In the sacred name of Lucifer, cast out obscuritanism. We already know what that word means in the Masonic language. A Masonic leaflet states, quote, It was John Ziska who, with John Huss, laid the foundations of Masonry in Bohemia. He represented Satan as the innocent victim of a despotic power. He made of him the companion in chains of all the oppressed. He went further still. He placed Satan above the God of the Bible. In the old greeting, God be with you, he made this substitution. May the one to whom injustice is done keep you. For that reason, proud Hun invoked him, saying, quote, Come, Satan, exiled by priests, but blessed by my heart. The Reformed Palladium Rite has, as fundamental practice and purpose, the adoration of Lucifer, says Dom Benoit, and it is full of all the impieties and all the infamies of black magic. Having been established in the United States, it has invaded Europe, and each year it is making terrifying progress. All its ceremonial is full, as may be well imagined, of blasphemies against God and against our Lord Jesus Christ. Adriano Lemmy, the supreme chief of Italian masonry, did not hide his worship of Satan. Quote, in Italy, says Margiotta, all know that Adriano Lemmy is a Satanist. Quote, in the name of Satan, he used to send his circulars, although adapting himself at times to the opinion of the imperfect initiates, but is enough to leave through the collection of his diary reserved for Freemasons to know his sentiments concerning occultism and the wickedness of one who had delivered himself to the devil. Yes, as a Satanist, he organized the anti-clerical movements and boasted of it from 1883 on, causing to be inserted in his official organ, the Revista della Masoneria Italiana, volume of the Masonic Year from March 1st, 1883 to February 28th, 1884, page 306, this cynical declaration, quote, Vexilla regis redunt inferni. The Pope has said, Indeed, yes. The standards of the King of the Inferno advance, and there is not one conscious man who loves liberty. There is not one who will fail to enlist under those standards, under whose flags of Freemasonry, which symbolize the living forces of humanity, intelligence in opposition to those inert forces of humanity, brutified by superstition. Vexilla regis prudent inferni. Yes, yes. The standards of the King of the Inferno are marching forward because Freemasonry, which by principle, by institution, by instinct, has always combated and always will combat, without truce or quarter, all that can impede the development of liberty, of peace and happiness for humanity, and must combat today more energetically and more openly than ever before all the artifice of the clerical reaction. Let us hear now the praises which another brother showers upon their God. Quote, when we see reigning as sovereign under the arches of our temples, the father of all sectarians past, present, and future, he will tell us with his legendary smile, Beloved and illustrious brothers, do me the favor of recognizing in me the pinnacle of Masonic progress, the perfect and sublime Mason of the end of the 19th century. Number 67, Satanic Societies. I shall end the matter of the worship of Satan with a quotation which seems to me opportune. Quote, Some years ago, says Copenhagen a circumstance permitted me to lay hands on the proof that there are certain Masonic societies which are Satanic. 
not in the sense that the devil comes to preside over the meetings, as that mystifier Leo Taxil pretended, but in the fact that initiates profess to be worshippers of Lucifer. They adore the latter as if he were the true god, and they are so animated with an implacable hatred toward the god of the Christians, whom they declare to be an impostor. They have a formula which sums up their state of mind. No longer is it, quote, to the glory of the great architect of the universe, but glory and love to Lucifer, hatred, 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 to God be damnation, damnation, damnation. It is confessed in these societies that everything the Christian God ordains is disagreeable to Lucifer, that on the contrary, everything he forbids is agreeable to Lucifer, and consequently it is necessary to do everything the Christian God forbids and to guard against everything he ordains as if it were fire. I repeat that I have held the proof of this in my hands. I have read and studied hundreds of documents belonging to one of these societies, documents which I am not permitted to publish and which came from members, men and women, of the group in question. I have been able to prove that his pleases Lucifer, also that murder is practiced there, always because it displeases the Christian God and pleases Lucifer. Margiota relates that Albert Pike had decreed that the God of Masonry ought to be given only the ineffable name of Lucifer, while Lemmy, a rabid Satanist, wanted the God of the most secret lodges to be invoked and evoked only under the most holy name of Satan, and that in order to annoy Pike, Lemmy asked his friend, Brother Carducci, to compose the hymn to Satan, the Godillo Mirror. Lemmy insisted on having the hymn sung at Palladium banquets. Let us not forget that if Satanism is the refuge or the masquerade of anti-Christian impiety in one part of Masonry, the other part is the most sincere, the most logical and consistent, with their first denials and hatreds, namely, that which declares war on God without replacing him with more than man. It is not strange, then, that in some lodges an open profession of this is made. Thus, at the International Congress of Brussels in 1886, Lafargas exclaimed, quote, War on God, hatred to God. In this is progress. It is necessary to crush heaven as if it were a piece of paper. And the brother Lanisan, in the Solistical Festival of the Clement Friendship Lodge on March 13, 1880, blasphemed with these words, quote, We must crush the infamous one. But that infamous one is not clericalism, that infamous one is God. After reading these horrors, the reader will call that masonry upholds in its statutes and by the words of those who make its propaganda that it does not concern itself with religion, and that it respects the religious faith of its members who belong to all religions. This deception cannot be qualified. Their fish victims are always their own adepts. Chapter 3 Masonry and Politics, Number 68 Its Political Action in France During the 18th Century. The Masonic Constitution states Masonry does not concern itself with the civil constitutions of the states. It must respect and does respect the political sympathies of its members. Consequently, all discussion leading to political consideration is expressly and formally prohibited. End quote. Practically, the same statements were made regarding the various religions of its members, which has been proven false. Now we will examine their statements toward political activity. Cope and Abincelli states, For 150 years, Freemasonry has affirmed and has proclaimed in its statutes, as we have said, that it was not concerned with politics, and that in the lodges they prohibited all discussion which might be related to the subject. Yet by a strange coincidence, they suddenly appeared in possession of all the state posts during the Revolution, and in our own time this miracle is again taking place. Quote, Volumes would be needed to cite all of the documents which could prove the lodge's meetings are full of political discussions, in spite of the declaration contained in the statutes, he concluded. In reality, Masonry was preparing the fall of monarchy in France, just as it prepared the fall of Napoleon I, and of all the governments that have followed, until it gained complete control of the power of the French Republic, and found itself in a position to carry out its plans against the Church. For seventy years, it had been in France professing the most profound respect for the monarchy and for religion. It had inscribed in its statutes the most formal declarations on these points. Because of these declarations, it had attracted to its temple members of the clergy, nobility, and even of the royal family itself, which it planned to destroy, upholding this part with hypocritical constancy. In Wilhelmsbad, under Louis XVI, a Masonic convention was held, and there they resolved that the humanitarian revolution, which had been prepared at the time, would break out in France rather than in Germany, and this plan was carried out. In a book entitled La Franc Mecanaria Ecrasé, written about the year 1746, an experienced ex-Mason related that as a Mason he had visited many lodges in France and England, and had consulted with other Masons in high official positions. He described this as the true program of masonry, of the program of the Great Revolution of 1789. It has been confirmed by authors who were masons as well as those who were not that the principal role in the direction of the French Revolution can be attributed to Masonic influence. I will now confirm it. Brother Sicard de Plazoles ends an affirmation at the Masonic Convention of 1913 thus, quote, Freemasonry can with legitimate pride consider the revolution its own work, end quote. Brother Amiable and Calfavru at the Masonic Congress of 1889 gave lectures each making two well-documented statements whose resume is this, Quote, at the beginning of 1789, the Freemasons took an active part in the great and worthwhile movement inaugurated in this country of France. Its influence was preponderant in the assemblies of the Third Estate. For the printing of acts and for the nomination of the elect, they played a less considerable part in the assemblies of the privileged orders. Nevertheless, the influence of Masonry is recognized even in numerous reforming propositions among the acts of the clergy and of the nobility. Of 605 delegates from the Third Estate, 417 were Masons. In Lord Action's essay on the French Revolution, he states, quote, The frightening thing is not the tumult, but the plan. 
Above the fire and the smoke, we perceive evidence of a calculating organization. The directors remain studiously hidden in mass, but from the beginning, there is no doubt of their presence." End quote. In the last two works cited, one sees clearly the universal concurrence of foreigners. With their people, and with their gold, and with their action in the French Revolution, one sees the work of a universal organization which makes its people and their money arrive from everywhere to pay the propaganda agents, to produce misery, and to prepare, by means of it, the popular mind for the revolt. One sees a common accord which historians point out was effective in the Masonic convent of Wilhelmsbad in 1782. Reading these words, the patriotic heart cannot help being filled with anguish, thinking how simple it is for secret international organization to make any nation a plaything and a victim of its worst enemies. When the patriotic spirit is weakened or lost, foreign gold can carry a country to all manner of aberration and ruin. In the Confessions of the Count of Hogwitz, presented at the Congress of Verona, one reads, quote, I then acquired the firm conviction that the drama begun in 1788 and 1789, the French Revolution, the regicide, with all its horrors, had not been the result of a sudden decision at the time, but happened as the result of the same Masonic associations and oaths, etc. The Count of Hogwitz speaks as an authority, being one of the most prominent chiefs of Masonry. Number 69 is actions in France during the 19th century. When Napoleon became the idol of the revolution, Masonry, though working tirelessly to oust him, bent its knee to him. In 1812, at the Festival of the Order, the Grand Orator of the Grand Orient pronounced this emphatic abjuration, quote, And we, my brothers, joined in this Orient, just as in another time one of the Hebrew chiefs upon a mountain, while the warriors of Israel were fighting, lifted his hand toward the Eternal One, who has promised victory to the eagles of his chosen people. Let us rejoice in recognition of the internal peace which has power assures us. Nevertheless, the majority of the same military lodges had become anti-Napoleonic to such an extent that, during the invasion, some began to admit official masons of the Allied powers to their lodges. When Louis XVIII ascended the throne, they treated him as they had Napoleon. The Grand Master Deputy, General Bournonville, threw himself at the feet of the monarch, declaring he was as devoted to him as to himself. But then the new rise of Napoleon took place upon his return from Alva, and at that moment, masonry, veering toward him, addressed a salutation of welcome to the Chosen of the Eternal One. Later, when Napoleon disappeared after a hundred days of restoration, once again masonry was at the fleet of Louis the Eighteenth, the desired one, offering prayers for him and singing him in his honor. The story keeps repeating itself with Charles the Tenth, Louis Philippe, and the Republic, and with Napoleon the Third. Louis the Philippe went so far as to prohibit military personnel from belonging to the lodges, knowing that masonry was working surreptitiously to oust him. It was all in vain. A great congress of German, French, and Swiss masons gathered in Strasbourg in 1847 deciding to substitute the monarchy for the Republic. Five directors of the Parisian lodges prepared the revolution and Odilon Beret, Mason of the Lodge of Tournesus, and President of the Council of Ministers, after having vowed fidelity to Louis-Philippe, ordered the fighting against the revolutionaries be stopped and the provisional government was organized. Masonry then sent a deputation from the Grand Lodge of France, composed of members dressed in their insignia, to lend their support to the provisional government. An official statement states this, Quote, 40,000 Masons from 500 lodges, who share but one mind, one spirit, promise you their close support in finishing the work of the regeneration so gloriously begun. Of 11 ministers of the provisional government, nine were Masons. The other two, Lamartine and Dupont de la Hur, were not, but were amenable to Masonic opinion, surrounded as they were by Masons. The government was, then, Masonic, when on March 10, 1848, the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite went to congratulate the provincial government, Lamartine, in the name of the government, replied to the Masonic delegation, quote, I am convinced that it is from the depths of your lodges that there have come, first in darkness, then in half-light, and finally in broad daylight, the sentiments which have just created the sublime explosion which we witnessed in 1789, in which the people of Paris have shown the world for the second, and we hope for the last time a few days ago. Later, the nation elected an assembly, which was not Masonic, as was the government. Then the struggle began between the government and the assembly, until reaching the coup d'etat which made Louis Napoleon the Emperor Napoleon III in November of 1852. Did masonry, which had previously shown itself to be so republican, take part in the movement? Of course. On October 15, 1852, President Bonaparte received an official Masonic letter which stated, quote, France owes you its salvation. Do not stop in the midst of such a wonderful career. Assure the happiness of everyone by placing the imperial crown on your noble brow. Accept our homage and hear the cry from our hearts. Long live the emperor. Prince Marat, cousin of the emperor, had been elected Grand Master on the following day of the coup d'etat of December 2nd, 1851, by which Napoleon dissolved the chambers of Parliament in order to have a new constitution approved. Napoleon was greeted and hailed as emperor by the lodges six months before he was proclaimed as such. But curiously enough, after all this, Masonry cursed the man of December, the bandit, the assassin of liberty, as Victor Hugo called him, and prepared for his downfall. Copenhagen Jelly states, M. Charles Gaillot shows us in his excellent book on La idea de patria y humanitarianismo, the idea of the fatherland and humanitarianism, 
how masonry opposed the reorganization of the army undertaken by Marshal Nicel, how French masonry acclaimed the foundation of a German lodge in Paris, how the brother Brisson sent to this lodge the Concorde to extend the hand of friendship to its German brothers and to celebrate with them the suppression of friends and universal brotherhood. Yet during this time, Germany was adding incessantly to the power of its combat organism. The occult power was preaching pacifism and humanitarianism in France through French masonry, while patriotism was being preached in Germany by German masonry. Attacked in its moral and material resources, the empire's downfall took place. After the disaster of the year 1870, the established republic was gaining strength at the same time that in the chambers of parliament, deputies were striving to implant laws contrary to the church, which means that masonry maintained and increased its political power. Quote, clericalism, here is the enemy, end quote, one of the leaders had said, and all the forces of masonry were directed towards combating Catholicism. Thus, it is explained that in 1900, the Masons, of whom there were only 25,000 in France, had more than 400 senators and deputies, or a senator for each 70 Masons, while for the rest of the French people, the proportion was one senator or deputy for each 10,000 electors. The Masons, then, were 193 times more favored than the mass of the French people. Four years later, they carried out the Masonic plan for the separation of church and state, for the expulsion of religious orders and congregations, and for the confiscation of the church's possessions, properties, etc., and breaking in a violent and arbitrary manner all relations with the Holy See. This created the need for war, and a great number of Frenchmen gave service to it unselfishly, those, quote, outcast exiles, end quote, by law who forgot de facto the unjust and anti-patriotic cruelty of those laws. But once the war was over and the danger passed for the resurgency, they began to urge the fulfillment of those laws and the suppression of the ambassadors to the Vatican. They counted upon the majority of the Chamber of Deputies and the Ministry for this as it was formed entirely of Brother Masons. In La Dictature de la France Maconnerie sur la France, the Masonic Dictatorship of France, by A.G. Michel, one can see all the facts which at the same time justify the title of the book and illustrate the shameful servitude in which the occult sect has held the government of the nation. In this work, one sees how, after the note sent from the lodges, the ministry has begun to execute their decisions, proposing to the chambers their plans leading to it. Fortunately, the national conscience and the Catholic conscience have begun to awaken and to organize the League of National Defense to stop the destructive blow dealt to peace and to Christian civilization and to the prestige of the country by masonry. Later, they will again affirm that masonry knows nothing of politics. Masonry has sought to do everywhere what it had done in Germany. To give an idea of its activities in Germany in the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, we give the following quotation from Count Haugwitz in his confession at the Congress of Verona. After speaking of the division of masonry in two parties, one with its seat in Berlin and the other having the Prince of Brunswick as a parent head, he adds, quote, In the open struggle between the two parties, they gave each other mutual support in order to arrive at the domination of the world, to conquer thrones, to make use of kings as their administrators, such were their ends to exercise a dominating influence over thrones and over sovereigns, such was our end, as it had been the end of the Knight Templars. I regret that space does not allow me to give in all its amplitude the instructions of Weishaupt, head of Illuminati. I shall quote only a few of his words, quote, to inspire everywhere a single spirit to direct toward the same object, and deepest silent, but with all activity possible, all men scattered over the face of the earth. I have here this problem to show, solve even in the politics of the states, upon which is established the control of secret societies. Once this domination is established through the close union and multitude of its members, let force follow the invisible empire. Bind the hands of those who resist, subjugate at once evil in its beginning. Priests and princes are resisting our great plan. Quote, Around the powers of the earth, it is necessary to join together a legion of indefatigable men. But all that must be done in silence. Our brothers must help each other, thus aid the good who are oppressed, and must try to win all positions of power for the good of the order. Eckert, especially in the second volume of his work, shows the amazing activity with which France, with masonry, worked during the first half of the past century in Germany, especially when the institution, Young Europe, an international association which united all of its national institutions, Young Italy, Young France, Young Switzerland, Young Germany, Young Poland, etc., spread throughout Europe. Quote, we have seen, he says, in what manner the various professions have been put in fermentation and how they have gathered, gathered into German associations. We have seen how it happened in Italy, the gathering of the Congress of Doctors, Naturalists, Professors, Artists, Pharmacists, and of German Lawyers, one Congress was soon followed by another, sometimes in one city, other times in another. Everywhere, there were fraternal banquets, liberal and enthusiastic discussions. There were many other gatherings which were advantageous for recruiting. But not only are they the chiefs of the revolution which broke out later, but also the most fierce insurgents and the apostles of assassination which we owe to the ranks of masonry. It seems that this revolutionary effervescence was moderated slightly with the formation of the German Empire under the hegemony of Prussia whose kings had occupied high positions, at least honorary, in the Brotherhood. Masonry showed itself to be devoted to emperors and sought to quench in them all suspicion of treason by baptizing many lodges with names most suited to flatter the princes of the state. Here is a most choice collection. Frederick of Oscanian fidelity, William of Oriental Prussian fidelity, 
Frederick William of the Dawn, Frederick William in Justice Crowned, Louisa and Beautiful and Constant, William Radiant in Justice, Hohenzollern, Faithful and Constant, Frederick William of Truth and Fidelity, and many others of this kind. Nevertheless, this did not prevent the German lodges from maintaining strict relationships with the Italian and even the French who had a profound scorn for the German princes. Later, I shall have opportunity to say something of the activity of the lodges in the Great War. Number 70, in Austria. From the time of the French Revolution until the termination of the Great War, Austria, because it was known as a Catholic country, has been exposed to the fires of masonry perhaps more than any other country, following a carefully and long-laid plan for this purpose. The Great War ended with the destruction of the Austrian monarchy. The revolutionary calm which followed the formation of the German Empire under the kings of Prussia, dismembering the Austrian Empire, is explained partly by the German lodges having succeeded with this political change in what they had proposed to do against Catholicism. But it is correct to note that it has been foreign masonry which had been determined to destroy the Austrian Empire. In the country itself, it seems that the Brotherhood counted but few adherents. And speaking of the World War, there will be a reference to Austria again in regard to the crime of Sarajevo. Number 71, its action in Russia. Freemasonry experienced alternate periods of tolerance and prohibition under the government of the Tsars. Nevertheless, it pursued its surreptitious work for the outbreak of the revolution which overthrew that government. Has it intervened in that revolution and the universal disaster which took place under the Bolshevist revolution which characterizes it even today? I shall give to the reader two indications that masonry has been the instrument of that revolution, which, if it did put an end to despotism, was to substitute for an incomparably more tyrannical, harmful, and criminal oppression. The first indication is the realization of the plan pointed out in the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, which, authentic or not, are a prophetic plan which is fulfilled in an astonishing manner and which counted upon Masonry as its instrument. A copy of the 1905 edition of the Protocols was deposited in the British Museum at London on August 10, 1906. That is more than ten years before the development of the events which marked the realization of that plan. The relationship of Masonry to the authors of the Revolution becomes increasingly obvious when one reads, quote, Who can destroy an invisible force? And, that is precisely our force. All of masonry served as a screen for us and for our plans, but the plan of action of our force, even its very abiding place, remains a mystery unknown to the whole people. Protocol 4. To continue, quote, For what purpose, then, have we invented all this political activity, and why have we insinuated into the minds of the Gentiles without giving them any chance to examine its hidden significance? For what, indeed, if not in the order to obtain in a roundabout way what is for our scattered tribes unattainable by the direct road? This is what has served as a basis for our out-organization of secret masonry, which is not known and has aims which are not even so much as suspected by the herd of Goyim. Gentiles, cattle, attracted by us to the army of exhibition of the Masonic lodges in order to throw dust in the eyes of their comrades. Protocol 2, the cause, page 95. The plan of the protocols is the ruin of nations to establish over them Jewish domination. See how Lord Churchill described on November 5, 1919, the execution of that plan, speaking in the House of Commons in England, quote, Lenin was sent to Russia by the Germans in the same way that a culture of typhus or cholera is sent to be spilled into a fountain which provides water for a great city, and it has been carried out with terrifying accuracy. Scarcely had he arrived when he began to gather around himself here and there obscure persons living in secret retreats in New York, Glasgow, Bern, and other countries, and be brought together by the guiding spirits of this formidable sect, the most formidable sect in the world, of which he was the high priest and chief. Surrounded by those spirits, he applied himself with devilish skill to break down all the basic institutions of the Russian state. Russia was brought down, Russia had to be crushed. And the cause, the work of Monsignor Junin, concerning the protocols, and the work of Wichel, are given the names of all the Jews who have been in the government of the Soviet, and thus it is shown that the Jews are realizing their plan, for which they counted on masonry as a blind and servile instrument. The other indication of the participation of masonry in the revolution and the present upheaval in Russia is a letter in La Diable au 19 Cecile, 1896, attributed to Albert Pike, quote, Sovereign Pontiff of Universal Masonry assisted by ten ancients of the Grand Lodge of the Supreme Orient of Charleston to the very illustrious Joseph Mazzini, dated August 15, 1871. What I have said of the document previously mentioned, the Protocols, I say of this one. Authentic or not, the letter had been published long enough before the events, not to be an invention accommodated post factum. Its publication is catalogued in the British Museum of London, and the plan attributed to Pike is also in part of La Paladisme of Maggiota, page 186, published in 1895. It is a plan to destroy Catholicism, to throw the Pope out of Italy and force him to seek refuge in Russia. And then, when the autocratic empire had become the citable of papal Christianity, quote, we, continuing the author of the letter, shall unleash the nihilists and atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effects of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority or revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization, and the multitude, 
disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will be from that moment without compass, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light. Through the universal manifestation to the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out in the public view, a manifestation which will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Pike was Luciferian. The part of the plan relative to the papacy has failed, as on many other historic occasions, the plans and intentions of human power against the Pope have failed. As to the sad realization of the second part, namely the, quote, formidable social cataclysm, no one in our time can ignore it. The Russian revolutionaries have not done, nor do they do anything else but execute a plan set up many years before by one of the supreme pontiffs of masonry. Can one deny the part which masonry has played in the formidable social cataclysm? Number 72. Its action in Italy. Because of the action of masonry and of its affiliated secret societies, Italy was, during the greater part of the past century, a great volcano in constant eruptions and agitation. The Viscount of de Alencourt, in his pamphlet La Italia Roja, Red Italy, says that, quote, one of the first to organize masonry in Italy was Lord Byron, the famous poet, atheist, and skeptic who hated the Pope against whom Napoleon, in the midst of his glory, had just dashed himself. Then he adds, quote, taking all kinds of intangible forms and bound by horrible oaths, those secret societies associated for crime declared a war of extermination not only of thrones and altars, but on the entire social order. They formed invisible tribunals in which, without pity, they decreed the death of any person who stood in their way. In 1834, revolutionaries chose as a chief Mazzini, who established in Switzerland the center of his activity. Quote, he had been expelled from France as a consequence of three murders. He proposed to extend the revolution to all the states of Europe and through the institutions which, with the name of, quote, Young Italy, had him as chief. All Italy, continues to Alencourt, was involved in a web of treason and of wickedness. Political murders were planned. Revolutions were in fashion. By means of scientific congresses, held in one city or another, by means of circles or clubs, the revolution is propagandized until, in 1848, it reached the point of ousting Pius IX, the most popular and kindest of popes. Reinstated on the papal throne shortly afterwards, thanks to the combined action of the Catholic powers, especially Austria, France, and Naples, the conspiracies continued nevertheless until they carried out that phase of the Masonic program. Quote, the, Mas the revolution has gone to Rome, writes an atheist brother in La Revista de la Masonia Italia. Quote, to combat the Pope face to face, to give Masonry gigantic proportions in the very heart of Rome, the capital of the universe. There it will attack without pity the religious, which have as a common dogma the belief in God and in the immortality of the soul. Francisco Crispi, its ministers of King Umberto, in his turn declares, quote, We have gone to Rome to throw down that tree, 18 centuries old, of Catholicism. Adriano Lemmi, high pontiff of Italian Masonry, sent in 1887 to all the lodges a circular in which he says to them, quote, The anniversary of September 20th, the day on which Rome became capital of Italy, and on which the temporal power of the Pope was destroyed, belongs exclusively to Masonry. It is a holiday, purely and simple Masonic, a point which marks the date of the arrival of Italian Masonry in Rome, an end which had been proposed for many years. It would be impossible to describe in a few pages the political work which the Italian Masonry has not ceased to do since its triumphant arrival in Rome. But the following secret messages addressed to all of the venerables or worshipful masters by the Grand Orient of the Valley of Tiber, and signed by Adriano Lemmi on October 10, 1890, will give us some idea of it. Quote, to the brothers of the venerable Italian lodges. The edifice which the brothers of the entire world are working to build cannot be declared of solid construction while the brothers of Italy have not handed over to humanity the debris of the great enemy's institution. Our work is pursued actively in Italy and the Grand Orient of the Valley of Tiber has been able at the yearly anniversary of our 1789 meeting to proclaim that the laws in Italy are being set up in the light of the spirit of the universal masonry. Let us apply the scalpel to the last refuge of superstition and the faith of the 33-degree brother, Crispy, who is at the head of the political powers, serves us as a sure guarantee that the Vatican will fall under our vigorous hammering. But in order that this work may not come to a halt, and in order that humanity may not lose any of the benefits expected of it, it is indispensable that in the next political elections at least 400 brothers enter the legislative chamber. In the present legislature, there are 300. This number is not sufficient for the future work. The Lodge of Tiber, joining itself with the numerous Italian lodges, has succeeded in having its venerable Master Crispy extend the period of the dissolution of the chamber, so that we could arrange together the tests of our candidates to national representation. The brothers of the different lodges will work, then near the prefects, who in the majority belong to us, near the departmental councils, and with other influential persons for the triumph of our candidates. Whoever has cooperated in the diffusion will live in the light as far as we are concerned. It is necessary to render harmless the, the priests, the newspapers of darkness, and even the irregulars who, during the present legislature, have attacked masonry under futile pretexts, such as the question of tobaccos or of our influence in that field. We must take advantage of this circumstance to remember the legitimacy of the means which permit us to make money for the purpose of spreading a fruitful propaganda, and respecting our influences, which the Grand Orient must not renounce. 
that we may always put them to good use and favor the supreme interests of the order. The Grand Orient invokes the genius of humanity to the end that the brothers strive to break down the stones of the Vatican to build with them the temple of emancipated reason. Signed, Adriano Lemmy, 33rd degree, Delegated Sovereign Grand Commentator. Quote, concerning the part which Masonry had in the entry of Italy into the Great War, I take from Wichel the following data. On September 6, 1914, the Grand Master Ferrari sent a circular to indicate to Italian Masonry the attitude which it was to assume from that time on, namely Italy, must enter the war, and it will enter the war as soon as the opportunity presents itself. Meanwhile, the brothers must stir up the national conscience most energetically, and they must educate the people for war. A few days later, on the 13th, the first noisy manifestations took place in Rome, in which it was demanded that Austria lose Trieste and Trent. The principal speaker was Brother Sivanini. The 20th of the same month, a circuit circular from the Lode of Milan expresses the convictions that the war will bring the greatest triumph to masonry, an epoch free from throne and altars, the Masonic princes must triumph everywhere. On October 20th, the street manifestations are repeated everywhere, prepared by masonry. Victoria writes at the beginning of March 1915, those who since 1870 have insisted upon the dissolutions of the state wish to lead us into a war proceeding from masonry, which received its orders from the lodges of Paris and of London. Masonry scattered terror among independent men. Gilote feared for his life. General Polio, enemy of war, died suddenly under mysterious circumstances which were never clarified. The pro-war agitation reached its height on May 5, 1915, on the occasion of Garibaldi holidays in Corto, near Genoa, the Annunzio, delivered the principal discourse. The 493 lodges of Italy, obeying orders from the Grand Master, took part in them, sending deputations which displayed their banners. Before three weeks, the declaration of war took place. If anyone doubted that it was principally the work of masonry, he will be easily convinced by the affirmation of the Grand Master Ferrari made on May 24, 1916, the first anniversary of the declaration when he said, Quote, the declaration of war was produced by virtue of a decree of the Grand Orient of Italy. Number 73, its action in Spain and Portugal in Spain. In the third volume of Heterodoxes Espanoles by Menendez Palayo, one may read a description capable of giving us an idea of the action of masonry in Spain up to the writing of this book. This reading will prove to be of great interest and profit for all. The author, after recalling in a few words the universal conspiracy of thrones against the church, of which the first victims were the sovereigns themselves, has revealed to us the dealings which the Count of Aranda had with the French encyclopedists, the same Count who, after destroying the Jesuits by force of calumny and violent injustice, they flattered themselves that they would all kill the mother, that is, the Catholic Church. The King Jose, the philosopher king, as he was called in the lodges, inaugurated in Spain the war against the Church and the confiscation and foreclosure of its property, as it is called to avoid calling it by its proper name, vis-a-vis -vis robbery. The French multiplied the number of lodges in Spain, and with them, not only the seed of impiety, but also of revolutions and insurrections, which have not ceased there, but in the last quarter of the past century. That is, if we do not take into account those which ended with the loss of ultra-oceanic colonies, which still retain Masonic anti-patriotism as an important factor. In the Cortes of Cadiz, Masonry had played an important part, going so far as to pay the rabble represent in the galleries to bring about the success of plans adverse to religion. Since 1814, Masonry has been involved, so to speak, in a cloak of liberalism. Its lodges have been multiplied, and along with their growth, the hatred of the anthropophagy, cannibalism of the clergy. From that time, says Menende Palayo, masonry comes complaining to our liberal parties because of the mockery and vilification and contempt which the rest of Europe bestowed on them, telling them that this singular procedure of political regeneration has already grown antiquated and outmoded. In 1814, the common danger and sectarian fanaticism brought together the liberals and the Scottish Rite Lodge, and one can well say that scarcely anyone failed to become affiliated with them, and what all tentative plans to overthrow the government of Ferrando the Seventh were directed or promoted or paid for by them. They conspired almost publicly, and in several cities, but the strangest of all, and that which most clearly gives signs of those times and of those men, is the chief of the reorganized Spanish masonry became Mirable Dictu, the Captain General of Granada, Count of Montijo, the famous Tio Pedro, Uncle Peter, of the insurrection of Aranjuez, perpetual agitator of the masses, turning of all parties untiring conspirator for no other reason than for the love of art. This shameless and reprehensible military insurrection of Cadiz, 1819, worthy of a place side by side with the desertion of Don Opas and sons of Witsia, gave the triumph to the revolutionaries. The Lodge of Cadiz had prepared it, being powerfully seconded by gold from the Americans, the English, and the Jews of Gibraltar. Since that time, poor Spain continued to be tormented by a fever of uprisings, which blazed constantly in attacks of the most bloody fury, perhaps not equaled anywhere, even putting children to the sword, and in one day shooting 300 prisoners, as did the incorrigible in Chacheres, and turning the peninsula into a wide-open fortress given over to the fiercest mob rule and military anarchy which were enthroned on all sides. The instigators of such brutal excesses were the secret societies, 
already very deeply divided. Triumph made them come to the surface, and even to denying each other's names and object, each society, and even to denying each other's names and object, each society giving all possible publicity to its activities, and ostensibly influencing the government's representatives whose candidacies were planned in the lodges. Masonry had created the revolution, and it collected the spoils. But how was it able to satisfy all ambitions, and to reward its own with fat and honorable employments? On this point arose discontent, and in the end, a split. And on the account of this split, there were organized to the greater misfortune of the mother country, the secret societies of Los Camioneros y Vengadores de Juan de Padilla, the Commodores and the Avengers of Padilla, with their towers instead of lodges, and the Gran Castilians instead of Grand Orients, and still later the Vendita of Cabanares, an Italian importation, and the Societies Patricias, patriotic societies. No one knows exactly, says the aforementioned author, what was the organization of the lodges in 1834, but is in the minds of all, and Martinez de la Rosa solemnly declared it before dying that the killing of monks were prepared and organized by them. I mentioned this killing elsewhere, that blood so fiercely spilled, which not only spattered to the brow of those which all demagoguery gathered in the quarter of the garrisons, but this killing rose higher and engraved itself like a perpetual indelible stigma on the brow of all liberal parties, from the highest to the most moderate, of some because they strengthened the arm of the assassin, of others because they consented or aided and did not punish the wickedness or reproved it weakly. Some gained advantage from the spoils, and their greed closed their eyes. The effervescence and the bloody uprisings formed a large part of the revolutions and political activities in Spain from 1875. The resume can be read in the works of Menendez Pelayo, cited above, whose affirmations concerning masonry, it is only fair to state, are accompanied by evidence frequently taken from Masonic authors. One can also read it in volume 21 of Espaza, page 1025. In Portugal, in Portugal, masonry has not been less fruitful in political revolutions. Mendendez, Bolayo has stated, Those who know central Spain in that epoch also know Portugal and can guess its history, although he may not realize it. The same legislative exper inexperience, the same patriotic delirium, the same lodges planning the same uprising, the same chambers dictating the same decrees, and the mass of people as different there as here, not understanding a word of that confusion. They are equally disposed to receive with open arms the most absolute reaction and uphold it weakly, or submit to a rebellious faction stronger because of its audacity and secret bonds rather than numbers. This opinion of Palayo concerning the Masonic influence in the political revolutions of Portugal is also shared by Professor Borjas Grenha, brought out in his history of Masonry in Portugal from 1733 to 1912. He states, quote, The majority of the men most important in the religious, political, and literary revolutions of Portugal in the last two centuries were Masons pointing out that most of the leaders in the coup d'etat of 1910 belonged to the various Masonic lodges. In a meeting of the Grand Orient of Belgium on February 12, 1911, Mr. Tournament said, quote, You recall with pride the revolution of Portugal. In a few hours, the throne fell, the people triumphed, the republic was declared. For the ignorant people, it was like a ray from the serene heaven. But we, my brothers, knew the secret of that glorious deed. We are confronted again with the cruel and manifest contradiction existing between Masonry's avowed non-intervention in politics and the reality of its constant activities. Number 74, its action in England. The first appearance of the order on the political scene, says Eckert, was in 1470. At the time, it took part in the dissensions of houses of York and Lancashire. Who can ignore the war of the white and red roses? From its many Mason authors derive the origin of the roses, which the masters carry as a symbol of their authority. Nevertheless, Masonry also took part in the pacification of both houses. A second commotion, 1645, was particularly a work of Masonry. King Charles II was expelled from the throne and died on the scaffold. The Masonic associations of that time took the name of Puritans and Independents. They were composed of the bourgeois scientific element and were of great assistance to Cromwell in his bloody executions. The political activity of the order depended upon the sovereigns who were sometimes affiliated with the Masonry and other times were trying to antagonize it. After 1813, at which time the antagonistic Masonic elements were untied, according to the democratic or aristocratic ideas which they professed, and, thanks to that concentration, Masonry of England held the direction of universal Masonry and its revolutionary political spirit make itself felt not so much in that country as outside of it, in Europe and America, availing itself even of English diplomacy, since Lord Palmerston was at the same time head of the government and supreme Grand Master of Universal Masonry. Quote, Under the direction of Lord Palmerston, England declared that it would shield with its protection all democratic uprisings, revolutions, and the actions frequently repeated in all parts of the world support the declaration. The world was astonished at this announcement, yet from this it becomes quite evident that the power of the government was entirely in the hands of Masonry. We have seen the new policy used by England at times, successfully, at other times, unsuccessfully against Brazil, Portugal, Holland, and Belgium, against Russia and Poland, and finally against Switzerland. We have seen revolution induced in Italy, in Sardinia, and especially in Hungary, under the impulse of Lord Palmerston. It reached to the point where the main direction of the European Revolution came from London with the Committee of Action being established there. 
We have seen in the Viscount of Alincourt how Lord Minto, the English ambassador, proclaimed in a full theater the independence of Italy. We have seen that M. Frenhorn, the English consular agent, belonged to the Amazinian associations of Rome, which met twice a week, and which prepared and carried out the assassinations of Rossi, minister to the Pope. In the work Les Atours Cachés de la Révolution Française, among some chapters, all of which are interesting, there are three entitles respectively, The English Agents, From Where Does Money Come, and England and the Revolution, in which it is shown that in the French Revolution, a work in masonry glories, and in which the intervention of foreign agents cannot be doubted. The English agents were the most numerous, that the pockets of the popular agitators were found full of gold at a time of general poverty, gold which came principally from England, that each uprising counts costed thousands of English pounds, and that the British cabinet and the English secret societies counted on the help of Freemasonry to aggravate the already distressing situation of the people in France, to promote uprising, and to further the destructive work of the revolution. All this is supported by abundant documentation, much of it diplomatic. Upon reflection, it causes one to think about the facility with which any of our countries, which are smaller and poorer than France, can or perhaps have been the vile plaything of intrigues, not only of a rich and powerful government like England, but even of a simple secret society which can count upon thousands of English pounds with which to aggravate the economic situation of a country by monopolizing its products or by producing upheavals on the rate of exchange. One secret society can provoke great discontent within a nation by paying a few agitators to incite revolutions as a best remedy for all its ills. No doubt this has been done on many occasions and is being done now. If true history can be written truthfully in the future, will it not bring to light the dark intrigues of the foreigner in our American countries with his hidden plots and his gold, working now for our ruin, and how anti-patriotic and vile has been the conduct of those who have loaned themselves to serve as instruments of treachery to betray the government of the country where they have established themselves? Now, after 100 years, we are showing with clarity their part in the bloody chaos of France, and those of us who know the past history of Masonry can well imagine the powerful part they are playing in the entire world, wherever chaos is found. Regardless of that, we know that Masonry is doing precisely the opposite of what it proclaims. Number 75 and 76. Its Action in America. We cannot deny that Masonry had its part in the emancipation of America, as did many patriotic elements who believed with sincerity in the justice of the cause of liberation. However, this does not imply that all methods employed were justified. In truth, the end does not justify the means. We must make this exception to avoid being accused of lack of patriotism or of moral rectitude. The political action of Masonry in America has been very effective and very fruitful in revolutions and uprisings, as it has been in Europe and in this respect. Not only has it achieved independence, but above all, after having achieved it, Either it has used its power to exalt its leaders, to break down parties and to satiate greed, or to further its campaign against religion, especially against the Catholic Church. As for Mexico, one should immediately examine Volume 3 of Medendas Palayo, especially page 537, to give only a few of the quotations after referring to the struggle between the York and Scottish Rite factions, he states, quote, By degrees or by force, quoting Dr. Mora, they, the New York Masons, subjugated all the public powers to the action or influence of associations not recognized by law. They annulled the Federation by the violence displayed in the states, by the imperious necessity in which they placed the people of recognizing them as the only and exclusive center of public authority. The public powers and the clergy and the militia were, all more or less, subjected to the dominion of one party or the other. All the later history of Mexico, continues Palayo, stained with the blood of Maximilian, is contained in these premises. Wherever the spirit triumph, it nourishes and foments all misguided ambition, and one can expect the artificial revolution which consumes and enervates the people. Even though it excites tumultuosity, just as do alcoholic liquors, it never results in organic evolution, internal or fruitful. It is well known that the restriction of liberty in Mexico was not only religious, but was converted into real persecution, at times bloody, of the political as well. This persecution has reigned in Mexico up to this day, even throughout the long period of the government of Porfirio Diaz. It has resulted in wars and revolutions which have followed his downfall. Masonry's part in all this has been manifest, a manner of public knowledge, and the data given previously in dealing with its anti-Catholic action confirms it sufficiently. I would exceed the limits of this work and of time at my disposal to consider all Latin America nation by nation. The number of uprisings, revolutions, and civil wars for which Masonry is responsible is very great in spite of the fact that all the history of those countries has not been written. There are many deeds of cruelty and tyranny attributed to Masonic initiative or to the evil instincts of the government, which Masonry has established and upheld as instruments of its power. The close relationship which Masonry has had with liberalism has served the Brotherhood as an instrument to execute its political action with the greatest deceit and the most secure success. In reading the history of the American Republics, bear in mind the observation of Menendez Balayo quoted above. Later I shall elaborate on the subject of the political activity which has engaged Masonry during the century of independent life which those countries have led. In spite of the assertions made repeatedly by the Masons that they do not interfere in politics, with the exception of their interference in religious wars, nothing else concerns them more than politics. 
Espaza gives an idea of the revolutionary movement which has become the characteristic of many American republics. I refer you again to section 58 to refresh your memory of the reports made at the International Masonic Congress of Buenos Aires, transmitted to all the lodges of America enumerated therein. Number 77. Is masonry ignorant of politics, or does it make use of politics as an instrument? Masonic statutes, propagandists, and members proclaim that, quote, masonry respects the religious faith of its members just as much as their political sympathies, end quote. Yet here in France, we observe the fallacy of their absurd assertions, for while the masons are few in number as compared to the rest of the nation, still public posts are as numerous among them as if the majority of Chileans were masons. It is well known fact that many of them have contact with political direction of the country. The preference given to Masons in the political field is not due to their merits, but rather the insignia on the Masonic apron, which commands much more respect than the opinions of the government. Those of us who are natives of Inquique, where it is easy to know men, realize how important it is to be a Mason if one aspires to occupy high posts and to be maintained in all the degrees of power. Concurrently, with a search for new members, they preach that Masonry is an association of benevolence, that they do not deal with religion nor politics, pushing this propaganda especially toward those who show fear or distrust whereas to others better prepared to receive Masonic truths, they promise to help them obtain good positions. In fact, there is always an insufficient number of positions, however numerous, to fulfill their promises. Which brings to mind an occurrence related in the magazine of the Order in the time of Santa Maria and told by an ex-Mason, which has been bearing on the subject. Quote, Upon arrival in the ministry, I was deluged by a flood of letters, postcards, and telegrams, all of one type, namely requests for public employment and commissions for the brothers. The official notes of the lodges asked for favors for a member or relative of one, and the brothers spoke in behalf of themselves for positions and favors, even at times making requests for outsiders they wished to influence. This is no exaggeration, for even clergymen of a snobbish nature asked my assistance. Such an honor for the order. Without thinking of what they were doing, the private correspondence I received showed evidence that the Masons wished to transform the ministry in my charge into a civil service employment office. It was enough to drive a minister crazy, and certainly an abuse of Masonry, in fact, prostituting it. In the case of a Mason who is a minister and ignores the advice of the heads of the order, we should pity them. Masons constantly preach, quote, Our brothers must give each other mutual support and must try to win all the positions of power for the good of the order. Some of the older residents of Inquique can recall changes of positions or of chiefs taking place unexpectedly. Horrible hostilities shown toward those who apparently refused to comply with requests. Toward others, there would be show of unexpected political favor. There is no other explanation other than the intervention of the lodges. My purpose now is to let the truth be known to those who have fallen victim to the initial deception which brought them into the lodges, if possible, and caused them to rely on the propaganda that Masonry respected political and religious opinion. There was a time that their subtle propaganda could fool the best of us, and even I was taken in somewhat, especially in regard to politics. If a man did not belong to the radical party, whether he were a Mason or not, he served its purpose either through frustration, through his ignorance, or proceeding in accord with it in the realization of the anti-Christian program, which is their principal objective among us. It is not unusual to hear the phrase in certain circles, quote, this must be taken care of through masonry. Outsiders are sometimes astonished when a mason commits an error which would warrant a jail sentence to any other person, or at least some discipline such as suspension or loss of employment, to find a hidden hand, which is certainly not God's. Yet, almost as if it were, the matter is dropped. Meanwhile, the guilty ones laugh at the naive individuals who thought masons would govern them according to the laws or the public sanctions of the country. Number 78. Masonry's Political Masks Masonry faithful to its watchword of secrecy or pretense, never presents itself upon the political scene under its true colors because light is harmful to it. It must present its deals or its programs wrapped up in those of the political parties in whose first ranks it can station its most able members, charged with the execution of its plans and the fulfillment of its orders. With this concealed intervention of masonry, one fully understands the terrible meaning of the words of the celebrated English Prime Minister, Disraeli, when he said, quote, those who govern the world are not those who seem to government, but rather those who operate behind the scenes. In 1888, Brother Blatton, a French deputy, based his claim on the same fact to glory in having organized in the French Parliament a real syndicate of Freemasons, with which he obtained truly efficacious interventions a hundred times and more. The reader will ask in what parties will find Masons in control. At one time, the Liberal Party was the center of their operations. From there, it has spread to form a more advanced party, the Radical, using its advanced members who were unable to carry out their extreme proposals and the more conservative Liberal Party. However, before leaving the Liberal Party, they made certain to leave the people necessary to impede reaction and to drive ever forward those obstinately afraid and timorous of change. Another thing has happened in the new field of operations. The ideas have germinated. The principles of the order, which the founders of the Radical Party profess, now seem to many people too conservative and stale, so they lean toward socialism, communism, or Bolshevism, etc. These are, of course, the most advanced brothers. The rest are in the Radical Party, with heavy reserves in the Liberal Party. 
as in other countries, the brothers have also infiltrated all political parties. However, from liberalism to Bolshevism, and undoubtedly there are a few who are affiliated with the conservative party. The proof of this is found in the force with which the lodges have organized propaganda, and the radical parties and the liberal party predominantly anti-religious, which has spread even amongst the clergy. Liberty and liberalism are words with an ambiguous meaning, which can be applied to the cry Lucifer uttered against God, as well as to the protestation of St. Peter when he declared his choice was to obey God and not man, as was his duty. At times, Masonry has cleverly used the same battle cry, but only those well-versed in the order would know they mean Lucifer when they use the term God. To fight unmasked would have been imprudent, says Frederick Siddow, but propagating freedom of thought and feeling of independence was the way one could overthrow the monarchist or imperialist monument built by ambition. In the shadow of authority itself, Masonry labored at the great work which has been entrusted to its care. According to their own declarations, the official bulletins of Belgian Masonry manifest a constant concern which the Grand Orient of Belgium has had for the Liberal Party. Outsiders do not realize this. The Liberal Party, which outwardly is the expression of Masonry, must shake itself out of its torpor, says Brother Jacquier at the meeting of January 25th of the Grand Orient of Belgium. Its momentary lethargy is due to a lack of precision in its program. It is necessary to limit this to a brief discussion. The lodges of this great order lent union, force, and direction to the Liberal Party. He continues, in these lodges, liberal ideas are matured and the sessions for the Liberal Congress are prepared. In them resides the possibility of an entente among the heads of liberalism. It is in the lodges that the program for separation of church and state is prepared as well as that of free, compulsory public schools. Also, the suppression of diplomatic representation to the Vatican and the suppression of financial support for religious cults and the support of divorce laws. At the Masonic Congress of Milan in 1881, the eighth resolution, which was put to a vote, reads as follows. The Congress decides that there is an opportunity for the secret organization of the liberal forces of Italy and that the lodges must make a greater effort than ever before to gain a majority in the national representation in Parliament for the benefit of Freemasonry. The tenth resolution adds, in conclusion, the Congress decides that, on the initiative of Masonic authority, it will proceed with the formation of a great anti-clerical party without distinction of political opinion, whose object it will be to combat and destroy clericalism by whatever means there may be. This is the same reason why they make their anti-religious campaigns the name of liberal ideas and principles. Masonry hides its own name in these activities. When the President of Chile returned from Europe in 1925, Masonry of Buenos Aires appointed a Comité Liberal to organize a popular reception and to give him welcome. By means of that committee, all the liberal Argentine elements rendered homage to Mr. Alessandri. The part, latter, on his part, made very conclusive declarations under these circumstances, and his next activity in the government condensed and this formal promise to comply with Masonic and liberal principles, cementing in them the greatness and the glory of the country. I would rather not have written these lines. I feel within myself the confusion which will be felt by many sincere gentlemen who have taken pride in their liberalism and who, without knowing nor wishing to know it, have been following the directions of an occult power unsuspected by them. Those who have been informed instruments of that power will recognize also that the most normal and loyal act toward their co-religionists would have been to work and fight openly. The political concentration of the anti-clerical forces, that is, not only for those of the Liberal Party, but also of the Radical Democratic, the Socialist Parties, has also been an object of preferential attention on the part of the Belgian Grand Orient. Quote, the Liberal Party, on the irresistible impetus of the democratic movement, is urged toward a new political and economic orientation. It is in masonry that it will find its guide and its firm support. At the meeting of February 23, 1902, the most serene Grand Master, Gustavo Reyes, in his opening speech, quote, the Grand Orient has organized this day's meeting to continue the mission to which it has been assigned. The first decision has been to reunite Freemasons of the various political parties to serve the purpose of the final legislative elections. The Masonic fraternity has managed the Masons ably. This enterprise has been crowned with success. Masonry's affinity for the Radical Party has been all too apparent among us. The preferences of the party in the elections and in appointments for public posts, if not in everything else, has been held by the brothers with little advantage to the country and with less honor for the party. The Democrats themselves have announced through the press that they have lost their value and independence by allowing the intervention of Masonry in the direction of the Democratic Party. Later, to avoid repetition, I shall, God willing, show Masonry's contact with the extreme radical parties. Number 79. Political Domination Over Its Members The frequently quoted author Copen Abancelli in his book La Pauvre Occulte devotes an article to the means of coercion used by Masonry to keep Masonic deputies, senators, and ministers under Masonic discipline. I regret that I'm not able to give it here, but through it one sees that there is no other solution. Either the politician obeys the suggestion or mandate of the lodges, or he falls into the oblivion from which they have lifted him. Michel, in his book La Dictature de la France, Macanilla de la France, also devotes another article in which are seen the declarations of the official organ of masonry on this subject. I shall give one or two samples. Quote, the Freemason parliamentarians, who are in a manner of speaking an emanation from the order, must remain as its tributary during their mandate. 
There is a need for them to take as directions the work of the General Assembly and parliamentary affairs throughout the course of which their political life they must bind themselves to the principles which rule us. They must, with an idiom of Parliament, form groups which will work in the best manner for the interests of Masonry. The Grand Orient of Belgium has affirmed categorically the right and the deputy of the lodges to supervise the acts of public life of those of their members whom they have caused to assume public functions, the duty to seek explanations, the duty to accept them with good will when they are satisfactory. On the other hand, they should be reproved if they ever leave something to be desired, and even to cut off from a Masonic body the members who have gravely and voluntarily failed in the duties which their Masonic quality imposes upon them, especially in public life. Let no one envy the liberty which public figures enjoy in Masonry. And in order that one may think that in the United States, where there are so many Masons, things are done differently, I shall conclude with this article quoting the words of Mr. Merritt, Grand Master of Ceremonies, and Worshipful Grand Master, in his reply to the toast of the Great Consistory of California, quote, We maintain that no man or corporation of man has a right to influence our political conduct. We recognize no party. We vote according to the principles of Scottish Rite Masonry, and the man who belongs to the Scottish Rite, and who does not do so, violates all his obligations from the first to the thirty-third, each one of them. I shall make no comment upon the evident contradiction, for it is quite clear between the first affirmation and the last what the speaker means. Enough has been said for the reader to judge the sincerity and honor of the Masonic order as it applies to politics and its statements of ignorance. The first victims of its deceits are always its own members, and, as one may see, the deceptions are obviously intentional. Chapter 4. Masonry and its Ideals of Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity. New Deceit. Number 80. Masonic Liberty. Since in speaking of the objectives of Masonry, Masons take such great pride in fighting for the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Let us see just how much truth and sincerity there is in these statements. We already know that for Masonry, liberty is the absolute freedom from all authority, whether it be gods, the kings, the churches, the parents, or the spouses, etc. Quote, you will be free, it says to its members, if you are priest, king, and god, if you are the adored one as well as the adorer in the temple, as the ancient promise of the serpent to our first parents. A similar liberty is the revolt the rebellion against all authority. If anyone believes that this is an exaggeration, he has only to read the declarations of Masonic authorities already quoted. One must also take into account the Masonic symbolism and the ritual discourses in order to comprehend all the profundity of Masonic liberty. These facts can be seen in Benoit. Anyone might believe, after reading those declarations of Masonry and knowing the continual double talk it makes of the words liberty and liberalism, that the institution allows its members a great deal of liberty. The truth is quite contrary. It is certain that in the sense of libertinism and license in morals, there are many who have learned and who do practice Masonic liberty, living with neither God nor law, just as do many others who are not Masons. The difference lies in that some do so in the name of principles as well as through weakness, the rest only through weakness. But there is no tyranny equal to Masonic tyranny. I myself have heard Masons say that they undergo pressure from the lodges in connection with their business affairs. I have heard others who wish to recover the liberty by withdrawing from the lodges. I have come to know that when a brother has taken the liberty of going to church only perhaps to satisfy his curiosity, shortly thereafter is visited by another brother and reprimanded. I see that to be initiated as a brother and to lose one's religious faith are one and the same thing, because I cannot suppose the serious persons who go to Mass on Sundays can immediately lose their faith upon being initiated, and when they still have not realized the apostasy which that ceremony of initiation implies. Number 81. Political Liberty and Civil Liberties In regard to politicians, from the foregoing, one can see that they are even less free than the rest of the citizens. It is enough to recall the decisions of the Grand Orient of Belgium, and the conclusion at which it arrives that it is necessary to be severe and exorable against those who, rebellious to warning, are guilty of felony, even to the point of support in political life acts which Masonry combats with all its forces, as contrary to its principles and upon which there can be no compromise. Here, then, stands the Brother Mason, who does not even have that liberty which the least of the citizens enjoys. He is denied the infallibility of the Church to recognize an infallibility of which he knows neither what it is nor where it comes from. While the outsider obeys visible, legitimate authorities and laws which he knows, the brother is exposed to being managed, like a small child, according to the caprice of that hidden direction, which, as has been seen in France, takes an active part in politics, makes the head of the nation alternately worshipped or overthrown. Sometimes he is obliged to perform infantile exercises in the lodges. Other times he takes his vows, in which he renounces more even than does a religious entering a monastic order. Quote, I swear to obey without restriction the Masonic constitution as well as the general rules of the order, end quote. The Masons in Chile take this vow while the Minerval of the Illuminists say, quote, I pledge an eternal silence, an inviolable fidelity and obedience to all the superiors and statutes of the order. I renounce completely my own opinions and my own judgments, end quote. On the other hand, since Freemasonry can impose the law, it can also take away those liberties, which are most natural and inviolable, as a liberty of conscience, the right to educate one's children, the right for each man to live in conformity to his own inclinations, provided he does not harm others. In Mexico, for example, wearing ecclesiastical dress, has been forbidden for many years. 
There, as in France and in other countries, religious teaching is prohibited in public schools. In the United States, Masonry has insisted on doing away with private teaching in order to oblige all children to attend public schools. In various countries, Masonry has discredited religious congregations at the same time that it was sheltering all kinds of immoral or subversal associations. It has expelled and persecuted them as it has never persecuted anarchists or subversives anywhere. The liberty which Masonry preaches is, then, another great mystification with which it deceives its own adepts and through which it prepares tyranny toward outsiders and society in general. Masonry knows how to implement the already cited instructions of Weishaupt, quote, let force succeed the invisible empire, bind the hands of all those who resist, subjugate, etc. Those of us who know the power which Masonry exercises in the branch of teaching and of tendency to suppress all freedom pertaining to it, and who know also how much has been done in that sense, will have a firm proof of Masonic liberty. Read now how that liberty was judged by the celebrated Spanish orator and the famous trial which Masonry had brought against La Verdad for supposed slander. Quote, the following is the force that Masonry took in Spain. It served and exploited absolutism, which took away our holy liberties and traditions. It initiated the work of our ruin by placing a sacrilegious hand on our secular organism. It poisoned our laws and customs with the aberrations of encyclopedious royalism and Caesarist dictatorship. It expelled, without any form of justice, motive, or rational pretext, a great number of Spanish teachers of unimpeachable virtue and of great knowledge and killed the light of learning. God alone knows how long it has wounded unto death the liberty, personality, wealth, and grandeur of Spain. Absolutism and masonry formed an alliance, and never before was the decadence of our country so frightful. Never before did depression and dejection reach such a point as in the past century under the power of absolution and of masonry. Number 82. Masonic Equality Anyone, upon hearing that word equality, repeated as enthusiastically as the other two, would believe that is practiced with complete perfection within masonry as well as toward outsiders. The facts of the matter are quite to the contrary. Quote, from the very initiation itself, the initiated brother is made to believe that in masonry all are equals, save for the distinction of office or position, and yet there is not any other association in which there is, no, there is more inequality. The Masonic companions, masters, or those of high degrees, call the apprentice brother of only three years, who is initiated only into the society of masonry children, and this society, although forming a part of the Masonic societies of high degrees, not only is beneath them all, but, what is much more important, it is penetrated and dominated by all of them. The apprentices, one may say, not enter any part of the Masonic temple if it is not in a certain part which has been assigned to them. Assigned, we say, not reserved, because they cannot close the door to the Mason of the higher degrees. The latter come and go as they please in the meetings of the apprentices, just as teachers can come and go in the various classes of the schools where they give courses. These are the words of an ex-Mason. The same thing happens to those of the lesser degrees in respect to the higher degrees. They do not know their secrets, they cannot attend their meetings, and they are constantly spied upon and watched without their realizing it which places them in a worse condition than school children, who at least know who watches them. The Catholic Church, accused by Masonry of maintaining inequality among men, teaches that before God all men are equal, and indeed all we Catholics have the same doctrine. There is no secret doctrine. We can all approach the same Eucharistic table, that is, we can all take part in the most elevated act of religion we profess. In Masonry, the Masons of the lower degrees are nothing more than the plaything of the superior degrees, especially the most occult, where they would be surprised at the degree of human stupidity which allows one to be attracted with the bait of a secret which is never revealed and that without insisting upon the distinction which they make between the servant brothers and the other members of the order. Number 83. Masonic Fraternity Fraternity, or brotherhood, is the other device whereby masonry diffuses around itself an atmosphere of sympathy, especially among those who need to be encouraged in life. That fraternity has, as it has been said, a double significance, that of erasing all differences of family, country, nationality, religion, rights, etc., and that of mutual protection among the masons. I do not deny that this fraternity may be exercised among brothers and that it may be a legitimate right that of seeking mutual aid through association, but provided that is within certain limits, provided that it is not against the rights which by natural equity belong to a third party, or that they do not cause injury to society, to the nation, or to individuals. Thus, for example, who will deny that the preference in promotion granted to Masons in the French army caused grave harm to this military force and placed the entire nation in great peril? That in the last war, guided by the instinct of conservation, the French government kept displacing inept military chiefs which Masonry had elevated and calling back to the Catholic heads who had been pushed aside. Thanks to that tactic, the country was saved? Who will deny that the preference toward Masons and their appointments to public positions has caused everywhere great defalcations and the exchequer, as well as great injustice to individuals? It would be interesting to read the history of the question of the tobacco scandal in which were involved the Worshipful Master Crispi and the Delegate Supreme Grand Commander Adriano Lemmi, Grand Master of Italian Masonry in 1890. There were 300 Masons in the chamber. The total number of deputies was 504. The deputy Imbriano asked that an investigation be opened. The Masonic deputies viewed that this is an alternative of either good Masons or good deputies, and in order to be a good Mason and to help a brother in distress, they denied the investigation and saved Brother Crispy and the Honorable Grand Master Lemmy. Margiota submitted the data on this matter. Here's the way Mason Fisher judged the Brotherhood, fighting the introduction of the higher degrees. 
Quote, the constitution of these degrees is always the same and is as dangerous as before. Where the degree followed upon degrees, where the bond is stronger and there are fewer members and it unites, where there is no responsibility nor control, but grandiose methods and powerful influence where a blind obedience can be demanded, where one has the right to come and say to the others in the lodges that they do not grasp the matter, nor have a sufficiently complex complete intelligence nor experience to be able to judge the association competently. Here the inferiors are no more than blind and passive instruments. Here there is no more fraternity. The brothers are toward the superiors like a child of two is to man of thirty years. Who is the brother capable of judging the abuse which one can make of authority when he yields himself up violently to it, thus giving it a new strength with the best intentions in the world? Number 84. Fraternity dangerous to justice and to the army. The mason has sworn promise to help a brother under any circumstance. Quote, two parties await his decision, one of them known as belonging to the lodge. The sentence is given. He who is not initiated waits with distrust. The brother Mason has fulfilled his promise to the brother Mason, and rightly or wrongly, the uninitiated turn his back contemptuously. Oh, that it were only in Germany where one could make a similar reflection and manifest those fears of partiality. In the debate, which took place in our Chilean chamber over Masonry and the army, there was read some interesting data on the scandalous question of the index cards in the French army, called the scandal of the Fichet a system whereby masonry promoted its own military masons, conceding to them all possible favors and hindering those who were not their own and denied them any favors. The interpolation which was made in the Chamber of Deputies for this reason is worth reading, especially when it dealt with the punishment imposed on Colonel Quinemont, quote, who as head of regiment possessed the finest standards of service, who had been made a second lieutenant on the field of battle at Morsbrunn, and who had not ceased to be an irreproachable soldier. Why was he placed in reserve? Because he had just been punished a uh, prevaricating officer, and the officer was a brother, and masonry avenged him. Quote, between a prevaricator and heroic soldier, ended the interpolant, addressing masonry, you have hesitated, you have wounded the heroic soldier, and you have protected the thief. This matter of interference, which masonry used in France to do its work, is one of the most repugnant and vile which, especially for the military, there could ever be. From a book which the English general, Sir Francis Howard, published in 1924, there was printed in the January 31st issue of La Union of Valparaiso, an article entitled Masonry in the English Army, in which the general, in spite of not noting that English masonry is only an institution of charity, Nevertheless, its interference in the army has given rise to lamentable abuses, and as a sample, he published the following charge of a sergeant. Quote, the consequences this may bring me are unimportant, but for the good of the regiment, I must say that frauds are being perpetrated in the mess halls of the non-commissioned officers. Liquor is sold after hours and in much greater quantities than one would imagine from the accounts. Unfortunately, the officers in charge of the mess halls are all masons, and although many officers and soldiers realize the evil that exists, they dare not say or do anything for fear of antagonizing or being attacked by a group of masons. The same thing is happening in other regiments, and if it is not stopped, it is going to destroy the discipline of the entire garrison. Would to God that this horrible gangrene will not undermine our own glorious army? The internal fraternity, fraternity of masonry usually leads to these extremes among its own, and these are also signs of the fraternity which it exercises toward outsiders, which, unfortunately and to our shame, are beginning to be stamped on the great press of the country and to be suspected all around. I shall add also that I have never been more fierce hatred than that born in the lodges against the unfortunates who fall into disgrace. I remember especially two cases which took place in Inquique during the time I lived there. Number 85. The best samples of Masonic liberty, equality, and fraternity. It has already been seen that Masonry was mistress in France during the French Revolution, as it has ultimately been before the war, according to the confession of Masons themselves. They have had, then, the opportunity to manifest to the world the realization of the sublime ideals proclaimed by Christianity. See what they have done in the name of that formula? There have been established, so to speak, in a legal manner, plundering, conflagration, banishment, and murder. Only three short years after its proclamation, the ideal or revolutionary fraternity ended with ignoble killings in the prisons. Yes, three years had been enough to produce that atrocious transfiguration. One year later, the reign of terror was inaugurated, thousands of corpus, corpses staining France with blood. In four years, the destruction of the true Christian spirit and its replacement with the spirit of which we speak had as a consequence the establishment of the most frightful tyranny which history has ever known. In order to explain how the revolutionary fraternity could bite so fiercely into human flesh, people have sought reasons, but they have found only irrationality. It has been said that the principles were adulterated by the obstacles which opposed them. Christianity, Christianity found them too, but for that reason did not turn into a destroyer of humanity. Christians died, they did not kill. Undoubtedly, there were obstacles. There always are to anything that is done, but it is this very thing for which we reproach the revolutionaries, that of having been so easily led astray. They were led astray in 1789, in 1871, and now and always. Tane says that there were nearly a half million victims of the terror in the 11 western provinces alone. We know now that the revolutionaries saw clearly that the population could not continue to exist, and they were determined to reduce it. Corte, in referring to some papers discovered in the house of Robespierre, speaks of a plan to annihilate some 12 or 15 million Frenchmen. 
One of the Illuminists, Urakas Bebuf, said that the depopulation was indispensable. Pradholm assured that the terror was a part of a plan of depopulation conceived by Marat and Robespierre. Carrier, one of the instruments of the reign of terror, said, let us make a cemetery of France if we are not to regenerate her in our own way. Reference is made by Lorian Lipio that Jean Bonsant André had stated that in order to establish securely the Republic in France, the population had to be reduced by half. And those killings were without discernment. The modern analysis of the names of the victims show that were not, they were not principally aristocrats, but rather taken from the poor and obscure people of humble professions. During the reign of terror, the priests, in order to celebrate mass, had to hide in the woods to wait for the shadows and the silence of night. Such was liberty. If he was discovered, he was shot or guillotined by the ruling fraternity. When masonry again came into power at the beginning of this century, it put into practice its ideals in reverse. French citizens were expelled from the country for the crime of wearing a cassock in a religious congregation. Blessed liberty! Those who taught the Christian doctrine were prepared to do so, while even the anarchists could preach their divisive doctrines without interruption. Blessed fraternity and equality. Only the religious congregations could not own a house in France. Number 86. What Masonry Vehemently Desires Among Us What has been done in France and Mexico and Portugal under Masonry is what they long to do here in Chile. Lists have already been made of the properties of the Church. After the arrival of a Mason of high degree, M. Matinench, who came to awaken the Chilean lodges from the inertia in which they seemed to live, there were frequently heard wishes to expel foreign priests from this country, where foreigners from all parts are able to come without difficulty, even those who come to preach subversive ideas. It is unnecessary to speak of liberty and equality in teaching, or of the distribution of public offices. All the country knows what is happening. Masonic liberty, equality, and fraternity are, then, one of the most mystification, one more deception, most cruel at times, with which masonry deceives the outside world, as it deceives its own members. Number 87. Masonic Humanitarianism. Since masonry has it so much on its lips, it will not be excessive to say a few words on this idea, although, after what has already been said, it may seem redundant. Humanitarianism is the expression of the idea of absolute equality, of the suppression of class distinction, of brotherhood among races, religious, and conditions of men. Beautiful utopia, unrealized on earth or in heaven itself, where each will receive a reward according to his own merit. But this idea is very useful on earth, where people allow themselves to be deceived so easily, especially when an idea flatters or consoles them. Notice that the thoughts of Fichte, quote, the word humanity is one of the most famous of the words which can so, be so easily abused to describe human perversion. With a strange, sublime, and brilliant sound, this word attracts attention, but basically it enveloped the listener in the darkness of ignorance. Shudorov, who has devoted himself essentially to the dogma of humanity and its Masonic quality, later paints for us, Humanity is a vague thing, so that every lodge that proposes it as an objective takes up an insoluble problem and is lost in a vain undertaking. Who can give us a better idea of Masonic humanitarianism than the famous Baron Nogi, the right arm of Weishaupt, who, under the pseudonym of Thelon, had such a thorough acquaintance with the management of the lodges. After saying that he does not know any lodge that is not guilty of some of the evils engendered and those which he points out, he adds, Do not initiate anyone before having been well instructed yourself. Do not be blinded by deceptive appearances, by seductive promises, by plans, most flattering to the good of humanity, by the affectation by which disinterest will be shown outwardly as cleanliness of actions and purity of intentions. We seek proof of them in their deeds. By the fruits you shall know them, the divine master had said, speaking of those who appear to do good for humanity by means of their doctrines. Chapter 5. Masonry and its idea of morality. Number 88. What it says of itself. The Masonic doctor Mackey says, in a frequently quoted definition, that Masonry is a science of morality veiled in allegories and illustrated by symbols. In the first article of the Masonic Constitution, we are told that the Masonic order has its object of beneficence, the study of universal morality and the practice of all virtues. The International Masonic Congress of Geneva, 1912, among the principles of the International Masonic Association, established that Freemasonry has its object the investigation of truth, the study and practice of morality. It is then of paramount interest to become acquainted with Masonic morality. Number 89. Brief Explanation but the reader note carefully what I say Masonic morality and not the morality of Masons. I frequently said that there are in Masonry many sincere men who know nothing or almost nothing of Masonry, who are only superficially initiated into its secrets and its doctrines, who do not live Masonically, although they do not live according to the tenets of Christianity either. I do not speak, then, of the morality of Masons in general, or in particular, except of those who live in conformity with the Masonic doctrines. Number 90. Basis of Morality Beyond Our Grasp It is impossible to determine the moral principles which Masonry teaches, and the reason for this is very simple. It is not a morality based on the Christian religion, on Buddhism, on Mohammedism, on any particular religion, since Masonry regards all these to bring together men of all religions. Neither is it a religion founded on deism or a reasonable knowledge of God, since it has denied God as the supreme being who is separate from man and superior to him. Therefore, to have a morality which fulfills the exegesis of Christian and of the materialists, of the Buddhists, and of the Mohammedan is simply impossible. Nevertheless, 
Masonry affirms that it is devoted to the study of universal morality and the practice of all virtues. What is that marvelous morality which can reconcile all religious creeds? It is impossible for an outsider, such as I, to imagine it or conceive of it. Number 91. The end justifies the means. Let us speak the truth. One thing finds, certainly and plainly, when one searches Masonic morality, not only in doctrinal declarations, which are inclined to be very fallacious, but in practice. The method of procedure adopted by Masonry is this. The end justifies the means. Masonry usually attributes to the Jesuits that principle or norm of morality. In this, it only confirms the fact that it, that it lies and that it is Masonry itself which follows this norm. Not many years ago, there was a challenge accepted by the Catholics from those who attributed this morality to them in Germany, if I am not mistaken, by risking a considerable number of francs on the part of those who lost. A jury was named, the works of the Jesuit moralists were diligently examined, and none was that doctrine found, and all it was found to be condemned. So it cannot help but be, having been so clearly condemned by St. Paul the Apostle, who said, quote, and not rather, as we are slandered, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that there may come good, whose damnation is just. Romans 3.8. It is then calumny to infer that the Jesuits are employing a norm, current, and masonry. La Savita Catholica gave an account of that challenge. The constitution of the Jesuits prescribe obedience to superiors, but with the limitation that no sin is seen in what they order. Ubi non seratur peccatum. Between obeying only that which is lawful and to no superiors, as the Jesuits do, and obeying unknown superiors or heads, as it is prevalent in masonry and all they order, there is a difference between that which is moral and holy and that which is immoral and impious. Number 92. Evidence at hand. The doctrine. In order not to see a calumniator, also I am going to give proofs, not only in declarations, but especially in practice, that morality follows as a consequence. Among the first, Weishaupt, the famous chief of the Illuminists, in the instruction which is given to an initiate in the degree of Magian, after calling for him all that has been done before to arouse him, says to him, quote, Remember that the end justifies the means, that the discreet person must take for good all means which the wicked person uses for evil. Those which we have used are nothing more than a pious fraud, etc. In the same sect of the Illuminists, the novices ask these questions as well as the others. Second question. Have you thought maturely about the important step into which you are venturing, about taking unknown commitments? Sixth question. If you were to discover in the orders something evil or just to be done, what part would you take? Twelfth question. Are you ready to give, on any occasion, preference to members of our order over all other men? Twentieth question. Do you bind yourself to absolute unreserved obedience? The reply is suggested in the questions, and the archives of the order present the protocol of the reception of two novices. One of them responds to the sixth question, quote, I would do even those things, evil or unjust, if the order commanded me to. And he gives this reason. Quote, even though they could be unjust under another aspect, they cease to be as soon as they become a means of arriving at happiness and of obtaining general welfare. Quote, of all the detestable principles of the Luminous, said Ruhner, in his legal deposition, the most detestable, in my opinion, is this. The end justifies the means. According to this morality, and according to its faithfully followed practice, it is sufficient to slander a man of good character on the supposition that one day he could propose obstacles to the plans of the order. They will plot to drag him from his position. They will murder another, in short. They will do everything that leads them to their great objective. In the same vein, various other legal depositions were made which can be seen in Benoit. Speaking of the Carbonaris, John Vitt, who had reached the degree of sovereign, patriarch prince, said, quote, All means toward the exec execution of their plans, the destruction of all religion, and of all positive government, are permitted. Murder, poison, false testimony, it is all at their disposal. In the statutes of the Universal Humanitarian Alliance, one reads, quote, Kings, nobles, the aristocracy of wealth, employees of the police or of the administration, priests and the regular armies are the enemies of humankind. Against them, one has all rights and all duties. Everything is permitted to annihilate them. Violence and intrigue, fire and iron, poison and dagger. The end sanctifies the means. There can be seen several other testimonies taken from the same statutes or Masonic catechism cited by Benoit. In conformity with those moral doctrines, Adriano Lemmy, in the secret speech already quoted, said that he was taking advantage of that circumstance to recall that, quote, the means are legitimate, which permit the brothers to make money for their propaganda. That which is not always said, with all the crudeness and clarity of the declarations quoted above, and of others which I have omitted in favor of brevity, it is inculcated in other equally efficacious ways. Quote, in all the Masonic institutions, the initiate is taught from the very first degrees that he can never, under any pretext, reveal anything of what he has seen or heard, or of what he will hear or see in the lodges. It is added that he is not bound by any of his previous commitments contrary to his new duties as a Mason. It is declared implicitly that he will be obliged to do that which is unjust, or to violate his most sacred obligations. Quote, in the majority of the institutions, he who is going to be received swears to execute promptly and perfectly all the mandates which may be given to him by his superiors, and even to renounce his own point of view and his own judgment to follow the conduct which may be pointed out to him. This is not making a promise to do evil just as much as good. Number 93. Proof of the deeds. Current lies. Calumnies. A philosophical adage says that, quote, against deeds there is no argument. If any doubt remain concerning Masonry's application of that norm of morality, the end justifies the means, the deeds. 
The constant practice would dispel all doubt. In order not to lengthen this work, I shall reduce these deeds to three categories. The lie, whether it be in the form of simple lies or in the form of hypocrisy or calumny. Crime, in the form of attempts against individuals or against society, in the form of revolts, sedition, etc. And indecency and licentiousness, authorized and elevated even to the category of a cult or cult ceremony. Although on account of what is being said, there is almost no necessity to point it out. Nevertheless, in order that Masonic morality may appear with even greater clarity, I shall add something to that which has already been said. Of course, Masonry not only deceived those who it wished to conquer, as has already been proved, but it also deceived those already under its authority. Quote, the blue degrees, says Dr. Mackey, are but the outer court or portico of the temple. A part of the symbols are explained there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he understand them, but rather that he imagine that he understands them. Their true interpretation is reserved for the adept, the princes of Masonry. Masonry, says Pike, like all religions, all mysteries, hermeticism, and alchemy, hides its secrets from all, except the adept and sages or the elect, and uses false explanations and representations of its symbols to deceive those worthy of being deceived. Thus, Masonry jealously hides its secrets and intentionally misleads its presumed interpreters. And speaking of the way in which initiates are deceived about religions, Nagy Philon says in his, says in his letter to Katon Zwak, quote, In our last mysteries, we have, of course, to reveal this prize fraud to the adepts, showing by the writings the origin of all the deceitful religions. In the statutes of the sect of the Illuminists, one reads, quote, You will have, as a constant principle among us, the rule that frankness is not a virtue, except before superiors. Apply yourselves to the art of falsification, secrecy, disguise, observing others to penetrate their interior. This was one of the instructions of Weishaupt. Quote, lying, said Voltaire, is not a vice except when it does evil. It is a great virtue when it does good. Be then more righteous than ever before. It is necessary to die like a devil, not timidly, not a little at a time, but audaciously, always. Lie, lie, my friends. I shall pay you for it when the time comes. If I had one hundred thousand men, he said, on another occasion, I know what I do, but since I do not have them, I shall take communion on the holy day, and you will call me a hypocrite as long as you wish. Quote, let us guard against expressing ourselves clearly, said one high mason of Medina, before having recognized well the disposition and strength of character of the aspirant. If we do not find it solid enough, we must at once launch a new attack by force of astuteness and skill to give a more favorable turn, to weaken or lessen the force of each term, until we successfully dissimulate our intention. Liberty, equality, we must say. They apply only to society, without thinking or spreading any further. One does not deal with revolt, with independence, with withdrawal of all authority. Everything must be cleverly metaphor posed in an instant. There are no duties to fulfill, no God to recognize, no virtues to practice, no inviolable submission and fidelity to observe in respect to all authority. It is necessary to know how to incense and to adore the Colossus, which crushes us, in order to work more securely towards its ruin. The Baron Nagy, already quoted, gave, among other advice, this, to avoid the dangers of secret societies, by pointing out the following, quote, And, if in spite of having taken these precautions you are tired of the order, if you are grieving over your initiation, draw away without noise or commotion. If you wish to escape persecution, never say a word about what you have seen and heard. But if, in spite of your reserve, you are not left alone, show yourself openly for the edification of others. Expose to the public eye the madness, the imposure, and the perversity of these associations. Are the counsels of the High Mason fulfilled in practice? Is the imposture of which King speaks carried on? See what is said by the ex-Mason, Copan Abincelli. Quote, Although French Masonry, like all the others, may have begun by calling itself spiritualistic and deistic, actually, it has always tended to work upon the consecration of atheists and materialists. Although it is announced as its teachings, and while it believed that it had an interest in it, that is working for the glory of the grand architect of the universe, it has hastened to deny this when it felt free of all pressure. Although it persists in proclaiming liberty of conscience, it does not now wish to affirm its existence, nor even that there be a pronounced the name of the grand architect, whom its affiliates used to adore rhythmically at another time. Although it affirms its respect for all religious faith, it wages a fanatical war against the Catholic faith. In short, although it may have declared that it is not concerned with politics, it has twice been in power, once during the Revolution, and now, 1910, showing its spirit of tolerance, at times by mass murders in the prisons and out of them, at times by prescriptions, persecutions, and the monopoly on teaching, which it proposes to establish for its own exclusive benefit. I shall not underestimate the calumnies which here, in this very place, Chile, where it was so easy to destroy them, but which the press inspired by masonry has invented against the clergy, without there ever having been an honorable contradiction. How many of this type have there been in all places? How many have become history, like those invented to ring about the suppression of the Society of Jesus, after having committed against its members all types of scurrilous criticism. When the Eucharistic Congress of Maltranial was about to be celebrated, this Congress, which on the account of the numbers of the faithful and their further, has been perhaps the greatest of all, them all, Masonry really planned to ruin it by raising slanders against the clergy. Fortunately, the machination was found out, the blow was foreseen, and the infamous plan was destroyed. How many other calumnies are there, such as that of the secret cunning of the Jesuits, which Masonry has taken a special care to divulge and maintain? 
In the already quoted The Book of Red and Yellows, the author, among the points which he indicates that his going to deal with and to prove, marks with the number eight the following, quote, in order to bring about all these things, murders, outrages, sacrilege, etc., with some show of reason, they, the revolutionaries, have published the most vile lies against the church and against the clergy. We already know that masonry was the guiding spirit of that revolution. I shall close with the resume which Monsignor Rosé makes concerning the lie of masonry. Quote, in the campaign which has undertaken against the clergy, religious congregations, and Christian teaching, it employs equivocation, hypocrisy, lies, calumny. It uses them all. It makes history a lie. It makes monuments lie. It makes science lie. It makes poetry lie. It makes everything lie. It is the conspiracy of the universal lie against charity, justice, and truth. Number 94. Violence and Venom. The reading of the Masonic ritual shows, at least in several degrees, that it prepares its members for vengeance, revolution, and therefore for crime. Quote, in all the rites, says Benoit, the Masons are exposed to an education which teaches them, in theory and in practice, violence. They are told that the Masonic order has an objective, the revenge of the death of Haram by his three treacherous companions, or the murder of Jacques de Molay by the Pope, the kind, and Nafadai. There is one degree where he, who is about to be initiated, tests his bravery over neck and heads, decorated with entrails full of blood, in another degree. He, who is about to be received, must knock down heads, place upon a serpent, or even slaughter a lamb, 30th degree of the Scottish Rite, A.A., thinking that he is killing a man. Here he must be locked in bloody combat with enemies who contest his return to the fatherland. There are human heads displayed on pikes. There is a cadaver enclosed in a casket, and all around the brothers is mourning. Proclaim vengeance. Quote, These various ceremonies have the object of teaching the initiates that it is by means of violence that masonry is to destroy its enemies, the priests and the kings, and to make humanity return to the state of nature. Quote, For the same reason, as is advised, that all members of young Italy be armed with a dagger, a gun, and fifty cartridges, and in all the lodges, as we have noted, there are unsheathed swords, daggers, and all kinds of articles of battle. In short, in order to make all brothers' instruments ready to execute the crimes, in order to have in them the docile executors of the schemes planned by invisible criminals, it is demanded that each new member, upon his entrance into the order, and at the reception of a new degree, be bound by execrable oaths, that he swear in absolute obedience to unknown chiefs, and be committed under horrible penalties to do whatever may be commanded. In truth, if one wished to make murders, we shall say, with an author of the last century, would one work in any other way to accustom them to the horrors of death, and to make them stifle the remorse of a conscience, which would be capable of being distressed? Oh, if in the Church of God one were to find even a trace of this system of violence, how great would be the outburst of indignation! If the Society of Jesus were to manifest only traces of those dark oaths, what declamations would result? But those atrocious oaths, those dismal tests, those displays of axes and of daggers belong to masonry. One is not indignant, and is almost tempted to consider it irreproachable. In the sect of Martinism, one comes to swear to respect aqua tofana, a poison containing opium and the cantharides, which produce a weakening and a decline which lead irremediably to death. One swears to look upon it as a sure, swift, and necessary means to purge the land by death or torture of those who try to revile the truth or to snatch it from the hands of those masons. And the teaching of crime is in truth a practice to judge by which the ex-mason, Yeriel Kanamari, wrote to Lemni in 1871, upon retiring from masonry, quote, one must not think that masonry scorns us because we are small. No, masonry has irons, calumny, and venom for everyone. In the house and in the villa of the defunct Grand Master of Masonry, Jose Petroni, there was made a double order of theocratic practical studies of mineral, vegetable, and animal toxicology. Specialist in the culture of the Tomains was the Grand Master adjunct Raphael Petroni, and in Rome there are persons who can testify to it as we can. As science of Kabbalism and the Order of the Illuminists, which was invaded the Masonic dominions of the masonry of the European continent, Webster points out that among the papers discovered by the government of Bavaria, there was, quote, a list of receipts for procuring abortion, for making aphrodisiacs, aqua tofana, pestilential vapors, etc., headed Kabbalah Major. But has all this preparation for crime served at some time to commit it? The authors who have written on masonry cite several instances, classified as treasons, as suicides ordered by the lodges, and as individual assassinations, as killings, summary executions and sackings, seditions, wars, revolutions, and terror. Within the plan which I propose and the space which I have, I cannot give all this in detail. It can be seen in Dom Benoit, La Franc Macaneria, or in Senya. Nevertheless, I shall give some extracts of what these authors say. Number 95. Punishment or Prevention of Treason All know of the murder of Rossi, minister of Pius IX, by his former brothers of the Carbonari. All know that Orsini was charged by the lodges in 1858 to make attempts on the life of Napoleon III, accused of infidelity to his oaths, that, from that time, the sectarians never ceased to obtain from him new concessions with threats against his life. In the last century, the knight Lescure, who sought to renounce the Ermonville Lodge, was poisoned. Quote, I die a victim of this infamous horde of the Illuminists, he said to his friend, the Marquis of Montreuil. In 1883, four Italians, Emiliani, Scoriati, Lanchonesci, and Andriani, members of Young Italy and refugees in France, were denounced to Mazzini and his accomplices as guilty. 
First, of having propagated writings against the Holy Society. Second, of being parties to the infamous papal government. Some were chiefs gathered in Marseille under the leadership of Mazzini, and without hearing the accused, without giving them a defense, they condemned Emiliani Scariati to the penalty of death, Manoscelli and Andriani to be scourged with whips. As the condemned men were sheltered in Rodez, the court added to the sentence the following decree. The president of Rodez will elect four executors of the present sentence, who will be charged with it in the regular term of 20 days. He who refuses will incur the penalty of death, ipso facto. The sentence was executed. Quote, when the French Revolution was working through its emissaries in all of Europe and preparing those numerous treasons which were to serve even more than the valor of the French soldiers to obtain victories and to conquer provinces, the Brabantine Segre sent to Portugal to foment a conspiracy, but discovered, arrested, and imprisoned, received from his brother Masons a mattress with the announcement that enclosed a razor. The sectarian understood the mute language of his chiefs. Soon he was found in a mattress swimming in his own blood. When almost at the same time the court of Vienna discovered that famous conspiracy to Simonville, directed by the clubs of Paris ready to overthrow the Austrian monarchy. Many sectarians committed suicide in order to escape the interrogation. In Wichtel's work, White from Marais, World Masonry, the suicide of Rudolf, heir to the Austrian throne, is attributed to the same origin. The prince had contracted with the order certain promises which he did not dare to fulfill. He had to commit suicide. The tragedy of Meierling, in which he and the Baroness Marie of Batsera killed themselves because the father did not consent to the marriage, is a clever invention of masonry. John Orth, Archduke of Tuscany, had to flee in order to avoid the same fate. The forest keeper, Wolf, who they obliged to swear to maintain secrecy until death, was murdered mysteriously in 1919. The emperors, Joseph II and Leopold II, both Masons, were obliged to take steps against Masonry. Both died unexpectedly. The assassin of the last was the brother Cologne, designated for it by the Jacobian government of France. Francis II, son of Leopold, escaped the same fate which Masonry had decreed for him. On October 22, 1916, Count Zurg, Chancellor of Austria was murdered. Fritz Adler, the assassin, was a Mason and the son of a Mason and member of a lodge of high Masonic dignitaries in Switzerland. In his testimony, he defended the right for himself to do justice. The lodges of France decreed death sentences for William I, Bismarck, and Mulks, and offered a million francs for each head. There were attempts to assassinate William I, but their origin has not been proved. In France, on the occasion of the Dreyfus Affair, the following were murdered. Captain Dertel, who testified against him, Deputy Chaugen Savinier, who had received from a detail the details of the confession of Dreyfus, the prefect, Lorenzo, who could denounce sums of money sent from abroad to the friends of Dreyfus, as an opinion as a bribe, the employee of the garrison, Rocher, who claimed to have heard Dreyfus partially confess his crime, Captain Valerio, one of the witnesses against Dreyfus, and President Boré, who had declared himself contrary to the provision of the trial, also appeared shortly thereafter. All the defenders of Dreyfus were Masons, primarily Jews. In Sweden, Hermann Gustavi III was murdered by Brother Ankerstrom, emissary of the Grand Lodge over which presided Concordiat, according to the agreement of Masons gathered in 1786 at Frankfurt on Main. Oscar II of Norway had better luck. The Lodge of Karlstad made the resolution only to dethrone him, and it was carried out. The king was a Mason also. In Russia, they murdered Peter I, a Mason, who, knowing the danger of the Brotherhood, prohibited it strictly. The same fate, and for the same reason, befell his son, Alexander I, murdered in Taganrod, 1825. The murderers were all Masons. 96. Murderers of Outsiders In France, the death of Louis XVI is attributed to them. Cardinal Mathieu, Archbishop of Bescanon, and Monsignor Basson, Bishop of Nimes, have referred in letters known by everyone to the revelations which have been made to them concerning the resolution made in 1787 by the Convention of Wilhelmsbad to murder Louis XVI and the King of Sweden. These revelations had been made to them by two former members of that convention. The murder of the Duke of Berry, of the great patriot and ardent Catholic of Lucerne, Switzerland, Lou, had been resolved and executed by sectarians. In Austria, the famous crime of Sarajevo, cause of the Great War, was decreed, announced with anticipation, and executed in time by masonry. A high Masonic dignitary of Switzerland expressed himself in the year 1912 on this matter in the following way, quote, The hare is a person of great talent, a pity that he is condemned. He will die on the way to the throne. Madame Thiem's announced his death two years before it took place. The principal culprits were all masons. All this, says Wichtel, is not a supposition, but judicially proved facts which are intentionally silenced. The murder of Emperor Franz Joseph was attempted, but it failed. The instigator was the brother of William Oberdunk, who, in whose honor the name of Masons Udine and Trius have formed a new lodge bearing his name. The end of Maximilian, his brother, Emperor of Mexico, is known by all. He had been condemned to death by a revolutionary tri tribunal in 1867. After his execution, Juarez, a high Masonic dignitary, assumed the presidency. In Germany, on July 30, 1918, Marshal Eckhorn and his adjutant, Captain von Dressler, were murdered. The day before, La Matin, the Masonic Daily of Paris, wrote that a secret patriotic society had offered a large reward for the head of Eckhorn. One can imagine what kind of society would submit them notice to La Matin. 
In Italy, Umberto I was murdered by the anarchist Pressi, a mason of the lodge in Patterson, New Jersey, USA. Even though he himself had not been in America, two brothers of the lodge agreed to carry out the murder. Thus was put in practice the explanation which, in certain degrees, the Carbonari gave to the inscription of the cross, INRI, Justum Nicare Regis Italia, it is right to murder the kings of Italy. On March 26, 1855, the Duke Carlos III was murdered in Parma. The assassin, Antonio Cara, had been chosen and encouraged by Lemmy the day before in a secret meeting presided over by Lemmy, who was later sovereign grandmaster of Italian and apparently of world masonry. A certain Lippi had prepared a mannequin to teach the dealings of the most terrible dagger thrusts, and the executor was selected. On May 22nd, Ferdinand II of Naples died. He was given poison and a slice of melon, which caused him a horribly painful death. The author of this regicide was a Freemason affiliated with one of the most criminal branches of the sect, one called the Sublime Perfect Masters. He was a disciple of Mazzini and one of the most respectable people in the court. Margiotta does not dare to give his mane. In this author's work, one can read of many more crimes committed by masonry in Italy. The Portugal, King Carlos and his son Luis were married, weren't murdered. The masons prepared the fall of the monarchy. A worshipful Grand Master H. Malgahes de Lima went to Paris in December of 1907, where the brother Moses, a member of the Council of the Grand Lodge, received him solemnly. Magalhães gave lectures in which he announced, quote, the collapse of the monarchy in Portugal and the next constitution of the republic. The known adversary of masonry, Agé Tormentin, wrote that then the masons were manifestly preparing a blow against the royal house of Portugal, expressing the fear that within a short while King Carlos would be dethroned or murdered. Ten weeks later, his fears were fulfilled, and Tormentin publicly and openly accused the masons of that murder. The latter have preferred silence. In the United States, Eckert brings out certain details of the persecution and of the murder of which million William Morgan was a victim because of his intention to publish a book to reveal the secrets of masonry and the destruction of the print and persecution of the printer and other odious offenses which happened to the victim. Public indignation resulted when it was discovered that the authorities, masons for the most part, had given considerable support to the murderers and that the lodges, too, had given their approval. Well known also is the murder of President of Ecuador, Grazia Moreno. When this masonic crime was brought up in the Chilean Chamber of Deputies, one of the lawyers of the order objected to the declarations of one of the murders by the unique declaration, quote, I swear to it, and I must be believed. See how Nocidal describes in his famous discourse already cited the responsibility of masonry for that crime. After telling that Garcia Moreno had liberated his country from anarchy and barbarity and from the clause of the lodges, and that these published in Europe and America resulted in horrible calumnies against him, he continues, quote, But as the grateful people loved him and hated his calumniators, twice the lodges to no avail decreed his death, of the three attempts, there were more or less veiled announcements in the Masonic and Jewish newspapers of Europe, and one of them it stated that it could be only rid of him by an unexpected and providential happening. But the attempt had failed, and the newspapers of New Granada had published the news in advance when they believed that the act had been carried out, telling us if it had taken place all the details which had been combined and plotted. The third time he was condemned to die by the high Masonic powers, who then resided in Germany. Germany. The Independence Belge announced one day after, with admirable precision, that within three or four months, there would take place in Ecuador, things of which the whole world would talk. Through all Europe ran the news of the decree of the lodges. In Ecuador, people talked of nothing else for months before the deed, and it was known in what traitorous and perfidious legation the murders were gathered. Their names were suspected, even though it was not possible to give proof, nor even to have entire certainty that they were assassins chosen and paid by the lodges. Garcia Moreno wrote himself to Pius IX, bidding him farewell, aware that the American lodges, incited by the Germans, were going to murder him. The man who had rid Ecuador of the evil of the Masons was not afraid to stop the dagger which lurked treacherously for him in the shadows, nor even to know from where it was to strike his breast. The day before the crime, they advised him that the crime was to be committed shortly, that he should take precautions, that he should surround himself with guards, and he replied, And who will rid me of the guards if they are those brought to strike me? When by writing or by words they advised him of new indications or signs that the decree of the lodges was to be fulfilled, that he should take precautions, he would answer, quote, One only can I take, and I have taken it. That is to give myself up to God and to prepare myself to die in a Christian manner. And, in fact, one day on, which he received communion in the morning, preparing himself for death, upon leaving the cathedral where he had adored Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament, he fell wounded in the shoulder by a machete and riddled with bullets by the assassins from the lodges. The wretch who first wounded him treacherously roared upon seeing him fall, Die, scourge of liberty, that is, of liberty, of evil, and of crime. And the avenger and martyr of Christian rites fell exclaiming, quote, God does not die. It would be interminable if I wished to recall all those murders of which history makes masonry guilty, if indeed I can scarcely do it with some others, and certain others I cannot ignore because of the interest they hold for the reader. Be outside of what which is known with some certainty, or is it judicially evident, how many other mysterious deaths, unexpected and unexplained, can be attributed to masonry as their only possible explanation? Here, even in, in Quiqueway, I have heard of one or two cases which inspired suspicions because of their coincidence pointing directly to Brother Masons. 97. Frustrated Attempts at Murder 
I have already cited the attempts against Franz Josef of Austria and of the two attempts from which Garcia Moreno escaped. On January 14, 1858, at the entrance of the Opera de Paris, three deadly bombs were exploded, killing eight persons and wounding 176. It was the execution of the plan to kill Napoleon III, a plan instigated by Mazzini and Ledru Rollin, and agreed upon in London in 1857. I have related how Ferdinand II of Naples died from poisoning, but that unfortunate king had already been the object of a criminal attempt, the author of which a reward of 1,000 ducats had been offered. Brother Crispy publicly approved the act of Milano, the criminal, and Garibaldi granted a pension from the national treasury given to his mother. To English masonry it is attributed the criminal intent of the English minister Finlay in Norway against the Irish chief Sir Roger Casement. The plan was denounced in time by the faithful servant of Casement, but no action of any kind was taken against the unmasked minister. In the same vein, it was established in a direct trial in Turkey against the Armenian conspirators who attempted to murder the minister of the interior, Talet Bey, for whose head Lord Kitchener had offered 20,000 pounds of sterling all of which did not keep Lord Kitchener from being proclaimed as a model mason by the English. The attempt to murder Alfonso XIII, King of Spain, on his wedding day, miraculously frustrated, had as its author a member of the Escuela Moderna, anarchist center of Barcelona, whose director was Ferrer. Well then, Ferrer played an important role in masonry. After having been a professor of Spanish in the commercial courses of the Grand Orient, in Paris, and a member of the lodge Le Vrai Experts, and of chapter Les Amis Ben Fascistes, he maintained in Spain most favorable relations. In the name of the Grand Regional Lodge of Cataluna, from the Grand Orient of France, and the convent of the Grand Orient projects have been affirmed for establishing a Spanish Republic, and the Grand Lodge of Cataluna had political program for the ruination of Spanish monarchy. Does masonry have part in that connivance of crime? The reader may form his own judgment and know why so much worldwide notoriety has caused by the rare process. Number 98. Killings, Summary Executions, Lootings. It would be necessary to read the description of the free thinker, Tainé, have an idea of what happened in France when the Masons ruled in 1789. and the three following years, displaced persons were, and fugitives were numbered at 150,000. 10,000 persons killed without judgment in the province of Anjou alone. 500,000 dead in the province of the West alone. In 1796, General Hody wrote to the Minister of the Interior, quote, There is not one man left in 20 of the population of 1789. There were as many as 400,000 detained at one time in prisons. More than a million, 200,000 individuals suffered personally. Numerous millions, all those who possess something, have been deprived of their own right. If the Catholic Church, to which has been falsely attributed the massacre of St. Bartholomew, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and into whose face is thrown the imprisonment of Galileo in a palace jail, had done a, only about a hundredth part of what had been done in those four years of the Masonic terror, how even yet the world would resound from the imprecations and condemnations of human nature. But Masonry has not done it. What happened when the organized forces of Masonry fell upon Naples? There were sacrifices of forty to fifty persons at a time. Amante Congliusu, of 87 prisoners, 47 were left by troops. In Montefiquian, 50 men who had taken refuge in the church were beheaded. In Monte Caglioso, an official had 10 or 12 workers imprisoned who had not given him right directions about the road leading to those who were defending their king, and they were burned in the presence of their families. In the time of Garibaldi, entire populations witnessed the killings of at Ariano, Trasso, Paoli, Mintimileto, Fresco, Panabet Pisi, St. Antino, Castellacis, Castel Saraceno, Carbone, Lucerunico, which were peaceful localities of agriculture and industry. According to official figures published by the Ministry of the Interior of Turin, undoubtedly inferior by far than in reality and referred to in the Posa Foglio Maltese, there were 30,000 Italians begging bread in foreign lands, 80,000 deprived of their position and reduced to misery inside the country, more than 18,000 shot or executed. The Neapolitans, imprisoned in one year alone, exceeded more than 14,000. Quote, as far as the criminal activity of masonry in Spain, I would like to just transcribe a page from the discourse of Don Runan Nocedal, already mentioned. After recalling the assassination of General Prim, a mason, an assassination which, because of the mystery surrounding it, was attributed to masonry and about which no one demanded that the newspapers publish the suspicion, and leaving out the testimony of Leo Taxo, Nocedal says, It's all right, Senor Moret Yata, but I'm going to cite another testimony in another book which no one can challenge, against which there is no recourse. One has to admit it. What is the testimony in the book of history? Does Senor Moreta wish to tell me who were the ones in 1814 who devised the plot to assassinate General Elio in Valencia, and in Seville, the Count of La Bisbal, who later became the blind servant of the lodges, supplanting two royal orders and falsifying the signature of the ministry, so that they might be arrested and judged as traitors, as was about to happen? Could Senor Moreta tell me who had been ambushed and assassinated from behind the venerable bishop of Vich near Valerana in the year 1823, Friar Raimundo Struc? translator of the book of Abbey Barrio against Jacobite masonry, and the poor laborer who accompanied him? 
Whom shall we hold responsible, Senor Morita, for the blood of the twenty-four neighbors of Manresa, venerable old people, wise and virtuous religious, honest merchants, assassinated in the year 1822, in the ambush of three roars, and for many other innocent victims taken treacherously to slaughter in the infamous carriage of Rotten? Who impelled the governor of La Coruna in 1823 to take from the castle of San Anton fifty-one prisoners in the dark of night, and to put them handcuffed in a boat, and to hurl them at bayonet point into the sea, smashing the heads of those swimming on the surface with oars? Who made, and who sent, in 1829, that package and infernal machine, which General Eguia opened cautiously, putting it under the table, their fire, saving his life, but losing his hand? Who maintained and paid the several seven hundred soldiers and officials who, in La Puerta del Sol, Madrid, assassinated General Cantarac, alone and defenseless, in 1835? Who sent the mob to Hortaleza, those fugitives from justice who stabbed to death Queen Quesada when he was clean helpless and alone? Who loosed against the cities of Barcelona and Atazanas the ferocious and savage mobs which tore to peace Colonel O'Donnell and more than a hundred other prisoners in their cells? Who assassinated Fugosio? Who armed the assassins who, in 1844, fired upon the coach of General Navarrez, who miraculously escaped unscathed and did kill his adjutant, Bassetti? Who accomplished with complete and incredible impunity the regicide of La Riva in 1847? Who put in the hands of the priest Marino, because it fell to him by lot, the dagger that wounded Isabel II? Who forced another unhappy sectarian to blow his brains out of a vo to avoid committing the regicide which had also fallen him by lot in 1867 in a secret meeting in Valladolid? And I do not speak of innumerable jurisdictional assassinations, and I do not speak of the blood shed in innumerable insurrections and riots cleverly contrived by masonry. I do not speak of the villages put to the sword and destroyed for the honor and glory of masonry by the Mason, Nina, and Catalonia, nor of assassinations of such as those committed by the people of Zumbiano in Victoria, nor of the horrible slaughter of enemies who had already surrendered of defenseless citizens and innocent children, called by Colonel Gonzalez the Inflexible to Extremadura, province of Spain. But how can one put into a single paragraph of a discourse even the assassinations committed in Spain by masonry under all shapes and forms of crime which constitute murder? Ah, Senor Morasta, supreme head of the Spanish Orient, who sang in the streets of Madrid, in front of the convents, two or three nights before the 17th of July of 1831, that horrible ballad which began, Death to Christ, Long Live Satan, who spread the rumor that the friars had poisoned the water? Who let loose upon the Imperial College, Santo Tomas, San Francisco Grande, Merced, Discalced Carmelites, Atoka, those savage hyenas who with impunity and untirely killed, mutilated, and tore to pieces all the religious? Who withheld the troops in their barracks until the assassins had their fill of the killing? Who tied the hands of the regiment quartered in San Francisco to, in order to prevent them from helping the friars, and who freed them to drive back those who sought shelter in the quarters? Who stole from the commissary of the holy palaces the half million with which the assassins were paid? All Madrid knew where the crime had been plotted. The president of the Council of Ministers, defending himself as he could for the apathy of the authorities, also clearly acknowledged in his own hand in a letter, and on one dared deny it, that the frightful and sacrilegious hedicomb was the work of secret societies. Anyone wishing to learn in greater detail of those killings may read Menendez Balayo, Heterodoxos, Encyclopedia Universal Illustrada, 3, page 589. In 1871, during the slaughters and burnings committed by the communists of Paris, that monstrous commune, which destroyed respected monuments by enemy bullets and shot or burned with petroleum patriotic soldiers who had escaped with their lives in the war, that commune, which assassinated even the hostages, was solemnly approved and congratulated and applauded by 10,000 Freemasons, who organized toward that goal the most hateful demonstration. Number 99. Masonic Seditions all the uprisings that have occurred since 1789, with perhaps the expectation of three or four, are the work of masonry, says Dom Benoit. Edmund About, editor of Opinion Nationale, has written in it that since 1728 until 1789, masonry had done nothing but conspire. It would be too long to go into detail into the method, which has been followed, first in the orders given to the lodges, afterwards through the control of soldiers and police, the uprisings of the mobs, to inaugurate the movement. One may refer to the author cited, Dom Benoit. The narration of the revolution of Parma caused by Carletti, who executed it, is interesting. It seems like a comedy. Number 100. Wars and Revolutions. Once in power, masonry has been implacable in maneuvering national forces to the advantage of its own plans. History tells us that the masters of power in France, in the year 1792, within a few months and even within a few days, declared war on Austria, Holland, England, Italy, and Spain. It did not cease to disrupt Europe until it had established a new order of things in accord with its ambitions. In Cretan no Jolie, in Margiotta, etc., one may read of every intrigue, not only of the Italian lodges, but even those of the United States, of England, and of France in the, in the Italian wars, to despoil the Pope and other legitimate sovereigns of their estates, and to defy the popular will, as also in the Crimean War, which cost so many lives. Why have so many coalitions been formed against Austria? Why did the disasters of 1870 befall France? 
Why was the Grand Imperial Protestant German Empire formed? Why did Napoleon I find so many friends and allies in his campaign throughout Europe? The governments of this century, says the Israeli Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1876, quote, not only have to deal with governments, with emperors, with kings, and with ministers, but even with secret societies, which may at the last moment nullify their orders, for they have their agents everywhere, unscrupulous agents who instigate assassinations and may, if it is necessary, perpetrate a slaughter. Already in speaking of masonry and politics, the part which masonry played in all the French revolutions in the past century has been sketched. It would be interminable to follow it step by step across Europe and America. Speaking of Europe, the celebrated free thinker, historian Tanay says, quote, having devoured France, the band begins to devour Europe, leaf by leaf, like the head of an artichoke. But why I tell of the tragic comedy which they play here and abroad? It is a repetition of the part they played in Paris, a ridiculous and improvised translation in Flemish, in Dutch, in German, in Italian, a local adaptation, such as with variations, shortcuts, abbreviations, but with the same band. It is a downpour of blows dealt to the property owners, communities, and individuals to oblige them to empty their pockets of all objects of any value whatsoever. They do so to the point of being left shirtless and penniless. In effect, the lodges of Paris, especially the Lodge of Propaganda, had organized branches in Belgium, in Holland, in Germany, in Switzerland, in Italy, and even in Austria. Zimmerman prized himself on having established under the name of literary and other similar societies more than a hundred of these lodges or clubs. The members received directors from France and dedicated themselves to create followers of the regime in force in France and to paralyze national resistance. Your country is completely mined, said Bonaparte to the Italian officials who had concluded the armistice of Cherasco. I have found in Genoa a sum of 700,000 francs cash consigned by hidden revolutionaries, Lombards and Piedmontese, to help the progress of the French armies. Since 1821, all of the plans and revolutionary agitations of which Italy was the theater have been, according to Walter, the work of Freemasonry. As an example, I think that suffices. Whoever desires to know more about this repugnant attitude will have a great deal to entertain himself with in the references cited. There may see seen also the proof that Masonry not only presided, but prepared and decreed beforehand the reign of terror, which in the course of centuries, whenever terrorism occurred, never so fully deserved that name. Eckert, in his works so often cited, proposes to prove that all the revolutions in the religious and political and social life of our period have been prepared, nurtured, and directed by Masonry. And it is by the history of the order, by the most unequivocal confessions of the order frequently given publicly, also by the latest events of his time in Saxony and elsewhere, and finally by the examination of reason. In The Cause of the World Unrest can be read some chapters relative to the latest European revolutions, with the same stamp and characteristics of religious and cruel persecutions favoring the Jews or partly organized under their direction. Number 101. Masonic Purity and Honesty. No one can deny that the purity of love and of thoughts and curbing of inordinate sensual desires is one of the most delicate points of Christian morality, and so important that even the enemies of the church, if they are sincere, admire its doctrine regarding those virtues, whereas if they are not sincere, they hypocritically seek to accuse the church of not living it to perfection. It is, then, the gist of moral perfection which it professes. Let us see what the Masonic doctrine is on this point. But, at the same time, since it is so delicate, I shall try to touch upon it superficially as possible, referring to those who have a major and legitimate interest in the work cited, which provide much data and documentation. There are Masonic principles that necessarily should be treated according to their customs and with those who profess and feel their influence, even though they are inconsistent. Such are the Masonic liberty. That is to say, the independent, with much suggestion, in such a way that each one is his own god, his king, and his pope, the adored and the adorer at the same time. When no superior law is recognized, a need or powerful restraint is lacking to subject wrong inclinations. From thence comes, as a very natural consequence, the teachings of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, which we all know, but which do not obligate the Masons. Especially, it says in the Encyclopedia of Masonry, they, the Ten Commandments, are not obligatory for a Mason as a Mason, because the institution is tolerant and cosmopolitan. Moreover, the materialism, which actually is professed throughout Masonry, does not permit moral obligations. The material is elastic and not responsible. It is also a Masonic doctrine, proclaimed by Masonic doctors, like Mackey, that, quote, woman is essentially incapable of true morality. She appears bound by the chains of error and of Christian and mosaic in ignorance. The Mason should not struggle with his own instincts. These are the teachings of Albert Pike, champion of the order. The same author teaches, always in conformity with the philosophical doctrines of the order, that man is an animal who has received a ray of divinity which takes the place of a soul, which is capable of sin, the ray of divinity or the simple animal. From these principles, an entire cult arises, which in Christian language is wont to be called cult of the flesh, to such a point that according to the most studious Mason doctors, in all the lodges, all the symbols have a meaning which tends to honor the flesh, in conformity with the pagan rites, squares and compasses, temple columns, tree in the middle, hall in the middle, the point within the circle, the same cult given to the sun, purely symbolic, all, I say, tends to honor the generative organs of man. 
the same letter G that the English perhaps imagine the initial of God is no more than the initial of generation. At times they give the meaning as geometry. The same word God, if at some time they use it with all its letters, is only the result of the initials of the three words which represent ideas relative to the very object of the pagan cult. The commandments of the Masonic morale, while speaking of chastity, command respect only for the wife or the daughter of the brother, it says, Masonry recognizes none but physical cleanliness. There is no other blemish for man save physical uncleanliness. In the masonry of adoption, or adoptive masonry, which admits women under symbols or legends, they are taught the practice of a vice most nefarious and dangerous to humanity, namely the love of polygamy, free love, and to practice Masonic kindness towards the brothers or friends. The reader will excuse me from going into detail on this subject and of telling what else is practiced in the higher Masonic grades thereof. I have given enough for the reader to have some idea of Masonic morality, which is the reverse of Christian morality, even though we could call it natural morality, which never authorizes a system of falsehood, of violence, and licentiousness. Number 102. Masonic Honor. I had not intended to touch upon this point. However, since it is most used by those who dominate the social opinions when they pass judgment upon the morality and rectitude of man, I find it necessary to do so, even though briefly. As I have already warned, repeatedly, I make no reference in general to the persons who are Masons, but just to those who live as Masons. It would be unjust to think that so many Masons, who I know the Masonic doctrines, have not penetrated, and who ignore them almost completely, would stain their honor by shameful acts. Likewise, it would be unjust to attribute to the Catholic doctrine as robberies and scandals committed by Catholics who don't, do not live as such, who do not know and do not even practice the doctrines which they profess. Is the warning, then, given by Leo the Thirteenth, in a general way, and which I find repeated in the pastoral of Reverend Archbishop of Caracas, already quoted, All we have told and say is that it is necessary to understand the Masonic sect in itself, but not each of its initiates. In effect, there may be many, not only a few, who may be at fault for having compromised with such societies, but not all willfully participate in their crimes, actually ignoring their ultimate intents. Therefore, in Masonry, there is evidence of lack of respect for the property of the Church, the systematic plan used to encroach on its rights, as has been done in many nations, which they have dominated France, Italy, Mexico, Portugal, Spain, etc., and from the statistics of their properties, it seems they will do the same here. It is known that in France, when the properties of the Church were confiscated, the people were told they would be dedicated to their needs. It is notorious and also scandalous to have observed the way the liquidation took place. The explanation of the liquidation of those properties that the Christian people had looked upon as most sacred provides only an object lesson whereby the fear to steal is removed very eloquently, if only that were all. Commenting upon a circular of the Grand Orient of France to the lodges of their obedience, wherein Masons tell of the prudence of the great work and goodwill of Masonry, Cope and Abincelli makes this opportune observation. Masonry lies. Masons want to make believe their work is great and well done, that the ideas they consecrate are noble and pure, but their acts belie them because there are conspicuous members of the Masonic congregation whose names are Mil Wilson, Meyer, a swindler, former editor of La Lanterne, Geyer, receiver in bankruptcy, Tomas, the robber of churches. There are a great number of others to be counted among the Panamists, the Sudists, the Umbertus, the defrauders of the South, the falsifiers of all kinds, and gamblers of all sorts. It is extraordinary that such a doctrine, so pure and noble, should produce such fruit and in so great a number. The robberies and scandals of Adriano Lemmi, Supreme Grand Con Pontiff of Italian Masonry, have been made public, especially the frauds of the tobacco supplies, which we have already mentioned, and many others who participated in like Crespi, Schiara, and Carducci, the poet of Satan, etc. So narrates Margiotta in his book, Adriano Lemmi. If only Masons among us could raise their heads still pure and clear from the stain they have placed upon their other nations, if the Church had only to fear the doctrines that take away the fear of God and which teach man not to combat his own inclinations. As an appendix to this chapter, I shall transcribe the following data concerning the formation of a lodge which a friend wrote me and in whose veracity I have absolute confidence. Quote, I have had occasion to come upon, as a surprise, the first meetings of a founders of a lodge here in the north. The brother Mason, the founder, was an ancient distinguished military man, now decrepit. The secretary, whom we surprised, had a role of documentation in hand, an inspector of schools who had to leave. There were present young professors with plenty to say. Another of the founders, a military man, perhaps the most involved in an awful case several years ago, and who has been discharged from the army because he disgraced the uniform, a postmaster who was mediocre and who tried to vainly conceal the Masonic insignias which showed on his bulging abdomen like a charm on a chain, a director of a municipal school or school principal who was the kingpin of the sessions, another municipal employee, fatuous and ignorant, a professor who, shameful to relate, still is of public scandalous immorality in and out of his home, four shameless young men without education, lawless, godless, and of doubtful patriotism, a fiscal employee swelled with pride, promoted from the lower ranks, a hardened heretic involved in noisy lawsuits, 
Such were the fires that prevented, that pretended to be able to diffuse light, science, and philanthropy in that city. Chapter 6. Masonry and its Ideal of Beneficence. Number 103. Generosity so hidden that little is seen. Generosity so occult that little is visible of it. Who has not been told many times that masonry is only a society of beneficence? How many have imagined, when hearing that, outside of mutual hope that is promised to the adherents, masonry occupies itself solely with helping the needy, with the large funds it collects? Unfortunately, notwithstanding the fact that numerous secret works accomplished by the brothers become known, masonry has little to do about its philanthropic work. I do not claim that under its auspices, masons do not accomplish works of beneficence or philanthropy, as they would choose to call them. Sometimes they are on a great scale, but not from money belonging to the order of brotherhood. Their philanthropy comes from the collections made as fiestas, games of chance, or lotteries, etc. Neither will I deny the individual generosity of many of the adepts. There are persons who are naturally inclined to give, and would do so whether or not they were masons. But in Inquique, where masonry is flourishing, with four or five lodges, and where they have reigned for a long time, really, their beneficence is much more mysterious and secret than the conspiracies against the church of their political work, which are brought into the light. It is curious that what has happened to me does and has happened to all those who pay attention to the things that concern masonry. See what Eckert said in his time, quote, It is said that beneficence is the objective of masonry, but in no way is that beneficence shown as the distinctive seal of the order. Where, then, are there munificent gifts and acts of generosity practiced on a vast scale? Never is anything but a very modest gift seen. Moreover, such acts of beneficence, however small they may be, have been only local and in no way universal. End quote. Proves on his part, after a long study of Masonic doctrine expounded by Mackey, reaches more or less the same conclusion. Quote, its charity is for the poor brother, who has fallen into poverty or disgrace, and is for no one else. If the brother has fallen into poverty, he was not in that condition when he was received. His prosperity, or at least his well-being, which has been transformed into poverty, the strength of vigorous humanity, undermined by age and necessity, is the only charity admitted within the limits of the order, which rigorously exclude from their files the needy classes. This is to be found in which charity is exercised, let it be found. End quote. Number 104. Spiritual generosity, well disguised also. As a Masonic doctor has said, the chief benefit consists of the intellectual benefits conferred by the order, teaching, quote, the truth of God and of the soul, end quote and breaking the chains of error and ignorance that heretofore had the candidate in moral and intellectual culture, etc. The quoted author shows that, being given the secrecy used by the lodges toward outsiders, and even toward their own brothers of inferior grades, that benevolence or beneficence is the most unreal that can be given, in view of the necessity so universal for the light which masonry claims it can supply. On the other hand, all that has been said here thereto is seen by who wish to open their eyes the cruel barbaric conduct of masonry toward their enemies suggests the thought that renowned Masonic beneficence can be classified with the rest of the affirmations that until now have been studied. Anyone can ask, where are the works of Masonic beneficence? Who has seen them? Outside of English masonry, which has some works of charity due to the aid of a few wealthy brothers, it is difficult, if not impossible, to see them elsewhere. Chapter 7. Masonry and its Ideal of Science and Progress. Number 105. What Masonic Science is. The hatred which masonry shows in its works against the church is customarily attributed to its love of science and progress, and is claimed that it is in the Catholic Church their main hindrance is found. Is there sincerity and truth in that? As to which pertains to science, we have not seen that masonry has led it to its apogee. I do not deny that there are some learned masons, but they are not wise because they are masons, nor because they acquired their science through their initiation in masonic works. And the reason is manifest. Scientific studies are not pursued in the lodges where the main concerns are religion, politics, and what directly or indirectly can be attained through those objectives. Lectures are given on pretended scientific subjects, but still with the idea of reaching the goals directed against the church or against revealed religion. I have had occasion to see some of these works myself. In them are repeated old-fashioned ideas. They turn to heated objections undoing the church in a thousand ways. Theories are maintained already repudiated by the wise, such as Darwinism, spontaneous generation, etc. And with those, they nourish the credulity bestowed upon master masons by the adepts who have reneged the infallibility of the heads of the church. Cope and Abincelli, studying the organization of masonry to which he belonged and its immense destructive work, observing that masonry was composed of inferior beings, as he puts it, unable to conceive and to prepare the immense destruction that has been realized, was led to suspect that it could be no more than a poor instrument wielded by some occult political power. Referring also to the conversation with a brother, higher in grade, and who confirmed his confession, he said, quote, You are in a situation to measure the mediocre intellectual norms of the main portion of the 25,000 masons. End quote. Intelligent persons who are in masonry will not accept from masters who are so far from sincere the belief that those lessons advance in science. I have already noted elsewhere that the chiefs of masonry impose their doctrines upon their adepts in a single manner to that of Pythagoras. Their basis is the authority of the master, the magister district, the master has said, and from a master who neither knows who he is or where he is, quote, masonry does not inculcate its truths, says the supreme grand master Pike. They are affirmed once and with brevity, end quote. 
Dr. Mackey says that Preston gave masonry a philosophy so that, from dawn to twilight, a fraternal light shines in the instructions of the lodges. Quote, since 1717, he states, the fraternity occupied itself in something less useful, but something more co-natural than the culture of the Masonic science. Delicious foods, easy works, the harmony of song, the miserable mistakes that provoked the ire of Johnson, more so that Boswell remembered, left no time for the study of obtruse manners. The revelations of Sir Oliver supplies a abundant and positive proof of the inferior state of Masonic literature in those days, and if we want negative proof, we will find it in the absolute absence of books worth reading about Masonic science, and even including the appearance of works of Hutchinson and of Preston." End quote. The reader should notice that it speaks of nothing but Masonic science, that is, from the web of legends and inventions that are used in their superior grades, above all inculcate the philosophical doctrines of the sept, doctrines that must derive from ancient pagan mysteries, and with which is formed the most fabulous history of Masonry. Number 106. Masonic Credulity. There is no science in Masonry, and only a credulity improbable in serious people. Quote, in reality, the Masons are believers, since they believe in the widow and her sanctity. At least, that is the way it is with the majority. They have been persuaded that science requires the destruction of Catholicism. They know absolutely nothing by themselves, since they are not learned. Nevertheless, it has been necessary that they believe what has been affirmed to them. They have believed, they have faith, is a considerable fourth. It is necessary to know, it is necessary to have seen the limits of their hallucinations. As a consequence of the suggestions they receive, those whose intelligence is debatable are offered as scientific minds. Very sincerely, those dishwaters from the kitchen of the widow consider themselves as forerunners of science and of reason." End quote. The opinion that the Masons of the higher philosophic grades have of the mulcted crowd of blue masonry can be deduced from the following testimonies taken from their writing. Quote, it must be noted that the majority of Masons are far from being initiated, and that they are dragging themselves along in the darkness of Egypt. End quote. Masonry of the higher grades, says Pike, teaches the great truths of the intellectual science. But as for these, and even as for the rudiments and first principles, blue masonry is absolutely mute. Her dramas appear to have as their object the teachings of the resurrection of the body. The pretended possession of mysterious secrets, it states elsewhere, has made blue masonry capable of counting its initiates by tens of thousands. Never has pretension been made to the possession of secret knowledge as a baseless and absurd as that of the head of the royal blue cross. Quote, the simian, like Christianism, of blue masonry, adds Pike, has made of her an enervated and impotent society with grand and resonant pretensions and poor realities. Number 107. Progress in Reverse. The word progress is one of those magic words with which masonry beguiles the simpletons and the ignorant. If their actions were to be called by an appropriate name, perhaps the work retrogression would express one of the many concepts that should be evaluated. The wars, the upheavals, the revolutions caused by masonry in the world, with its courting of infinite evils that destroy or retard all true progress, fully justify this assertion. Licentious habits, fruits of satanic liberties, are precipitating the Christian peoples into the chasm of pagan degradation from which the church had raised them. The dignity of family is daily dragged in the mire due to the efforts of masonry to destroy it. Not only does it want to dissolve matrimony by divorce, but advocates free love. Masonry would even cross the borderlines of a barbarian stage in order to reach the clear state of the animal. As far as religion is concerned, not only in the fraternity taking the world back to ancient paganism, not only to the cult of the sun, the cult of nature, the cult of flesh, but with materialism so boldly declared, they retrogress beyond the limits of humanity itself, to reach the very condition of the brute, which does not adore God, because it has no capacity to know him. The fear of cruelty, of plunders, of dishonesty, to which the peoples have sunk, when no longer restrained by their religion, will show whether such can be viewed as enviable progress or as an abhorrent retrogression, which masonry finally represents as a sweet ideal, each believing that he is his own god. Quote, where Christianism is ardent, writes Bourget, people's customs are improved, whereas they are lowered when Christianity is stagnant. Thus, where the tree on which bloom virtue, deprived of their practice, human societies are condemned to perish. I pray to proclaim expressively, a nation is demoralized by tearing away its faith, thereby assassination is committed, a moral assassination, by dechristianizing it. There is no social salvation outside the virtues of the Decalogue. This was the conviction of Laplay. It was that of Tainé, and it is of mine. All sincere souls think the same way. That which to us would be a disgrace to masonry is an ideal. And what is most saddening is that many masons, who have not lost their ordinary moral sense toward men, even know that such is the ideal, and not that of the widow in whose house they live. Part 3. Doctrines of Masonry. Chapter 1. Social and Philosophical Doctrines. Number 108. Materialism and Atheism. Almost all the variations of the Masonic cult and symbolism coincide with the negation of the Supreme Being, distinct from this material world, that is, with the denial of God, such as the Christian world knows, with an infinity of actual perfection, and not only with the passive infinity of receiving forms infinitely possible proper to matter. Masonry, according to the world of their pontiffs, 
protest the charge of atheism against them, but they try to conciliate their affirmation of the divinity with materialism. Quote, materialism, says Regan, is very improperly called atheism. Atheism is not conceivable. It would be supposed without cause, since the cause of all that exists is designated by the name of God, which is the unknown cause of known effects. Very well, such absurdity is admitted by no one, unless through ignorance or by bad faith. Therefore, there can be no atheists. The only division that exists is the question of knowing if the cause of all existence is spiritual or material. That is, isolated, independent of matter, or inherent of to matter, and form an integral part of it. But a materialist is not an atheist. End quote. That successfully deceives fools. From the moment it is accepted that divinity is nothing more than a part of a material world, that is, superior part of the world, thus they deny the existence of God and reality, leaving only the name as a sample of deeper deception and hypocrisy as used by masonry. Seeing that each individual mason builds, one infers from this that construction is universal, that constructive activity is exercised throughout the world, which does not exist but is being built perpetually. The universe appears to be an immense workshop that builds itself by means of an infinite number of beings dedicated to its construction. But whereas human beings are constructed for a limited time, the building of the fraternity is unlimited. Note here that construction implies discernment. An egg is hatched according to plan. As the cells are multiplied, they obey a constructive scheme to constitute an organism. Do they, for example, fulfill a great plan accord to human evolution? Here is the grand architect recognized by his work. This is the grand work of general progress. Quote, a mason has nothing from metaphysics, a skillful puppeteer with ethereal conceptions. He is a builder on level ground who does not construct in the clouds. Feeling the ground under his feet, he turns to himself before investigating the clouds. What falls under his senses is for him the point of departure from all revealed truth. End quote. There are others who present more frankly their atheism. Quote, we are personally as atheistic as can be. The idea of God is among those we refuse even to discuss. So unworthy of consideration does it appear to us. Very well. Not by that we are less partisan of what will sustain the great architect of the universe. It is inscribed at the head of the first constitutions. The list leave it at that. Others accept it as truth. We support it as part of a pact. End quote. Upon such principles is built the absolute liberty that defends masonry, and with much logic, because if there is no other god than nature, of whom we men are the culminating part, we are god, or the principal part of god. We are, above all, independent of all other beings, as there are no natural laws of physics, chemistry, or mechanics. Man should exhort himself to be his own god, and worshipper of his own self. Number 109 negation of the spiritual and immortal soul. With respect to the immortality and the spiritual essence of the soul, the Masonic theories cannot be put in doubt. If the soul as a whole is part of the divinity which is somewhat material and divisible, it is clear that the soul is clearly also somewhat material and therefore subject to corruption and to death. Quote, in the beginning, says Pike, the universe was no more than a soul was all by itself, like time, space, and infinity. Such is my thought. I believe that man, whose soul is my image, will rule, and so stands man with instinctive senses and a rational soul. However, man, being an animal that breathed, saw, and thought, until his brain was penetrated by this immaterial spark from the infinite being of God himself, and thus became soul, and so was man, and immortal." End quote. At death, the spark returns to the bosom of God if it has been purified through Masonic initiation, which is like a spiritual death that erases the past. But if it is not purified, it will have to return to life until it is purified. This is a doctrine of the great supreme pontiff of the universal Masonry, Pike. It is certainly affirmed that the soul will have activity and intelligence in God before uniting with the body, but that cannot be a different life from what has part and all that is created. In principle, therefore, man is endowed with immortality of the soul. In reality, however, it is denied. Therefore, if man's immortality is so reduced, 
Then the plants also, the fruits, are immortal, since none of their components is reduced to nothing, but that all the elements are dissolved with death and again form part of all the matter from whence they issued. The Masonic doctrines pointing this out, such as are expounded by Pike and Mackey, are the same as those of the Gnostics with the old theories of the pre-existence of the soul, of its transmigration and of its return to God, with all its contingent incongruities and lack of logic, which the Masonic doctors prefer to overlook, and yet then accept such theories because those were the doctrines of the ancients. The predominance of materialistic ideas among the brothers is the reason for the determination with which it is taught and the professorial tears which are almost all under its ways, such as the theory of Darwinism or evolution, with its indispensable postulates of spontaneous generation and its attending absurdities, eccentricities, foundationless affirmations, its efforts to discover in the folds of the earth some slight indications in the immense mine of deeds which do not allow for one moment of the most absurd idea of things putting themselves in motion. After having commenced to exist, without any one having given them existence, of things that might have given themselves life, of those that possess it without having received it from a pre-existing being, who first possess it, i.e. life. Can it be that they might have given themselves intelligence and possess intelligence without having received it from whomsoever could give it? Can it be that things might have put themselves in order alone, that those admirable organisms might have created themselves, which our intelligence does not yet understand, yet admires, without there having been an intellect which might have established order and laws? In a word, can it be that nothing produced existence, and that by blind chance the universe might have been filled with law and order? These illnesses of the spirit, which are not new to humanity, one must have patience with and much charity. At the same time, one must use reason with all those who are not yet fanaticized and blinded by the constant repetition of the same errors accompanied by the same accord of the words science, progress, evolution, and other similar expressions. Number 110. Communist, Anarchist, and Bolshevik Doctrines Communist, Anarchist, and Bolshevik Doctrines are no more than the consequences of the Masonic Doctrines referring to the primitive equality which they propose to restore among men, that absolute equality so invoked and so dear to the communists as a foundation of the realization of their dreams. Even from their very entrance into the lodge, the initiates are taught that in masonry there are no distinctions, that everyone is equal, they are made to turn over all their metal, that is to say, the money which they carry, and if they are not left fully stripped, it is because custom does not permit the realization of that ideal. For only thus men remain equal in all that does not depend solely upon nature. That equality entails a community of goods, and logically everything else, including community of womanhood and countries, to which certain scholastic schools, socialistic schools, aspire. Naturally, when masonry needed the help of those kings and princes to work in their shadow in order to dethrone them, and when it was needing the money of the rich for its propaganda, or for its revolutionary missions, the anarchist and socialistic doctrines were not so clearly pronounced. And even now, not everywhere, are those ideals spoken of clearly. That would cause the withdrawal of many of those whose help and money the widow needs. All, or nearly all, of the authors I have studied establish both the similar doctrine between masonry and the destructive systems of the social order and the efforts employed by masonry to retain the revolutionary parties as allies or as their instruments. The latest authors manifest clearly the intimate relation existing between Judaism and masonry and with the revolutionary parties from socialism to Bolshevism. Quote, About the explanations of the ritual, says Eckerd, and of the history, and of the confessions of the order, there is reason to believe that Freemasonry is a conspiracy against the altar, the throne and property, with the purpose of establishing upon the face of the earth a socialist and theocratic rule, whose religious and political government would have its headquarters in Jerusalem. The indispensable condition for its realization is the destruction of three obstacles which oppose it, the church, the throne, and property. 
The Masonic Congress of Saints in 1847 and those which followed proved conclusively that Masonry has as its goal socialism by means of revolution. That explains the favor which Masonry bestowed and bestows upon all those associations or leagues which directly or indirectly dedicate themselves to partial or total destruction of property, social revolution, and war against Christianity. Associations which multiplied in Europe and America in the last century. To them, Benoit dedicates the second section of the second part of his work, Freemasonry, so often cited, to who I refer the reader who wishes to study them in detail. What is worthy of observation is, as Webster notes, that all those subversive movements of which Bolshevism is presented to us as the ultimate phase have only one goal, the destruction of Christianity. Quote, I repeat, it is not an economic revolution which forms the plan of the real directors of the movement. It is not even the dictatorship of the proletariat, nor the reorganization of society by the intelligentsia of the worker. It is the destruction of the Christian idea. The socialist orators can break out in invectives against the corrupt aristocracy or the, quote, bloated capitalists, but it is not those who will suffer most once the conspiracy is completely achieved. World revolution has always shown itself indulgent for and with the corrupt and egoistic. From the Marquis of Sade and Duke of Orleans until now, it is the good, the righteous, and benevolent who have fallen victims of the revolutionary fury. Quote, the lodges today want, says Marquis of Colbert in the Echo ou Cher, the spoliation of proprietors, the suppression of inheritance, the socialization of the individual, new taxes, the nationalization of all the great enterprises, etc. That is to say, the program of the Red International. That is why, behind all of the revolutionary movements, which branch out into so many systems, groups, or parties, at times against themselves, and, nevertheless, they all tend toward the same end, the destruction of the social Christian order. Those who study and observe cannot help but see a general direction that maneuvers adroitly the strings of all that revolutionary army, whose companies seem to move of their own volition and direct themselves. Masonic liberty, which leads a man to be a god himself, and naturally leads to all revolutions and the most absolute anarchy. And if that ideal cannot be realized, it is because common sense has not been lost among men, and because the rational and social nature which we have received lets us judge even amongst those who profess the most dissolvent principles. There is another force rooted in the very depth of our being that places some deterrent on the most dangerous human aberrations. History shows the actions that have been produced when a dissolvent force of the Masonic principles have been exercised with powerful strength, and when it seemed that the triumph of disorder was definite. Quote, Man, says the historian, and the sect of the Illuminati to the adept who is ordained, or priest, Man is evil because religion, the state, and bad example pervert him. With what truth and logic, Prodhan stated that the Masonic system, quote, is the negation of everything in politics. It is anarchy. Concerning the relations of anarchism with Judaism, it is not strange that proportion, not only of the Jewish anarchist criminals, has been demonstrated, but also of insane Jewish anarchists, as was observed by a doctor of neuropsychiatry of New York, Mr. Collins. Number 111, Doctrines Destructive of the Family. The attack of masonry upon the family has been one of the most dangerous to society. Starting with laws of civil matrimony, depreciating matrimony in the eyes of the pernicious or ignorant masses, masonry has deprived it of consecration that character of sacramental institution endowed by our Lord Jesus Christ, and has reduced it to a character of a human contract, similar to many others, whose strength depends on human law. The evils that have been caused in the Christian society we live in, our first attempt against matrimony, again against the family, are unfortunately visible to all. They are so enormous that they have almost destroyed family life among the popular classes of the cities. As though only minor evil had been perpetrated, Masonry, following the examples or instructions issued by other nations, desired to establish the law of divorce. And the ceremony of Masonic matrimony, 
The master and the first vigilante have in one of their recent meetings held the following dialogue. Quote, what do you think of the indissolubility of marriage? This is contrary to the laws of nature and of reason, because social conveniences have united many times beings that nature had separated by antipathies, and which are not discovered except when married. To the laws of reason, because indissolubility makes a law of love and pretends to enslave the most capricious and most involuntary of sentiments, what should be the corrective? Divorce, answers the first vigilante. The law of divorce is part of the code in various nations, and others, as in Chile, it is as yet a project formulated under the auspices of masonry. From there, free love, as desired by the socialists, is not far distant. Outside of that, masonry introduces corruption of customs within matrimony itself, advocating practices which are in opposition to principles. When the law of the secret and the insistent recommendations to guard it, especially from the family, friend, and neighbors, a wall is built between consorts and it creates an antagonism between the Christian wife who professes her religion with sincerity and he who has endured it when he entered masonry and follows the instructions and preparation to combat religion with all the arms available. It is easy to understand the martyred life a wife must lead when she learns at least something of the school in which her husband finds himself, of the projects with which he has obligated himself to carry out under oath, and yet being unable to share the trust upon matters that are so vital to the Christian soul. She did not suspect, when she chose her companion and intimate confidant for life, that he had taken a path which prevents him from having confidence in her, and that behind that oath is a conspiracy to destroy what she most appreciates, namely her religion. This should make it evident to anyone who, how the family ties are thus weakened. The Grand Orient of Belgium in 1864 put in the order of the day of all the lodges the question of compulsory education. From the discussions of the lodges emerged the project of non-religious and obligatory law, whose last article was the following, quote, Number five, to snatch the child from paternal guidance, end quote. Two months later, there was formed the Education League with the active assistance of Masons and Jews controlled by Masonry to prepare the ground for the acceptance of the law. Number 112. Hypocritical Attack on Confession It is customary for Masonry to attack confession under the protest that impedes or weakens the mutual trust which a husband and wife must have in one another. Therein, as usual, Truth is lacking, since nothing hinders the wife from telling her husband all that she must tell her confessor, so that her sins may be absolved. It is another matter if it suits her, her husband, or the peace of the home to do so. There is no oath or prohibition whatsoever that hinders it. And if it is not sufficient for a wife to confess to her husband, as hypocritically the Masons are accustomed to say, is because the husband does not have the power to forgive offenses committed against God. As for the rest, the intervention of the confessor can never be the cause for the disruption of the home which observes a natural and positive law. Number 113. Unpatriotic Doctrines and Deeds Which Confirm Them As an international society dedicated to the establishment of universal liberty, equality, and fraternity, understood in their way, of course, Masonry is the enemy of nationalism and has given proof of it. If, as in the convent of Wilhelmsbad in 1782, it had been decreed that the revolution be should begin in France, it, I say, it had been resolved that it began in Germany. This would have been the land devoured by the revolution, and instead of aiding the traitors to the revolutionary arms or empires, when they invaded Italy or the German Empire, France would have been the theater of those incredible perfidies that caused Napoleon to say that Italy was completely undermined. And according to Henry de Beauregard, chief of staff of Carlos Manuel, there the French would fire their powder in places, and their power had no more limit than their own conscience. The same thing happened in Austria, where the emissaries of the French lodges found many affiliates to second their plans. And the capture of Semonville, an envoy 
extraordinary of the Jacobins to Constantinople brought about the discovery of a world of traitors, as was written in publication at that time, a fact about which there had not been the least suspicion. About Germany, during the furor of the French Revolution, more is to be said, quote, I believe I have demonstrated sufficiently, says Eckert in the history of French masonry. It is incontestable that German masons, through their union with the General Masonic Association, and especially with the military lodges, were the accomplices or the instruments of various treasons. The infamous conduct of Maguncia Garrison is notorious. End quote. The defection of which, at that epoch, many commandants of Prussian fortresses were guilty, have then the same fundamental principles? I would not dare to assure it, yet no, it is true that many acts could not be explained in any other plausible way. These unfortunate acts have not been verified, but during the epoch in which masonry was in complete submission to Napoleon, the same could not be proven, or rather events happened to the contrary. At last, the order acquired the conviction that it was not the emperor who had been its simple instrument, but that it was masonry that had only been a medium that had served Napoleon. Never again did Germany taint itself with such infamy. When masonry raised a cry against the sacrilegious profanation which Napoleon had made against the Masonic sanctuaries, quote, in Spain and Portugal, says the same author, masonry showed a docility that had been unnoticed until then and displayed great activity to create an imperial party. It has been said before how masonry was preparing the fall of Napoleon III and the defeat of France in 1870. The history of Italy is, perhaps, that which presents as most repugnant the aspects of the convenance of the revolutionaries with foreign powers through the lodges with Napoleon III, with Lord Palmerston, the Orient of the Orients, as they have been named, and with the supreme pontiff of the North American masonry and, as it appears, of all masonry, Albert Pike, who, if he could not aid them with forces, aided with dollars. Margiotta furnishes much and precious data in this respect. Much also is found in the histories in general. With such historical antecedents, nothing is more natural, just, and patriotic than the law decreed by the Italian government about secret associations to defend the country against great treasons, no only in time of war, but also in time of peace, when foreign influence may operate by the means of secret societies against the most vital interests of the country, what has happened in Italy, though taking on religious aspect, is considered for morality and also for internal peace. In the information concerning that project of law passed by Mr. Bodreo, one reads the following, quote, While impregnating their adepts with a pseudo-moral, and that the concepts of nationalism and patriotism give precedence to the most universal concepts of humanity, all masonry effectively places the Masonic ideology and the diverse social organizations as first and superior to all other qualities, authority, or hierarchical obligations. End quote. If it is a grave fault, Budreo continues, for all the citizens of the state to form part of the secret societies, what shall we say of the magistrates, whose function should always be inspired with a righteous, serene objective, free of all influence or pressure, which chiefly menace the honest equity of his office? What shall we say of the official of the armed forces of the state? army, navy, aviation, voluntary militia, who must be faithful and loyally true to only one holy oath given the king and countrymen, selected to honor the uniform they wear and the noble mission they have chosen freely? That is why the state cannot admit such delicate and essential posts, like the administration of public funds, justice, education, national defense, public welfare, to be entrusted to men who, in the name of secret association, might disturb all the rules expressively established for the accomplishment of their functions. Quote, As for Spain, states Nocidal, in his speech already cited at the time of the French invasion, the Grand Duke of Berg, then leader of the invading armies, did find wicked Spaniards, Frenchified flatterers of the powerful traitors to the country, finding them in the lodges, and while entire Spain was summoned to a heroic fight, 
The Masons sent their most conspicuous chiefs to place the crown on the brow of Joseph Bonaparte. Therefore on, masonry weighs more than the crime of treason to country, all crimes, massacres, burnings, and ravages of the French. There was its accomplice and ally. All that is not strange, since that is the doctrine of the Illuminati, quote, love of country is incompatible with the objects of an immense love, which is the ulterior end of the order. And Rebold states that Freemasonry proclaims universal fraternity. Its aims tend constantly to extinguish among men the prejudices of class, the distinction of color, of origin, of opinion, of nationality. The results of those aims are expressed by Le Etale de Rome in an article edited the 16th of October, 1879, quote, What is amazing in the doctrines professed in this day by the radical orators of all the European states is the complete perversion of patriotic sentiments. The philosophers and philanthropists, i.e. the Masons, who candidly asked a universal alliance of the peoples, wars, without doubt, very far from imagining that their innocent dreams would produce so many criminal extravagances. In books and magazines of masonry, illegitimate acts and treason committed for the sake of mutual assistance are recommended and extolled as the glory of masonry. Quote, the same inexorable laws of war, says Leferber of the Grand Orient of France, must yield before Freemasonry, which perhaps is the most eloquent proof of its power. A signal is enough to withhold a massacre. The combatants put aside their arms, they embrace each other fraternally, and with a moment they become friends and brothers, as prescribed by their oaths. End quote. Is expressed in the same sense by Handbuch, or Manual Masonic Aleman, which is German. Laudable is the love for all men in general, and especially of our own associations, but it can be converted into crime against the wounded fatherland. When with such a pretext it betrays or places it in danger. This danger, born of Masonic oaths to which alluded the orator above quoted, and through which obligations are superimposed upon those of military discipline and of country, this danger, I say, more than justifies the prohibition made in various countries to the military to affiliate with Masonry, a prohibition which the Masonic influence has left disgracefully without effort among us. It is not, therefore, too surprising that, when in Chile, a voice was raised to endure patriotic sentiment, where has always been amongst the brothers, apologists, or defenders of those without a country. Chapter 2. Summary of the Anti-Masonic International Congress of Trent. Number 114. Religious and Philosophical Doctrines. As confirmation of all that preceded, I give the conclusions arrived at by the Anti-Masonic International Congress, celebrated recently in Trent. Conclusions taken from the works of Creus and Coronua. Based on the official authority that has been sanctioned in more than 150 volumes of Masonic works, volumes that have figured in the small exposition of the Congress of Trent, it has unanimously been declared, quote, that the religious and philosophical doctrines reproduced and propagated by Freemasonry are the phallic doctrines of the ancient mysteries of India, of France, of Greece, of the Romans, of the Druids, and after Christianity, of the Gnostics, of the Manichaeans, of the Albanians, of the Al Valdenses, and other similar sects, of the Templars, of the philosophers of fire, or alchemists, or rose croix. The latter, in June 24, 1717, founded masonry with an actual symbol to perpetuate under their name the cult of phallus, thereby named naturalism, or nature cult. For this reason, masonry calls itself, by authority of the Grandmother Lodge, of all the lodges of the world, Mother Lodge of England, quote, as to the capacity of nature, is defined by that simple word, light the excellent light that illuminates all men who come into the world. As to the power of the intelligence that exists in nature, it is defined as, quote, the science that supersedes all science. Above all the science of man, noce te ipsum, know thyself. As to the variety of operations of nature, it is proclaimed, quote, 
This is a beautiful moral system under the veil of allegories and the adornment of the symbols, end quote. And last to sum up in a few words, the preceding definitions, quote, masonry is the science of the holy name of God, the word of Jehovah, pronounced and interpreted in lodge by high ho, which means he, her, both the sexes, the power of generation. Number 115, masonry and Satanism. With respect to the relations of masonry with that of Satanism, it has unanimously ruled that simple masonry or masonry in the first three grades, beginners, companion, and master, as they are found, common and necessarily divided into exoterics, that is, their members, ignore as they do, the greatest significance of their symbols, and, consequently, do not find themselves morally prepared and ready for the physical intercourse with the spirits or with Satan. In this relation, no physical point of view exists within masonry common to the spirits. From the moral and intellectual point of view, at least, it has a perfect relation with that of Satanism, mm -hmm. since it is an association that calls itself God, and as Mazzini defined it, Ecclesia Sancta Dei, understanding by this God, Lucifer, or the Son, the beginning of universal materialistic generation. Quote, that in the end, the masters of simple masonry, well distinguished by their symbols and by their separation of their reunions, of the apprentices and companions to whom are not explained their symbols can practice if they wish the black or hermetic art magic under the name of masonry priesthood by the fact that they are masters they are priests of satan representing all the lodges symbolically by the flaming sun number 116 relation of the masonic dogma within themselves with respect to the relation existing between the diverse doctrines professed at least as they seem to be, by the Freemasons, if they really exist at all, it was unanimously declared that the diverse are all united within Masonry, quote, all within all, end quote, or in the grand all, God of pantheism ideal, and of materialism under the name of positive science or positivism. It was declared that those doctrines in the symbolic languages of the Masons, they received the name of Masonry visible to the profane, quote, that they have within themselves an intimate relation, since they all identify the universe with God. Quote, that within Masonry are founded schools and seminaries of atheism. That their tenet consists of the substitution of the conception of God, creator of heaven and earth. That in Masonry, this institution has dedicated itself to Masonry, the use of the term architect of the universe applied to God. The architect supposes the pre-existence or the coexistence of the material over within architecture which should be exercised and the instruments used, putting them to work. Number 117, Objectives of Masonry. As to what the objective of Masonry is, after much discussion, it was also unanimously answered, quote, that the object of Freemasonry is the universal destruction of physical order, moral and intellectual and the physical order, or of the existence, since Masonry has defied death or universal destruction, substituting the Christian Holy Trinity, the Hindu Trinity of God, Generator, Destructor, and Regenerator, representing a triangle realized in the cosmos according to the general principles, Mors Unius es Generatio Alterius, and vice versa, successfully and eternally, and put into practice by the Masons, is a grave injury to human society under the specified names of struggle for perpetual revolution and indefinite progress. Quote, in the moral order, the objective of masonry is universal destruction, since it defies the principle of evil, and with that advocates all vices under the name of virtues. In the intellectual order, their object is the universal destruction of truth by explicit profession and necessity of secrecy, by lies, by perjury, and blasphemy. Quote, in one word, resuming all that preceded, it has been concluded, like shutting off or obscuring, in a certain way, the sun, that those who close their eyes to its light shut off or obscure life, the order and beauty of the universe. Freemasons, falsifying the Christian concept of a God-creator, by the substitution of a God-creator, tend to universal destruction, as seen in all the symbolic rituals 
and in all the religious ceremonies where they profess the worship and the cult of evil, committing mortal sin indeed. Per peccatum mors. It is visible that they render homage to the universal rebellion of Satan and the infinite lust of humanity, which are the alpha and omega of their god, destruction. Number 118. Masonic Action. Under Masonic Action, we come to the conclusions of the Congress which stated, first, that Freemasonry is a religious sect and a Manichaean, that the ultimate word of their secrets and of their mysteries is the cult of Lucifer or Satan, adored in the backstage lodges as the good God in opposition to the God of the Catholics, whom the initiate blasphemers call evil God. Second, that the demon, inspirer of the Masonic secrets, knowing that he shall never be directly adored by the majority of men, tries to infiltrate in the souls by means of masonry the germ of naturalism, which, with respect to God, is nothing else than the complete emancipation of man. Third, that in order to implant in the world this irreligious naturalism, Freemasonry endeavors to accustom men to place all religions on an equal footing, the only true one together with the false, substituting for the Catholic atmosphere the Masonic atmosphere through the medium of the press and of godless schools. Fourth, that the particular method which served Masonry to destroy the souls of those who are fanatics regarding matters pertaining to the supernatural, but are not sufficiently prepared for Luciferian Manichaeism, is to excite them until they give themselves over to the perverse practices of Spiritism. Fifth, that Freemasonry is also a political sect which tries to gain control of all governments to make them the blind instruments of its perverse action and tries also to sow rebellion everywhere. Six, that the object of Freemasonry and sowing revolution in all parts of the world is the establishment of a universal republic based on the rebellion against divine sovereignty, the destruction of local liberty and freedoms, the abolition of frontiers, and the perversion of the patriotic sentiments which next to love of God has inspired in mankind its most beautiful deeds, its noblest sacrifices, its most heroic abnegation. Seventh, that Freemasonry continues to fight against the church, introducing into Christian countries an anti-Christian legislation. Eighth, that Freemasonry is directly responsible for modern socialism because it has substituted for the Christian ideal that of social happiness, which mm -hmm. is its own mm -hmm. ideal. It has also been substituted for the Christian social hierarchy, governed by justice and tempered by charity, a pretended equality of all men among themselves. Masonry is making men forget that it is in the future life where each one will be recompensated according to his works, and is teaching them that happiness can be found only in material pleasures here below, and that all have a strict right to an equal part of this happiness. Ninth that Masonic philanthropy, opposed to Christian charity, and being, as it is, a purely natural love of some men for other people, is incapable of serving as a link between God and humanity, and that, moreover, this Masonic philanthropy is exercised only among Freemasons themselves, and very often to the detriment of civil society. Number 10 was not included in the third edition. Eleventh, that to break up the family irremediably Freemasonry tries to pervert women, not only making them enter their lodges as they always succeed in doing, but because it is the soul of the movement called feminism or emancipation of women, destined to bring disturbance and disorder into families based on the vain desire for a completely unattainable reform. The twelfth, that in order to accustom men to neglect church and social life, the sect tries to suppress religious festivals and days consecrated to the sanctification of souls and to physical rest, in order to substitute for them festivals merely civil. Thus far the resume of the Congress. Number 119. What then is Masonry? After what has been said above, the following definition of Masonry can be given. Masonry is a conspiracy can skillfully organized and disciplined against Jesus Christ and the Church and consequently against God himself, and against all that signifies order and respect for any authority, and the recognition of any duty that must be formed, as well as against any restraint of our passions. It was thus which Proudhem confessed with all frankness, quote, Our own basic principle is the denial of all dogma, 
our point of departure, nothingness, to deny, always deny, such is our method. It will lead us to put as principles in religion, atheism in politics, anarchy, in political economy, no ownership of property. This is what masonry has tried hard to realize without ever being able to attain it altogether not only because providence watches over humanity and defends its church in a special manner, but because from the very depths of our nature, protest arises against the excess of evil and reaction surges up against it. After what has been said, masonry can also be defined in conformity with that which many masons have declared, namely a society composed of two classes of members, a few who deceive and exploit others and through them profane the world, the others forming the great majority who are deceived and exploited by the first mentioned whom they serve as tools toward all sorts of ends, even the most perverse, working as tools against their own religious, patriotic, and social ideas. Part 4. The Origin of Masonry and Its Relation to Other Sects Chapter 1. Origin of Masonry Number 120. Diversity of Opinions Insensibly, I have been getting away from my object, giving greater length than I had thought to this book, and although I like to end here, doubtless there are two or three more points that I must be cleared up before my readers who have had the patience to read the preceding pages. Among these is the origin of masonry, of which I shall now treat. There are a few subjects about which are found a greater diversity of assertions and opinions, and which have afforded a freer field for invention and fable. When I say that Freemasons have traced the origin of masonry not only to our Lord Jesus Christ, not only to the construction of the Temple of Solomon, but even to the builders of the Tower of Babel, as far back as Adam, even to God himself, then you will have an idea of the confusion with which masonry has enveloped its origin in the minds of its adepts. Quote, it is opprobrium of masonry, says Mackey, that as yet its history has not been written with the spirit of true criticism, that credulity has been the foundation upon which have been built all the historic Masonic investigations. But the missing links of the chain of evidence has been supplied frequently by inventions with no foundations, and that affirmations of great importance have been supported by testimonies of documents whose authenticity has not been proven. This same Mackey shows twelve diverse opinions on the origin of masonry. Number 121. Origin of its organization. Nevertheless, the brothers generally agree among themselves that blue masonry of the first three degrees, in its true form, dates from 1717, when it was organized in England by Anderson. Four lodges of the Masons of London met in the, quote, Tavern of the Devil, as Mackey says in Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, and constituted the Grand Lodge, giving it a ritual and a constitution. In Paris, the first lodge also met in a tavern, and the remainder of lodges being founded followed this custom, which was common in the countries of Europe. Quote, in America, continues Mackey, this practice has ceased only at a relatively recent date, and it is possible that in some obscure villages it has not been yet abandoned. The first Masonic salon, of which there is mention, is one which was built by the Lodge of Marseille in France in the year 1765. In 1772, the Grand Lodge of England made the first efforts to build a salon, having subscribed a considerable sum for it. The word lodge, common to all idioms, derived from the English lodge, is proof. According to Mackey, of the English organ, origin of Masonic lodges everywhere, the same as the letter G is a substitute for Y in Yahweh, Jehovah, shows the same fact, although only in English, and in German it comes to represent the primitive idea of Dios, God, or Gat. But this word, which for the blue degrees simply means Dios, and is God, for the higher degrees, and for the supreme doctors of the lodges, is no more than the result of three Hebrew initials, G, O, D, of the three words Gomer, Oz, Dabar, which mean respectively wisdom, strength, and beauty. And if it were not for this coincidence, these high masons would not use the name of Dios, God, nor the letter G, which they are accustomed to put in a triangle of their lodges. Quote, it is a singular coincidence, says McLennan, a follower of Mackey, and worthy of thought, that the letters which form the English name of the divinity are the initials of the Hebrew words wisdom, strength, and beauty, the three great columns or metaphorical supports of masonry. They seem to present almost the only reason that can justify a mason in using the letter G in its visible suspension in the orient or east of the lodge instead of the delta. The coincidence seems more than accidental. Going farther into the explanation, the Masonic doctors arrive at the conclusion that these letters represent the prolific powers of nature, which is the grand architect of masonry. Touching the other degrees, joined to the first three recognized in the constitution of the Grandmother Lodge, 
I shall not enter into discussion of the opinions that there are concerning them. They can be seen in some of the works of the authors cited. I have here the resume of Nesta Weber. Quote, the following facts stand out. Number one, that whilst British craft masonry traces its origin to the operative guilds of masons, the Freemasons of France from 1737 onwards placed the origin of the order in crusading chivalry. Number two, that it was among these Freemasons that the upper degrees, known as the Scottish Rite, arose. And, number three, that, as we shall now see, these degrees clearly suggest Templar inspiration. It is not a rare thing to find in the authors on the subject the declarations of the Masons or ex-Masons, which attribute to the high degrees all the crimes and corruption which have been blamed on Masonry. This is true only in the sense that the secret of the high degrees has stirred up extraordinarily the spirit of subversion, which in the first degrees is not yet very frankly developed. Number 122. Origin of its Doctrines. Masonry, being a conglomeration of sects and of various degrees, formed in different times, and with occasions and tendencies actually very diverse, there is found traces of doctrines scattered in the history of humanity from the most remote periods to the most modern. The character common to all these doctrines is the opposition more or less declared complete to the dogmas of revelation. As Freemasonry is the anti-church, it has gone on gathering up all that Christian teaching has repudiated as absurd or as condemned as opposed to the word of God, and all that human reason, left to itself, has invented in its feebleness or in its propensity toward favoring the whims of the human heart. We will see it in a brief review of the principal systems of doctrines. I take the greater part from Benoit, FM 2, page 97, and the following pages. Number 123. Affinity to Protestantism. Why? Our attention is arrested by the fact that although Masonry has spread all over Europe from Protestant England, nevertheless it is in England where it has shown itself most peaceful and tolerant, the same as in the United States, even Chile itself. And I believe that I am not mistaken in saying that everywhere, from where I have seen also in Rome, that Masonry, which wages an implacable war of lies and violence against the Church, whenever it can do, manifests the greatest good will, if not favor, towards the Protestants, whatever sect they may be. How can this be explained? The explanation is quite obvious. Protestantism is a rebellion against the authority established in his church by our Lord Jesus Christ, expressly contained in the Bible, and indirectly and logically it is a rebellion against the same authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rationalism and deism continue the work commenced by Protestantism and the denial of God himself favored by Masonry or openly professed by it, it is a complement of these rebellions and denials. This is why the Masons declare that Protestantism is one half Masonry. Quote, Protestantism, says the Masonic magazine Latimia of Germany, is half Masonry. For this reason, Eugene Sue says, the best way to dechristianize Europe is to Protestantize it. And E. Quinet states, in order to put an end to all religion, I have here two roads which open before you. You can attack at the same time Catholicism and all the religions on earth, especially the Christian sects. In this case, you have opposing you, all the universe. On the contrary, you can arm yourselves with all those who are opposed to Catholicism, especially with the Christian sects who war against it. Gathering the force of the impulse of the French Revolution, you can put Catholicism in the greatest danger that has ever undergone. This is why I address myself to all creeds, to all religions which have combated Rome. They are all, whether they desire or not, in our ranks, since the foundation of their existence is irreconcilable with the domination of Rome as much as ours is." End quote. The Protestant sects are a thousand open doors through which to depart from Christianity. I have here a sufficiently powerful reason for which Masonry not only does not molest, but helps Protestantism, and also the reason why not only the simple faithful, but the Protestant ministers and bishops are as much at home in Masonic lodges as they are in their own homes. No one is going to combat his auxiliaries so long as he needs him. Another reason for this difference of conduct is that the Catholic on becoming a Mason has become an apostate to his own faith and has to quiet his remorse and justify this apostasy before his own conscience and before others. This is why he has to make greater efforts, manifest more hatred against what he has left if he does not want to turn back, with the shame of having permitted himself to be deceived. For this reason, Masonry makes the greatest effort to turn him into a fanatic, inflaming him with fury against what he has abandoned in order that it may be more difficult for him to return to his first faith. Number 124. Relationship with other sects, with the Templars. After what I have just said, it is not surprising that Masonry presents many affinities with Socianism, the philosophy of the heretic Socinius, who denied the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. 
as Monsignor Fava has noted in his discourse on the secret of masonry, for is one of the most rationalists of the Protestant sects. From the studies made by Webster, it is inferred that at least some Masonic sects have inherited doctrines and practices, at times abominable and criminal, from other older sects through the Rose Croix or Rosicrucians, and other anti-Christian and Satanic bodies that practiced the cult of Lucifer and worked magic and enchantment on the grand scale. See, for example, Chapter 4, Three Centuries of Occultism. Among the sects that are linked more closely and dearly with Masonry is that of the Templars, which seems to have continued to exist secretly after its abolition in 1312. I have here the resume of the affinity to Masonry which can be found as having had much in common with the Templars, for instance, the denial of the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the horror of the cross, war against Catholic clergy, the indecency of certain manifestations of goodwill and love, the secret meetings, the cult of magic, the justification of the means by the ends and night meetings. For this reason, the Freemasons are the panegyrists of the Templars, and, in some Masonic degrees of vengeance, which they vow against the assassins of Jacques de Molay, the Grand Master of the Templars, and of the corpse that they expose in the middle chamber in his memory. On this matter, Ragon, great Masonic doctor, says, quote, In Asia, the Templars take the initiation with the formulas and wearing the shawl of the Jews. The initiates, since the founding of Templarism, propagated in Europe the Masonic mysteries, and, without doubt, the secret practice of these mysteries must have inaugurated there the accusation of atheism and irreligion which caused the Templar Order's tragic end. Number 125, with the Albigenses. Pantheism and dualism, hatred of the God of the Bible, hatred of Jesus Christ and the blasphemy against him, duplicity or double idea of Christ, namely the one born in Bethlehem on the one hand and the spiritual Christ of the Albigenses on the other, which some German lodges have considered a mystic Christ underlie the Albigensian heresy. Many others take Christ to be simply a symbol of humanity, a man of genius, a benefactor, etc., and harbor hatred against the Catholic Church, contempt of its sacraments, especially against matrimony, the condemnation of generations, and favor license and customs similar to those of the Templars. Albigenses believed in the doctrine of transmigration and the transformation of souls, the division of rites. They had three degrees, first degree the catechumens, those taking instruction to prepare for baptism, second degree, the believers, and third degree, the perfect ones. They advocated the same violence against the churches and the objects of a religious service and held banquets on Good Friday, just as some Masonic degrees recommend should be a practice. Number 126, with some Arab sects. Those who have dedicated themselves to the most profound study of the historic roots of Masonry have not seen in the Templars anything more than a channel by means of which the doctrines and organizations of the Orient have become inculcated among the peoples of Europe. Among these sects, Webster points out some which were formed in the bosom of Islamism, and which, with their secret organizations, their degrees, their materialistic or dualistic degrees, and with their infamous and criminal practices, have been like a prelude of the sects which we see developing in the 18th century, under the shadow of, or on the basis of masonry. Such are, number one, the Ismailis, whose principal leader, Chief Abdullah Iba Maun, founded the sect of the Batinis with seven degrees. His method for attracting members and securing domination over the multitudes, besides the secret, was the institution of missionaries who talked to each person conveniently to gain him, and who, with prestigidation, as if they were miracles, and with the mask of piety and devotion, and with enigmatic discourse, etc., made the masses docile to work in the execution of his designs. He seems to have served as a model for Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati. Number two, the Karthamahites whose madness dominated the heart of Islamism for a century, until the universal conflagration, which was distinguished in blood, is another of the sects whose doctrine and practices are seen initiated in some Masonic sects. They profess dualism, the double principle of good and evil, the common ownership of goods and of women. They soon came to be a terrible band of murderers and robbers, given to all licentiousness. Their founder was Hossein Hawazali, sent from Abdullah to Iraq of Persia. Number three. The Fatimites increased the degrees established by Abdullah to nine. Quote, his method of lining up proselytes, quote, as, Jean, as Claude Jeannet has noted, and his system of initiation were absolutely those which Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati, prescribed in The Insinuating Brothers. Externally, the proselytes were of two classes, the wise and the ignorant. In the first degrees, as observed in Masonry, respect for religion was preserved, but they managed to go on diminishing the faith either by discrediting former teachers, or by putting all the prophets in the same category, including Moses, our Lord, and Muhammad. 
From the fifth degree onward, they openly work to destroy all religion. I have here the evident model of the Illuminati of the 18th century to which this descriptive summary of Van Hammer can apply. Quote, believe nothing and dare all, was, in two words, the sum total of the system, which destroyed every principle of religion and morality, and had no other object but that of the execution of ambitious plans by means of docile servants who, daring all and knowing nothing, until they considered all things a lie, and nothing prohibited, were the best implements of an infernal policy. Number four, the Druses, reduced to three degrees, profane, aspirants, and wise, and propelled a kind of worship of naturalism and Sabianism, with the faith of the Ismalis and the dynasty of Ali and of his successors, and an obtruse and esoteric creed about the naturalism of God, who they declared to be the universal reason, incarnations of Vishnu. Their catechism is very much like the one which the Masons use. Finally, the Hashishan, or Assassins, is another of the Arabian sects whose traces are discovered in modern Masonic sects. It is that terrible sect whose chief was the old man of the mountain. It had seven degrees. Its secrecy in regard to the profane was rigorous. They kept the fundamental doctrine of the sect of Islamism. They established a veritable reign of terror in the Orient, using the incentive of paradise as the spiritual pivot. They had a system of assassinations based on religious fervor to destroy all who opposed them. The Jacobins of 1793 were their legitimate descendants. Number 127. With the Polycans and the Manichaeans. With the Polycans, masonry has in comic, common magic words and expressions which enchant and deceive the simple people for the sake of pretense that they are accustomed to declare at times that they profess pure and primitive Christianity, and they exalt St. Paul above St. Peter, terming the former a more liberal spirit, etc. Similarly to the Manichaeans, masonry used to profess the following dogmas and principles, the God nature and dual principles, good and bad, light and darkness, the revolutionary spirit, the destroyer of order, war against property, against marriage, the satisfaction of carnal passions without any restraint, sun worship, the horror of eternal punishment, and the belief in the metapsychosis and transmigration of souls, the denial of the reality of Christ, as followed by some Masonic schools, the seductive words of light and truth, and their promise used to capture initiates, the imitation of the institutions of the Church, especially of baptism, communion, hierarchy, etc. The three fundamental degrees, which in the Manichaeans were the believers, the elect, and the perfect, the three signs of the mouth, of the hands, and of the genital organs. Because of the indecency of this last gesture, the lodges have suppressed it, retaining the other two as well as vestiges of the suppressed sign in the songs, and also in a certain Masonic degree. The vows about the secrets, the honor and praise given to all the heresies and the hatred of the Catholic Church, the mourning, attending the reception of the Master in the name of the, quote, sons of the widow, the last term being a reminder of the rich widow who adopted Mainz, the founder of Manichaeism. The affinities of Masonry with Manichaeism are evident. Weishaupt recommended to his adepts the study of Manichaeism, and Roderes praised Mainz as one of those men who have wished to put reason and truth in his religious faith. Number 128. With the Gnostics. The Gnostic affectation of science, Gnostic means wise, the variety of sects and rites, pantheism and dualism, denial of the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the pretension of possessing the true Christianity, the practice of magic, which is much recommended in certain Masonic sects, the doctrine of metempsychosis, the signs of recognition, the recommendation of abandoning family relationship, the common ownership of goods and women, the rehabilitation and veneration of great wrongdoers like Cain, Judas, etc., pointed out in the Bible, the dishonesty taught and practiced in certain rites and degrees, and the general license taught in all the degrees, one and all accord with the many-sided universal Freemasonry. It can be said that the same analogies are encountered within the first sect of heretics, which were found around Christianity from the earliest time, and whose principal elements were Jews. Chapter 2. Relationship of Masonry with Judaism Number 129. The Kabbalah and its division into Orthodox and Pharisaic sects Kabbalah is the name of the esoteric and occult doctrine which the Jews pretend to have received by oral tradition from Moses, and even from the beginning of the world. According to the Learned One, it is found contained principally in the two books called Book of the Creation and Zohar. It is claimed by those who follow the Kabbalah that it is a commentary on the Book of Moses that only the initiated can make. The importance of the Kabbalah had commenced after the 10th century of our era. The book Zohar is said to be founded by the Spanish Jew Moses de Leon, who died in 1305. There are authors who distinguish between an Orthodox Kabbalah and a Pharisaic Kabbalah. 
the Orthodox, which came at least from Moses and which was the true Jewish tradition, was purified of the alterations which it had received in the time of Esdras, and hidden from the people so that the people could not recognize the Messiah, and fell into forgetfulness after the dispersion of the Jews. It was resuscitated in the 15th century by the Jew Pagolo Ricci e Pico de la Mirandola. The converted Jew Drac has noted that knowledge of it brought about the conversion of many Jews. The Pharisaic Kabbalah was formed along with the Orthodox and according to Eliphaeus Levi, patriarch of modern occultism, it constitutes the dogma of high magic. There are Jews who claim that the Kabbalah has nothing to do with Orthodox Ju Judaism. Quote, the fact is, says Webster in regard to this, that the principal ideas of Zohar are found confirmed in the Talmud. As the Jewish Encyclopedia observes, the Kabbalah is not in real opposition to the Talmud, and many Talmudic Jews have supported and contributed to it. Adolf Frank has not hesitated to describe it as the heart and life of Judaism. The greater part of the most eminent rabbis of the 17th and 18th centuries firmly believed in the sacred character of the Zohar and in the infallibility of its teachings. The introduction of the Jewish element into the Templars from where it has passed to Masonry increased during the epoch of the Crusades. Quote, For by the state no less than three Kabbalahs appear to have existed. Firstly, the ancient secret traditions of the patriarchs handed down from the Egyptians through the Greeks and Romans, and possibly through the Roman Collegia to the craft masons of Britain. Secondly, the Jewish version of this tradition, the first Kabbalah of the Jews, and no way incompatible with Christianity, descending from Moses, David, and Solomon to the Essenes and the more enlightened Jews. And thirdly, the perverted Kabbalah, mingled by the rabbis with magic, barbaric superstitions, and, after the death of Christ, with anti-Christian legends. Whatever Kabbalistic elements were introduced into craft masonry at the time of the Crusades appeared to have belonged to the second of these traditions, the unperverted Kabbalah of the Jews, known to the Essenes. There are, in fact, striking resemblances between Freemasonry and Essenism. Degrees of initiation, oaths of secrecy, the wearing of the apron, and a certain Masonic sign. Whilst to the Sabiist traditions of the Essenes may perhaps be traced the solar and stellar symbolism of the lodges, the Hiramic legend may belong to the same tradition. Number 130, the relation of masonry with the Kabbalah. Moreover, the Masonic authors, i.e. Pike, Mackey, as well as the anti-Masonic writers, attribute to masonry a direct relationship with Kabbalah. Concerning the philosophic doctrine, both hold that the world is identical with God, that is pantheism, and consequently materialism is the bisexualism of God, to which American authors have given great importance, as if it were the great secret of masonry. Quote, the search for the word, the finding of divine truth, says Mackey, this and only this is the work of a mason, and the word is his reward. This word comes to be a masonic invention to convert into a bisexual name, the Hebrew name of Dion, Yahweh, or Jehovah. Masonry also manifests its relation with the converted Kabbalah introduced first in some of the most terrible Masonic sects, such as the Illuminati, the Martinists, the Rosicrucians, etc., and in modern Masonry through the moral doctrine which permits hypocrisy, lying, robbery, dishonor, when attempting to do ill to the Gentiles or even to the non-Jews, all things which are much practices in Masonry, as we have seen, when it tries to gain its end, while professing the same principle common to the Kabbalah that the end justifies the means. The Masonic ritual shows evidence of its Jewish origin, the symbols commencing with the Bible itself, the coat of arms, which treats of displaying and heraldy the various forms of cherubim described in the second vision of Ezekiel, an ox, a man, a lion, and an eagle, the two columns of the Masonic temple, this last a reminder of the temple of Solomon, the reconstruction of the temple, which is the Masonic work, etc. The legends and catechisms taken in great part from the Bible intermixed almost always with Masonic lore, especially the legend of Hiram, which played an important part in the Masonic ritual. The words or usual terms, like the names of the columns, Boaz and Jachin, the words of recognition in the passwords, that is, Tubal Cain, Shibale, etc. The importance which is given to numbers, a thing belonging to the Kabbalah, is also another testimony of Kabbalistic influence in Masonry. Finally, the deeds, the explosion of satanic hatred against the Church, against our Lord Jesus Christ, the horrible blasphemies uttered by the revolutionary Masons in France are only the expression and the culmination of the aspirations of the Kabbalistic and secret sects which, during so many centuries, have been working secretly against Christianity. What the Bolsheviks, the majority of whom are Jews, are doing now in Russia against Christianity is no more than another edition of what the Masons did in the French Revolution. 
The executors are different. The doctrine that moves and authorizes the terror and the supreme direction are the same. Number 131. Epilogue concerning its origin, for once the truth is told. I do not think it necessary for me to delay in acquainting my readers with the relation which masonry has or pretends to have with the more ancient sects, the Egyptian, the Chaldeans, the Indo-Brahmins, the Greeks, Persians, etc. From those sects or schools, it has imitated the doctrine of the dual principle, exoteric or external, and esoteric or occult, the latter reserved for the initiates. From these sources come also its doctrine or pantheism or materialism, the dualism or bisexualism of God, the emanation of souls, their metempsychosis, etc. He who is interested can read Proust, who explains with greater care what the Masonic doctors teach, at least the North Americans. It remains for me only to discover the reason why Masonry exists at all. In the Masonic legends of certain degrees, it is customary to say that Masonry descends from Cain, the son of Eve, from Iblis, the Masonic angel of light, or perhaps the Lucifer of the Christians, whereas, according to them, it comes from Satan himself, who, for them, is the good God, the eternal enemy of Jehovah, the God of the Bible and of the Christians. I believe that the readers who have taken account of what has been said hitherto, especially in the matter of the doctrines and morals practice, commencing with the constitutional or social lies constantly and manifestly approved, followed by the violence and crimes committed, I believe, I say, that the readers will find that in the boastfulness of masonry about its exalted origin, even though enveloped in deceit, tells a truth which no one will dispute. It comes spiritually from Satan, not in the form which it claims, of course. The devil has been a seducer, that is to say, a deceiver from the beginning. He has been the instigator of all the sins, the murder of souls, the cause of rebellions, of all impurities, of all the culpable human license. The devil has said to man that he would be like God. The devil has been the implacable enemy of Christ, instigating against him all kinds of treachery, heresies, and persecutions. Masonry, which has done the same thing, is really his legitimate child and his instrument in the world. The devil is the father of lies, and masonry is a lie in its nature as well, for the necessity of its existence. It is truly the child of Iblis, or Satan, and has every reason for offering him worship and singing him hymns, as it does in some of its degrees. Chapter 3 is masonry the instrument of Judaism? Number 132. The most important question of the day. This is one of the most important questions which presents itself to the student of masonry. It is not my intention, nor can it be, to stir up hatred against the race destined to unite itself some day with the Christians in the knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. The race from which bursts forth upon all the earth the fountain of all the blessings which Christian civilization has brought to the world in spite of all the efforts which have been made to obstruct its actions. That is not my intention, but it is my desire to call the attention of the readers to a subject which is worth the trouble of studying, as much from the standpoint of religion as from that of economics and politics. Since my youth, there have resounded together in my ears the names of Masonry and Judaism, of Masons and Hebrews, and the attacks upon the Catholic Church. Was it simple coincidence, or is it in reality an effective union, and perhaps dependence, between these two entities? Recently, books have been written and continue to be written to show that masonry is no more than the mask with which Judaism conceals from the nations its anti-Christian designs for universal economic and political domination. According to these authors, masonry is only the poor tool, generally unrecognized, of the Jewish supreme government. Copen Abincelli has dedicated a book to prove it. His reasons certainly make one think. Because of the impossibility of giving many details, I'm only going to indicate the general trends which show the strict relation and subordination to the lodges to Judaism. The situation is due, on the one hand, to the condition of conquered race both in religious and civil life. Dispersed and despised or persecuted, not only on account of its religious traditions, but because of the sordid avarice which has made it the owner of the wealth of the peoples among whom it has lived. And on the other hand, this race lives supported tenaciously by an ideal which has never abandoned that of world domination through the medium of its messiah, personal or symbolic. In its perpetual opposition to the society in which it lives, the Jewish race, with its central government, which preserves its national unity, could do nothing more than conspire perpetually against the Christian people, making use, consequently, of secret societies in order to gain its ends. This is a consideration a priori in view of the condition of the Jews. Does the reality of the facts correspond with it? We shall soon see. In the same vein in which Copen Abincelli writes, the author of The Cause of World Unrest, distinguishes among the Jews one peaceful group, patriotic and loyal to the nation it has chosen, and another which follows the dream of universal government, and in order to accomplish it, are working for a universal revolution as they are doing in Russia, 
and from there are working to bring it about in the entire world. Another point Webster makes in her work, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, in which, noticing that where Masonry is more subversive, the Jewish element is less so, and where Masonry does not exist or is less subversive, there the Jewish element is more so, she arrived at this dilemma, quote, either Masonry is the veil under which the Jews, like the Illuminati, prefer to work, so that where they cannot take advantage of the veil, they are obliged to come more into the light, or Grand Orient Masonry is the directing power which uses the Jews as its agents in those countries where it cannot work on its own behalf. Monsignor Junin, the tireless exponent of Judaism and Freemasonry, manifests the same convictions as Copen Abincelli in his study of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, etc. Number 133. Masonic Consideration for the Jews. In Masonry, there has always been noted the great and special consideration for the Jews. When speaking of superstition, the Jewish religion is never mentioned. When the French Revolution broke out, French citizenship was persistently asked for the Jews. Being refused at first, they persisted in asking for it and it was granted. The reader will recall that in those days the Catholics were put to death. Masonry has looked with horror upon anti-Semitism, to such an extent that an anti-Semitic brother, who believed in good faith and the tolerance of political opinions of Masonry, once offered himself as candidate for the post of deputy and was elected. But when he tried for re-election, express orders were given in the lodges, which had to be obeyed. Number 134. The Preponderance of Jews in the Lodges In 1860, a mason of Berlin, taking account of the preponderance of Jews in the lodges, wrote a newspaper of Munich, quote, There is in Germany a secret society of Masonic form which is subject to unknown rulers. The members of this association are for the greater part Jews. In London, where one encounters, as is well known, the forces of revolution, there are two Jewish lodges under the Grand Master Palmerston, which never see a Christian pass their doors. There is where are gathered together all the thread of plots woven in the Christian lodges. Quote, in Rome, another lodge, composed entirely of Jews, which also joins together a whole network of Christian lodges, is the supreme tribunal of the revolution. From there, the other lodges are directed as if by secret leaders, so that the greater part of the Christian revolutionaries are only puppets manipulated by Jews by means of the mysteries. In Leipzig, on the occasion of the fair which causes Jewish and Christian busyness, men from all over Europe to gather in the city, the Jewish lodge, and each time permanent, and never has a Christian mason been received into it. Here is something that will amaze more than one of us. None but secret messengers have access to the Jewish lodges of Hamburg and Frankfurt. Cousineau de Masseau refers to this fact, which confirms the former, quote, Since the outbreak of the revolution in 1848, I was associated with a Jew who, out of vanity, betrayed the secret of the secret societies in which he was a member and always notified eight or ten days in advance of all the revolutions that were going to break out at any point in Europe. To him I own the unbreakable conviction that all these great movements of the oppressed people, etc., are manipulated by a half-dozen inv individuals who give their orders to the secret societies of all Europe. The ground beneath our feet is completely mined, and the Jews provide a great contingent of these miners. In 1870, De Camille wrote in The World that in a, in a town in Italy, he had met one of his old acquaintances, a mason, and having asked him how the order was, he answered him, quote, I left my lodge of the order definitely, because I have acquired the profound conviction that we are only the instruments of Jews who are pushing us toward a total destruction of Christianity. As a confirmation of the above, I am going to transcribe some information which I found in Revue des Societies Secrets. Quote, According to the Russian Tribune, which appears in Munich in the Russian language, militant Judaism would maintain upon different levels the following combat organizations more or less disguised, but all with the end of preparing the triumph of the Third International. First, the Golden International, Plutocracy and High Finance International, at whose head are found A. In America, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, and Vanderlippi. Some of these names do not seem to be the best chosen. B. In Europe, the House of Rothschild and others of secondary order. Second, the Red International, or Union International of the Social Workers' Democracy. This includes A, the second international, that of Belgium under Jew van der Velde, B, the two and a half international, that of Vienna under the Jew Adler, and C, the third international of Communist International, that of Moscow under the Jews Affelbaum and Radek. Quote, to this hydra with three heads, which for greater convenience operate separately, six are added, the Prof Intern, International Office of Professional Associations, which have their seat in Amsterdam and dictate the Jewish word to the syndicates 
not even affiliated with Bolshevism. Third, the Black International, or Judaistic Combat Union. Its principal organ, paper, is disseminated by Universal Organization of Zionists, London, by the Universal Israelite Alliance, established in Paris, by the Jew Kermot, by the Jewish Order of Banai Moshe, Son of Moses, and the Jewish societies Henelust, Hidakodot, Darbut, Keren Haisod, and a hundred others, more or less hidden and spread throughout the countries of the Old and New World. Fourth, the Blue International, or International Masonry, which unites all the Masons in the world by the means of, quote, the Reformed United, Reunited Lodge of Great Britain, also the Grand Lodge of France, of the Grand Orients of France, Belgium, Italy, Turkey, and remaining countries. The active center of this aggregation, as our leaders know, is the Grand Lodge Alpine in Switzerland. The Judeo-Masonic Order of Benai Birth, which, contrary to the statutes of the Masonic Lodges, accepts only Jews, and which numbers in the world more than 426 strictly Jewish lodges, serves as liaison between all the internationals mentioned above. Quote, the directors of Benai Birth are the Jews, Morgenthau, late former ambassador of the United States in Constantinople, Grandiers, late supreme judge in the United States, Mac, Zionist, Warburg, Felix Bankers, Elkus Drauss, Alfred, its first president, Schiff, now dead, who supported and engineered the emancipation movement of Jews in Russia, Marshall, Zionist. We know for certain, says Webster, that the hundred authorities to which we have referred, Grand Orient Masonry, Theosophy, Pan-Germanism, International Finance, and the Social Revolution have a very real existence and exercise a very definite influence in world affairs. Concerning this, we consider no mere hypothesis but facts, deeds backed up by the documented evidence. Unified or not, as Jewish power, the Jews find themselves cooperating with all the five powers whose existence is known, if not actually directing them. So the Jews, for a long period of time, have held the directing role in masonry of the Grand Orient and predominate in the higher offices. Number 135, Judaic Action and Masonic Front Against Catholicism. There is no doubt that Masonic activity against the Catholic Church is no more than the continuation of the war against Christ practiced by Judaism for the last 1900 years, and indeed that has been rendered possible by the help of secret, deceit, and hypocrisy adjusted to the circumstances of the Christian world against which Judaism has but to wage its war. Read the Gospel and you will see, and Jewish espionage, and their captious questions, and their hypocritical attacks clothed with the veil of pretended piety of the Pharisees, and the efforts to make him hated before the people, Christ, who was their greatest glory and their wonderful benefactor, and the use of gold to corrupt an apostle, and the formation of public opinion against Christ, and the preference for Barabbas, and the fury and false accusations with which they tried to bury the memory of Christ in shame, and the constant opposition, many times bloody, against the preaching of the apostles, etc. In all this, you will see the same that masonry practices today, at times in very subtle form, and at other times in more violent form. Judaism was anti-Christian, and masonry, and the service of the same Judaism, is still anti-Christian. The same hatred, the same hypocrisy, the same violence, the same deceitful lies of action of the Church of Christ, to accuse it, after having impeding its doing good it could have done, for not having done it. Quote, Let us not forget that rabbinical Judaism is the declared and implacable enemy of Christianity, says Webster. The hate for Christianity and the person of Christ is not a remote thing of history, nor can it be seen as a result of persecution. It forms an integral part of the rabbinical tradition organized before any persecution of the Jews against the Christians had taken place, and has continued in our country long after that persecution had ended. Further, on the same author notes that, after three centuries of peace that they enjoyed in England, and which they themselves have been permitted to become employees of the state, to join the Masonic lodges, etc., they have done nothing to temper the hatred for Christianity inculcated in them through nine centuries by rabbinical teachings. For its part, the British Guardian, March 13, 1925, makes this affirmation that for those who are accustomed to hear the spirit of tolerance preached as it's predominated in the Anglo-Saxon countries, it is all a revelation. Quote, the Christian church is attacked today as it has never been before throughout the centuries, and this attack is almost exclusively the work of the Jews. For the rest, the relations of masonry or of the Judaistic persecutor of the Catholic Church, and according to many cases, there is proof they are directed toward Christianity. For instance, that of Bolshevism and Communism in Mexico, in Russia, in Hungary, and with the threat of accomplishing the same infiltration in all countries is public knowledge, as is the relation of Judaism with masonry. 
He who desires dates and documents can read them in the works in English mentioned above and in Monsignor Junin's Le Pereil Judeo Maconique, the Judeo Masonic Danger. Number 136. The Protocols of the Wise or Ancients of Zion. A word about this document will not be amiss. Its authenticity has been much discussed, and therefore we will not go into it. But whoever should read them and know something of their history will not be less astonished by the reality of the outline plan of the genuine or alleged wise elders of Zion than by the efforts made by Jewry to bury the, quote, protocols in oblivion. First, by burning an entire edition in Russia, they, by lying about the existence of a copy in the Library of London and making great efforts to prevent an edition from being published in the United States. No New York Daily Papers will publish statements about it. These protocols contain a proposed plan for the Jews and a directive, as they say, to accomplish the ideal of complete domination of the world under a Jewish government by corrupting morals, impoverishing nations in favor of the Jews, and by the constant agitation and discontent that should reach such proportions that the people would throw themselves into the arms of the Jews to be saved from anarchy and misery, only to be treated subsequently as they were the Gentiles in Russia under the Soviets, whose leaders are almost all Jews. I have read a refutation of the Protocol's authenticity, written by a Jesuit in a Belgian daily. It seems that the Jews have been very intent on relegating them to the category of plagiarism, making them to appear to have been copied for the most part from the book of Maurice Jolie, Dialogues Ox Infers Entre Machiavelliat Montesquieu, published in 1864. Webster gives the following statement from her studies on this material, quote, The protocols are either a simple steal from the work of Maurice Jolie, in which case the prophetic passages accumulated by Nihilus or someone else remain without explanation, or they are a revised edition of a plan entrusted to Jolie in 1864, brought out at that time and transformed to be adapted to changing conditions by those who were the former conspirators. If in this case the authors of the protocols were Jews, or if the Jewish parts have been interpolated by the people into whose hands they have fallen, that is another story. In that case, we have to admit the collapse of all direct evidence. An international circle of world revolutionaries that works with the same plans as the Illuminati whose existence has already been pointed out, offers a perfectly possible alternative to the, quote, ancient wise elders of Zion. It should be much easier, without a doubt, to absolve the Jews from all suspicion of complicity if they and their friends had adopted a more direct course from the time the protocols first appeared. Some years ago, when a book of like nature directed against the Jesuits contended to give as a secret plan of revolution something very like the protocols, the Jesuits did not abandon themselves to invective, nor demand that the book be burned by them, nor did they result to fantastic apologies, but only stated quietly that the charge was a fabrication and that ended the affair. But from the moment the protocols were published, the Jews and their friends have resorted to all methods of torturous defense, bringing pressure against the editors, succeeding in the fact to restrict the sale of the book, appealing to the Secretary of the Interior to order suppression of them, concocting one refutation after another without foundation, all contradictory, after a matter that, at the time when a solution held actually as a correct one appeared, we should have already been assured a dozen times that the protocols had been refuted and the explanation complete by satisfactory agreement. If finally a real plausible explanation had been discovered, why was it not presented in a convincing manner? All that was necessary was to establish the origin of the protocols as having been found in the work of Maurice Jolie, given the parallel places in support of this declaration. Why the necessity of embroiling a good cause in a web of obvious fable? Why this display of confidential sources of information? Why a pretense that Jolie's book was so rare as to be almost impossible to find when browsing in libraries would have proved the contrary? For that purpose was the allusion to Constantinople as the place to, quote, find the key of hidden secrets to the mysterious Mr. X, who did not wish his real name to be known, and the anonymous ex-official of Okrana, who by chance bought the same copy of the dialogues employed in the compilation of the protocols for the same Okrana, even though the fact was ignored by the official in question. Moreover, why, if Mr. X was a privileged Russian owner of the Orthodox religion and a constitutional monarchist, was he experiencing such anxiety about discrediting his own monarchist co religionists who should bold effrontery in stating that, quote, the ma only Masonic organization, such as the Protocol spoke of, namely a system of abominable Machiavellian nature, which had been able to discover in South Russia was the monarchy, is evident that even the complete history of the Protocols has not been yet given, and that much remains to be uncovered bearing on this mysterious affair. Concerning this matter, you may consult Lambelin, La Regne d'Israël chez les Anglo-Saxon, Israel Kingdom amongst the Anglo-Saxons, Monsignor Junin's La Pero Judeo Menaconique, 
the Jewish Masonic danger, the cause, etc. For one to whom this question is of interest, the work of Henry Ford especially will give him abundant insight. The international Jew, which, with very good reasoning, and much data supports the Judaic authenticity of the Protocols. Part 5. Masonry's Method of Action. Chapter 1. General Methods. Number 137. It is necessary to recognize its methods. One would willingly blind oneself and would reap no appreciable gain by not recognizing that Masonry exercises an extensive and complicated activity in the world and that its influence is very powerful under whatever aspect you may view it. And if added to this in the coordination with Judaism, or even its cooperation with it, that action and influence becomes much more efficacious and transcendental. In England and the United States, the number of its affiliates is truly great, considered by itself and in relation to the population of these countries. But in the Catholic countries, the proportion is wont to be very insignificant, and in no way corresponds to the predominance that Masonry is accustomed to enjoy in the former countries. How has it attained this? Here's what I'm going to say briefly, following chiefly Father Benoit. Number 138. The Method of Judging. Quote, Let one understand, says Copenhagen Chile, that from the day following his initiation, the Mason conveys everywhere around him the force of the action that is exercised incessantly upon his spirit. Masons repeat what they have heard said by the preachers of the occult powers, the journalist in his articles, the publisher in his writings, the dramatic author in his plays, the singer in his songs, the pornographer in his infamous productions, the professor in his courses, the instructor in his classes. All of these disseminate in various ways the teachings that they have received and the ideas which they are impregnated with. The state of mind created and filled in the lodges as in a well-stocked storehouse is the profane medium, met everywhere, and the mind is altered by it. And, as the Freemasons perform this duty of propagandists not revealing themselves as Masons, the activity which they exert is not recognized as Masonic. The moderate, patriotic, even religious daily paper can have, without it being known, Masons on its staff, who say only what they can say, yet they are found in the lodge of the rabid Freemasons of the Lantern and the Action. If it does not have its Freemasons, it has one or another of its editors saturated, thanks to the individual influences carefully concealed in the Masonic spirit, diluted to a convenient degree so that it can be absorbed in the way in which it would work. These exponents of Masonry, for their part, transmit to their associates the spirits that they have received. And so it is that our press, even that of the opposition, is attacked at many points by Masonic infiltrations. The same thing happens in the factories, parlors, and in the groups which we constitute in such a manner that for such a state of affairs there exists but one single remedy, which, unfortunately, is that to which we resort the least, and which consists in knowing the characteristics of the Masonic spirit and of opposing it in everything, uniting and submitting to the intellectual and moral discipline which the opposite state of spirit represent. What the author says about France is perfectly applicable to Chile and any other country. Number 139. The Hierarchic Action As one easily understands, action by the Masonic hierarchy is most efficacious for all propaganda. From the Supreme Council emanates a suggestion to work in a given manner to propagate a definite idea, and in that moment the action begins in all parts of the country where there is a Masonic nucleus and at times even where there is but a single brother devoted to the service of the order. And as is wont to make use of the press, there are the published ideas which they seek to circulate, the sentiments which they wish to make felt. Immediately, telegrams begin to arrive from all parts of the country, expressing the opinion artificially formulated by those directing the plot. And since the rest of the public does not suspect the plot, the Masons do not let the public's voice be heard. In that matter, the only voice that is heard and the only opinion which is allowed to be expressed is that which the Grand Orient has wished to express. And there you have formed, as if by magic, a public opinion, perhaps entirely contrary to the ideas of the majority of the population. When Belen de Saraga was about to come to in Quique by Masonic manipulations, as it has been said, 
there was carefully formed a union of journalists, and then the press began by the order of masonry, or suggested by them, a clamor presenting her as a great confederate. The rest of the daily papers, partly because of their solidarity with the former, partly so as not to be left without anything to say about a matter of which they knew nothing, follow suit. The city, the people themselves, had no other information about the Mason's true character and intent other than the very modest note inserted in the Sunday, La Lux, and that when favorable opinion had already been formulated about the Masonic spokesman. The hierarchy of Masonry, the Supreme Council, had formed public opinion to their tastes. Number 140. The Press. It is also most effective everywhere than is ordinary believed, precisely by the reason of secrecy with which it is made to serve the order. Through the press, the order works with all its means and designs, from the most impious and callous to the most hypocritically disguised, designed for all categories of readers, so that some will not become frightened, and so that others will not become more and more hardened. The instruments are distinct. The head directs the same. The claims of masonry in favor of some work are powerful, as is deduced from the aforesaid. In a given moment, they let it be heard from one end of the country to another, and sometimes the entire world. There are lodges, circles or centers of the brothers. There are daily papers, which they are in, and if by some enchantment they all start to place in the clouds, productions at times well mediocre, without the rest of the world knowing, of the plot that has been formed to make ready the work. I have had occasion to see that at times the results were simply infamous. The minute the press, which is destined for the public, sprouts and is disseminated in all places, is directed or sponsored and aided in all ways by masonry, in reviews, almanacs, novels, treaties, etc. The popular libraries established by masonry or directed by them abound in productions that carry their spirit and cause their work to destroy the faith, Christian morals, and sane social ideas. Hardly anyone least suspicious the intent accumulated in those works of such tendencies and others have been written that might contradict the lying propaganda and the immorality that is found in them. Number 141. Masonic Societies, which are less perfect. In order to carry out their plans, without opening their doors too much, the Masons have created many societies which formulate their own principles and live according to their spirit. The chief ones are the International or International Society of Workers, the Universal Republican Alliance, the International Alliance of the Socialist Democracy, the Nihilists, the Fenians, the Fraternal Union of Working, Societies of Italy, the International Society of Free Thinkers, the International Society of Universities, Young Italy and Young Europe, the League of Teachers, etc. The general characteristic of all these associations is hatred toward the Catholic religion, Christ and God, community of property and licentiousness as regards to marriage. For more details regarding its origin, its organization, its alliance with masonry, I recommend Don Benoit's work, La Franc Maconeria, Volume 2. Among these sects, I call your attention to the one of freethinkers or associations that have taken the pledge to die outside any religious cult whatsoever. This is the limit of evil, to vow to close all doors to divine mercy. Number 142. Auxiliary Societies There are various kinds of masonry. Among them, we should count in the first place the public societies organized according to the Masonic principles, like the Sansimonians, the Fortiists, or Valentinians in France, and the New Harmony in England and the United States. Ragon, great doctor of the Grand Orient of France, used to say about these, quote, Due to its immense power of association, masonry is the only one able to realize in a creative communion this great and beautiful social society created by San Simon, Owen, and Fourier. Let the masons will it, and the generous conceptions of those philanthropic thinkers will cease to be vain utopias. All three associations professed pantheism, communism, family dissolution, etc. Among these societies, we have to count the Education League, 
whose program has inconspicuously been tried among us in order to reach the desired ends of the institution of the godless, compulsory and exclusively public schools. And the same category is the League for the Defense of Human Rights, which name conceals the purpose of providing one more means to serve the ends of the occult direction of the lodges. Such as these, there are a number of social societies or culture centers, sometimes very short-lived, which sprung from Masonic inspiration, which directly or indirectly work either for the realization of their program, or at least in preparing the right atmosphere of this kind of societies. Either scientific or literary masonry has taken advantage in order to spread its anti-Christian and revolutionary ideas during the last century, also utilizing the scientific congresses in order to facilitate the liberal and free movement of their agents in those centers where such a propaganda was more useful or would bring the best results. Number 143, Public Societies Without Sectarian Purposes. Masonry takes great care to infiltrate all kinds of various associations and to dominate them by placing its members until, when the majority prevails, they can close the doors to those who are not fully in accord with the sect. Let us take, for example, a teaching association, founded, if not by priests, at any rate, by Catholics. A wealthy gentleman, whose affiliation to masonry is ignored, comes to such a society, and he enters it with apparently good intentions. When the doors have been opened to him, he later on proposes another harmless mason like himself for membership and nobody will deny it to him because no one suspects actions taking place in the very bosom of the society. Even the members of the sect themselves ignore the final results. And in a few years, such a society, Catholic as it was, will be converted into a Masonic society, thanks to the secretiveness of Masonry and the confidence and simplicity of the initial members. And it is in this manner that the Masonic spirit enters little by little in all kinds of military, literary, welfare, sport, teaching, and other societies. Quote, you are not at this moment, Brother Blotton used to say at the convention of 1892, a majority. You are only the officials. You have not as yet grouped sufficiently the troops that you must lead to combat. You cannot call these troops to your lodges. But I tell you with a profound personal conviction, you need, under the means that have been found, thanks to the elements which you already can gather among you, all those masses of universal suffrage which do not ask for anything but to be disciplined by you. The Masonic Congress of Amiens in 1894 recommended the creation of societies acting under the Masonic inspiration in these terms, quote, Our commission has decided that this means ought to be called to your attention in a very special way. It will give, in fact, to you all the opportunity to make your ideas predominate everywhere if we have the talent to organize such societies, however always remaining concealed. Masonry, says a Masonic newspaper of the United States, works calmly and secretly, but it penetrates through all the pores of society in its many relations. And those who receive its multiple favors are amazed at its great deeds, without being able to tell where they have come from. The real strength of Masonry, it states on another occasion, in its external work lies undoubtedly in the fact that there are many more Masons, sometimes better qualified for carrying out of the Masonic work outside the Brotherhood than within it. Masonry itself, and Europe and America, creates societies and institutions of similar characteristics and ends in all the classes of society and spreads its spirit among them. Number 144. Boy Scouts. I'm going to dedicate a special paragraph to this institution because of the importance which it is having everywhere. The institution of Boy Scouts was created by the English General Baden Powell, apparently only to develop physical energy among children as well as the spirit of initiative and welfare. He never thought, at least that is what has been said in the rules and regulations say so, to take advantage of this institution for anti-religious means. On the contrary, children were taught the obligation of fulfilling their religious duties and they were given time and opportunity to do so. This is how the Catholic Boy Scouts were established without interfering with the fulfillment of their religious duties but stressing them as a complement to youth and their handiwork enabling them to practice the Scouts exercises 
together with the means and the supernatural forces which result from the fulfillment of religious duties and the practice of sacraments and prayer. This is how we have seen them come in large numbers, an irreproachable presentation to pay tribute and homage to the Holy Father and to receive his advice and blessings. However, masonry, which has stealthily taken over teaching in almost all Latin countries, has also easily seized the direction of the Boy Scouts and betraying the faith of the children and the confidence of their Catholic parents. It takes advantage of the institution and its rules and regulations to take them away from the fulfillment of their religious duties, which are most necessary and fundamental to man, and it prepares their affiliation in the sex. That is why much effort is made in spreading the institution and in letting it escape out of Masonic hands. The Boy Scouts constitute but one day's work in Masonic high advance. The very soul of the whole brigade throughout the Republic was composed of Masons. Nevertheless, last year came an alarming crisis in this beautiful institution in almost all the cities. Following what occurred this year, 1918, a reaction has been initiated which will restore the activities of all the existing directories and brigade and which will multiply the organisms of this institution. All the defeats which paralyze its development are being studied, and an effort is made for their correction. Let no Mason forget the circumstances whereby the enemy of Masonry delivered Scoutism into our hands, sealed by the approval of public opinion and the indelible Masonic seal. Such were the words of Venerable Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Chile in its message of 1918. The Shrewd Reader after reading the above-mentioned words, will immediately recognize that, according to the confession of the Grand Master himself, the ecclesiastical authority of Chile had complete reason to denounce the Boy Scouts as a society directed by Masonry. It was not Masonry which put the Masonic seal on the institution, but the public decoration of the very things which the Grand Master had so proudly told in the Grand Orient Lodge. Quote, I did not want to make the followers of Scoutism sorrowful, the Le Temps editor wrote on March 27, 1924, nor fill with such sudden indignation the hearts of children who belong to it with ar some ardor. But I confess that the reading of special organs, which have as a purpose to maintain the mystic zeal in these use, is sometimes very confusing for an atheist. I have before my eyes a monthly bulletin of the Unionist chiefs of France, and I notice a work whose importance and necessity will not be concealed from anybody namely, the official rules of the Pax. In France, it applied to dogs or wolves, and is used to designate malefactors or gangs. What is wanted, I abbreviate, what Le Temps says, is to say to make wolves out of the Boy Scouts. They are grouped under the flag of wolf, and the wolf is their totem, animal recognized as an ancestor of their clan or worshipped like a god. Baden-Powell has declared that his subordinates have to subject themselves to the gospel of the Book of the Jungle and adhere to the wolf cub's habits. Quote, the experiment has been made at the camp of Cappy, says the editor of that official bulletin of the scouts and light bearers, name used to designate some companies or brigades of scouts, that at the end of six days, all the chiefs, and of course, with more reason, the children from eight to twelve years old, will be convinced that they are wolves. The screams or exclamations which are taught them resemble wolves, howls, yahoo, yahoo, yap, yap, yahoo, screams which are sung, the music for which came in the above mentioned bulletins. It is of course not very nice that a child should be trained as though they were, he were a wolf. It is not strange, therefore, that in the parades of Boy Scouts we should not be carried so far as to prefer them in attention and charity to human beings who are often forgotten. The same tendency is carried out in children's societies, colonies, and other cultural centers, directed by brother Masons or by members of the teaching staff, who consciously or otherwise are instruments of Masonic plans. People will probably say, quote, What evil is there in such institutions? Apparently none, or little. Perhaps in reality, they are directed in a way to take the youth away from religion. They make attendance to Holy Mass and Catechism incompatible with their actions or reunions, depriving scouts of the means of obtaining instruction in their religion or from performing their duties. 
Besides, they little by little become religiously indifferent, and at first neglecting their duties, and later on attacking religion covertly with historic deeds or scientific theories which cast a doubt, arriving finally at the open attack and blasphemy. Of course, attack on the clergy is the first thing that is taken care of, in order to destroy any defense that the Catholic faith may have, do the confidence and communication of Catholics with their directors and teachers in religious matters. The fanatical ideas which are given to the youth are such that it is enough for somebody to propose to them the reading of a book written by a priest or defending religion for him to spurn it without further ado. The breaking up of the family spirit and the alienating of the child from home to weaken its influence and subject him to strange things is a damage which the high Italian chiefs had in mind about one century ago, as is stated in some other place. Number 145. Parties. It is almost sure, considering the spirit which gives it life, that the YMCA, or Young Men's Christian Association, is directly patronized by masonry, Protestant as it is, and called upon to separate youth from the fulfillment of their Christian duties. Youths who innocently allow themselves to be carried away by the attraction of pastimes. Our dances on Saturday nights, prolonged until dawn Sunday, and all other social parties, etc., which produce the same effect of leaving the great majority of those who attend them without Sunday Mass attendance, the result of some Masonic plan? The frequency with which such actions are repeated makes one think so, as there is no clear reason to justify them. Number 146, Public Masonic Meetings, called, quote, White and Grand Orient Masonry, Public meetings are held at which the doors of the temple are open to the ignorant, and they are even invited to assist under the pretext of some party given by the order. They are one of the means to gather friends, dispel the fear and the objections against the lodges that the profane might have, or also with the purpose of making women adopt masonry. In one of those, one of the brothers gives a lecture in relation with the object they pursue. Dom Benoit gives as an example of three white or public meetings whose themes were the Masonic role of women in the 19th century and the free, obligatory, and professional teachings in one white meeting in which four sects had been gathered in May 1877. One of the venerable gave a lecture on, quote, the dangers of the clerical invasion and the doctrines of the marvelous, urging the ladies to instruct themselves in Masonry, of course, reflecting their actual instruction, which is not based but on revelation and mysticism. What has been said above is enough for the Catholics to know what to do when they are invited to those gatherings and are told they are harmless. Of course, it can be supposed that it is not so innocent to go to a temple where, consciously or otherwise, in a concealed manner or openly, God is denied and anything that is not God is worshipped. Number 147. Theosophical Societies Masonry usually patronizes anything which goes against Catholic teachings. From its heart sprout either the founders or the spreaders of all systems of doctrines which could alienate Catholics from religious practice. Among the things which has favored very steadily in theosophy and all that refer to occult science, Madame Blavatsky, the promoter or founder of theosophy in Europe, was also a member of the Masonic Lodges. Her successor, Anna Bassant, president of the Theosophical Society in 1911, was vice president and great teacher of the Supreme Council of the International Order of Co-Masonry. And among us, in our city, the Brother Masons are the ones that contribute mostly to the spread of the Theosophical Society. It is understood the Theosophical doctrines on the nature of God and same doctrines as taught in Masonry. It is enough to read the books dealing with the history of Theosophy to see that each Theosophical center is founded, almost without a doubt, by members of the Lodges. And as long as among us there are persons who, by mere curiosity, let themselves get affiliated to the Theosophical Centers on, or Lodges, it would be a good idea to let them know something which Webster said regarding these sects in her book so frequently quoted about co-masonry and about the insanity of its creed. From Mrs. Webster's book, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, quote, Suffice it to say here that its course, like that of most secret societies, have been marked by violent dissensions amongst the members. The Blavatskyites 
proclaiming the divine infallibility of their leader, whilst at the same time scandals of a peculiar recurrence of such scandals in the history of secret societies, leads one inevitably to wonder how far these are to be regarded as merely deplorable accidents or as a result of the secret society methods and of occult teaching. That the men against whom charges of sexual perversion were brought were not isolated examples of these tendencies is shown by a curious admission on the part of one Madame Blavatsky's chelas, or disciples. There are, then, a certain number of theosophists in this country who have the courage and public spirit to protest against the use of the society for political ends and against infractions of the moral code which they believe certain members to have committed. But this party, unfortunately, constituted only a small minority. The rest are prepared to render blind and unquestioning obedience to the dictates of Mrs. Bassant and Mr. Ledbetter. In this respect, the Theosophical Society follows the usual plan of secret societies, for although not normally a secret society, it is one in effect, being composed of outer and inner circles and absolutely controlled by supreme directors. The inner circle, known as the esoteric section, or rather the Eastern Schools of Theosophy, usually referred to as ES, is in reality a secret society consisting in its turn of three further circles. The innermost, composed of Mahatmas, or Masters of the White Lodge, the second of the accepted pupils or initiates, and the third of the learners or ordinary members. The ES and co-masonry thus compose two secret societies within the open door controlled by people who are frequently members of both. Whether even these higher initiates are really in the secret is another question. A certain co-mason, who is said to have been also a Rosicrucian, an important member of the Grand Orient, once cryptically observed that, quote, Theosophy is not the hierarchy, implying that it was only part of a world organization, and darkly hinting that if it does not carry out the work allotted to it, another body of adepts would take control. That this is more than probable we shall see later. The outer ranks of the Theosophical Society seem to be largely composed of harmless enthusiasts who imagine that they are receiving genuine instruction in the religions and occult doctrines of the East, that the teaching of E.S. would not be taken seriously by any real occultist, and that they could learn far more by studying the works of recognized authorities on these subjects at a university or at, a, at the British Museum does not occur to them for a moment. Nor would this fulfill the purpose of the leaders, for the Theosophical Society is not a study group, but essentially a propaganda society which aims at substituting for the pure and simple teaching of Christianity the amazing compound of Eastern superstition, Kabbalism, and 18th century charlatanism which Mrs. Bassant and her coadjutors have devised. So now my readers know what is the Theosophical Society, which usually looks for adepts with the same deceit and hypocrisy that Masonry uses saying that they don't attack any religion and that people of all faiths can belong to it. Number 148, Frauds and Occult Science. Telling the history of Masonry, Eckert says that around 8, 1780, alchemists and chevaliers d'industrie, crooks, had gained possession of the government of Masonry and founded the degree of Rosicrucian or Rose Croix. Quote, it was a means, he adds, of hiding the deceitful tactics which they use in the pretended fabrication of gold and its ridiculous evocation of the spirits and its distributions of eternal youth. Concerning Count Cagliarostro, one of the names which the Jew Joseph Balsamo used, Eckert continues, quote, This famous impostor said that he was in possession of the philosophical stone. He pretended he could predict the future, call the dead, make absent people appear, and with the help of his wife, he could deceive a large number of credulous people. He used masonry to cover his deceitful deeds. He exploited France, England, and Italy. But France, where he stayed longer, was to him the most abundant mine. He founded in 1782 Egyptian masonry. Women were admitted to it, and the number of its fellows was very, very large. From Martinism, or the Masonic lodges founded by Martinez Pasquales, Ragon says something similar as regards the communication with spirits and occult knowledge. The Society of the Freemason Initiates of the Strict Observance used to study principally the Kabbalah, 
the philosophical stone and the evocation of spirits. Because of them, this knowledge was the system and the ends of the ancient mysteries of which masonry is the continuation. The same things occurred in the high observance, and the Masonic rite established by Swedenborg, in the masonry of the 72, and the rite of Philadelphians of Narbonne. Quote, Nobody should be puzzled, says Dom Benoit, that occult science should have been practiced in certain Masonic circles. When the most illustrious of the writers of the sect, he whom the high initiated celebrate as the oracle of masonry, teaches them in special treaties, and when he recommends with such insistence its study and cultivation to all the Masons who want to deserve this name. There is no complete initiation, says Ragon, without the study of occult science. Occult science was in all times the heritage of privileged intelligence. Webster herself, who dedicated an interesting chapter to magicians, after saying that when these magicians did during the period before the French Revolution is very well known and never doubted by the official history, says that, quote, the important point that has to be proved is that precisely as the so-called philosophers were all Freemasons, the principal magicians were not only Freemasons, but members of occult secret societies. Therefore, she adds, we should not regard the men of whom we are going to talk in rapid review as quacks, but as agents of some occult power. It would be good if the devotees of theosophy paid attention to the relation existing between occult science and masonry. They, who, regardless of facts, would like to remain free of influence from masonry. Number 149. Penetration into Catholic Societies and Clergy Anybody would think Catholic associations, and above all the clergy and priests, are free from Masonic influence or conquest. Unfortunately, this is not so. Whether authentic or not, the advice of a member of the Alta Vendita which used to function in Italy in the same quarter of the last century, advice in which he urged Masons to penetrate into societies and seminaries. Whether or not the efforts of the Alta Vendita were to carry them out, the fact is that the revolutionary spirit entered among many members of seminaries, among them many priests of poor theological preparation, to the point where the supreme head of the church was alarmed, as we can see in the ecclesiastical reports of the time, and especially in Cretino Jolet. It is well known that in Brazil there were religious confraternities dominated by masonry, who applauded persecution, jail, banishment, and, as I do not remember it well, also the death of virtuous bishop of Olinda, Don Vital, who defended bravely his rights as pastor. Neither do I know if here, in Chile, there are Masonic infiltrations among our charitable associations, at least. This can so easily take place when all means are used beginning with lies and hypocrisy. It is to be feared, in all case, it is good to be ready against that poison which is administered in small doses. Chapter 2. Masonic Trickery Number 150. Lies and Hypocrisy It has already been said that the great means used by masonry in order to make their conquests and gain their ends is lies and deceit. This deceit has been used in the manifestation of its purpose. What they say they want is precisely the contrary to what they really want. It's not strange to find also among Masonic writings, or to hear from speakers and apologists of the order, the affection of Christianity, or respect for religion and Catholicism. The whole, of course, free from all admixture, which might enlighten the ignorant. Not long ago I came upon a booklet published by Masonic Editorial Center of Santiago, in which the Masonic author attacks the Christian religion and God himself with all the Masonic hypocrisy, presenting himself as a believer, and a better believer even, than the pious person whom he addresses, lying, changing, interpreting, with the most crooked intention, all that he needs to destroy the faith of the Catholic. Those who assisted a short time ago at the Eucharistic Congress of Santiago and Conception know how Masonry deceived many Catholics, selling at the doors of the temples blasphemous booklets, presenting them as Eucharistic booklets. That is the ancient Masonic system. The similarities between the correspondence of Weishaupt, says Webster, and that of Voltaire and Frederick the Great are really very surprising. All of them pretend they respect Christianity, and at the same time work to destroy it. Thus, just as Voltaire, in a letter to D'Alembert, expresses his horror for the publication of an anti-Christian booklet, 
Le Testament de Jean Melier, and in another he urges him to circulate amongst thousands in all of France. So Weishaupt takes care in general to make believe he is a benign philosopher and even a Christian evangelist. Only sometimes he casts aside the disguise and shows what a satire he really is. Quote, this pretense of Christianity gave such good results that Spartacus himself, pseudonym for Weishaupt, writes triumphantly, You cannot imagine what consideration and sensation our degree of priests is arousing. The most admirable thing is that great reformed Protestants and theologians who belong to Illuminism are still in the belief that the religious teachings given therein contain the true and genuine spirit of Christian religion. Oh, man, what you won't believe, I never thought I would come to be the founder of a new religion. The magic words used by masonry to deceive and seduce are too well known. Even so, it is difficult to be convinced of the power they wield. When one sees the highest and most independent men of the country being managed like small children at the call of such a word as liberalism or liberal conquests, which, if it holds any reality, is precisely the reverse of their dreams. When we see the multitude enthusiastic over the mentions of liberty, equality, and fraternity by those who themselves work to take all liberty, equality, and fraternity away from them. When we see that they are told that truth really means deceit. When we see those at the top and those at the bottom give themselves up like gentle sheep to the direction of those who lie and who already on other occasions have been deceivers. Only then can we realize the ability with which masonry uses these means to be able to dominate the world and of the constancy with which he uses them. Such has been one of the most powerful means with which masonry has found followers and has made blind and simple multitudes obey their plans without question, especially in those times of fanaticism and madness, which the history of the 19th century above all presents in France, Germany, Italy, and Spain as can be seen from the authors who specially tell about their actions in those countries. The same, unfortunately, is also observed among the countries of America, and Chile herself, notwithstanding the high mentality of people and the fact that previous revelations have uncovered deceit hidden in with facts. Double talk is common in the Masonic style, for the bulk of the people words have one meaning, for Masonry another. What means fanaticism to the uninitiated has not that meaning for the Mason. What means superstition to all others has a different meaning for Masons. The same is to be said about despotism, tyranny, emancipation, and the name of God itself, if at any time they mention it. Superstition and fanaticism to Masons means religion, especially the Catholic religion. Despotism and tyranny to them are kings, priests, magistrates, and authorities. Emancipation is to them license, anarchy, etc. With the use of those words, Masonry knows how to adjust its propaganda to the degree of preparation which their listeners have, emphasizing more and more toward the end of its works, the destruction of all religious and orderly ideas. Number 151. Expounding Principles While Concealing Their Consequences Among the Masonic abilities, Dom Benoit gives the following, quote, affirming principles, concealing their consequences. Always principles. Weishaupt used to say, the consequences never. Equality, liberty, secularization, for example, are principles affirmed constantly by masonry, but they are careful to keep from showing the consequences of the destruction of the social order, of negation of all authority to which they want to arrive with liberty, and general destruction of the state, of the family, and of individuals, to them, it offers the goddess sexual, sexualization. Number 152. Pursuing one to end while pretending to search for another. Thus, when they were trying to destroy the temporal power of the Pope, Masons did not talk about that, but about forming an Italian unity. When they want to separate the church from the state, they say that it is in so in order to have more funds for teaching, to avoid arguments between religion and politics. But never will it be to that is in order to have more funds for teaching, to avoid arguments between religion and politics, etc. But never will it be said that it is in order to deprive religion of a part of its action. When it is sought to keep children from attending Mass, as also young boys and girls and teachers, Masons create society of Boy Scouts, musical sports societies, and or etc., 
in order to develop physical exercise or to cultivate an art or a science, etc. And they'll try to fix exactly the time at which such religious duties are supposed to be carried out, but they will avoid seeing that that is precisely what they meant to do. Quote, when masonry was organized in Latin America, says the pastoral letter written by Reverend Archbishop of Caracas, and which has already been mentioned, it has been found that these countries were entirely and profoundly Catholic. To demonstrate then, clearly, the goal pursued would have been a very clumsy procedure, and that is why Masons used deceit, disguise, hypocrisy, telling the people that they were only a charitable association. Number 153 combating the enemies without mentioning them. It is common among us, as everywhere else, because the Masonic style is universal, to hear speeches against reactionaries and obscuritists. It is known that they are aimed at Catholic people or the clergy. If they are named, many of the listeners would be hurt and would go against it. When they tried to take the rights of God away in the French Revolution, they only mentioned the rights of man. Number 154 persecuting others with a pretext of self-defense. At the same time, we held the commemorative procession of the centennial of Constantine in Inquique, which we have mentioned before, and in which we were attacked in a savage manner, and in which respectable and helpless ladies were victims of fury of the attackers. It was said we were guilty of provocation. While two-faced liberalism, which was nothing but a mask behind which masonry hid its cowardly face, was being defended in that matter, our supposed attack consisted in a pious procession, which was pacific and respectable. Two, masonry, clerical deeds, and religion are always denounced as the enemies that endanger the ideals which they themselves follow. Number 155. Profess Scientific Aims of Masonry. The flag of science is flown by masonry and used as a weapon to attack the teachings of our faith. We have already talked about the quality of science and the intellect of the Masons, confessed by themselves. Such an incomplete science has gathered into itself every erroneous word which ancient and modern people have used against morals and God, against the spirituality of the soul and the consequent dignity of man. It contains all the sophisms and calumnies, all the falsifications fabricated by other philosophy or science in order to weaken faith and shake its rational foundations is a fabulous and powerful conspiracy against truth. There you have the wise men of masonry spurning all the dictates of science and arriving at the most ridiculous conclusions in order to sustain it, the materialism, the spontaneous generation, and ascent of man from ape or any other animal, of which no proofs have been found on earth, no matter how hard they have searched for them, but they have tried to find some even among the ants which lived in prehistoric times. When I reached this point in my revision of the first edition, I read in the Catholic Review of Santiago an article inspired in European magazines, especially in a studio, a French magazine, which deals precisely with the poverty of worthy means among the Masons. This article, published in the issue of October 3, 1925, is worth reading. The Italian philosopher Benedicto Croce, talking about Masonic culture, says, quote, it is an excellent culture for merchants, employees, teachers, doctors, but is a cheap culture. Moreover, is a detestable culture for the same reason. For the one who wants to dig down into the problems of spirit, of society, or of the reality of things, is detestable intellectually as well as morally. Lombardo Radice, in his pedagogic magazine Nuovo de Veri, New auteurs used to say, analyzing Masonic action in the Italian public life, quote, social and intellectual life was a monstrous downfall. As a result of an inquiry made among persons who do not belong among the extreme Catholic circles, nor among the Masonic circles, Masonry was defined as a grave danger, as a, quote, dead weight of all combined mediocrities. Someone else has said with cruel irony, quote, I believe that the manifest or hidden actions of masonry constitute a benefit to our country because it spreads everywhere and more and more each time a healthy contempt for secret societies because of their subtle intrigues, their humanitarian declamations which hide the hollow thoughts and the violence of special interests. Number 156. Spread of Corruption. 
Masonry, as the child and heir of the fallen angel, enjoys like him the fall of man. The doctrines it professes are those that corrupt all moral customs, materialism, pantheism, absolute liberty, identification of nature with God, etc. All our doctrines which set, sanctify all kinds of inclinations or suppress all sense of responsibility when we satisfy our disorderly appetites and worship the flesh. When we shed tears over the death of Haram, that is to say, more the primitive state of nature which masonry supposes was destroyed by religion and society, and instills the desire to reconstruct primitive naturalism, making people believe that the happiness of the savage is enviable and is an ideal, as is also that of the animal, who without any modesty can satisfy its desires. Such too are other stimuli towards dishonesty and the commission of all kinds of crimes and sins. Nobody seems to see that. In Dombin Ma's works can be seen the degrees of greed shown by the leaders of the French Revolution. I shall be satisfied with only quoting Tainé, a very well-known writer who cannot be suspected of partiality. According to him, the revolution, quote, took the three-fifths of France's real estate, took from the communities and individuals from 10 to 12,000 millions in values of real estate and movable property, elevated the public de debt, which in 1789 was less than 4,000 millions, to more than 50,000 millions. Well then, the majority of those things were only used for the benefit of the personal interests of the virtuous republicans. Napoleon I, says Don Benoit, did not accomplish anything but grant pensions and good positions to all the most passionate revolutionists in order to convert them into conservatives. Napoleon made his brother Joseph, Grand Master of Freemasonry, turned him into King of Spain, and then raised Cambacheres to the dignity of High Chancellor, with the title of First Grand Master attached to His Majesty the King of Spain. He then granted to the lodges all liberties, grouping them around the Grand Orient, in which they saw their protector and savior. In this matter, according to the author of the Memory of Military Masonry, the revenues of masonry benefited the Grand Master to the extent of two million francs, and his attached cambacheres received one hundred thousand francs. According to Menendez Palayo, the selling of religious property carried out by Spanish masonry during the so-called desamortization of Mendizabel was nothing more than a collection of tremendous injuries and immense spoliation in which, if the church lost, the state, on the other hand, gained nothing, and the only ones who gained anything were not the agriculturists and Spanish proprietors, but adventurers and bucket shop stock gamblers. What happened in France at the start of the century is that masonry, having gained full power, took from the church all its properties under the pretext of selling them for the benefit of the state schools. This scandalous theft with which a few became rich, and the millions that had been promised to the people in order to effect such a robbery faded, is recent history, and too well known. What happened in France has happened everywhere else. It is happening in Mexico, it happened in Italy, and masonry has been preparing itself to put the scheme into execution also in Chile, where the public voice would not entrust the handling of somebody else's funds for masonry. I, myself personally, have had occasion to know it. But I do not want to take the least step which could make the charge a personal one. Many of the readers know it. Others will know it later on as a very few things remain unknown in this world. Those who, after the first edition of my book, have given me data on this matter will be satisfied with this general affirmation. I t cannot go into detail here. I do not have to say that Masons have used as powerful a weapon the arousing among the people of desires for pleasure which is difficult for them to satisfy in order to prepare them for results or to acquire their votes, making them vain promises which will not be fulfilled. As regards sensuality, the most violent of all passions, see what Leo the Thirteenth says, basing himself, as he says on authentic data and his encyclical Humanum Genus against secret societies, quote, there have been found among the Masonic sects those who have said and advocated the necessity of working with art and carefully so that the masses would be able to satisfy their vices without limit. Toward those ends are directed obscene publications 
theatrical plays, movie productions, almost all of them in the hands of Jews, and ill-famed houses destined to spread vice, etc. Number 157. Visible Results They are everywhere. In the city where I wrote this, there are proportionally more Masonic lodges than in any other city in the Republic, and consequently the influence of the sect is greater where the influence of the church is smaller, all in proportion to the population. Well then, those who know the city can say whether that greater Masonic influence has made of it a city of sober habits, or if there exists more corruption of habits than in those cities where the reverse proportion is observed. Furthermore, anywhere else you look, you will find the same law where there is greater Masonic influence, all other circumstances being equal, greater corruption will be found to exist, manifested in crimes of passion, in juvenile delinquency, in suicide, divorces, prostitution, gambling, etc. Chapter 3. Co-Masonry and the Cubs Number 158. Feminine or Androgynous Lodges and Co-Masonry Quote, women, did a fourth used to say, he was one of the Illuminati chiefs, have a very strong influence over man, so we can reform the world if we reform women. The workshop of brother masons, which does not annex itself to a lodge of sisters, Pika said, is an incomplete workshop, dusted fatally, never to perfect their members. Only in adoptive measures is masonry complete. One of the high chiefs of the sect, called Vindis, wrote in 1858 in a letter published afterwards, quote, I heard lately one of our friends laughing in a philosophic way about our plans, and telling us, in order to destroy Catholicism, it is necessary to start by the suppression of women. This is true in a way, but as we cannot suppress women, let us corrupt her with the church. Corruptio optimi pessima. The goal is too beautiful not to tempt men like us. In order to carry out the scheme, Masons have taken her into the lodges. The Masons have procured the creation of feminine lodges from the first times of its expansion throughout Europe. Lodges that have been called, quote, adoptive, and also androgynous, made up of men and women, as they are most of the times, in which the brothers do not let the sisters function alone. They are called adoptive because, according to Masonic doctors like Mackey, women cannot really be Masons, with rights to possess all secrets of Masonry and that is why it also shows that they are incapable of morality inasmuch as morality is learned in masonry. In some parts of the United States, says Mackey, these degrees for women are very popular, while in other places they have never been practiced and are strongly condemned as improper innovations. When women are told that on receiving these degrees they are admitted in the Masonic order and that they are obtaining Masonic information under the name of Masonry of Women, they are simply deceived. The Great Lodge of London has never watched to recognize the androgynous lodges, but in 1893 the French Lodge, Freethinkers, was constituted by itself into the Great X Symbolic Lodge of France, or Lodge of Human Rights, having the special feature of admitting men as well as women. It is what is called co-masonry. The Great Lodge has all 33 degrees. It has its headquarters in Paris, and it has hundreds of lodges of the same kind which are affiliated with it in Europe and in American countries. The lodges that speak English have their own subsidiary council, but they are an integral part of the Continental Order and they practice a funny mixture of theosophical cult which puts it in context and in part under the direction of the supreme direction of Theosophy and of the 33rd degree of Annie Besant and Adyar, while the supreme mix universal council, whose headquarters, as I have said before, is in Paris with its Grand Master, Piron, and Grand General Secretary, Madame Amelia Gedalje, 33rd degree. Number 159, its degrees. It has been told that co-masonry has all 33 degrees of the Scottish Rites, but in simple masonry of adoption, in which women are like pupils, directed by the chiefs of the order, there are five degrees, the three common to all masons, and that of the perfect master, which corresponds to the degree of Rose Croix in masculine masonry, and that of sublime Scotch, corresponding to the Kadosh degree. The first one, it is known, are symbolical, the last ones philosophical. In them, through ceremonies of initiation, as well as through questions and answers of catechism, women are made to lose all their modesty and delicacy, 
and to obtain Masonic liberty and charity. They are taught hatred towards priests, the religion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of Satan. Also, co-masonry has its politic or satanic right. I've already said that they are made to profane the consecrated host. Number 160. Extreme Licentiousness As it is to be supposed, licentiousness has reached and surpassed all limits to such a degree that the uninitiated even Masons have protested, says Eckert, against the orgies of the Lodge of Egyptian Masonry of Adoption, founded in Paris in 1782 by the famous Count Cagliarostro. The Great Grand Orient itself, in its convention of 1807, recalls the deplorable abuses committed in 1774 in some lodges of adoption. In Chile, we have had in Belen de Saraga an example of woman masons, doubtless initiated in the philosophical degrees, judging by what she has said in her lectures, lectures taken from the legends of masonry, and judging also by the lack of modesty with which she made many of her listeners blush, according to what a gentleman who had heard her reported, and one who does not blush easily over anything. Note, however, this cannot be surprising to anyone knowing anything about her life and the reasons why she was expelled from her country. Quote, we possess, Eckert says, various rituals of the lodges of adoption, but we do not dare reproduce them in a serious work. Mr. Seeger gives some details that can be read. Number 161, the cubs. There is a second kind of masonry of adoption, that of the wolf cubs, which has been introduced not very long ago. Quote, the cub, says Clavel, one of the great Masonic doctors is a child of a Mason. This name, which because it lost its etymology, has been denaturalized and is of a very old origin. The initiates in the mysteries of Isis used to carry, even publicly, a mass the shape of a jackal or a golden wolf. After what has been said, the name they honored is significant. If the Grand Lodge of Chile, a child of seven years of age, son of a Mason, is adopted as a cub, at 17, he can be an apprentice. Number 162. Masonic Sacraments Received. The small wolves are initiated with a ceremony which is Masonic baptism. Why should not the anti-church have its anti-baptism? In this ceremony, there are the brute stone, the sinsel, and the mallet to signify to the father the work that he has to perform on his son, engraving all Masonic perfection on him. The godfather holds in front of the heart of his godson the plomata to teach him to march straight on the path of Masonic truth and virtue. The first village with the godfather holds the trowel in front of his heart to teach him that he must level pass over him and over everybody else to make them all equal. Then the sonare is placed on his head with both sides downwards and then comes the ceremony in which the Venerable, the two Vigilants, and the Godfather go with him with lit candles in front of the three candelabra, making the Vigilants promise that they will do their best to make the young cub march along the path of truth and virtue, and kindling in his heart the love towards his fellow men and the desire to work some day for the good of mankind, to which the brothers swear. We already know what is the sense which the Masons attribute to these high-sounding words. Soon after this, there is a ceremony similar to the anointing made in the Catholic baptism on the five senses. The Venerable makes them with wine in the mouth, the ears, and the eyes. The cub can also receive Masonic confirmation, in which he promises not to reveal the doctrines of the order to the initiated, and he is submitted to terrifying proofs such as thunder and the crashing of falling walls, which symbolize the war of the passions, the confusion of prejudices, of error and ignorance, according to the Masonic signification, of course. After this, the clash of arms and combats, symbolizing the power with which the virtuous should fight against error, etc. Finally, the cub marches backwards in order to learn that one cannot reach the sanctuary of truth from the first steps. Before a confirmation, he must confess his sins, being led by the venerable who tells him that none of his faults or defects are hidden from him. Part 6. Condemnation of Masonry. Chapter 1. Why does the church universally condemn masonry? Number 163. Condemnation evidently justified. What has been said here justifies completely the constant and energetic condemnation that many popes have made of masonry ever since they started watching the deeds of masons and getting knowledge of their spirit and tendencies. That condemnation will be found wise 
and just not only by the men of faith, but also by those whose judgments and conduct are ruled solely by natural reasons, if they are sincere. As regards Catholics, knowing that the Church's mission is to attract toward her all men, and that to attain this she uses everlasting patience, and does not condemn anybody or cast away anyone just because he is a sinner, quote, if only for this reason, one should be convinced of the reason why the Church, after having an idea of what Masonry is, presents it more truthfully than the Masons. Consequently, one cannot find that such a condemnation is necessary, and also that it is equally necessary that all Catholics should know the facts. Number 164. Consideration and Consultation. My English and American friends will perhaps excuse me if I manifest a noble conviction which flatters them. Their behavior towards myself and the Church in general has rightly deserved my gratitude, especially considering those persons who do not profess my religion. I, myself, had come to believe that English masonry, as it is sometimes called, did not have anything to do with Chilean or Latin masonry. That didn't mean me ask Rome as to whether there should be any difference between the English masons and others when they desired to belong to the Catholic Church. The answer cleared my error. Studying the business of masonry, I've come to the conclusion that the institution is the same, and that if the behavior of some differs from that of the others, it is part and due to the reason that has been given when dealing with masonry and Protestantism, and in part to the face that, because they are serious, educated, and people of character, when dealing with members of the English Lodge, they are to be treated with all necessary seriousness and circumspection, so that such people will open their eyes and leave the order. This study has made me admire once more the prudence with which they act in Rome, and how well informed is the consultative authority. Number 165. The Great Mother Lodge its international action. English masonry has been the fountain from where that revolutionary masonry, full of impiety and fury against Catholicism, has spread throughout all Europe and later throughout America. That is a very well-known thing. The action of dechristianization of English masonry is more silent, but constant nevertheless. The proof is given by the Protestants themselves, who so many times are the first ones to deny the fundamental dogmas of Christianity, causing great scandal among the faithful. Quote, I have brought the history of Freemasonry in England, says Eckert, up to a very recent time, not only because England has been the mother of modern Freemasonry on the continent and even in America, but also because the leading threads which direct the Masonic Association today come from there, threads without which it would be impossible to follow history. In the efforts made in the course of the Italian Revolution against the Pope, the English Masons and those of the United States gave powerful financial help, even if it's true that part of that money was taken by Lemmy to further his own interests, as stated by Margiotta. Lord Palmerston, Patriarch of European Masonry and British Prime Minister, used both titles to confuse the Kingdom of Naples and help the Brother Masons of Italy and to sow revolution throughout the rest of the world. In April 1864, Garibaldi was very pompously received in London by the ministers, members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and 30,000 spectators. He declared, quote, Without the help of Palmerston, Naples would still belong to the Bourbons, and were it not for the English feet, I would not have been able to cross the Strait of Messina. Referring to the Portuguese Revolution in 1920, Mrs. Webster says, that the Masons directing this movement hid themselves under the name of England. Quote, how, they said to the people, can you accuse the lodges to the clubs of murder when Masonry is directed by England and King Edward is the Grand Master? Then she adds that a witness of this orders declared that if the Great Lodge of England had published at least in the Continental Press a declaration separating itself from the Grand Orient in general, and in particular from the Portuguese Masonry, the revolutionary power would have been weakened immensely. The Grand Lodge preferred silence, damaging its good name, above all, before the Catholics. Albert Pike, founder with Mazzini of the new Palladium Reformed Rite, a Luciferian Rite, and Supreme Pontiff not only of the United States Masonry, but undoubtedly all of use of universal Masonry, had as his chief aim the destruction of clericalism, especially in Rome. When Lemmy consulted with him about the Masonic Congress of Milan, Pike answered approving of it on December 5, 1880, and among other things told him, it is necessary to ruin in the short term the clerical influences in Italy. The laws against the religion, religious congregations are not observed there. Was it worthwhile to work so much to obtain them? Make people protest by means of the lodges. It is even necessary for the Congress to demand a vote in favor of a girl's lyceum. But do that talking all useful precautions and being careful not to have a priest appointed as chaplain. It is interesting to note with that satanic hatred towards the Pope Albert Pike used to write. Number 166. Decision of an English Masonic High Chief. It is well known that Lord Ripon, Grand Master of English Masonry and Viceroy of India, amazed at the condemnations made by Pope Pius IX against Masonry, sincerely studied the matter, and from his study he decided not only to leave Masonry, but also Protestantism, becoming a sincere Catholic. Who better than himself was in a position to know the crooked dealings and plans of Masonry and its opposition to Christianity? 
Number 167, Hatred of North American Masonry Toward Catholicism. I've said before that Masonry in the United States, as a rule, goes in unison with that of the whole world. Much of it has been affiliated to the Grand Orient of France and hates the Catholic Church. Its 40 or more papers are swamped with insults against the Church of Rome and the Pope, and some of its lodges, instead of the name of Jehovah to name God, it has been determined to call him Yah, the sun god of the Syrians, or the sun god of the Egyptians, and Baal, or Baal, the fire god of the Chaldeans, whose cult had been so gravely prohibited by Jehovah. The hatred of North American masonry against religious teachings, especially Catholic teaching, is the same as that of all lodges in the world. Because of it, they have dictated the law of only public and compulsory teaching, and of course it is atheistic in several states, but as a benefit to liberty and religion. It has not been able to survive, for it was unconstitutional. However, this does not mean that the campaign does not go on, to prepare the land, to transform the constitution, and reach what in that country is called liberty. We already know, too, that according to the explanation given by the most noted Masons in the United States, the god of Masonry is not the god worshipped by the Christians, or the Mohammedans, or the Jews. It is a pagan god, any god, nature, sun, flesh, etc. Anything except the real god, the personal god, different from the world and the creator of Christianity. Number 168. Fundamental Unity of Masonry. Proust, in his book, A Study in American Freemasonry, dedicates one chapter to the study of the unity of North American Masonry with European Masonry, and comes to the conclusion that they are one in the same thing in its true and esoteric spirit, one in its aspiration and object, one in its enlightenment and doctrine, one in its philosophy and religion, forming therefore one sole family, one sole institution, one brotherhood, one order, which in its Catholicity desires to substitute itself for the Catholic Church established by Christ. The same is proved in the appendix of the Worldwide Congress of the Scottish Rite, held in Brussels, in which the Supreme Councils of the United States, England, and all the American republics, Chile among them, were represented. It is true that the Grand Lodge Masons of New York have declared that they do not want affiliation with lodges which do not acknowledge God or the Bible, but that does not mean an absolute breach at all, as can be seen from the declarations of its Grand Master, William A. Rowan, who, in The Builder, issue of March this year, publishes, quote, There is only one God, Father of the human race. There is the rock over which we build, the Holy Bible is the great cross on masonry, as a rule and guide for our faith and practice. In short, adherence to the constitutions directs our procedure. On these principles, I dare say, our great jurisdiction will be in union with all the great jurisdictions of the universe, with a view to better reciprocal understanding, closer relations, and a common action to realize the Masonic unity and make the spirit of brotherhood progress. We must not forget what sometimes has been declared in the heat of masonry, namely, that all of it is contained in the first three degrees, of which the others are nothing but its development and perfection. I have told you already that starting with the initiation of the apprentice, Masons renounce all supernatural faith, and the seed of rebellion are sown. That is done under the veil of the symbols, which do not uncover deceit before the mind is already educated and ready to accept it. English and American Masonry are not therefore different from the Latin or Latin American Masonry, but incidentally, in some external form, which in the United States is not as well safeguarded as in England, but one and the other are serving as a base, just as all the others, to that mysterious pyramid, in which at the top Satan is worshipped, and Jesus Christ and God are renounced, and where there is taught as an ideal universal rebellion and absolute licentiousness. I am plainly convinced that among the English Masons there are many who sincerely believe in the goodness of an institution which has as its members the royal prince themselves, but we have seen before what this amounts to. It is because I do believe in the sincerity of many English Masons that I also believe that Whenever they will realize the true spirit and history of Masonry, they will think that it is dishonorable to go on belonging to it, and they will imitate Lord Ripon and others who have, who have occupied high places in Masonry, abandoned the society because their consciences forbade them belonging to it any longer. Chapter 2. Resume of the Condemnations of the Church. Number 169. Terms of Canon Law in Force. The condemnation of the Church is actually in the following term of Canon 2335 of the Canonical Law Code. Those who give their names to the Masonic sect or other associations of the same kind which conspire against the church or the legitimate civil authorities are excommunicated automatically, which excommunication is reserved to the apostolic see. The following canon in the code condemn with greater punishments the clergymen who commit such an infraction against canon law. Although this alone would be enough to make Catholics feel horror towards Masonry, nevertheless I think it is useful to present to my readers some of the judgments that the popes have pronounced about it, only regarding having to do so in such a limited space. Number 170, Constitution in Eminenti of Clement the Twelfth. 
Clement XII, 1738, speaking about masonry in his constitution, quote, in eminenti states, such is the nature of the crime that it betrays itself and that the efforts made to hide it make it stand out all the more. So the mentioned societies have caused such strong suspicions in the spirit of the faithful that belonging to them is before the eyes of sensible and honorable persons to stain themselves with the sign of complete perversion. And in effect, if those men did not do wrong, would they fear light so much? The universal disapproval has come to be so manifest that in many countries the secular power itself has long ago prohibited such societies as being contrary to the security of the kingdom. Number 171. Constitution Providas of Benedict the Fourteenth, Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, in 1751, in his Constitution Providas, renews the condemnation. Thus, quote, among the very grave causes that induce our predecessor Clement the Twelfth to prohibit and to condemn said societies, and which have been expressed in the above mentioned Constitution, the first one is that in this type of society men of all religions and sects are gathered, which evidently can cause the gravest damage to the purity of the Catholic religion. The second is the absolute secret made in these assemblies so that the word said by Cecilio Natal, referred by Minuzio Felix, can be applied, stating, Good deeds love publicity, whereas crimes seek secrecy. Third one is the oath taken by the members of these societies to keep this secret inviolate, as if it could allow them to invoke a promise or an oath to justify the refusal to answer when questioned by legitimate authority. Yet what takes place in those Masonic meetings is against the established order, be it religious or contrary to civil laws, than to the canonical laws. The fifth one is that already in many countries they have been forbidden by the laws of secular princes. The last one, finally, is that these societies have a bad reputation among serious-minded and honest people, and that to belong to them would mean, in their eyes, to stain themselves with the stain of perversion. Moved by these same reasons, the popes recommend to the bishops and ecclesiastical superiors, as also the secular princes, to fulfill the duty imposed upon them to try and abolish those societies. Number 172. Apostolical Letters, Ecclesiam a Jesu Christu, of Pius VII. Pius VII condemned Masonry in general and the sect of the Carbonari in particular in his Apostolic Letter, Ecclesiam a Jesu Christu, of September 13, 1821. He points out the hypocritical character of the Carbonari, which make believe they respect Christ, his religion, and his church, and try to propagate rationalism or religious indifference, deriding the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and of other Christian ministries, and favoring all seditious enterprises permitting the murder of anyone who makes any revelations. That is why the Pope says that it is not surprising that such great attempted assassinations have been committed in Italy. Number 173, Constitution of Quo Graviora of Leo XII. Leo XII condemns masonry with even greater solemnity than his predecessors. In his Constitution Quo Graviora of March 13, 1825, pointing out especially the sect of the Universitarians, he attributes to the sects of the French Revolution, all the perturbations and seditions that were constantly renewed and the calamities suffered by the Church. Quote, we must not think, he says, that it is false and slanderous to attribute to the secret societies these evils and others which we do not mention. The books that members of these sects have dared to write about religion and civil society and in which they despise authority, blaspheming about majestic power representing Jesus Christ as a scandalous or mad, denying the existence of God and sustaining that the soul dies with the body. The codes and statutes in which they explain their practices and their projects prove evidently what we have said, i.e. that these sects are the foundation once flow so many efforts to overthrow the legitimate powers and destroy the church entirely. Finally, it is true and incontestable that all these different societies, even carrying different names, are bound together by the criminal link of their infamous projects. Number 174, Encyclical Trariti of Pius VIII. Pius VIII writes to the patriarchs, primates, and bishops of all the world, pointing out the duty of keeping watch over these secret associations of evil men, declared enemies of God and of the princes, who use all their power to undermine the church, to confuse the states and the whole universe, and who, by destroying the restraints of the true faith, open the road to all crimes, trying to conceal under the cloak of religion an obscure oath, the iniquity of their reunions and their plans formed in them. From the beginning, they have made people suspect them of those horrible events that we have witnessed in those unfortunate times as springing from the abyss, and which have burst, causing great damage to religion and to the empires. Number 175, Encyclical Morari Vos of Gregory the Sixteenth. Gregory the Sixteenth, in the first encyclical to the whole world, Morari Vos, points out masonry, quote, the principal cause of all the calamities on earth and in the kingdoms, and as the cesspool of all preceding sects. Number 176, Encyclical Qui Pluribus, and other elocutions, etc., of Pius IX. Pius IX slandered 
as a mason by masonry, during his pontificate, condemned and prohibited the sect more than twenty times. He said, quote, Among the numerous machinations and multiple means that the enemies of the Christian name have used to attack the church, and with which they have tried, although in vain, to destroy it, is necessary. Venerable brethren, to count, without a doubt, that perverse sect, vulgarly called Masonic, which hidden at first in dark alleys, has finally come to light to ruin religion and civil society. Certainly, neither our parents nor ourselves would ever have had to regret such seditious and revolutionary movements, so many incendiary wars which set Europe on fire, nor so many evils that have afflicted the, and still afflict the Church. If the princes had heeded the exhortations of the previous popes who were trying to make them see their duty to stop the dangerous sect, said the pope, and he adds, what do those meetings signify, and that secret oath that the initiated members are obliged to take not to reveal anything that concerns those societies? Why those horrible punishments to which the members agree in case they ever broke their promise? Certainly it cannot be but a criminal and bad society that flees that way from the daylight, because he who does wrong, according to the holy books, hates the light. The Pope confirms then the condemnations made by his predecessors. On April 29, 1876, Pius IX declares that those condemnations and prohibitions of masonry are extended to the lodges of Brazil, and those of any place on earth, to eradicate the deceit of Masons in Brazil, who pretended that those condemnations applied only to the lodges in Europe and not for America, lodges which according to them were occupied only in favoring the progress of civilization and the benefit of mankind. Number 177. Encyclical Humanum Genus of Leo XIII. Finally, on April 20, 1884, the Encyclical Humanum Genus came out, the most interesting and complete document ever published by the Church against Masonry, written by the immortal Leo the Thirteenth, This document should be distributed everywhere, because it has not lost its importance and actuality. On the contrary, it sparkles brighter every day with the wisdom of him who dictated it. A. Introduction to the Encyclical. The Pope starts remembering that after sin, mankind was divided into two cities, the city of God and the city of Satan. The first one works toward reestablishing the kingdom of God through obedience to his laws and the recognition of Jesus Christ and his church, and the other one works for the kingdom of Satan with disobedience and war against God, Jesus, and his church. B. Kingdom of Satan. In this war, the Pope says, Masonry is a powerful auxiliary of Satan. He then proceeds to prove it, explaining that such is the essence of its nature and its intention, saying, The constitution the spirit of Masonic sect were clearly discovered by manifest signs of its actions, by cases investigated, by the publications of its laws and of its rights, and commentaries, with the addition, often, of the personal testimony of those who were in the secret. The popes then have not spoken inadvertently about masonry, nor have they slandered it. Number C. Disculation of its plans. Leo XIII exposes the way in which masons dissimulate their plans. Quote, As a convenient manner of concealment, they assume the character of literary men and scholars associated for the purposes of learning. They speak of their zeal for a more cultured refinement, and of their love for the poor, and they declare their one wish to be the amelioration of the conditions of the masses, and to share with the largest possible numbers, all the benefits of civil life. D. Monstrosity condemning reason. Talking about oaths and punishments to which Masons subject themselves, and about the death suffered by some as a punishment inflicted by Masonry, the Pope says, quote, But to simulate and wish to lie hid, to bind men like slaves in the very tightest bonds, and without giving sufficient reason, to make use of men enslaved to the will of another for any arbitrary act, to arm men's rights, hands, for bloodshed after securing impunity for the crime, all this is an enormity from which nature recoils. Wherefore, reason and truth itself make it plain that the society of which we are speaking is an antagonism with justice and natural uprightness. E. Its evil fruits. Then the Pope says that the fruits of masonry are evil and bitter. In order to substitute Christianity for naturalism and civilization, the Church has been persecuted with great hate, as well as the clergy, Christian teachings, and above all, the Pope. Quote, Even if other testimony were lacking, the Pope says, it is sufficient that, as confessed by the members themselves, many of whom on s several occasions, as well as lately, have declared that it is true that Masons try whenever they can to deprive Catholics of all they can, with great implacable en enmity, never resting until they see all religious institutions established by the Popes destroyed. Were it only with the sole purpose of admitting men of every religion, the Pope says, practical religious indifference is established. Quote, is a fact that the sect concedes absolute liberty to its members to defend the fact that God does not does or does not exist. Thus it is plain that they deny even the most fundamental truth known by natural reason, like the existence of God, spirituality, and immortality of the soul. As a consequence of the above, it is the wish for non-religious education, free and independent, and for spreading the incentives leading to the corruption of morals. Leo XIII says, of what we have said, the following fact, astonishing not so much in itself, 
as in its open expression, may serve as a confirmation. For since generally no one is accustomed to obey crafty and clever men so submissively as those whose soul is weakened and broken down by the domination of the passions, there have been in the sect of Freemasons some who have painfully determined and proposed that, artfully and of set purpose, the multitude should be satiated with a boundless license of vice, as, when this has been done, it would easily come under their power and authority for any acts of daring. The Pope further makes people note the naturalistic doctrine on the family, civil marriage, without God, license, equality, and absolute sovereignty of the people, the state's atheism, which is derived from naturalism, and which is common to the Masons with communists and socialists, to whose designs, the Pope says, the Masonic sect cannot call itself alien, as it favors in a great way its intents and agrees with them in the chief opinions. Would that all men would judge of the tree by its fruits, Leo the Thirteenth says. F. Remedy against the evil. Indicating the remedies against the evils already caused and the dangers of greater evils issuing from masonry, the Pope points out the following. First, he renews the constitutions and prohibitions of his predecessors. Second, he advised the bishops to tear off the mask from masonry so that the masons may be known as they are and that nobody, by any given title and his name to the Masonic sect, that nobody should be deceived by pretended honesty. It may in fact seem to some that the masons do not actually ask for anything openly contrary to religion and good habits. But, as all the reason for the existence and the work of the sect lies in vice and evil, it is clear that no one should be allowed to belong to it or to help it in any way. Third, religious instruction for all, the spreading of the Third Order of St. Francis and of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Fourth, the struggles for Christian education for youth, and for inspiring children and youths in their early years with the horror deserved by the societies prohibited by the Church. Finally, the Pope exhorts the union of all good people in prayer and action in order to obtain divine help without which any other media would be valueless. Number 178. Ecclesiastical Regulations Regarding the Conduct to be Followed with Masons I shall end this chapter by quoting the words of Bishop of Guyana in Venezuela in his pastoral of August 26, 1907, in, we make, in which he makes a resume of the rules of conduct which the Church has ordered should be followed in regards to Masons. Quote, Up to the present time, it may be that there has been some good faith among those who used to associate with the Masonic sect. Our object is not to deny this. On the other hand, we are inclined to believe so, but such good faith, or better yet, such ignorance, has no place today, inasmuch as masonry has uncovered itself and has declared a manifest war against religion and the Catholic Church. Today, therefore, there are only two ways to be followed, either to belong to masonry and be, as logical, separated from the bosom of the Church, our loving mother, or depart from masonry and run to the groups of true Catholics who are submissive children of the Church whose decisions and regulations should be obeyed by every Christian who desires salvation. For gl greater clarity, and so that there is nothing left to be wished for, we come to explain the regulations that the Church, from time immemorial, has taken against Masonry and those who belong to it, after having pronounced against it and its adepts the last excommunication reserved to the Pope. According to said regulations, first, no Mason can be absolved in the Holy Tribunal of Penance if he does not abjure Masonry first and separates himself from it complying with what was ordered by the Congregation of the Holy Office, the 5th of August, 1898. Second, no Mason can be admitted as a godfather in baptism or confirmation. Third, marriages of Masons cannot be celebrated in the church, and the parish priest can only witness marriages in the house of the contracting parties, in his ordinary clothes, with no ecclesiastical robes, limiting himself only to hear their mutual consent. And the Masons shall promise under oath that he will not oppose their children being educated in the Catholic religion. Fourth, the Mason who dies in the Masonic sect, not having sought to leave it, cannot have church burial services. Fifth, funerals, burials, are forbidden at which Masons attend with any Masonic insignia whatsoever. Sixth, no Mason can be a member of any religious community. Chapter 3. Condemnation by the Civil Authorities Number 179. Prohibitions of Masonry by the State in Past Centuries Let it not be assumed that only the Church has seen itself menaced by Masonry and been obliged to prohibit it, or that has only been done by the some Catholic state, influenced by the Church. By no means. The first measures taken by civil governments was in Protestant countries. Holland prohibited it in 1735, Switzerland and Geneva in 1738, Zurich in 1740, Bern in 1745. In 1738, measures were taken against it in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. In Bavaria, it was prohibited in 1784 and 1785. In Austria, in 1795, in Baden in 1813, and Russia in 1822. Since 1847, it has been tolerated in Baden, in Bavaria since 1850, and in Hungary and Spain since 1868, in Prussia, 1798, 
Masonry in general is prohibited, excepting the three ancient Prussian Grand Lodges subjected by the protectorate of the government to its rigid control. In England, by an act of Parliament ordered in 1798, quote, a most efficient suppression of societies established or seditious, and traitors plots and the prohibition of the traitorous and seditious practices. They have only allowed themselves to tolerate the lodges that have existed at that time, governed by ancient laws of masonry of the kingdom. More details can be had by referring to the authors cited above, from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Number 180. Prohibitions in the present century. It is easily understood that masonry, having its men placed in the highest and most influential state posts, would not dictate or permit to be presented any arrangement or plan which could be harmful to them in the least. In Chile, we have seen how an order by the Minister of War, a general of our army, which prohibited members of the army from belonging to associations of this class, was left practically ineffective. On the other hand, the secret character which masonry jealously guards, where yet it cannot exert with security its influence of power in many places, it does, it however unknown officially, and the scope of its power and the plans is candidly ignored, as unfortunately happens in Catholic nations of this continent. In the Argentine Republic, masonry sought to depart from the status of a shameful sect and asked to be recognized by the government, but the study of its statutes and the information submitted to the government was contrary to its pretenses, and the government decreed, quote, there is no ground for recognition of the society, Grand National Orient of Argentine right as a judicial person. A resolution that was ordered published in the official bulletin September 26, 1906. But where the malevolent action of masonry has been most deeply felt by the government has undoubtedly been in Italy. It can be understood that one could not turn back on the road so disastrously traveled towards social unrest if secret societies were not prohibited. In number 113, I have cited a fragment of the information which was presented to the chambers, the reading of which leaves in every sincere and patriotic man the profound conviction of the sound reasoning with which the government, for security, must know what takes place in the associations of its citizens and the people who form them, and is that which has set the government of Signor Mussolini with such great rage against the Masons. It has already been said that Masonry cannot exist in the open. Number 181. Is the complete fulfillment of a prophecy beginning? What is actually happening in Italy and the profound disregard with which the intellectuals of France view Masonry and the alarm of the English writers who, with an impartial and patriotic judgment, study the actual revolutionary movement directed from Russia, and she could not help but see the intimate connection of Bolshevism with Judaism and both with Masonry. Moreover, the evident signs with which the actual power of Masonry and most of the European nations, and possibly in the Americas, greatly differs from what it was in the first three quarters of the past century. All this, I say, makes one wonder if it is not already the period in which its definitive decadence is beginning, after having reached the zenith of its power and glory, according to the prediction which is attributed to Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, directed to Leo the 19th at the beginning of the 19th century, with these words, Holy Father, the Freemasons do not actually create a great disturbance, but little by little their audacity will grow, and there will come a time when they will seem to be the most absolute masters, but God will destroy them in a terrible manner. The first part, relative to the absolute predominance of Masonry, has already been accomplished in most of the European countries. Is the second way on its way to completion? At least that is what the first signs indicate. Epilogue, number 182, a word to Catholic women. I know something of the great suffering that some mothers, wives, sons, and daughters of Masons have to endure when the latter have taken their Masonic work to heart. I know that little or no liberty of practicing their religion has left them, and the attending danger of losing their faith being exposed as they are to endless attack against it, if they are not well prepared through knowledge of their religion and a great strength of character. I also understand how great must be the anguish of Christian mothers to think that their sons are forming part of such an army that has sworn warfare against our Lord Jesus Christ, and even extends its perversity to deny the existence of the Supreme Being, feigning to believe in the occult name that shields this denial of God. I myself announce and rejoice that many mothers have understood the evil contained in Masonry and requested from their sons to promise never to become a Mason. I state, also, that many young women act likewise with their suitors, so as not to be bound later to shallow, endless bitterness, nor encounter the greatest dangers of their whole destiny. Would to God that all Christian women and young girls would do as much. That is what the Church wishes when she orders that marriage with Masons or those affiliated with forbidden sex be discouraged. What a terrifying nightmare it must be for a soul adhering to the faith, the idea that such a beloved person on earth, a father, husband, son, or brother, is despising that which they themselves love most, vis-a-vis -vis their faith. That such a loved one is striving to destroy that religion, which has elevated the position of woman from slavery to a companionship with man, and has placed on her brow the crown of a queen of the home, 
entrusting her with the mission of begetting and schooling her children, making of him an adopted son of God and a happy citizen of his eternal kingdom. If there would be a new woman, love for Christ, love for your country, be your prayers directed to God, by your dearest entreaties to your sons, to your husbands or sweethearts, to your brothers, by your befitting instruction, and with the most diligent care to educate yourselves also. You can do much to avoid in your homes, and for those dear to you, the misery of being affiliated with the satanic army that has done so much evil to the kingdom of God, to society and everyone's fatherland. Do not forget that the Masons are the very first ones to avoid choosing Masonic women for wives. Number 183. To the Masons. It should be unusual, or not this book likely to reach the hands of some Masons. If that should happen, for whatsoever reason it may be, I entreat them to believe that their receiving it has been a mark of esteem or of love of someone who obtained it, and a proof that they judge them sincere and upright. I have considered, in so far as it was possible, and with all sincerity, the cause of Masonry, in its essence, separated that of Masons in particular, because I candidly believe there are many ignorant of the aims and the plans of society which they have joined, just as they are unaware of its real constitution, or who, in the back room, wield the supreme command. I am sure, at the very same time, that there are many in Masonry who, when they willfully understand the aim of the organization and who they are who are directing its course, these innocents will honorably withdraw from it, as so many have done, even those who had reached high degrees. We can, as will be done in a subsequent article, point out that such Chileans who have renounced masonry. Moreover, I entreat them to recollect and weigh within themselves whether it is true or not that this fraud has been followed by others, as I have stated, and if it is honorable, and if there is sincerity in establishing a fit guide to you what utilizes deceit as its essential means and methods to direct and inspire you, and for the direction hides its personality, responsibility, and authority in darkness. Lastly, if there is some word, above all those mentioned, that appears excessively harsh, I pray you excuse it, and assuredly, I do not have the slightest intention of offending anyone, but indeed of doing them the greatest good possible, convinced as I am of the extreme aberration to which they have arrived through Freemasonry. Why do you remain in Masonry? Well, reflect on these words, which a former member directs to the Masons of France, quote, You, Freemasons, are for anti-Catholic fanaticism. By so much do you regard the Catholic cause so good, so pure, so lofty, that you can attack it only under the cover and outfit of pretense of lies. Contrasting teaching are able to be noble and fruitful, but wrought in this fashion. What shame to you, quote, You radicals, who, in your February Congress of 1925, were acclaiming your leader, President of the Cabinet, when he was asserting his inviolable assurance of political integrity, is he conforming to the principle of integrity to form in a democracy part of a society that isolates that democracy with a wall of secrecy, that places itself so above it that it governs it without her knowing that? Do you excite yourselves with him alone invoked to integrity, and you yourselves give no account of your making them voluntary prisoners of an or organized intrigue? Quote, you Catholics, since there are also those who allow themselves to join such ranks for your welfare to defend your Catholicism, as you say, do you not comprehend that you outrage your principles and that you put yourselves in a state of inconsistency as much as of degradation, exposing yourselves to the need of deceiving and lying to conceal your secret? You yourselves do that, the believers of a doctrine whose moral can be summed up in these principles. Be honorable, be loyal, which, if they were universally observed, would make of our wretched earth a paradise. And you Protestants, should you not have given the same value to these considerations? You Democrats, Equalizers, Socialists, Humanitarians, Supernaturalists, neither can you give your allegiance to secret societies, nor to accept their existence and free operation without trampling your own principles. Because it is proper to such organizations to devise two classes of citizens, those who belong and those who do not belong to them, the second deceived by the first, and those in their turn cheated and exploited by their hidden masters. After a manner, through getting to the bottom of things, is verified that the only accomplishment from assembling in a secret society constitutes immediately a crime against each citizen and a conspiracy against all humanity for the advancement of some lying leaders. You, patriots, forming part of any secret society, whatever they are, are laboring in the formation of subversive channels by which the doctrines can be admitted surreptitiously into your country and under an irresistible action comparable to that of a poison gas in the trenches of the war. Finally, there remains an argument, but for its moral and social scope ought perhaps to supersede all others, and is this. The aim of the struggle with arms is the triumph by force. The ambition of the contest by secret societies is the victory for deceit. Masons, radicals, Catholics, Protestants, Democrats, humanitarians, supernationalists, patriots, honorable men of all parties, of all countries, you who do not desire to hear more about force without placing it at the service of righteousness and the lawful. Is this what you, by the maddest contradiction, strive for, the domination and exploitation 
exploitation of the peoples of the earth, assuring to those that win all the rest through its ingenuity to deceive. Number 184. Masonry and the Chilean Character Likewise, the Chilean grieves extremely over the degradation of our beautiful character, which Masonry is accomplishing. The national character is one of perfect freedom, loyalty, and sincerity. Perhaps for that reason, we are not always the best diplomats. I have had the occasion of knowing sufficiently the sincerity and liberty of the Chileans that even they have not perverted. The Chilean is frank to admit his wickedness or his aberrations, and for that reason is worthy of esteem. Whom does it not delight to rely on a friend whom you know is sincere and loyal, who says what he feels, who does not ingratiate himself to you in order to deal a blow with greater confidence? Is it not better to stand before an honest adversary who does not deceive your good faith in order to do greater damage by performing an action entirely different than one he pretends? Masonry, with its system of deceits and pretenses, is corrupting those wonderful qualities. What else can a school of thought produce that says it neither interferes with any religion or concerns politics, so that it may attack even the root of Catholic faith and ensures itself greater political superiority? Does not Masonry say that it believes in God while blotting out his name from the memory of men in its real work? Does it not proclaim liberty in order to attain to the most oppressive tyranny as she exercises over consciences? The same can be said of so many other things. From this source develops a system of pretense that has formulated itself and the cowardice of character becomes more common every day, associated with hypocrisy and disloyalty. How has it affected society on all ways? That begins by lying in its very foundations, then making the lie its norm of conduct and the rule of purpose, not influence that character. Masonry, on another score, is anti-patriotic, and patriotism is so native to Chile, sources of such heroism and glory to the Chilean name, and so beneficial that the burning love of the fatherland it has produced the burning love in our social and political life. Number 185. Disillusionment. Entire works could be written to give sincere persons an account of the disillusionment that many should have met in Masonry, who have gone into it with sincerity. There is not space for that. However, I will relate a few cases. I have mentioned Lord Ripon, supreme grand master of the English Masons, who left Masonry and Protestantism after analyzing the condemnations of the popes of Masonry. Also, I have mentioned many times the Count of Hogwitz and that of Cope and Nobincelli. In referring to the German Masons, the Catholic Encyclopedia states that, quote, the masters of the period, Lessing, Goethe, Herder, were cruelly disillusioned by what they saw and what they experienced in the life of the Lodge. Lessing spoke with contempt of the life of the Lodge. Goethe depicted the associations and Masonic activities as stupidities and wantonness. Herder wrote to the celebrated philologist Heine, I feel moral hatred for every secret society, and as a result of my experience, as much within the most intimate circles as outside them, I consign them to the devil at most. Then the persistent intrigues that prevail and the spirit of the Kabbalah crawl beneath that blind. I will not reiterate all I have heard from persons, although living under the sad lessons of experience and discontent, which they feel when they are unable to break from with the sect without destroying their position of esteem, prestige, etc. But I shall never forget what a well-known professional from Enquiquis said stated as his reasons for not joining Masonry. He said there were only two types of persons who joined Masonry, the crafty and the shameless, ignorant exploiters, and the studied conscientious class that were exploited. Don Henry Fisher Rubio, whose conscientiousness and honorability were always recognized by all in Enquiquis, a government sub-treasurer and later the secretary of the Saltpeter Association, told me that when he entered Lima in the Chilean army, he received, as did many other Chilean officials, an invitation to join masonry. But since he seldom did anything important without first consulting with his uncle, Don Roberto Rubio, grandmaster of masonry of Valparaiso, he sought his opinion. He had always respected his paternal affection and felt no one could be better able to advise him. His uncle advised him not to join masonry. And so he never did, in spite of having many friends and associates who were very influential Masons. Why did his uncle, who regarded him so highly, tell him not to join Masonry? It is known that persons very highly ranked in Masonry, and similarly honored in all the political and social world, as Don Benicio Alamos Gonzalez, Don Juan de Dios Aguilui, Admiral Latore, and others have withdrawn from Masonry and shown repentance with Christian piety in the last moments of their life for having adhered to it. There is, then, reason to reflect so ser seriously. When death seems distant and one yields to the passions that guide the heart, masonry does not terrify one. But when the maturity of judgment and closer contact with the end of life is felt, then man seeks in the very religion which masonry teaches him to despise and persecute. The sure sanctuary, the comfort, and the enlightenment that the immortal soul needs to avoid being cast mercilessly in the eternal nether regions. Number 186. Mystery. 
Here is my estimation of masonry and its works, and I do not mean the dogmatic significance of, quote, truth revealed by God, which is beyond our power of reason, but rather the common meaning of a mystery more or less inexplicable, especially for a person who is not thinking profoundly. The Apostle St. Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, speaks of Antichrist as he, quote, who opposes and is lifted above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God, for the mystery of iniquity already worketh, and then that wicked one shall be revealed, whose coming is according to the working of Satan, and all power and signs and lying and wonders, and in all seduction of iniquity to them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them to operation of error, to believe lying, that all may be judged, who have not believed the truth, but have consented to, iniqu to iniquity. From Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. In the Apocalypse, St. John paints such a woman, quote, full of names of blasphemy and surrounded with great riches, and on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of the fornications and the abominations of the earth, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. All this mystery of the beast and the woman seated upon it and of the kings and his helpers, quote, have one design and their strength and power they shall deliver to the beast of Satan. These shall fight with the lamb, Jesus Christ, and the Lamb shall overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. On the Apocalypse 17. Those does not make think one thing of anti-Christian society, which carries on its forehead mystery, and its purpose, its doctrine, and its works, because it makes a sworn secret of everything? Is it not true that its mouth is full of blasphemies? Does it not hate Jesus Christ and the saints? Does it not make war against God himself? Mystery! Spiritualism, occultism, theosophy, provide the false miracles and prodigies that hoodwink the unwary and the curious. How is it that masonry can take root in a Christian society? How is it that after the governments and the people have seen its results, they have allowed it to exist, have helped it, and extolled it? How is it that so many Catholics, in spite of the restrictions of the Church, have allowed themselves to be ensnared? How is it that so many Masons, who know they were attracted to it through one deceit, continue, nevertheless, to allow themselves to be deceived over and over again? I can only give one answer to this entire question. Mystery. And what is even sadder, mystery of iniquity. Finis. Practical Remedies No matter what the future may be, it is our duty, venerable brethren, to try to remedy an evil so deplorable and so very widespread, since we are well aware that our best and firmest hope of remedy lies in the strength of that divine religion which the Freemasons hate in proportion to their fear of it. We hold it, therefore, to be the supreme importance to utilize all its wonderful salutary power against the common enemy. Accordingly, whatever our predecessors, the Roman Pontiffs, have decreed, in view of opposing the designs and machinations of Freemasonry, Whatever they have enacted to keep men from becoming affiliated to such associations or to withdraw from them if they have had the misfortune to already be members, all and each of these measures we ratify and confirm by our apostolic authority. Full of confidence in the goodwill of Christians, we beg and beseech each one of them, for the sake of his eternal salvation, to consider it a sacred obligation of conscience, never in the least to deviate from what the apostolic see has enjoined in this matter. From Pope Leo XIII. Freemasonry is naturalistic or anti-supernatural. Naturalism is more than a heresy. It is pure, undiluted anti-Christianism. Heresy denies one or more dogmas. Naturalism denies that there are any dogmas, or that there can be any. Heresy alters more or less what God has revealed. Naturalism denies the very existence of revelation. It follows that the inevitable law and the obstinate passion of naturalism is to dethrone our Lord Jesus Christ and to drive him from the world. This will be the task of Antichrist and his Satan's supreme ambition. The great obstacle to the salvation of the men of our day as the Vatican Council points out in the First Constitution on Doctrine, what hurls more people into hell nowadays than at any other epoch is rationalism or naturalism. Naturalism strives with all its might to exclude our Lord Jesus Christ, our one Master and Savior, from the minds of men as well from the daily lives and habits of people in order to set up the reign of reason or of nature. Now, wherever the breach of naturalism has passed, the very source of Christian life has dried up. Naturalism means complete sterility in regard to salvation and eternal life. From the book, The Kingship of Christ According to Cardinal P.A. of Poitiers, pages 57 and 58.